adventures in time and space, transcribed in future tense. Dimension The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Street and Smith, publishers of astounding science fiction, bring you Dimension X. Tonight's story, First Contact, by Murray Limester. They had been in space six months now, moving with the incredibly faster-than-light speed of the overdrive. In six months, they had gone from Earth outward and outward to the crab-like nebula with the twin stars, a routine flight of exploration and scientific research. Solid object about 90,000 miles away, sir. Located door exactly. Identify it. A small object, sir. Captain, I've never seen anything like this before. Whatever it is out there is coming toward us at an incredible speed and retreating to zero just as rapidly. What's the mass of the object, Dort? Well, it varies with the distance from us, sir. Step up the scanners. Nothing, sir. Absolutely nothing shows out there. And yet there must be something. Those alarms are foolproof. Action stations, man all weapons. Condition of extreme alert in all departments immediately. Captain, what is it? Dort, I ran into the same thing once before on the Earth-Mars run. We were being located by another ship, and their locator beam was the same frequency as ours. Every time it hit, it registered to something solid and monstrous. But, Captain, we're the only Earth ship in 18 light years around. How? I didn't say it was another Earth ship out there, Dort. Another race? That's right. There's a spaceship out there, all right. But it's not manned by human beings. It had been contemplated and speculated upon. Mathematically, it was almost a certainty that such a race existed. But in 18,000 Earth years, no human spaceship had ever encountered them. Now the situation was precipitated, and somewhere outside the Earth vessel, there was an alien race. Of what shape? Of what quality? Of what psychology? It's moving, sir. Heading right for us. That speed will be in touch in ten minutes. Heading right for us, huh? Just what we'd do if a strange ship appeared in our hunting grounds. Friendly? Or maybe. We'll try to contact them. We have to do that. But friendly. Thank the Lord for the blasters. They may not be hostile, sir. They may be. That's what I'm paid for. Put on this job for to worry about the troubles that may never happen. To all hands, now hear this. A ship is approaching manned by an alien race. I'll give the signal for attack or defense if it be necessary. There'll be no move made unless I give the order. I do not wish to provoke trouble. Stand by. Their ship is slowing down, sir. It's stopped. Weapons department, report. Weapons department, report. Alien ship remarked. Target fixed. Weapons alert. Communications department, report. Communications department, report. We're receiving a modulated short wave, sir. Frequency modulated. Apparently a signal... Not enough power to do us any harm. We'll try to make some sense out of it. Report any progress to me immediately. One thing in their favor, sir. They didn't attack immediately without question. They're trying to establish contact. That seems to indicate they're reasonable. We'll see, we'll see. What are they doing now? Can you make out the locator screen? Bring that power up. Uh, They're doing something now, sir. There's a section of the hull opening. Probably an airlock, sir. If they breathe there. They're letting something out. It's round. A bomb, sir? Unknown object released from alien ship, observed by weapons department and targeted. Stand by. See what they're doing, sir? They've left the object out there right where they were, and now they're withdrawing the ship. There's no reason why that object couldn't be a bomb, Mr. Dort. Intended to let us think precisely as you're thinking right now. I just have a hunch, sir. I think they're friendly. I think whatever it is out there is a means of communication. You're probably right, but I won't gamble the ship on a probability. Sir, I'd like to volunteer to go out there and look that thing over. You understand whoever does examine it is expendable. Yes, sir. Requisition of lifeboat. If it's all right with you, sir, I'd prefer just a suit with the drive in it. It's smaller and the arms and legs won't make me look like a bomb. And I'll carry a scanner, sir. You may leave when you're ready. Thank you, sir. I'm all ready. 
Clear the lock and let me out. Weapons Department reporting to the captain. Mr. Dort located. Mr. Dort is targeted. Stand by. If that object out there is a device to capture one of our people for observation and questioning, it'll be blown out of existence, including Mr. Dort. Stand by. Mr. Dort. Mr. Dort. Report. Object, as you can see on the scanner, sir, is covered with many small horns, like the detonating horns of the obsolete mines formerly used in naval warfare. Is that their purpose? Do you assume, Mr. Dort? I'm going to find out, sir. I'm going to grab one. Mr. Dort. I'm here, sir. I don't think this is a mine. Circle it so we can see it completely through your scanner. Deadlock, sir. Nothing to report that the scanner hasn't shown you. Oh, wait a minute, sir. A section of the outer hull seems to be opening. Do you see it? Very good, Dort. Hold that. I'm sure it's a communications device, sir. Uh, it looks like it. Fix your scanner so it'll focus on that communications device. Return to the ship. Communications department. Communications department. Progress report, please. We've established communication, sir. Is there a psychologist on the team down there with you? Yes, sir. Mr. Burns is working with us. Will both of you please report to the bridge at once? Oh, you look tired, Dort. We've established fairly satisfactory communication, sir. They seem to have highly developed thought patterns. We got a satisfactory translation from the machine on the fourth attempt. We can say almost anything we want to say to each other now. Of course, how much of what they tell us is the truth, we have no way of knowing. Mr. Burns, you're the psychologist. What do you think? Well, I don't know, sir. They seem to be completely direct. They haven't let slip even a hint of the tenseness we know exists. They act as if they were setting up a means of communication for friendly conversation, but, well, there's an overtone that... Yeah. Well, Mr. Burns, I have a decision to make. On the one hand, opening contact with the friendly people of a vastly different culture could only be beneficial to us of very... On the other hand, if they're hostile, I ought to blast them out of existence without any other preliminaries. Oh, but, sir, you can't... I'm not talking to you, Dort. It's not warranted yet, sir. Yes. Now, hear this, all departments. Hear this, all departments. This ship is on an extended alert. Provisions will be made so that personnel can have maximum rest and nourishment. Communication continued by means of the artificial language set up arbitrarily between the Earthman and the aliens, decoded by the mechanical decoders. Dort disobeyed orders. He lived on powerful stimulants so that he could stay with the communications machine. Talking, talking, talking to the aliens. Other people, other people, are we being received? We are receiving your message. The chief of this ship wishes to speak with the chief of your ship. The message is heard by the chief of this ship. The chief of this ship communicates that he will hear the message of the chief of that ship. Go ahead, sir. People of the other ship, I'd like to say the appropriate things about this first contact of two dissimilar civilized races... And of my hopes that a friendly intercourse between the two peoples will result. People of that ship, what you say is all very well. But is there any way for us to let each other go home alive? That's all, sir. They've stopped sending. Very direct people. Very direct. But, but, sir, I don't follow. I didn't know what that meant. You know, is there any way for us to let each other go home alive? It means what it says, Dort. Sir, what's to stop us from just cutting communication and leaving, and they can do likewise? What's to stop us? Simply that whichever ship leaves first will be followed by the other. If they find Earth and get back to their own planet and we don't know where that planet is, Earth will be completely at their mercy. If they leave first, we'll follow them. We'll attempt to find their home planet. 
Dart, could you swear to any decision that the policymakers on Earth will come to? Sir, even if they do follow us, the closer we get to home, the more of our ships and weapons they'll face. How They'd you... never get away. Well, how do you know that they can't communicate with their home planet without returning? We can't, sir. How do you know they can't? I don't, sir. Well, so that's the situation. We'll sit out here, facing each other, trying to outguess each other. Until time wears us out. And we'll have to face the fact. Either they destroy us or we destroy them. Navigation officer, attention. Navigation officer, attention. Every star map on this ship is to be prepared for instant destruction. The chief of this ship wishes to know whether the chief of that ship can suggest an answer to the problem concerning us both. Do you want me to answer that, sir? I'll answer it myself. Tell me when to talk. Now, sir. I am giving that matter personal attention. Every effort will be bent to the solution of this problem. Will you consider a temporary truce in the meantime? What would a truce gain? Could we trust you? Would you trust us? I suggest that we continue as we have up to this particle of time. I agree. Sign off, George. Weeks went by, and during the weeks, the exchange of information continued without let-up. What particle of time are the people on that ship at? The resting time. All rest except myself and others on alert duty. Same on this ship. You people of that ship are very similar in many ways. Do you have a family? I have a mate. I have a mate and three offspring. It is too bad for them, as well as us, to have to kill each other. This ship can't see any way out of it. Can that ship? If we could believe each ship, yes. Our chief would like it. But we can't believe you, and you are afraid that we do not tell truth, although we do. This ship would trail you home if this ship were able to. That ship would do the same. But this ship feels sorry about it. I believe you're a friend. I share your belief and like you. But there is a possibility that you were put to make a trap for me. I will stop now and think it over. Just sit down, Dort. Control yourself. We're all under tension. Doesn't do any good to pace like some caged animal. Yes, sir. All right, now I've read the complete transcription of your conversations with this one alien. What does it prove, Dort? Sir, these people are so much like us in their thinking. Well, sir, they're likable. They're likable and they breathe oxygen. Their air is 28% oxygen instead of 20. But they could do very well on Earth. It'd be a highly desirable conquest for them. Dort, I'm as set against violence as you are. I don't see any way out of this. And I think we've got to break this status quo. So if in 70 hours we don't see any other way, then I have no further choice. I'll blow them to bits. Will that ship receive communications? Will that ship receive communications? This ship is listening. It seems to me better to communicate than to sit by the machine silently. I would have called you, but you signed off before. The problem goes around and around. I find no answer. Perhaps we could turn our thoughts to other things. The psychologist of this ship tells us that you people on that ship have a threshold of tolerance to tension. He tells us that you will be forced to take one action or another in a period of less than a hundred time particles. I have no communication on this matter. Well, this ship is not trying to extract unwilling information from that ship. A truth is mentioned in passing. A report of this conversation will be carried to the chief of this ship. It would be so. We are prepared. 
If only the people of this ship could meet in direct contact with the people of that ship, it might be better. We could not communicate then. The communications machine is too large to carry from place to place. And direct contact, the peoples of the two ships would be further apart than now. That's true. I am sad. Much that is pleasant has passed between us. I am sad, too. We are not yet ready for each other. We are not yet ready for each other. It's hard, isn't it, Doc? But, well, Captain, I'm sorry. I, I didn't know you were here, sir. I've been here for quite a while. Eavesdropping, I'm afraid. It's all right, sir. Nothing can be personal in a situation like this. Yeah, that's right. How long is a hundred time particles, Dort? Pardon, sir? That reference he made to us not being able to stand tension is interesting. Their psychologists seem to make more out of us than we do out of them, don't they? Yes, sir. They hit the nail right on the head. Yes, they do. I think, Dort, we'll just have to push our timetable up a bit. No further communication with the aliens under any circumstances. That's clear, isn't it? Yes, sir. Sir, if they know so much about our psychology, isn't it possible that remark was intended to make us act more quickly? Probable, Dort. Probable. Well, why would they do that, sir? Why? You tell me why, Dort. Uh, all of a sudden, I have an idea, sir. That's crazy. Well, it doesn't matter how crazy. I'll listen to it. Sir... I think these people are playing some kind of a joke on us. Joke? A joke, Dort? Yes, sir. Over and over again, I've noticed what I think is a sense of humor. A highly developed sense of humor. Do you recall when we went to all the trouble to set up a fictitious star map and then they just sent us back a, a mirror image of the same one? I think somehow they're playing a joke on us. Well, maybe you're right. In which case, you've seen practical jokers, Dort? Their jokes aren't always funny. Sometimes they hurt people. All departments, man, instant alert. All departments, man, instant alert. Report instantly. Report instantly. Weapons department alerted. Target, the enemy ship. On target, sir. Stand by. Fire! They're gone, sir. Not a trace of them left. Not a tiny trace. Now we can go home. Communications to Captain. Communications to Captain. Report. Sir, I'm picking up new signals. Same frequency as the original alien signal. That's impossible. That ship was destroyed. I'm receiving signals, sir. Set the machine up. We'll be down there in a minute. Mr. Dort, come with me, please. It's good to be on the way home. Yes, it is good. Do you suppose we'll ever figure out what happened to the other ship? Never. A blinding flash and, and they were gone. I suppose they couldn't figure a way out of the situation. An unstable people. They had no sense of humor to cope with the situation. They exploded themselves out of existence. It seems reasonable. They must have had powerful weapons to destroy themselves so completely. Yes, what a shame. In a way, I grew to like them. This isn't meant for us, sir. I don't know what's happening, but I think we're overhearing a private conversation. Yeah, I understand, Dor. Be quiet, will you? Many things might have come out of a relationship with that people. They were describing a disease they call cancer. I think it is similar to the Frogren syndrome. We might have helped them. They might have helped us, too. Well, too bad. We'll never find them again, I think. The odds of such a chance meeting in the vast space of the whole universe... There are no figures for such odds, are there? Turn it up, Dort. Turn it up louder. That's all there is, sir. The signal stopped there. 
Sir, I don't know how, but somehow when we fired at them, we didn't destroy them, but we did set up a condition whereby they've become invisible to us and we've become invisible to them. Captain to engineering department. Halt forward motion. Captain, why are we stopping? Listen, Dodge, you say they're invisible. All right, they are. But they're not destroyed because we just heard them. They're out there somewhere. Invisible. Well, you heard them, sir. They're heading for home. We're invisible to them, too, sir. How do you know, Dodge? How do you know this whole thing isn't a setup? Well, suppose that's true, Captain. You heard their conversation. They weren't talking like any monstrous people. They seemed decent and warm, just as decent and warm as we are. How do you know this conversation wasn't planted, deliberately set up for us to hear? How do you know that, Dort? <sighs> yes, sir, you're right. They may be out there and they may not. They may be telling the truth or they may be trying to trick us. They may be friends or they may be the most deadly enemies. You said they had a sense of humor, Dort. What a joke to play. To deliberately set up a situation where we wouldn't know fact from fantasy, truth from lie. Wouldn't that be a joke, Dort? Yeah, but we don't know that they did that, sir. And we don't know that they didn't. We don't know anything. Sir, does that mean we never go home again? I don't know. I have to think about it. I have to think about it. <laughs> just heard another adventure into the unknown world of the future. The world of... Dimension X. Dimension X is presented each week by the National Broadcasting Company in cooperation with Street and Smith, publishers of the magazine Astounding Science Fiction. Your host was Norman Rose. Music by Albert Berman. Dimension X is produced by William Welch and directed by Fred Way. First Contact, written by Murray Leinster and adapted for radio by Howard Rodman. Featured in the cast were Wendell Holmes, Bob Hastings, Clark Gordon, William Lally, and Stan Early. Your announcer, Fred. And now, Peter Paul Mounds, Almond Joy, and Cadbury Chocolate Bars presents Alien Worlds. Slowly rotating at the edge of deep space, 1,000 kilometers beyond the atmosphere of 21st century Earth, is the Arthur C. Clarke Astronomical Observatory, Star Lab. Here, Star Lab Research Director, Maura Cassidy, along with scientists and technicians of the International Space Authority, watch over the countless suns, planets, and star systems that fill the universe. This week, space exploration team captains John Graydon and Buddy Griff are hurled from the outer boundaries of space into the subatomic light and shadow of a world within a world as the Infinity Factor Part 1 embraces the threshold of the unknown on Alien Worlds. Astrophysicist Tom Liu Ping has been performing experimental tests in supralight travel, moving at velocities beyond the speed of light. The final step in a series of tests is now at hand. A specially modified ISA Delta series craft, the Hyperion, will be piloted by John Graydon and Buddy Griff at speeds traveled before only by an infinity of light. This is Star Lab. Go ahead, Hyperion. I just arrested Timmy and Perry. I'll behind schedule. Jay 
I've got an arrived ETA. Any problem, Tom? No problem. It's just that I am getting rocky grades. Uh, what's your new ETA, Tom? 15 minutes, 29 seconds. Roger. I copy 15 plus 29er. Your docking orbit insertion coordinates are 614 at subvector alpha, docking bay 3. Star Lab, clear. When did Tom Luke Ping arrive, Maura? He got in at 0300, John. He was late leaving Timmy and 3. That's why we rescheduled the briefing. Here's his room. He should be ready by now. Oh, Tom, excuse us. I, I really didn't realize that <laughs> it's you... It's okay. Come on in, Maura. I was just finishing my Tai Chi exercises. Oh. Ah, Captain Graydon. So good to meet you in person after all the visual communication. Yes, hello, Tom. Nice to see you. Uh, tai Chi, huh? Mm -hmm. Sort of looks like slow motion karate. <laughs> yes, actually, it's more meditation than martial art. <laughs> well, keeping in shape out here is a good idea. I do a little hatha yoga myself. Oh, very good, Mora. Very good. Well, what's our program? I understand the briefing was rescheduled. Yes, uh, we're meeting at 1300 hours in room two on Level A Conference Center. All right, I meet you there in a few minutes. Screen 6 shows the final modifications we've made on the Hyperion's drive system. Well, it looks like you've practically rebuilt the entire Delta Series propulsion system. Yes, that's right, buddy. But the key to super right velocity is the ion drive we've installed just behind the Starsmith Parsec accelerator. What effect will super light warp through have on our communication systems? In my preliminary tests, I experienced plasma sheath buildup that caused a temporary communications blackout. Is there any way we can avoid the blackout? No. But even though our telemetry signals will be delayed, when we reach super right speed, we'll be able to monitor our shadow image on the screen. But remember, the scanning grip will show where we were, not where we are. Our warp speed will actually surpass the frequency right. Any final questions? No, no, let's go. Okay. Buddy, John, let's get our gear and prepare to launch. Starlab control to Hyperion. This is the Hyperion. Go ahead, Maura. Mycroft confirms your calculation for reaching super light critical at sector 098. 098. Roger. Thanks, Maura. Good luck with the test, and uh, try not to lose touch. Hey, don't worry, we won't, Maura. Okay, buddy, let's do it. Interface all computer functions. We have a positive decoder interlock on all data terminals. Manual launch functions are canceled. Real-time launch status, 15 seconds and counting. Okay, Hyperion, and you're cleared for launch. Roger, Starlight. Okay, let's see what this baby can do. Alien Worlds will continue. Ooh, baby, I'm confessing This man's got a fickle way Now maybe you won't like it much But to explain, I gotta say Sometimes I feel like a nut Sometimes I don't I'm a joy got nuts Mounds don't I'm a joy got chocolatey
Alien Worlds continues. After months of planning and experimenting on Tinian 3, astrophysicist Tom Liu King arrives at Starlab in preparation for the final phase of tests into supra light speed travel. Assisting in the tests and piloting the modified Delta Series spacecraft Hyperion are Captains John Graydon and Buddy Griff. As the experimental vessel jets away from Starlab, Research Director Mark Cassidy prepares the monitoring procedure that will track the Hyperion telemetry in progress during the multiple light speed flight. Oh, hi, Mara. Hi, Jerry. How's it going? Well, they've made a couple of orbits at light speed one to check the systems. We're monitoring them on screen four. Dr. Cassidy, uh, this is Barbara, spectral analysis. Our monitoring is beginning to show telemetry distortion coming back from the Hyperion. What's their position, Barbara? We're tracking them in final orbit prior to the super light entry at South Vector 096. Okay, thanks, Barbara. Jerry, open a channel to the Hyperion. This is Starlab to Hyperion. Over. This is the Hyperion Starlab. Jerry, I can barely reach you. Roger. Hold on a minute, John. How's the signal now, John? Any better? No, you still break it up, Jerry. Tom, how's the ion drive functioning? Jerry, can't you do anything about the transmission? I don't know where all the hash is coming from, but there's some kind of interference. But the best we can do is keep the shadow blip on the screen. All right. And that won't help us much communications-wise. Dr. Cassidy, Barbara again. The mass proximity indicator registers a radical shift in the molecular density level of the Hyperion's hull. Start an MPI printout recording, Barbara. Mora, the Hyperion shadow blip has just disappeared from the screen. And they've vanished from all our tracking instruments. Jeez, what kind of light show was that? Scanners indicate we've walked through some kind of photon barrier. Damage report, buddy. Now the surge buffers between the ion drive and the parsec accelerator have shifted 110 degrees out of phase. And we've got heavy vibration and thermal overload on engine number two. Reduce power, buddy. Correct to a pitch of 3-1-2. And fire yaw thruster with a 0.5 vertical correction. Let's see if we can stabilize. All right, Skip. She's coming around, Skip. Where the devil are we? Let me check the translocator beacon. That's pretty strange. What is it, buddy? Well, the beacon draws a blank. And celestial guidance doesn't respond either. It's as if we were in completely uncharted space. Try a long-range scan. I don't think that would be necessary. You'll find an Earth atmosphere planet at Vector 659 of Mark 5. Where did you come up with those coordinates? I... I can't tell you more than that. Trust me. Program the coordinates and you'll see. Listen, Tom. If you know something we don't, you'd better come up with it right now. It wasn't supposed to happen like this. Tom, out with it. Yeah, come on, man. All right. About six months ago, I made breakthrough in my experiments. What kind of a breakthrough? I discovered a parallel universe during my first super right walk through Tassin Delta Five. Oh, terrific. Is that where we are now? Yes. What about the planet you just mentioned? It's a water world called Asakusha. The people of the planet live on two islands. I made contact with one of the islands called Adusa. What I found was a world out of balance. Out of balance? What do you mean? Uh, the Asakusians had an ion generator that kept the people of the planet in balance, physically and emotionally. They regarded this... It is generated as some kind of holy shrine. It's a two-piece interlocking cylinder uh, called the altar of light and dark. So what caused the imbalance? 
other people from the other island, Kudor, broke into the shrine two years ago and stole half of the altar. As a result, the iron level of the atmosphere has shifted. This shift caused the people of Edusa to become weak and passive, while those of Kudor become strong and aggressive. How did you get involved? Why did you get involved? It was my intention to return to the planet after we had completed these tasks and leave my ion generator with the people of Adusa so they could restore their physical and emotional balance. But now the generator seems to have malfunctioned. I don't know what to do. Jerry, stop cross-checking the Hyperion's last known coordinates from the MPI graph. Okay, Mara. Uh, star left is Echo Leader. Roger, Echo Leader. Go ahead. Uh, we've completed our phase two search and reconnaissance. There's not trace the Hyperion anywhere. No debris? No sign of wreckage? No, apparently she didn't break up. Uh, there's nothing here. All right, Echo Leader, thanks. Return to base. Uh, Roger, Star Lab, Echo Leader on the return. Star Lab, clear. What could have happened to them? Even at light speed, spacecraft don't just disappear. Buddy, how's number two engine holding up? Uh, thermal overload is critical, Skip. Okay, shut it down. We're going to have to put it in the water. Okay, Skip. We're on descent. A thousand meters to impact. 500 meters. Okay, hold on. Here we go. Oh, my head. Are you okay, buddy? Yeah, yeah, I'll be okay. Just give me a couple of minutes. I wonder if the ship sustained any serious damage. I think we're okay. The flotation counter inflated on impact. I don't see any structural damage. Open the hatch, Tom. Let's see where we are. Hmm. See anything? Yes. A small boat approaching. It's ready coming and rolling gun show. Uh, friendlies, I hope. <laughs> yes. They're the ones from Medusa. I told you about. Uh, ready coming. You did come back. Thank God you found us, and not the raiders of Kudor. You brought others. Yes, Rod Gancho. This uh, here is John Graydon. Hello. And uh, Buddy Griff. Pleased to meet you. Uh -huh. You, you come with us. We take you to Adusta. Why did the people from Kodor steal the beacon device from the sacred altar? Ah, Warlord Hiko sought to gain control over the two islands. To him, possession of the altar represented ultimate power. But he did not realize the far-reaching effect this would have. With each new tide, his people grew more hostile and aggressive. That is why the two halves of the shrine must be restored. If not, all the people on Sukusha will eventually die because of this imbalance. Will you help us with this task? Buddy, what do you think? Well, we're here. We might as well see what we can do. All right, then. Looks like we're going to Kodor. Where is Kodor? It is... 26 miles across the sea. Ah, the four preps of 1958. <laughs> what does he mean? Uh, never mind. It's just Buddy's way of breaking the tension. Alien Worlds will continue. Get the sensation, the from Peter Paul. Cool as the snow falling light on the trees. 
Just take a bite for a cool and deep breeze. Let it go. an engine malfunction, forcing John Graydon to ditch the ship in the sea. Ten minutes later, John, Buddy, and Tommy Lou King are rescued and taken to the nearby island of Adusa. Here, Lady Cammy and Lord Gunshow convince them to help Adusa recover a sacred altar from the nearby enemy island of Kodor. Meanwhile, on Kodor, Fleet Officer Sora enters the Imperial Throne Room with a message for Heiko, Kodor's ruling warlord. Ah, oh, Lord Heiko! Alien skyship fall in waters near Atusa. Oh, skyship? Oh, come now, Sora. You know that such things exist only in the legend. Or oh, perhaps you have had a vision. Then it is vision I not see alone. Every watchtower on windward side of Kodor see also. Shared visions are not uncommon, Sora. Hey? How are you? Have you consulted the Oracle for an explanation of this, this phenomenon? I need not consult Oracle, my lord. I need only consult Telescope. Skyships still float in oh, waters near no, Atusa. No. Not possible. Step to window, my lord. You see. Here. Take telescope. Mm. Oh, they do it, Sora. My lord? Gansho and the Reddit Kami. How is it that they have the power to call the sky gods into their service? How I should know, Lord Aiko. What do you mean, how I should know? You get a find out! I want to contact our spies on Atusa. Hey. I want to know who those intruders are. Hey, hey. And I want to know before night tide. Hey, Lord Aiko! Mara must be going crazy wondering what's happened to us. Yeah. Dear Mora, we're somewhere in a parallel universe. The weather is overcast, and so are we. Your pals, Buddy and John. P.S. Help. Uh, where's the post office, Gunshaw? I want to get this off right away. Uh, what is your friend talking about, Tom? Uh, he's expressing dissatisfaction with our circumstances. Uh -huh. Can you blame him? No, I... I suppose not. Uh, look, Tom, we know that you know that you should have told us about all this before the Hyperion took off. Mm. So we're not going to get too upset right now. Uh, but when we get back to Star Lab, if we ever do, you'd better be prepared to run for your life. All right? <laughs> all right. And thanks. Our ship is ready, my lord, Gunshaw. Uh, wait a minute. I don't mind sailing into the valley of the shadow of death, but not in broad daylight. The sun sets quickly on twilight afternoons like these, buddy. It will be dark long before we sail. Cross your heart? My heart? Uh, that's just Buddy's way of asking for reassurance, Cammy. Oh. Yes, buddy. Cross my heart. 
Uh, Tom, where's the equipment you brought ashore from the Hyperion? Over here, John. Let's see. Two laser rifles, two hard beam photon pistols, five night vision helmets, a tool pack, and a hospital kit. Okay, pass out the helmets, buddy. Right, Skip. Oh, oh, what use are these helmets, John? The lens on top projects a type of light that can be seen only if you look through the helmet's faceplate. Then, when we get to Kodor, we will be able to see in the dark without those in the dark seeing us. Yes? Yes, that's right. Uh, another miracle of rare device. You you have so many. Are they endless? I hope not, Gunsho. We're going to need every miracle we can get our hands on before this is over. The night tide cycle is beginning, my lord, Gunsho. Yes. Y yes, it is time we sailed. Have you told Kiatsu where we are going? Yes. He's been aboard the ship all afternoon charting our course. Who is Kiatsu? Uh, he is our helmsman. A navigator, Tom. He knows these waters better than anyone on Adusa. Okay, let's get going. Sora, do you still have the message to carry about the brother this afternoon? Hey, Lord Echo. Read it to me again. But Lord Echo. I already need you a dozen times. Please, Zora. If you wish to remain in the good graces of your inferior warlord, you will indulge him. Not a question him. Excellent point, Lord Echo. <clears throat> My Lord Echo, Gunshu Kami, and three sky gods depart for Kodar on night time. Course I have chartered will take ship within 100 leagues of Pagoda Tower between islands. Your faithful servant, Kiatsu. Good old Kiatsu. He certainly doesn't epitomize the word of spy, doesn't he? Hey, 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 he does indeed, my lord. Hey. And what arrangements have been made to welcome our visitors from Adusa? But, Lord Heiko... Tell me again, Sora. I love the image it turns us up. <laughs> Fifteen Quartorian seeds galleys positioned in semi-circle round Pagoda Tower. Uh, when Gyatso sail past tower, uh, circle will close. Oh. And Gongshu, Kami, and Sky Guards will be taken prisoner. Oh, 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 oh. you certainly have a way with the world, Sora. I, I thank you, Lord Echo. Please wait. What you plan to do with them after the capture? We'll try to persuade the Sky Guards to give us the secrets of their power. Hey? And if they not easily persuaded, but then we will simply feed them to the cannibal eels. Ah. And when no trace of them remains, we will tell ourselves they never existed. Ah, hey. After all, Sora, life must go on. <laughs> One of the Infinity Factor was written by Larry Oakner, Jim Cook, Lee Hansen, and Ron Thompson, and starred Linda Gary, Chuck Olson, Bruce Philip Miller, and Corey Burton, with special guests Helen Funai, Herb Ellis, Larry Moss, Joe Young, and Clark Warren. Associate producer Ron Thompson, music director Tom Rounds, engineer Stu Jacobs. Assistant to the producer, Jim Cook. Technical consultant, Peter Skye. Alien Worlds was created, produced, and directed 
by Lee Hansen and is distributed by Watermark Incorporated. And so until next week, this is Roger Dressler inviting you to join us for the conclusion of The Infinity Factor from the elsewhere and elsewhen of Alien Worlds. Peter Paul and Cadbury Chocolate Bars hope you have enjoyed Alien Worlds. And now, Peter Paul Mounds, Almond Joy, and Cadbury Chocolate Bars presents Alien Worlds. Slowly rotating at the edge of deep space, 1,000 kilometers beyond the atmosphere of 21st century Earth, is the Arthur C. Clarke Astronomical Observatory, Star Lab. Here, Star Lab Research Director Mara Cassidy, along with scientists and technicians of the International Space Authority, watch over the countless suns, planets, and star systems that fill the universe. In last week's episode, astrophysicist Tom Liu Ping arrived at Star Lab for a final phase of tests in the development of superlight travel. Piloting the modified Delta Series spacecraft Hyperion and assisting in the tests are space exploration team captains John Graydon and Buddy Griff. As the experimental vessel jets away from Star Lab, Mora monitors the progress of the multiple light speed flight. Dr. Cassidy, the mass proximity indicator registers a radical shift in the molecular density level of the Hyperion's hull. Start an MPI printout recording, Barbara. Mora, the Hyperion shadow blip has just disappeared from the screen. And they've vanished from all our tracking instruments. A flash of multicolored light sweeps past the Hyperion as it passes from one dimension into another and enters a parallel universe known only to Tom Liu Ping. Where the devil are we? You will find an Earth atmosphere planet at vector 659 Mark 5. It's a water world called Sakusha. The people on the planet live on two islands. I made contact with one of the islands called Adusa. What I found was a world out of balance. Out of balance? What do you mean? The Secutians had an ion generator which kept the people on the planet in physical and emotional balance. It's a two-piece interlocking cylinder they call the altar of light and dark. So what caused the imbalance? The people from the other island, Kudor, stole half of the device. As a result, the ion level in the atmosphere shifted. The people on Adusa have become weak and passive, while those on Kudor have become strong and aggressive. Orbiting above the emerald green water world of Sakusha, the Hyperion suddenly develops an engine malfunction and is forced to ditch in the sea. Minutes later, John, Buddy, and Liu Ping are rescued by Tom's friends, Lady Cammy and Lord Gunshow. The three are taken to the nearby island of Adusa, where they're asked to go to Kodar and help recover the cylinder stolen from the altar of light and dark. Will you help us with this task? Buddy, what do you think? Well, we're here. We might as well see what we can do. Kodor, Fleet Officer Sora, and ruling warlord Hiko, now aware of the plot to regain the cylinder, discuss a counter plan. Fifteen Kodorian siege galleys positioned in semicircle round Pagoda Tower. When Gyatso sail past tower, Sokol will close, and Gongshu, Kami, and Sky Guards 
will be taken prisoner. And now, the conclusion of the Infinity Factor on Alien Worlds. <laughs> Jerry, let me see the last telemetry printout on the Hyperion. There you go, Mara. Thanks. Jerry, has all this data been cross-checked? As far as I know. Why? Well, according to this, the Hyperion is still right where it was when it disappeared. What? Well, then why aren't the scanners picking it up? They can't, Jerry. The MPI data indicates the Hyperion has been reduced to the size of a subatomic particle. Kodorian siege galleys. They're all around us. Ah, I see no Kodorian vessels, my lord. Perhaps that helmet causes her to see things that are not there. No, Kiyakyu. The helmets allow her to see through darkness. Lord Gansho. Ah, let me light this lantern so I might see. Kiyatsu, what are you doing? Skipper, he's signaling those ships. Stop it. <laughs> I can see many boats closing in on us. What are we going to do? We're going to take them out, that's what. Skip, right, buddy. Fire. Find the gods. A right new shooter. Good work. They break formation. Look, this corridor. I can see the island. Tom, Tom, take the helm. I know a cove just beyond those cliffs. John, Buddy, Tom, Lord Gunshow, and Lady Kami approaches the pagoda tower between Adusa and Kodor. Kiatsu, the ship's helmsman, signals to the fleet of Kodorian siege galleys waiting in the darkness. Stop, Kiatsu! Skipper, he's signaling those ships. Stop it! <laughs> Suddenly realizing that Kiatsu is a Kodorian spy, John and Buddy knock the traitorous helmsman unconscious and engage the enemy warships with laser rifles. <laughs> Half an hour later, Fleet Officer Sora reports the outcome of the battle to Warlord Heiko. Ten ships, my Lord Heiko! The Sky Guards projected lightning bolts that destroy ten of our ships! I nearly drown. Where are the Adusans and their Sky Guards now, Sora? You have captured them, yes? Uh, no. No! What do you mean, no? I mean, no, we did not capture them. They escaped to the other side of the island. Escaped? Hey, you had better find them, Sora, or I'll drown you myself. Oh, Lord Eko, you don't want to do that. 
どうよキラツゴロードヘイコーキラツゴロードヘイコーキラツゴロードヘイコーキラツゴロードヘイコーキラツゴロードヘイコーキラツゴロードヘイコーキラツゴロードヘイコーキラツゴロードヘイコーキラツゴロードヘイコーキラツゴロードヘイコーキラツゴロードヘイコーキ So, my trusty Kiazzo, you did not favor me after all. No, 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 Rod Heko, I not favor. Kiazzo,、oh. tell me about the Sky God's lightning. How did he do it? Kiazzo?、Uh, um, how I should know, my Rod, I out cold during battle? You, you missed the whole thing! That will be all, Piazzo! Yes, Rod Hiko. Sora, hi. Are you are there. Oh, you tell me about the lightning. Was it wonderful? Oh, Lord Hiko, it was so terrible.、Oh. And yet,、oh. it was beautiful too.、Oh. Everywhere there was lightning. Oh, oh. Red, orange, oh. and purple. <laughs> There was fire and smoke and the crack of wooden masts hitting, rolling and burning. It was as if the night itself had turned to fire. Oh, Sora, that's a way with the words you have. Keep the cylinder? Yes, in his throne room. Do you remember how to get into the palace, Lord Gensho? Yes, lady, I remember. How long has it been? He was brought here 200 moon tides ago and nearly tortured to death by Haeko's warriors as a demonstration of Kodor power.、Uh, I used to come here often. Kodor was once the trade center for the two islands. Of course, that was before Lord Haeko became so obsessed. Yes. But we do have one advantage. Haeko must certainly know by now that we are in the company of Sky Gods. Everyone on Sakusha fears the Sky God legends. Even Haeko. Oh, I'm sure we can make that work for us. What do you mean, buddy? We'll use our lasers to make them dance a little. I mean, we don't want to hurt them. Ah.、Uh, It is good you do not wish to harm anyone. We also believe this to be right. To hear you speak makes me feel for the first time since the theft of the cylinder that all is not lost. Don't worry, Gansho. We'll get your cylinder back. And I will do my best to understand the manner in which to restore the altar. But I will need your help, Lord Gansho.、Uh, yes, Don. Uh, can you tell me if there are any insignias, markings, colors, or anything like that which connect the two halves of the altar?、Uh, yes. The markings on the two halves of each disc fit together to form the law of the world symbol.、Uh, stop a moment, huh? Just a moment.、Uh, please show me the symbol. Here, draw it for me on the ground. Oh,、uh, yes. Circle, of course, the infinity factor. My lord, Hanko, Sky Gods, Gunshu, and Lady Kami enter palace. What shall we do? What shall we do? We, we should call the gods, you idiot! Gods! Lord Hako! Gods, where are they? Hell, but Lord Hako! Where are my gods? I already call gods, my、oh. lord.、Oh. They ran away, frightened by sky gods. Lightning shot us. They run? I, my gods, run away! Hey, hey! Oh, Sora, Sora, quickly! That's the end of it! Dig it! Lord Hako! Lord Hako, stop! Oh, you will be killed! Oh, where, where, where? 
Rota Gansho, and the Red Kami Ho, welcome. Oh, welcome, Bakato Kotor. We have come to take back the cylinder for the altar. Did you eat the buck? That's right. Hand it over, Hiko. And if I refuse? You've seen the power of our uh, lightning shooters on your vessels. How about we make a trade? You, Sky Gods, give me a secret of your power, and uh, I return the cylinder. Huh? Lord Hako, see that vase over there? Oh, that's really beautiful, yes? It is my favorite. Oh, you! You destroy my Kondorian Bagotabis! Sora! Sora! Attack! No, me, Lord Hako. Sora knows want to end up like a vase. All right, Heiko, that's it. Tell us where the cylinder is, now. Oh, Sora. Sky gods have us in tight spot. Give it to them, please. All right. All right. Oh, cylinder is over there. Behind Katan. Yes, yes, it is here. Oh, oh surrender, Lord Gunshaw. Oh, Lord Gunshaw. All right, everyone, come on. It's nearly daylight. Let's head back to the boat and set sail for the shrine. Alien worlds will continue. Uh, pardon me. Isn't that a Cadbury chocolate bar? I've never tried one. Oh, that's too bad. Do you mind if I have a teensy piece? Hey, you took my bar. I'll just take a little bit. It was for my wife and me. Oh, she'll love it. See, this is great. You know you can get carried away with this stuff? Yes, I've noticed. Oh, come on, it's a big bar. It's getting smaller. When people get a taste of a big, thick Cadbury chocolate bar, they get very carried away. Because only a Cadbury bar is so rich, so creamy, so Cadbury. And with the big size Cadbury chocolate bar, you get a big choice. Cadbury fruit and nut, Cadbury almond, Cadbury caramello, and of course the big favorite, Cadbury milk chocolate. So remember, when you get your Cadbury, be careful. Because with Cadbury, people can get very carried away. Uh, can I have my Cadbury back now? Your Cadbury? Oh, well, I guess I got carried away. You'll get carried away with Cadbury. Alien Worlds continues. Confronted at last by what Heiko believes to be sky gods, John, Buddy, and Tom Liu Ping convince him to surrender the cylinder, which will restore Sakusha's ion generator. Meanwhile, Commissioner White arrives on Star Lab to confer with Mora about the mysterious disappearance of the Hyperion. There's a strong possibility that whatever happened to them isn't alien to Tom Liu Ping at all. What do you mean? As soon as we heard about the Hyperion's disappearance, we pulled all of Tom's research tapes and retraced his experiments. We discovered through the fuel inventories that he'd taken some earlier test flights that no one knew about. Well, how does this tie in with his research? Well, from what we could decipher, he discovered some kind of parallel universe. There's also an emotional involvement. We found his diary. Personal motivation? Yes. He intended to return to this sphere of existence all along. I can't get over it. The shrine, it, it, it's so beautiful. The hieroglyphics. These paintings. And these. They look like formulas. The markings represent the entire story of Sakusha's great plan. It tells of how our world was to become one of perfect balance and wisdom. The altar was placed here to ensure that future. Lady Kami, the, Tom has restored the altar. 
It is working. All right. Well done, Tom. Well, I'm glad it wasn't as difficult as you expected. <laughs> it was actually quite simple. Once Rod Gunshu gave me the description of the pattern the two cylinders formed. It's a very primitive ion generator by our standards, but quite effective. How soon will the effects become noticeable, Tom? I measure the output of the ion generator as soon as it began working. I would estimate that its effect on the secutions will be seen shortly. Look, a ship is approaching. It's Haeckel's Imperial warship. We've just enough time to reach our ship before the generator is up to full power. Okay, let's go. But remember, buddy, we don't really know what effect this generator will have on these people, or on us. As John, Buddy, Tom, Cammy, and Lord Gunshow carefully make their way back to the ship, Sakusha's ancient altar of light and dark fills the air with an ionized aura, re-establishing the planet's balance. Meanwhile, aboard Lord Hiko's Imperial flagship. Ah, oh, Sora, isn't it a wonderful day for a sailboat ride? Water smooth and the wind just right. Hey, my lord. Oh, sailboat, very relaxing. Uh -huh. <laughs> lord Hiko, huh? didn't we have something we were going to do today? Ah, hmm. oh, yes, Sora, I believe you're right. Did it have anything to do with a rod a gun show? There's a, he's a vessel off the window at the side. Uh, hi, hi. It must be we were to sail with him. Shall we go alongside? By all means, Sora. By all means. Let us greet our old friend, the good and the kindly Lord of Atusa. Uh. Rod the gun show. Ready, Kami. How are you? Excellent, Rod Heko. Excellent. Who are your three friends? They are friendly visitors from another world. Another world? You hear that, Zora? Hey? Visitors from another world? What other world around the country? Uh. What? <laughs> what? <laughs> what a funny name for a world. <laughs> you must bring your friends to Koda for a visit. Thank you, Lord Hanko. I'm glad to see that you're feeling better. Uh-huh. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We will look forward to that. Be seeing you. Goodbye. Goodbye. Come on. Goodbye, Lord Hanko. Sora, what did the visitor from other world mean? Now that I'm feeling better, how I've been ill? Perhaps he was just wondering about your health. Ah, uh ah. -huh. Where I never felt better. So good to be feeling so good. Eh, Sora? Hey! I could not believe how quickly Eiko changed. Yeah, he really went from a tiger to a pussycat, didn't he? A tiger to a pussycat? Buddy means he went from ferocious to gentle, Lady Kemi. I am glad Lord Haeckel became pussycat. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's good to see the altar fulfill its purpose in restoring the Kudorian psychological balance. Uh, now, Lord Heiko will be able to govern his island wisely, gracefully, and with great kindness. What about your starship? Will it be able to return you to your world? What I learned about your ion generator showed me how to repair our spacecraft. We will be able to return safely, I'm sure. Will you ever return to Sakusha? There is enough in common in our hearts to make us all part of a great oneness. We too often forget one another. The emptiness is illuminated by the light of the heart. I must accept full responsibility for what I have done in our world first. Then perhaps I may return and go forth with what I have helped you create and give you greater understanding of what you have yet to create. We will always remember your presence and what you have brought to us. Goodbye. Goodbye, Lady Kami. Lord Gunshell. Goodbye, buddy. John, so long. I remember to keep clear of the ship when we lift off. All right. Uh, you have a safe journey. As Lady K 
Cammy and Lord Gunshow watch the Hyperion rocket away from the emerald green water world of Secusha, John, Buddy, and Tommy and Ping make ready for the critical warp back through time and space into their own universe. Uh, Buddy, let's program our coordinates for FTL reentry. Right, Skip. Tom, that circle Gunshow drew on the ground, what was that all about? This circle, John, was the missing key to all my research. I knew that by understanding what had happened on Sokusha, I would be able to understand what I had discovered. We were reduced in time and space to an infinity where balance is restored through the cohesiveness of philosophy and science together. And the moon circle on the cylinders united the two. The moon circle? Uh, yes, you see, the circle had been broken, separated, and the way the two cylinders fit together restored the circle and the balance of Sakusha. We're programmed for FTL re-entry at Vector 558, Mark 1, Skip. Okay. Keep your fingers crossed. Mora, Commissioner White, look. The Hyperion's back on the screen. Uh, at least I think it's the Hyperion. Well, looks like your theory may have been well-founded, Commissioner. Yes, it looks that way, doesn't it? Hyperion to Starland, over. All right. <laughs> it is them. <laughs> we read you, Hyperion. Welcome back. Thanks, Jerry. Uh, what's going on, a party? You might say that, yes. Are you all okay? Oh, we're fine, Ma. Where have you been? And do you know what happened? Yes, we know what happened. We're still not sure how we got there, but it was an incredible experience. We'll tell you all about it soon. Uh, Jerry, give us a document insertion. And break up the Beaujolais. We're on our way home. Infinity Factor Part 2 was based on a story concept by Larry Oakner and written by Lee Hansen, Jim Cook, and Ron Thompson. Our stars included Linda Gary, Chuck Olson, Bruce Philip Miller, and Corey Burton. With special guest stars Clark Warren, Larry Moss, Herb Ellis, Joe Young, and Helen Funai. Associate producer Ron Thompson. Music director Tom Rounds. Engineer, Stu Jacobs. Assistant to the producer, Jim Cook. Alien Worlds was created, produced, and directed by Lee Hansen and is distributed by Watermark Incorporated. And so until next week, this is Roger Gressler inviting you to join us for our next adventure, Earthlight on Alien Worlds. Peter Paul and Cadbury Chocolate Bars hope you've enjoyed Alien Worlds. Wheat checks, rice checks, and good hot Ralston presents Space Patrol! High adventure in the wild, vast reaches of space. Missions of daring in the name of interplanetary justice. Travel into the future with Buzz Corey, Commander-in-Chief of the Space Patrol! In today's transcribed adventure, Cadet Happy is piloting a space observatory while a scientist studies a strange phenomena. It's an invisible force that completely destroys all matter. Right now, Buzz Corey is in Terra the Fifth, warning Happy to veer away from the force, but too late. Out of control, the space observatory whirls toward the invisible menace. Happy! Happy, can you hear me? Pull away from it. I'm trying to, sir, but the rockets don't seem to have any effect. Use full power on your starboard rockets. I am, sir, but we're caught in some sort of a whirlpool. Have hit full repeller ray. If you're caught in there, you're finished. We'll be back in just a moment with today's Space Patrol story, The Hole in Empty Space. <laughs> Yeah, 
hear that, gang? That's right. Buzz Corey will send you a real, honest-to-goodness Space Patrol spaceophone set. Sounds just like a walkie-talkie. Looks just like the spaceophone Buzz Corey himself uses. Imagine, you can talk on it to someone a straight 50 feet away. Now, let me show you with this spaceophone right here. Uh, calling Bob Rate. Can you hear me, Bob? I'll say loud and clear. Just like talking on the walkie-talkie in the telephone, right? Right. I call it the magic phone you can carry anywhere. Yes, sir. See how the spaceophone sounds, boys and girls? Just like a telephone. Just like a walkie-talkie. And lots of fun. Yes, sir. So send for your spaceophone set today. You get two blue and yellow plastic spaceophones. You get 50 feet of communication cord. You get a spaceophone briefing sheet. Now here's all you do to get the entire set. Buy a box of Instant Ralston. Then, with your name and address, send 25 cents in coin and an Instant Ralston box top to Space Patrol, Box 686, St. Louis, Missouri. This offer good only in continental U.S. and may be withdrawn at any time. That's Space Patrol, Box 686, St. Louis, Missouri. The Space Patrol, with its well-trained personnel, has a very high morale. Disciplinary action is rarely necessary. In fact, a serious infraction of important regulations is so unusual that Commander Corey himself insists on a personal accounting from the man involved. Right now, Buzz is reading a report from the Commandant of the Mercury Patrol Squadron as Happy enters the central office on Terra. Commander. Yes, Happy? Lieutenant Grayson's waiting in the outer office. Oh, thanks. Ask him to come in, please. Yes, sir. Lieutenant Grayson, Commander Corey wants to see you. I'll call you when I'm through here, Happy. Yes, sir. Commander, at ease, Lieutenant. Sit down. Yes, sir. You have an exceptionally fine record. I've been looking it over, and so far I can find no explanation for your behavior of the last few hours. I'm sorry, Commander. Is that all you have to say? Except that I'm ready to take the brainograph test. Lieutenant, it shouldn't be necessary to resort to the brainograph to obtain a routine report from a space patrol officer. I realize that, sir. You returned from a routine search mission, three hours overdue and with ammunition expended, yet you refuse to offer any explanation. Those are the facts, Commander. I want a straightforward answer. Why didn't you file a report with your commanding officer? Commander, Colonel Gregory is a practical officer. He goes strictly by regulations, by routine. That's hardly a criticism, Lieutenant. I realize that, sir. But if I told Colonel Gregory what happened out there, he'd conclude that I was, well, space-happy. You're not responsible for the conclusions of your commanding officer. In all due respect, Commander, in this case, I'm not so sure. What do you mean? Something's out there in space that regulations don't cover. Commander, I want a brainograph test so I can be sure of myself, sure that my mind isn't playing tricks on me. Grayson, suppose you tell me the whole story. <sighs> all right, Commander. I was about to head back for Mercury when I saw a meteor. I tracked it on the viewscope to see if it was headed toward any shipping lanes. Yes? It was still pretty big on the screen when it suddenly vanished. Exploded? No, sir, just vanished. I started after it and checked for fragments. There weren't any. It was just as though... as though the meteor disappeared into a hole in space. A hole in space? I know it doesn't make sense, but that's the only way I can describe it. Nothing showed up on the viewscope. I, I tried both the ultraviolet and infrared scanners. Nothing. What about the cosmic missiles you fired? I swung in a wide circle around the point where the meteor disappeared. Suddenly, a black spot appeared on the sun, as though a planet were between me and the sun, an eclipse. But it wasn't a planet? No, Commander. There was no planet within thousands of DUs. There was nothing, no solid object to account for that spot. Well, maybe it was on the sun itself. No, because it moved across the sun in relation to the movement of my ship. That's when I fired the cosmic missiles. What happened? The missiles vanished. Without an explosion? Without an explosion. Lieutenant, that's the strangest story I ever heard. You don't believe me? I didn't say that. I think your account deserves further investigation. You should have told Colonel Gregory. He'd have put me in the infirmary for mental and emotional checkup. I figured I'd get a brainograph test sooner if I risked disciplinary action. And I was right. He sent me here to Terra immediately. That isn't a very wise risk to take, Grayson. Commander, that thing in space, whatever it is, is moving. Moving toward the inner planets. Can you point out the location where you saw it on that wall chart? Yes, sir. It was approaching the Mercury orbit on a line from the star Myra. About here, sir. How fast was it moving? It seemed to vary, but at the time I wasn't in any condition to make accurate measurements. I thought I was going space happy for certain. Are you ready for that brainograph test? Yes, sir. And come on. 
Oh, excuse me, sir. Happy, will you get Major Robertson? I want to run a brainograph test. Yes, sir. Oh, here's a top priority bulletin from communications, sir. A robot space freighter vanished. What do you mean, vanished? Well, it suddenly pulled off course. Two passenger ships tracked it, and it swung in a wide circle, then smaller and smaller circles, and then just disappeared. Not a trace on the view scopes. Where did this happen? Midway between Mercury and Venus, sir. On an orientation line with Myra. Lieutenant Grayson, I think we'll cancel that brainograph test. Happy. Yes, sir. Get my ship ready immediately. I'll notify Colonel Gregory that Lieutenant Grayson is assigned to temporary duty with headquarters. Thank you, sir. As astrogator aboard Terra 5. Commander, we're out beyond the point where the robot freighter vanished. Very good, Lieutenant. Happy established a zigzag course toward the sun. Yes, sir. We'll lace back and forth across the line between the sun and Myra. Reduce our velocity to 10,000 DUs. Right, sir. All view scopes negative, Commander. What's our approximate position, Grayson? In a few minutes, we'll cross the Venus orbit, sir. This is the craziest search I've ever been on, Commander. Looking for something that isn't here. It's there, all right. It just doesn't show up on any instruments. If you could have seen that meteor vanish, and those missiles... No, wait. There's something moving across the sun. A black spot. That's it. We've located it. Well, let's be certain. Check the viewscope, Happy. Yes, sir. Does anything register? Nothing except the sun itself. Reverse rockets while I turn on the space phone, Happy. We'll hold our present position for the time being. Commander Corey and Terra 5 to Major Robertson at Space Patrol Headquarters, Terra. Commander Corey to Major Robertson. Major Robertson here. Go ahead, Commander. Robbie, we're at the Venus orbit, Sun Myra orientation. We found what we're looking for. What is it? We don't know. It's visible only as a black spot against the sun, and it definitely is not a solid object. Well, I've contacted Professor Jelka for you, Commander. He's aboard Space Observatory Number 2 off Saturn. Good. Robbie, space phone and all planets bulletin immediately. All shipping is to avoid this sector of space until further notice. Yes, Commander. All commercial, private, and space patrol ships are to evacuate this sector immediately. Roger. Well, Professor Jelka is waiting on the 150 megacycle channel, Commander. Thanks, Robbie. Corey out. Happy switch to 150 MCs. Yes, sir. Commander Corey aboard Terra 5 calling Professor Jelka aboard Space Observatory Number 2. Professor Jelka here. Go ahead, Commander. Professor, have you detected any unusual phenomenon in space the last few days in the direction of Myra? Mm, no, no, Commander. There's something out there. Now within the orbit of Venus. It's not a solid object, but it cuts off light from the sun. Well, it's possibly a cloud of gas or tiny particles. Too sharp an outline, Professor. Besides, things like meteors, cosmic missiles, and spaceships just don't disappear permanently in a gas cloud. Did you say disappear? Vanish completely, without an explosion or a trace. Uh, Commander, I must have a chance to study this thing at once. I think I know what it is. It's got us baffled. What is it? I call it a cycloplex. A cycloplex? I wrote a paper about it 12 years ago, purely as a theoretical idea. This is no theory, it exists. This is marvelous, Commander. With your permission, I pulled the space observatory out of the orbit around Saturn and head for your present location. Well, good. No ordinary instruments register it. You might have some that will. Set your vector for Pluto. Where that vector crosses the orbit of Venus, you'll roughly be at our position. Thank you, Commander. I'll contact you when I'm on the vector. Good. Corey out. Well, at least there's one man in the solar system who seems to have an idea what this thing is. I hope so. But what's more important, I hope he'll know what to do about it. I've got the observatory in the view scope, sir. It's only a few DUs away. A very good time, considering. Turn on the space phone, Happy. Yes, sir. Corey aboard Terra 5, calling Professor Jelka. Jelka here. Go ahead, Commander. We've picked up the observatory in the view scope. Have you located us? Uh, yes, Commander. But I can detect the cycloplex. I've used several types of detection devices. You'll see the black disk against the sun in a few minutes. We'll join space locks with you and come aboard the observatory. Very good, Commander. Corey out. Grayson. Yes, sir. Well, Happy and I handle the controls. You watch that black spot. If it moves away from the sun, let me know. Right, Commander. We're abreast of the observatory airlock, sir. Oh, good. Stand by with magnetic holding field. Standing by, sir. Corey to Joker. Uh, go ahead, Commander. Professor. Hold your space observatory on an even vector. We're going to make contact. Yes, Commander. Apply magnetic holding field, Happy. Space lock secured, sir. Lieutenant Grayson, keep an eye on the controls. Happy and I'll enter the observatory. Yes, sir. 
Open the inner hatch, Happy. Press the release catch in the observatory hull. Ah, come in, Commander. This is the most thrilling moment of my life. Professor Jalka, it's about the most puzzling moment of mine. Well, this is my cadet, Happy. How do you do, Professor? Uh, how do you do? I tell you, Commander, this is a cycloplex. Just as I described it 12 years ago, they really do exist. Well, fine, Professor, but tell me, just what is a cycloplex? Well, uh, well, you might call it a hole in space. That's just the way Grayson described it. Grayson? Lieutenant Grayson, the space patrol officer who discovered it. Professor, this cycloplex has already destroyed a meteor, two cosmic missiles, and a robot spaceship. And it's moving toward the inner planets. If it holds its present direction and velocity, Mars will move right into it in a few days. Ah, that would indeed be a calamity. What's the nature of this thing? What happens to objects that move into it? Well, they are transported into other dimensions. Or perhaps into a matrix of several dimensions. Well, they cease to exist in space as we know it, that's certain. Yes, for years, mathematicians have speculated on the possibility of many separate dimensions existing simultaneously. I'd like to circle around it and study it some more. Or to maneuver the observatory and still manage the instruments. Well, Commander, the controls are very much like standard spaceship controls. Couldn't I work them while the professor handles the instruments? Ah, that would be splendid. All right, Happy, you maneuver the observatory. I'll go back to our ship with Grayson. We'll keep you informed as nearly as we can on the location of the cycloplex. Commander, they're getting pretty close. I'll tell Happy to be careful. Commander Corey to Cadet Happy. Happy here. Go ahead, sir. You're bearing pretty close to the cycloplex, Happy. Change your vector. The professor wants me to hold it on this heading, sir. His instruments are beginning to pick up something. Remember what happened to that robot spaceship, Cadet. But this isn't a robot. And the instruments are picking up something. We are on the verge of an exciting discovery, Commander. According to my theory... Well, right now, Professor, I'm relying on Grayson. He's had practical experience with this thing. Happy, this is an order. Pull away from the cycloplex. Yes, sir. Look at the observatory. It's whirling toward it. Happy, pull away from it. I'm trying to, sir, but the rockets don't seem to have any effect. Use full power on your starboard rockets. I am, but we're caught in some sort of a whirlpool. That hit full repeller ray. If you're caught in that cycloplex, you're finished. We'll be back with Space Patrol in just a moment. Hi, gang. Space Patroller Dick Tufel speaking from the planet Earth. Today I'm doing a man-on-the-street report. Going to see what some of these young fellows here on their way to school think about those three checkerboard super cereals, Rice Chex, Wheat Chex, and Instant Ralston. Now, here's a sharp-looking lad. Uh, say, tell me, what did you say the very first time you tried delicious Wheat Chex, that bite-sized super cereal spun out of shredded wheat? What did I say? I said... Enough said. Thank you. Now, here's a fine-looking boy. Uh, say, what do you think of Rice Chex, the bite-sized super cereal made of crisp and crunchy shredded rice? Uh, what did you say, for example, the very first time you tried it? <whistles> Thank you. That's good enough for me. And here's another young man. Tell me, what's your opinion of Instant Ralston, the hot super cereal? Man, oh, man, oh, man, oh, man. <laughs> there you are, gang. That's what these fellows think about the checkerboard super cereals. The only three official cereals of the Space Patrol. Try them yourself. You'll say the same thing. Mm -hmm. Man, oh man, oh man, oh man. Get them at your grocers today in the red and white checkerboard packages. The super cereals that help to supercharge you rice checks, wheat checks, and to warm up your motor, good hot Ralston. A space patrol officer, Lieutenant Grayson, has discovered an alarming peril in outer space. An invisible force that completely destroys matter without leaving a trace. Professor Jelka, an astronomer and mathematician, says this force, which he calls a cycloplex, is actually a hole in outer space. Happy, piloting the space observatory for the professor, flew in too close to the strange force. Now the observatory is being whirled closer and closer to disaster. Meantime, Commander Corey and Lieutenant Grayson in Terror the Fifth are trying desperately to find a way to save Happy and Professor Jelka. Happy, is your repeller ray on full? Yes, sir. All rockets on the starboard side and stern as well. The observatory is being pulled faster than ever toward the cycloplex. Jelka never should have ordered Happy to go so close. The observatories have a very low power ratio in proportion to their mass, Grayson. We can only give it a boost with our own power. You mean make magnetic contact with the observatory? Yes. 
Great idea, Commander. You realize what'll happen if we fail? I'm waiting your orders, Commander. And let's go. You handle a magnetic holding field, Grayson. Yes, sir. Commander, what are you doing? I'm going to tow you away from the cycloplex. Don't try it, sir. There's some sort of a whirlpool effect. A vortex, the professor calls it. Terra 5 may have enough power to pull itself and the observatory out of danger. But, sir, you can't. The sooner we act, the better chance we'll all have. Stand by for orders. Standing by, sir. We're ready to make contact, Happy. Grayson, apply magnetic holding field. Yes, sir. All right, Happy. Keep the observatory rockets on full power. Yes, sir. I'm going to increase our own power slowly at first. We won't try to fight the cycloplex force too strongly. We'll cut across at a tangent, understand? Yes, Commander. Here we go. Is it working, Commander? I can't tell yet. Happy. Yes, sir. As I increase the ship's power, it'll put a terrific strain on the hull of the observatory. Watch for any sign of damage. I will, Commander. that sound again. What is it? It's coming from the space phone system. Happy, do you hear it? Yes, sir. You're picking it up from the professor's instruments. He says it's caused by the cycloplex. Commander, our vector's changing. We're moving away from the cycloplex. We'll add a little more power. Happy, did the professor turn off his instruments? No, sir. Then we're free of the cycloplex, Paul. That's right, sir. We're swinging away in the other direction. Good. Wow. What a relief. Abby, we'll proceed several DUs away from this position until we're sure we're safe before we break contact. Yes, sir. Then we'll join space locks and come aboard the observatory. Got it? Yes, Commander. I'll maintain vector till further orders. Check. Corey out. Come in, Commander. How did the observatory stand up under that pull? Well, apparently quite well. Smoke and rockets, Commander. For a while there, I thought we were all going to plunge right into the core of that cycloplex. I thought so too, Happy. Professor, did you manage to find out anything about this phenomenon? Very little. Although it did finally activate some of the instruments. And exactly what is it, this force? I can't say. Apparently, this vortex, the whirlpool effect, is some sort of an electromagnetism. And that might account for its effect on the instruments. And this whirlpool effect extends beyond the core. Yes. It draws the objects into the center if they get too close. And we sure found that out. And we also know that this force is moving steadily toward Mars. We've got to get busy and do something. Well, is this cycloplex big enough to swallow a whole planet? What about that, Professor? Well, the core itself is fairly small. But with that vortex of force around it, it might easily demolish Mars. Certainly, it would make it unlivable. How can we fight this cycloplex? Every force we know of has some other force that can oppose it. But this thing is from some other dimension, Commander. It's an intruder into our space-time system. You mean it isn't even from, from another galaxy? From another part of our space? Yes, it's completely new to us, Cadet. It's impossible to imagine dimensions beyond the three we know. Length, breadth, and thickness. Huh? Professor, you mentioned that it has some sort of magnetic effect. That's right, Suppose we could produce a powerful magnetic force to oppose it. Mm, it would take more power than any planet power system could produce. And how could we transfer it here? Professor, you've heard of Huddleston's ring, haven't you? Uh, yes, a very interesting effect. What's Huddleston's ring, sir? It makes use of an effect that occurs at temperatures close to absolute zero. Oh, like those of outer space? Exactly. Extremely low temperatures, some metals become superconductors of electricity. Superconductors? They have no resistance to the flow of current. Oh. That means if a current is started in a ring made of a superconducting material, it flows indefinitely. Even when the power is cut off? Right. And if the power is constantly applied, the current builds up. It increases more and more. Oh, I see. A scientist named Huddleston has been conducting experiments with a giant ring in outer space near Jupiter. Yes. He has a laboratory spaceship in the center of the ring. Suppose that Huddleston turns the power on full, charging that ring and the magnets around it, and keeps the power on. Would it destroy the cycloplex? Mm, perhaps it would be dangerous. A magnetic force of incredible intensity would be built up. There is no telling. Professor, I want to send Huddleston's ring into that cycloplex. Under robot control, naturally. Well, Professor, do you think it would work? I don't know. But it's a challenging experiment. If it did, it would prove that electromagnetism is a force common to all dimensions of existence. Right now, I'm not interested in proving any theory. I want to save Mars. Happy, let's get back to Terra 5. I want to contact Huddleston. 
Cycloplex seems to be moving steadily toward Mars, Commander. Keep the ship moving with it, Grayson. Keep that black circle right in the center of the sun. Yes, sir. Major Robertson, Space Patrol Headquarters, Terra, calling Commander Corey aboard Terra 5. I'll take it. Happy to hand me that vector analysis, please. Here you are, sir. Corey, here, Robbie. Go ahead. We've contacted Huddleston, Commander. He's all enthused over the idea. Oh, good. How long will it take him to get the ring on the way? Or does he have to convert the controls to robots? No, a robot unit was built into the ship. Huddleston's in the ring waiting for your instructions. Well, here's the procedure, Robbie. Huddleston will pull out of the orbit around Jupiter under manual control. Check. When he's on the vector, which I give you in a minute, a space patrol cruiser will pick him up in space. Huddleston will handle the ring and its slab ship by remote control until we pick it up on our view scope. Got it, Commander. Then I'll take control of the ring from that point on. Okay, Robbie. Now, here's the vector I want you to relay to Huddleston. Nothing in the view scope yet, sir. Widen the scanning arc, Happy. The lab ship may be slightly off vector. Yes, sir. Uh, Commander. Yes, Grayson. Cycloplex seems to be increasing velocity. Any change in vector? No, sir. I'll check with Professor Jelka. Corey to Jelka in observatory. Uh, Jelka here. Go ahead, Commander. Lieutenant Grayson reports an increase of velocity by the cycloplex. He's right, Commander. My calculations confirm it. Is it still heading toward Mars? Yes, Commander. Is there any possibility of its changing direction? Uh, I'm afraid its motion is unpredictable. We don't know enough about it. Well, that's all, Professor. Thank you. Commander, look at the viewscope. I never saw an image like that before. It isn't very clear, Happy. See if you can get rid of that blur. I'll try it, sir. No, sir. That's as clear as I can get it. I'll check with Robbie. Commander Corey to Major Robertson. Robertson here. Go ahead, Commander. We picked something up in the viewscope, but it doesn't look like Huddleston's ring and lab ship. You got a blurred blotch? Yes. Now, that's the ring, Commander. I've been tracking it from Jupiter. Huddleston says your screen's blur is a tremendous magnetic force. Right, Robbie. I'm ready to take over control of the ring. It's now 1420 and 15 seconds, universal start time. Tell Huddleston the switchover will occur at 1421. Corey out. The ring's approaching very fast, Commander. The robot control panel's ready, sir. Fine, Grayson. Happy you take over our controls. Yes, sir. Grayson, feed the viewscope data into the vector computer. Yes, sir. I want to get the ring headed for the target as soon as possible after switchover. It might be hard to control if that magnetic force builds up much higher. Ten seconds to switchover. Trajectory computed, Commander. Thanks, Grayson. Five seconds. Three. Zero. Now we'll find out if we've got the ring under control. Watch the view scope, Grayson. See if the ring turns in the new vector. It's responding, Commander. Good. It's heading straight for the cycloplex now. Nothing to do but wait and hope it works. few more seconds, we'll know. Yeah, Huddleston's ring is practically in the outer field of the vortex now. Nothing's happening, though. Wait. The blur around the lab ship seems to be dimming. It's as though the cycloplex were choking down the magnetism. Look, you can see the outline of the ring now. And the lab ship. I'm afraid it's not going to work, Commander. The power of the cycloplex is too strong. Wow, look at that. The lab ship just blew apart. The ring is still intact. The blur is building up again. The magnetic force pulled the ship apart. The ring's in the black circle now. Something's happening. It's a battle of magnetic forces. The black circle is growing smaller. It sure is. It's shrinking. And rapidly. If that ring can hold up long enough, the, the cycloplex is just a black dot. It's gone. The cycloplex is gone, Commander. It worked. Whew. Look at the view scope, man. Huddleston's ring is still there. Thanks to you, Commander. It saved a planet. It took all of us. Enter the story in our logbook, Happy. Yes, sir. What a mission to describe. We've just filled in a hole in empty space. Hey, uh, maybe I should make the log entry in invisible ink. <laughs> we'll be back with an exciting preview of next week's thrilling Space Patrol adventure in just a moment. Hey, it's got things popping everywhere. It's setting the world on fire. It's even stopping traffic. What am I talking about? I'm talking about the Space Patrol Spaceophone, and I'm going to tell you how to get a set. A set complete with two spaceophones, 50 feet of communication cord, and an official briefing sheet on spaceophoning. What an offer. What an invention. The magic phone you can carry everywhere. Sounds like the walkie-talkie in the telephone. Barrels of fun. You can talk to someone standing a straight 50 feet away. Now, I'll show you with this spaceophone here. Hello, Commander Corey. Hi, Dick. Hi, gang. Aren't these spaceophones terrific? You can play space patrol with them just as though you were a real space patroller living up here on Terra. Yes, sir, gang. Your space phone will look exactly like the one space patrollers use. Only yours will be even more terrific because they're a special model made for use on Earth alone. And good-looking, too. And some blue and yellow plastic. Now don't wait. 
Send me your spacephone set today. Complete with two spacephones, 50 feet of cord, and a briefing sheet. Now, here's all you do. Buy a box of Instant Ralston. Then, with your name and address, send 25 cents in coin and an Instant Ralston box top to Space Patrol, Box 686, St. Louis, Missouri. That's Space Patrol, Box 686, St. Louis, Missouri. And now, an action preview of next week's exciting Space Patrol story. Buzz and Happy have been captured by two criminals and are aboard a relay space station near the Pluto orbit. While the criminals are removing a secret power unit, Buzz and Happy are locked in a passageway looking for some method of escape. The lights. What happened to the lights? They must have disconnected the Cosmolite power unit. They'll be coming through the passage in a minute to get us, Commander. They won't need to, Happy. Stecker has already figured out how he's going to get rid of us. How? When they get back into their ship, they're going to leave the relay station airlock open. What? In a few seconds, this passage will be a complete vacuum. Every bit of air will escape into space. Be sure to be with us next Saturday for the exciting story, The Glow Worm Project, when Wheat Checks, Rice Checks, and Good Hot Ralston again bring you Space Patrol! And now, a special message from Commander Corey. Boys and girls, this is your commander. I'm now holding an important bottle. When empty, it's worth very little. When filled... It's the most valuable bottle in the world. I mean, when it's filled with the greatest gift one person can give to another. His own blood. America has millions of these bottles to fill, and any grown-up can fill them. So, gang, will you help me get that message across to every grown-up in the USA? Then do this. Join the Space Patrol Blood Boosters now. Space Patrol, an original Mike Moser production starring Ed Kemmerer as Commander Corey and Lynn Osborne as Cadet Happy was written by Lou Houston, directed by Larry Robertson. Other players were Bela Kovach, Ken Mayer, Dick Beals, and Norman Jolly. Dick Tufel speaking. Now, don't forget to tune in next Saturday and every Saturday when Wheat Checks, Rice Checks, and Good Hot Ralston again present the new exciting Space Patrol! <laughs> And be sure to see another exciting Space Patrol story on your local ABC television station. Consult your local paper for time and channel. Space Patrol comes to you transcribed from Hollywood. This is ABC Radio Network. and its 98,000 dealers bring you Mr. Jack Benny in tonight's presentation of Suspense. Tonight, Autolite, following a popular trend, anticipates the strange disappearance of experimental rocket ship Y-272B. The time, the year 2053. The place, the planet Mars. The star, Mr. Jack Benny. Hey, Hap, that was quite a speech you made last night. You were as dynamic as an Autolite stay full battery. Oh, that's flattery, Harlow. And what a battery it is, Hap. The Autolite stay full is the power packed Pepster that needs water only three times a year in normal car use. I was really good, eh, Harlow? Oh, no one could do any better than to visit his nearest Autolite battery dealer, whose services all makes of batteries. To quickly locate him, just call Western Union by number... And ask for Operator 25. I'll tell you the name of your nearest Autolite battery dealer, where you can get an Autolite stay full. The battery that needs water only three times a year in normal car use. And remember, from bumper to tail light, you're always right with Autolite. And now, Autolite presents transcribed Plan X, starring Mr. Jack Benny, hoping once again to keep you in suspense. The card. Do you have the card yet? Uh, one more run through the machine. Turing... When do you think the Earth rocket is arriving? Tomorrow. But if the Grand Council wanted the card before now, they should have asked me before now. Is that it? 
Let me see it. Mm. Here. 13756. Zeno. Assembly line worker. Atomic escalator factory. Mm. Torrid. This is the man for the job? He has the specifications called for. An assembly line worker. Why, it's incredible. Incredible. Yes? Yes? Right away. You may go in now, Zeno. The Grand Council is ready for you. One, three, seven, five, six, called Zeno. Come forward. Yes, sir. You know, the Grand Council of Mars has a mission for you to perform. Me? A mission? You have been selected because of the qualities shown on your work and identity card. Form 42-A. Set habit patterns, attention to detail, no strong emotional or biological drives, and complete suppression of imagination. Well, I always pride myself Do not that speak I... unless questions, you know. The Grand Council has other important matters of state. Oh, of course, of course. You have heard the telephone broadcast that an armed rocket from the planet Earth is approaching Mars. Hmm? Oh, oh, I did hear something about it, yes. Their course has been plotted as bringing them to a landing on the plane outside the city at 10.14 tomorrow morning. 10.14. You know, I wouldn't mind seeing that. You will see it, Citizen Zeno. Me? You. Well, I'd certainly like to, but... I'm due in the atomic escalator factory at 8. I'm on stair treads, you know. And uh... We've arranged a leave from your job. Leave? Well, I'm not arguing with the Grand Council, but I've got a pretty important job there, and... Uh... 13756, you've been selected to meet and deal with the Earth rockets. Me? You will put Plan X into operation. Plan X? Citizen Zeno, every Martian for the last 50 years has been thoroughly grounded in Plan X if and when a rocket should come from the Earth. Oh. Oh, oh Plan X. Oh, you see, I thought you said Plan X. Of course. Then you understand and accept the responsibility. Oh, anything to help out. Those assisting you on the mission will be in contact with you. Good, good. Have the other council members any questions? Uh, no, I, I don't believe so. 13756 called Zeno. You are now officially operating under the provisions of Plan X. Well, thank you. I took the aerial transmission belt directly home. Let them get along without me at the escalator factory if they could. Besides, it was almost quitting time. I went to bed early that night. Uh, tomorrow was going to be a big day. Plan X. Out of the whole population of Mars, I was picked to carry out Plan X. Oh, I'll admit I had my criticisms of the Grand Council in the past, but this restored my confidence in them. Yes, sir. They couldn't have picked a better Martian. I think I'll have a second cup of ostrich, Mother. Zeno, you haven't time. You'll be late for the factory as it is. As I told you, Mother, I'm on leave. Orders of the Grand Council. Oh, yes, of course. Plan X. But will the Grand Council care if you don't get your job back? There won't be any trouble. They couldn't replace me in stair treads, and they know it. Pass the Gorot, will you, Mother? Here. But it's fattening, Zeno. I got a hard task coming up, Mother. I owe it to myself. And you will be careful, Zeno. Oh, Mother, if I've told you once, I've told you a thousand times. It's just an invasion rocket from that stupid planet Earth. So will you stop worrying? Ah, you're just like your father was, Zeno. Too brave for your own good. I am? Well, it's nothing, really. I took my time going over to the field where the Earth rocket was to land. 
I got there at ten, with not another soul around. Another few minutes, and I had my pocket radar screen working. Yep, the rocket was coming in, right on time. Then I could hear it out in space, and soon after that I could see it. Bearing our first visitors from Earth. Gee, I was thinking they must be a brave crew. I almost felt sorry for them. It wasn't a bad landing. Not the greatest, but not bad. After another ten minutes, a port in the side of the rocket started to swing open, and I walked over. If I do say it myself, I made quite an impression. Commander. Commander, look. Great Scott, what is it? Commander, I... I think we've met our first Martian. All right, keep back, everybody. Dr. Fielding and I will deal with it. Him, whatever it is. Hand me the Martian kit, Parker. All ready, sir. Come on, Fielding. Be ready for anything. Right, Commander. I'll try to talk to him. We, Earth people, we, friends, uh, friends, we come from out there. Fr oh, blast it, feeling I feel like a fool. Uh, uh, let me try, Commander. <clears throat> we bring you presents here. We bring you beads, cloths of many colors. Take them. You wouldn't have something a little more conservative? Fielding. He speaks Esperanto. Incredible. Incredible. Gentlemen, welcome to Mars. It's, it's almost as if he was expecting us. Oh, yes, for some days now. Ever since you left Earth, as a matter of fact. You hear that, Fielding? Commander, we may very well be in the presence of a superior race. Well, thank you. You... You say you expected us? Everyone expected us? Oh, certainly. But you're here alone. Yes. Well, unfortunately, all other adult Martians are, shall we say, unavailable. For how long? I'm not wishing to pry, but how long are you staying? Well, they've taken to the hills, have they? No need to be afraid of us. No need at all. There's uh, no one in your city over there? Mainly unavailable. But I'll be glad to show you around. Martian hospitality, you know. <laughs> Amazing. Can we go right away, Commander? I'll get Connie. Well, you can call her, Fielding. But we don't want to blunder into a trap. All right, men. All in. Parker, take three men and stay here for rocket guard. Yes, sir. Ready, Fielding? All set, Commander. Uh, Connie, I want you to meet our first Martian. Dr. Fielding, I don't believe it. Miss Morrison, this is, uh... uh... 13756. Call Zeno. Uh, Miss Morrison, this is Zeno. Uh, how do you do? Well, how do you do? Uh, incredible. But he's almost handsome in a strange way. And he speaks our language. Maybe a trick of some kind. Expedition force, on to... to... It's a little difficult to pronounce. On to... the city! <laughs> We marched into the city, which, of course, appeared quite deserted. Plan X. I showed them a few of the sites, the canals, the Og factory, and the hall of the Grand Council. I was walking alongside of Connie, Miss Morrison, who was most unlike the women of Mars. I caught myself showing off, riding the aerial transmission belt with one hand. Finally, I took them all to the art museum. Oh, Commander... This place, this civilization, it's fantastic, fantastic. Look at this sculpture, Dr. Fielding, the line, the detail. I've never seen anything so beautiful. <laughs> it's nothing, really. Zeno, you don't mean that you... Well, no, no, no. You see, I work at an atomic escalator factory. I'm in stair treads. Everybody, over here. Look at this. Huh? Oh, what is it? What, why, isn't that what... Why, is... Zeno, is, is this what I think it is? Hmm? Uh, I'll have to read the nameplate. Oh, yes, yes, a flying saucer. From 1952, your calendar. 100 years old. 1952, the year of the flying saucers. Then they did come from Mars. Oh, yes. But none of them ever landed on Earth. Why? Mm, it just didn't seem worthwhile. 
Nothing personal, of course. I just can't get over this planet. It's so different from anything we imagined. Now, here's something you might be interested in. Uh, right over here. What? Well, looks like a weapon of some kind. Oh, yes. Yeah, you see, it's a uh, paralyzer ray. 300 years old. But why do you have it in a museum? You don't mean that weapons like this are 300 years obsolete? Well, you might say that, yes. You see, no adult Martian has carried a weapon for hundreds of years. Well, why not? Why should we? But to defend yourself. Well, we just have no aggressive impulses, that's all. Well, if someone struck you, wouldn't you strike back? Mm, I couldn't. But it doesn't matter. No one could strike me. No Martian, that is. Yes. We've never had any trouble. Uh, Zeno, you're in the diplomatic service? The escalator game. Yet you were delegated to meet us. Yes, by the Grand Council. You see, we stopped having diplomats handle our important missions years ago. Again, nothing personal, of course. <laughs> I see. But you are empowered to deal with us. Deal with you? I certainly am. Uh, good. Now, it seems logical to me that we should work out a mutual defense pact. N not right now, of course. Mr. Zeno! B Mr. Zeno! Who's that? Oh, it looks like children. We have to see you, Mr. Zeno. Uh, just some little friends of mine. Oh, they're darling. What's the problem, Army? We're building something, and we're all out of uranium. We need some right away, and... Zeno, does he mean real uranium? Oh, of course, Dr. Fielding. Oh, it won't hurt them a bit. We have to have it right away, Mr. Zeno. We just have to have it. This, this city was deserted. Where did these children come from? Oh, you know how it is with kids when they get to playing. You'll get the uranium for us, won't you, Mr. Zeno? Will you? Fascinating. Uh, what are they playing, Zeno? Yes. Uh, what's the game? I don't think you've heard of it, Commander. It's called Plan X. For the next week, I showed the Earth expedition around the city, signed a few treaties, and had several long conversations with Miss Morrison. Well, not too long, but I felt we were building a solid friendship. It was too bad it was coming to an end. You're not going out again this evening, Zeno? Mother, so I've been out two evenings in a row. Doesn't have to be fatal, you know. This is the time of year you always get that chest cold. Oh, chest cold, chest cold. Anyway, Mother, I have to go over to the rocket. Don't they plan to go back to Earth tomorrow? They plan to, yes. Miss Morrison promised to take a little farewell walk with me this evening. Hmm. Don't let her keep you out in the moonlight too long, Zeno. Mother, why, that's the most ridiculous thing. I... You just don't know how attractive you are. Now, Mother, Miss Morrison and I are merely friends. And to think of anything beyond that is just... Mr. Zeno! Mr. Zeno! We're almost finished the game, Mr. Zeno. Good, good. All finished, Army? Just about. It's tomorrow morning at 8.45, isn't it? 8.45. Uh, anything else you need, Army? I mean, any more uranium? No. I just wanted to make sure it was 8.45. Well, see you in the morning, Mr. Zeno. Goodbye, Mrs. Zeno. See you in the morning, Army. <laughs> Such a cute little fellow, Zeno. And smart. Is he? Mother, you have no idea. <laughs> is bringing you Mr. Jack Benny in Plan X. Tonight's presentation in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Say, Harlow, do you like to make speeches? Sure, Hap, especially about the Autolite Stay Full Battery. Friends, Romans, motorists, lend me your ears while I praise the greatest of the great, the incomparable Autolite Stay Full. The battery that needs water only three times a year in normal car use. The battery that gives longer life as proved by tests conducted according to accepted life cycle standards. And where can one get this glorious battery? From your nearest Autolite battery dealer who services all makes of batteries. To quickly locate him, just phone Western Union and ask for operator 25. And I'll tell you where you can get an Autolite staple. 
the battery that needs water only three times a year in normal car use. And remember, from bumper to tail light, you're always right with Autolite. And now, Autolite brings back to our Hollywood soundstage Mr. Jack Benny in Elliot Lewis's production of Plan X, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. The Earth expedition was camped beside their rocket, getting ready for takeoff the next day. Connie, uh, Miss Morrison, waved when she saw me coming. I waved back, and then she smiled at me, and I smiled back. It was a beautiful evening. We walked out over the plain, Connie and I, and then we sat down quite close. Connie lit a cigarette, and I opened up a package of Gurkog. Dino? Yes, Connie. Miss Morrison. Uh, Connie. How is it you're not married, Zeno? Don't Martians believe in it? Oh, definitely. But there's mother and... And what? Connie, you don't find me a little bit strange? You mean because you're a Martian? Not exactly. You see, even a Martian girls, I'm a little bit strange. I find you very attractive, Zeno. Really? You're from a superior race? Well... The commander may not see it, but Dr. Fielding does, and I do. Your civilization, your culture, and you. Well, actually, I'm... What are the other Martians like? You know, I seem to feel there are people all around watching, waiting, and yet we've seen only you. And the children, of course. Yes, and the children. They've been playing around the rocket all day. Yes, yes. Zeno, what'll happen to this planet, this beautiful planet, when the next Earth rocket comes? And the next one? Connie. I'd almost like to stay here. Or I wish we'd never come. None of us. Connie, there's something I... I... What, Zeno? What is it? It's just that... It's getting cold. Maybe we'd better go back. I walked with Connie back to the rocket, and then I went home. There was a message on the autophone pad. The Grand Council wanted to see me at once. You sent for me, gentlemen? 13756 called Zeno. You are nearing the completion of Plan X. I hope my work has been satisfactory. You were selected for certain qualifications, Zeno. Set habit patterns, attention to detail, no strong emotional drives. I remember, yes. You have assumed a responsibility based on those qualifications. I suppose you might put it that way. Are you still prepared to discharge that responsibility? Well, I... I think you might as well know that it's been my criticism in the past, as well as that of a lot of other taxpayers, that the Grand Council interferes entirely too much in the private lives of, well, well, what I mean to say... Are you prepared to discharge your responsibility? But about Connie? I mean, Miss Morrison. Isn't there some way... You that... know that there is not. Well, I... I suppose not, no. Plan X will then be completed. I assure the Grand Council, at 8.45 tomorrow morning, Plan X will be completed. I didn't sleep well that night. And Mother was worried when I hadn't any appetite in the morning. She thought it was the start of one of my chest colds. Purposely, I didn't go out to the rocket until almost 8.40. They were blasting the motors, getting ready to take off. Zeno, I thought you weren't coming. I, I overslept, Connie. That is, I, I didn't really oversleep, but... The uh, children have been here for an hour. We're just about to finish playing, Mr. Zeno. Oh, good, Army. Did you win the game? Plan X? I think so. We'll know in a minute, Mr. Zeno. They're so intense. Are the children on Mars always that way, Zeno? Well, not always, no. Ah, come to see us off, did you, Zeno? Good boy. We counted on you. Well, thank you. Come over here, Fielding. Uh, yes, Commander. Connie, Fielding, Zeno here has been so helpful to us that I've come to a decision. That's very nice of you, but I'm pretty well stocked up on beads right now. Uh, a different I... kind of a present. Zeno, I've decided to invite you to come with us to Earth. 
to Earth. How about it, Zeno? We're taking off in uh, 16 minutes at 9 o'clock. How about it? Well, it's not that I don't appreciate your thinking of me, but Mother would worry and... Uh... You see, we need you, Zeno. That's not true. Well, I'm afraid it is. You see, I think Zeno is a much more important man than a worker in an elevator factory. Escalator. I'm in stair trance. And if we have Zeno along the next time we come back to Mars, we'd be much less likely to run into, well, an ambush. I'm afraid he's right, Connie. He's not right. How about it, Zeno? Thanks, but no. Commander, those kids... They've got some sort of a ray gun set up. Fielding. Is it real, Fielding? Why, it, it looks like it, Commander. Get Zeno over in front of us, quick. Now they can't shoot without hitting him. Get your gun out, Parker. You mean the kids, Commander? If we have to, yes. Tell them not to fire on us, Zeno. I'm sorry, Connie. Really sorry. Oh, it's all right, Zeno. Do what you have to do. Shall we shoot, Mr. Zeno? Have your gun ready, Parker. It wouldn't do any good, Commander. All right, Army. Plan X. Did you... Did you fire, Parker? Me, sir? Fire a gun? Why, I... I couldn't. I couldn't do a thing like that. No. No, of course you couldn't. I... I don't know what made me ask. Uh, the rocket. Its motors have stopped. Its motors have stopped, Commander. Well, we aren't going anywhere. Are we? Someone said something about going back to Earth. Back to, to Earth. Earth? Oh, no. Of course not. Of course not. Everybody all right? What happened, Commander? What happened? Nothing, really. It's just that Army and his little friends build a maturity ray. It takes people who are, shall we say, less advanced and increases their IQ by several thousand years. That's amazing. Child's play. Zeno, do you mean to say... Commander, Dr. Fielding, Parker, Connie, permit me to congratulate you as fellow Martians. <laughs> Utterly amazing. Connie... Look! Here come the Martians. Our fellow Martians, thousands of them. They're coming to welcome us. Connie. Oh, look at them. Oh, they look so handsome, so intelligent, so... Connie. Yeah, excuse me, Zeno. I'll be back, Commander. I have to go to them. I'll be back. <laughs> did like me for a while before Plan X. But she did like me. Even just for a while. That's something, isn't it? Suspense, presented by Autolite. Tonight's star, Mr. Jack Benny. Next week, the dramatic report of a man's desperate race for freedom. A true story with names and places changed in order to protect the lives of the principals. The story is called The Man Who Cried Wolf. Our star, Mr. Jeff Chandler. That's next week on Suspense. Suspense is transcribed and directed by Elliot Lewis, with music composed by Lucian Morrowick and conducted by Lud Gluskin. Plan X was written for Suspense by Richard Powell. Featured in tonight's cast were Mary Jane Croft, Norma Varden, John McIntyre, Truda Marson, Howard McNear, William Conrad, Jack Crucian, Joseph Kearns, and Stuffy Singer. The Jack Benny Show may be heard every Sunday on the CBS Radio Network. And remember next week, Mr. Jeff Chandler in The Man Who Cried Wolf. This is the CBS Radio Network. I can 
see them. I can see them now. Faces like gargoyles. And hands and feet. Claws. They have claws. They're ugly and hideous. They can see us, too. We find you earth people equally repulsive. But we are more tolerant. <laughs> Theater 5 presents First Encounter. Space Central to Orion 1. Space Central to Orion 1. Your constant signal still loud and clear, but no voice contact at last three checkpoints. Use auxiliary battery. Come in, Orion One. Over. What does he think we've been trying? Take it easy, Joe. Try again. Margaret, anything on your board? All systems check. We're transmitting, Clay. I'm sure of it. Okay, okay. Orion One to Space Central. I hope you hear this one. Orion One in moon orbit. Repeat, in moon orbit. All systems A-OK. Over. Should be at checkpoint Z. Ready for landing. Space Central to Orion One. Come in, Orion One. Mm, Rack it up biggest moment in history, and they've blown a tube in their receiver. Well, the folks on Earth will have to get their news late, on the playback from our tape. Yeah, at least it's working. Clay, I just got a strange reading from the nose sensor. Temperature suddenly shot up 400 degrees, and then it dropped. Are you sure? The drop is normal. We're over the dark side of the moon now, but... That's just it, Clay. The jump in temperature took place as we crossed the temperate zone between the light and dark sides of the moon. It could mean sudden friction. Yes, caused by an atmosphere circling the temperate zone of the moon. Atmosphere? Oh, it seems impossible. Joe, fire the retro rockets. I'm going on manual control. We're holding at one half mile per second. Well, that'll keep us from burning up if it is atmosphere. Air on the moon? Well, that could mean the possibility of life. Altitude 53 miles, nose temperature now constant at 280 degrees. Good. Good enough to boil us alive. Nothing clear on the TV monitor. More retro, Joe. Just a little. Velocity slowing, altitude 30 miles. Look at that monitor. Mountains. The Cordilleras. All systems, final check. Space suits first. Suits fine. Cabin pressure okay. Stern landing gear extended. Starting vertical ascent. Periscope swung to stern. Seems clear below. Ascent slowing. Free fall starting. 37 miles. 32. 26. Counter blast. Hey, man. Me too. Okay. Let's get out of these harnesses and put on our weighted boots. If there's atmosphere, there may be wind. Yes, and with a lesser gravity on the moon, a slight breeze would blow us for miles. Clay. Take a look at this gauge. There's oxygen out there, all right. Mm. But we don't know how much or what else is in the atmosphere until we test it. Till we do, we keep our spacesuits sealed. All right, everybody. Suit up and into the airlock. All right, Joe. Let's open the hatch and lower the ladder. All right. Earth man's first close-up view of the moon. Joe, climb down and stack the equipment as Margaret and I lower it. And be sure to stake it down. <clears throat> okay, here I go. Captain Joseph Gregson, first Earth man on the moon. Clay is still calm as cream. What will it take to excite you? Oh, not much, Marge. Just the look on the faces of my kids and my wife when we get back. I'm sorry, Clay. Oh, this oxygen tank, it seems to weigh less than nothing. Your sample kit... Aerated spray paint. Geiger counter. I'm bringing the tape recorder, Clay. The president's dedication. We therefore dedicate this expedition to all the peoples of Earth and pray that this beginning on virgin territory, unsoiled by man's tragic history, shall give birth to a new understanding among our nations. I, Major Clayton Brown, as commander of Orion One, have been instructed to express my own feelings at this moment. We are looking at Earth. We can see it turning, see the sun shining on continents. Other continents are in the shadows of night. Yet as Earth turns, I... 
I realize that each part of the world, each nation, will get equal shares of the sun's light. Maybe that's what God intended. <clears throat> All right, let's get to work. Well, it is a plant, and it is green. Photosynthesis is taking place. That means the atmosphere has carbon dioxide and water vapor. And I found no evidence of toxicity, Clay. Okay. Stand by with the respirator while I take off my helmet. Right. Well, if this isn't air, it's a good substitute. Come on. Let's get up to the crest of this small crater and get our bearings. Right. Hmm, there's rock erosion, but it's hardly more than sand. Slight radioactivity. Not enough to be dangerous. It's coming from these rocks. Now, I'll take a sample. You two go on ahead. Looks like a level plane down there. Too level to be natural. Hey, Clay, quick. The oxygen tank floated off. I started to chase it, but it just disappeared. I told you to be careful. The slightest there wind. There wasn't any wind. Clay, I feel something. I can't explain it, but it's like someone watching me. The tank was lying right here. I turned my back to get the ore sample. And then I saw it floating over this way. Look. Are those marks on the sand? They look like tiny claw marks. Marge, go to the ship. Joe and I... Now, look, that's an order. All right. But take off those weighted boots. If you see something, you'll have an advantage. Good thinking. We'll join you in a minute or two. Whose idea was it to send a woman on this expedition? Oh, hurry up with those boots. Margaret's at the ship. Now, let's see if there's a trail of these marks. There. Right over... Clay. The tracks. I, I see them moving. The sand's being kicked aside. Whatever it is, it's invisible. <laughs> Clay, she's gone. That sound. Some sort of vehicle. Look. These parallel marks leading down toward the plane. Let's go. Wait. Those spray cans of paint. Maybe if we spray, we'll be able to see what we're fighting. The vehicle tracks. They, they peter out here near the rocks. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. But the claw tracks go on. Whatever made them disappeared, too. That ledge... It looks like an entrance to a cave. Yeah. It's a tight squeeze. <laughs> Made it. Steps. Well, but these walls glow. If you feel anything, start spraying. Yeah. A door. This lever. It's stuck. Let's pull together. Come on. All right. Where do we go from here? There must be a hundred doors. No. This one, quick. Now, this room's empty. Marge, where are you? Glass partition. Look, she's strapped to that table. That instrument. It's moving right toward her eyes. i got to smash this thing. Wait, something's grabbed me. I, I can't see. Spray, grab I'm being carried, but I can't see what or who. see them or hear their voices. Are they here now? Why have they placed me in this room? And where are the others? All oh, right! You don't have to shoot! Joe! You can only see them. Joe! Well, we're alive. Where's Marge? I don't know. They put me on a table, too. But they were gentle. If we could only see them. I did see part of a face when I sprayed the paint. Like no human on earth. Hideous. I don't get it, Clay. How could an invisible race evolve? Well, I'm sure they're not invisible to each other. Oh? Apparently, their coloration is beyond our visible spectrum. Perhaps there's an entire range of colors which we can't perceive, but they're perfectly visible to a looning. Maybe that's why they examined our eyes so carefully. And we don't hear any voices. Could their sounds be pitched above our audible range? Maybe. March! Joe! Clay! I... Oh, why did you follow me? Just because I'm a woman? Now, none of us will get... Marge! 
If Joe had been carried off, we'd have tried to rescue him. Sure, the success of the expedition is important, but we're still human. So man or woman, let's stay human if we can. What? What are we going to do? Take it easy, honey. We don't know yet. That wall, look. It's changing. I can see through it. Yes, it's becoming transparent. It looks like some kind of a throne room. Strange light. I can see them. Them. Faces like gargoyles. And hands and feet. Claws. They sure aren't pretty. But they're humanoid. And apparently very advanced. Once they determined that they were invisible to us, they devised that light so we could see them. They're all looking in our direction. Well, go on. Take a good look. Easy, Joe. What? What's that sound? Earth people, do not fear. Boys, where did it come from? It didn't seem to come from anywhere except from inside my own head. Telepathy. Yes, we have created a telepathic field in which communication is total. You may either speak or think. All is understood. I am Bar, ruler of the moon. You will not be harmed, rest assured. <laughs> we find you equally repulsive, but we are more tolerant. We... we are the first Earthmen to land on the moon. We have come in peace. In peace, you are welcome. Well, why did you grab us? We sent a delegation to greet you, but we found you could neither see nor hear us. It was decided then to examine you for your deficiencies. Your eyes have a very limited range, and you are incapable of hearing any but the obvious sounds. The woman still fears harm. Forgive me. Will you permit us to return to Earth? You will remain in peace. Wait a minute. You can't mean... The decision has been made. No other expedition will be permitted to land on the moon. Their radio will be silenced as yours was silenced. Their ships will be destroyed. You shall be the only Earthlings permitted to dwell on the moon. Why did you spare us? Curiosity. Major Brown, we cannot permit Earth to conquer the moon. But we had no idea the moon was inhabited. There's no need for conquest. We could live together, sharing. Share? Live in harmony? We have studied our mother planet for centuries. There has been far more war than peace. At this very moment on Earth, men are dying for no better reason than greed. We dedicated this expedition to peace between nations. Earth's peoples must learn to live on Earth before expanding to new worlds. Years ago, when man on Earth had not yet evolved, the moon was fully inhabited. An atmosphere covered our entire surface as the moon revolved on its axis at a greater speed. We were many nations then, all highly advanced. But our scientific progress outdistanced our ethical progress. Several nations vied to be the first to explore Earth. You had harnessed nuclear energy? It harnessed us. We are descendants of the few survivors of the last war on the moon. Our atmosphere was all but destroyed in the nuclear holocaust. The moon's rotation slowed so that one side is always exposed to the burning sun and the other to perennial darkness. Only a narrow zone between the two supports life. Thus, we are now one nation, one civilization, dedicated to eternal peace. But let us take back this knowledge to Earth. Let us convince our nations. Earth must know its own purification. Out of its ashes will come men who will remember and tell each succeeding generation. Then perhaps thousands of years hence, Earth men will be ready to explore other worlds in peace. We're ready now. Listen, a hundred expeditions will follow us. Oh, sure, you'll destroy some of them, but some will get through. Then you'll wish you, you had... You threaten? You, supposedly a man of peace? How will the others treat the inhabitants of the moon? They will attempt to enslave us. You shall remain on the moon for the rest of your lives. <laughs> I don't know what this food is, but it'll never replace steak. Well, we're going to have a long time getting used to it. Maybe not. <laughs> Look, Clay, I'm afraid to think anything. They can't read our minds unless one of those machines is turned on, and we can hear the hum. Are you sure? Positive. I had a telepathic conversation with one of their scientists. I was careful to keep out any thoughts about escape. Clay, do you have a plan? The loonings are so convinced of their superiority that they don't believe we'll attempt to escape. You know the ship is just as we left it. Look, Clay, I know they've given us total freedom, but don't sell them short. I'll bet they've got a ray or something that they'll blast us apart with before we can hit escape velocity. The loonings have no such weapons. How do you know? Until now, they had no need for any. Remember, they're one nation. Oh, well, they have the knowledge, all right. If more expeditions start coming, I don't doubt they'll work out a defense system. What puzzles me is, with all their knowledge and scientific ability, 
Why hadn't they explored Earth? They did, with radar telescopes and interceptor radio waves. You mean they picked up our television broadcasts? Oof, what a mixed-up picture of our civilization they must have gotten. I'm afraid they accumulated a very accurate picture of nations at war. That's why they don't want anything to do with us. Clay, I, I don't want to live out my life on the moon. I second that motion. Even if they've got weapons we don't know about. Okay. Now let's go up to the surface. We walk on a sand path so we'll be able to spot any moving footprints. And if you should hear the hum from a telepathic machine, put your mind on any subject but escape. Well, there she is. Old Orion 1. I wonder if there's a guard on board. Let's find out. It doesn't seem possible that we're not being watched. Pull up the ladder and close the hatch, Joe. Ah, it's too easy. They're going to blow us up. I know. Start checking systems. Cabin pressure up. Oxygen okay. Attach harnesses. Ready to fire engines. Ready. Fire. State Central to Orion 1. You're entering radio beam range. Are you ready to hook into beam? Over. Orion 1, delighted to accept the invitation. You boys take over now. You're entering the ionosphere. Radio blank out due at any moment. Happy landing. Well, all we can do now is relax. You worried, Clay? Yes. Well, after we report to the president, he'll take over from there. That sound. Earthmen, it is now the time to make our presence known to you. They're right here on the ship. You'll let us escape. It was the wish of our ruler that you transport us to Earth. But we would have been glad to. There was no need to stow away. Our ruler is wise. He reasoned that if you knew of our mission, you would destroy your ship and yourselves. You are now controlled by radio beams from Earth. You can do nothing to prevent our landing with you. What are you going to do? We shall live among you, undetected by your inferior vision. Our mission is to bring peace to the nations of the Earth. Peace? And why the subterfuge? I think I know. The loonings believe that peace on Earth can be attained only the way they achieved peace on the moon, through nuclear war. Yes. We will help you achieve peace. We can do it without war. We shall see, Earthman. We shall see. Will you wait? Will you give us a chance to tell the world? Is there much time? There is time, but very little time. Theater 5 has presented First Encounter, written by Leonard Stad and directed by Warren Somerville. In the cast, Jackson Beck, Tony Darnay, William Mason, Brett Morrison, and Robert Dryden. Audio engineer, Neil Pulse. Sound technician, Ed Blaney. Script editor, Jack C. Wilson. Original music by Alexander Vlas Dutsenko. Orchestra under the direction of Glenn Osser. Executive producer for Theater 5, Edward A. Byron. We invite your comments. Write to Theater 5, New York 23, New York. This is Fred Foy speaking. This has been an ABC Radio Network production. Adventures in Time and Space. Transcribed in Future Tense. Dimension X. X, 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 X. When the first space rocket lands on Mars, what will we find? Will we be welcomed with open arms or will the Martians treat us as invaders? Only one thing is certain. Someday a giant metal ship will take off from Earth to travel through the black velocities, the silent gulfs of space, to descend at last into the darkness of the upper Martian atmospheres. And on that day, man will finally know the answers. The day we first land on Mars. Now hear this. Now hear this. Approaching critical deceleration. Fasten gravity suits. Stand by to land. Mr. Lustig, what do you make of the terrain? 
There seems to be a heavy ground, Miss Captain. We won't be able to use our infrared lights. And we'll have to come in on radar. Wasn't that a little risky, sir, landing in the dark? I'd rather run the danger of a blind landing, Lieutenant, than come in without the cover of darkness. Remember, we don't know what kind of reception is waiting for us down there. Airspeed 500. Altitude now 4,000. Bridge to engine room. Stand by for deceleration. Engine room. Aye. Fire forward tubes one and three. Aye. Skids down. Skids check. Altitude 500. Four. 350. Three. Up a point now. All right. Let's set her down. Look out. Cut the power. Master's pipe battle stations. Aye, sir. All secured, sir. Well, we're on Mars. April 20th, 1987. 4.33, Greenwich time. Enter that in the log, Master. Aye, sir. Well, gentlemen, it's less than two hours till dawn. As soon as it's light, we'll send out a landing party. Masters, get me an all-over hookup. All set, Captain. Now hear this. Now hear this. All right, men. The smoking lamp is lit. We're 17 men on an alien world. And it's up to us whether we ever get home again. Next few hours should tell the story. And I want instant obedience to all commands. I'll court-martial the first man who doesn't jump to when he's ordered. And one other thing. We may be on Mars, but this is still a United States naval vessel. Officers will conduct a personal and weapons inspection in one hour. That's all. Inspection, Captain. Now? Mr. Lustig, we've got an hour and a half to sweat out before we find out what's outside that airlock. I'd rather have a man worried about his stripes, about what's waiting outside on Mars. Landing party report to forward airlock. Captain Black, Lieutenant Hingston, Lieutenant Lustig, and Dr. Horst report immediately to forward airlock. It is now landing time, minus five. Sounds like they're paging us, Hingston. You ready, Dr. Horst? Yes. Ready as I will ever be. Oh, come on. Let's report to the airlock. to go. Where's the captain? Who knows? What difference does it make? Just want to get it over with, that's all. <coughs> Has anybody uh, got a cigarette? I think you're smoking too much, Lieutenant Lustig. Are you nervous? Lay off, will you, Horst? Wondering what's hidden outside underneath that ground mist? Very unusual planet, Mars. Why? It has an atmosphere. Wonderful thing, an atmosphere. Where you find one, you find life. You mean Martians? What do you think they'll look like? Who knows? Intelligent life can take many forms. You mean they may have green skins and eyes on stalks or something? A comic book conception is possible. Or they may have developed to a point that is far beyond us. Perhaps they have a science that can produce weapons far more dangerous than our atomic missiles. You think we may have to fight our way out? After all... We are invaders. Now I hear this. Landing time minus two. Landing all time All right, minus all right. Two. We heard this. I know what I'd like to find outside that airlock. Good old Illinois. <laughs> you ever been there, Lustig? Only Chicago. Well, you ought to see my hometown. Green lawns, big white houses. Sounds like my hometown. My grandmother used to have one of those iron deers on the lawn. Every Halloween, we'd paint another color. One time, we painted it black and white like a Holstein cow. <laughs> Where does your family live, Horst? I have no family. When I was a child, they were gassed to death in the Dachau concentration camp. That's tough. Oh, it has its advantages. I have no ties on Earth. Nothing to lose now. I imagine I'm the only one on board who is free to enjoy our present peculiar position. All right, Lustig. You can button it up now. Aye, sir. Now, gentlemen, in one minute we'll be the first men to set foot on Mars. Quite an honor, eh? As long as the medals are not awarded posthumously. 
Still uneasy, Dr. Horst? Captain Black, I've been uneasy ever since I can remember. On Earth and on Mars. Well, 30 seconds. Give me the intercom phone, Lusty. Masters? Aye, sir. Battle stations to be manned till we return. If we're not back in two hours, I want no rescue party sent out. Blast off and save the ship, you understand? Aye, sir. All right, gentlemen. Five seconds. Four. Three. <coughs> two. One. Lusty, open the outer airlock. Fresh air. Let's go. Hold it now. It's too dark to move fast. Quiet, isn't it? Not even a wind. You can't see anything through this ground, mess. Quiet. We don't know what's out here. Come on. What the... Quiet, Captain. I, I could swear that sounded like a rooster. I don't hear it anymore. A very unlikely sound. A rooster crowing on Mars. Kingston. Aye, sir. Set that machine gun 25 yards to the flank. We'll stay here till the ground mist lifts. Aye, aye, sir. What do you make of the ground, Horst? Grass. Plain grass. You can see some large foliage there where the mists thin down. What the heck is that? Kingston! Hold your fire, you fool! Some kind of wild animal. I hit it. I could see the tracers, but it's still standing. Come on, Horst. Doctor. Doctor, where are you? Up ahead. Admiring the wild animal. Careful, Horst. Wait for us. Don't worry, Captain. Huh. It's an iron deer. A lawn ornament. That's impossible. It's hollow. Interesting, isn't it? A whitewashed Victorian iron deer. Sitting on a lawn in the middle of Mars. I don't understand. Look around. The mist's lifting. The captain. Look there. A house, a regular old-fashioned house. On Mars. Good Lord. I haven't seen carved scrolls and gingerbread like that in years. Look at that port swing. The geraniums. There. I told you it was a rooster, Captain. Give me the glasses, Lustig. I want to take a look through that front window. There's an upright piano. Some sheet music on it. Lustig, it's beautiful Ohio. Beautiful Ohio? That can't be. Look here, Horace. Do you think that civilizations of two planets could be identical? I don't know. That specific variety of geraniums is only 50 years old on Earth. Is it logical they should develop in Mars? How about that port swing and that, that piano and beautiful Ohio? No, it's impossible. Captain Black... This looks like the town I was born in. Well, it looks like my hometown, too. I've thought of something, sir. It's the only solution. Maybe we're not the first ship to reach Mars from Earth. That's the only answer. That's impossible, Lister. There's been space travel that couldn't be secret. Do you have any idea what ships cost, what industrial power is needed? There's got to be some logical reason. Captain, I think perhaps we might find out. A light just went on in that house. Kingston, cover that door with the machine gun. Aye, aye, sir. Come on, horse. We ring that doorbell. There's got to be a scientific answer to all of this. There's something moving in there. Stand back, Horst. Give me a clear shot. Maybe a Martian. Can I help you? We, we, we were looking. Well, if you're selling anything, it's much too early. Uh, no, no. Wait, wait a minute. What, uh, what town is it? What do you mean? Are you census takers? No, we're strangers here. We want to know how this town got here. Is this a game? No, no, it's not a game. We're from Earth. From where? From Earth. Do you mean out of the ground? Hey, uh, are you sure you're feeling well? Madam, we came in a flying ship across space. We're from the third planet. This is this is Mars. Now, do you understand? Mars. <laughs> You go away now, you hear? I'll call my husband from upstairs and he'll chase you now. But go on. this is Mars, isn't it? This is Green Lake, Wisconsin, in the United States of America. 
Bounded on the east by the Atlantic and on the west by the Pacific. Now, 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 go away. Goodbye. Horace, do you suppose it's really possible? I've got to find out more about this. For the last time, now, go away. Pardon me, madam. What year is this? Year? Well, 1928, of course. Who oh, for goodness sake. You hear that, Horst? And we know it's 1987. And we know it's Mars. Is it possible that we got fouled up, made some tremendous blunder, and circled around and landed back on Earth? In 1928? Well, maybe some switch in time or, or dimension. Could we have shifted somehow and gone backward in time? Horst, it won't hold water. It's not logical. We've checked every mile. We went past the moon and out into space. We're on Mars. Find out anything, Captain? No, we're going back to the ship till I figure out some logical explanation for all this. Lustig, out at point. Aye, sir. Hingston in the rear. Keep that gun at half load. Aye, sir. Of course, there's got to be some cold, logical solution. Captain. Captain. What? That house down the street. The white one with the green shutters. Lustig, what's the matter? I never thought. I never thought. Thank God. Thank God. Lustig. Lustig, come back here. He's running for the house. That crazy fool after him quick. Lustig, Stop. Come down off of that port. Grandma! Grandpa! Lustig, what Grandma. the devil do you think you're crook? Grandma and Grandpa, it is you. Lustig, what's going on here? Albert, why, it's been so many years. How you grown, boy. Oh, it's so good to see you. Lieutenant Lustig. Oh, oh, Captain. Uh, Grandma, I want you to meet my friend. This is Captain Black. Oh. Captain, I want you to meet my grandfolks. Howdy. <laughs> Any friends of Albert is friends of ours. How long have <laughs> you been here, Grandma? Oh, Good many years. Ever since we died. Ever since you what? Oh, yes, sir. They've been dead 30 years. What? You mean to tell me that Mars is heaven? Oh, nonsense, no. All we know is here we're alive again. And who are we to question God's infinite ways? I, Lustig, we're going back to the ship. But, Captain, I want to talk to my grandfather. Listen, grandfolks. Lustig, I don't like any part of this. You come back with us, I have to club you and carry you. Yeah, but, sir, there might... Heaven only knows what they've run up against back of the ship. the ship. Looks like we're being welcomed with a celebration. Captain. Celebration? They've abandoned ship. Every port is open. No guards said. You! You, masters! Hiya, Captain. Meet my old dad. Dad, that's Captain Black, and he's not a bad guy for an officer. Of all the... Kingston! Uh, oh, oh, what, sir? Bring that man back. Use force if you have to. Uh, I... Oh, excuse me, sir. There's my Uncle George. Kingston! I'll be right back, Captain. Uncle George! Uncle George! What the devil Don't is going... Don't understand, sir. They've all found friends and relatives. They're all here. He's right, Captain. I've counted. The whole crew's out in the crowd. But I gave orders. Definite orders. I don't understand, Captain. I understand Holy... mutiny. I don't care how many relatives show up. I'll have discipline. John! Johnny! Johnny, you old son of a gun. Edward. Edward. It's you. It can't be. <laughs> of course it is. Johnny, you old son of a gun. Ed. Edward. Dr. Horst. This is my, my brother, Edward. How do you do? Hello. It's... It's wonderful to see you, Edward. Look, I, 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 I've got to get back to my hey, ship. Hey, I almost forgot. Mom's waiting at home. Mom? And Dad, too. Mom? Dad are alive? Hey, excuse me, Horst. Then you're real, Ed. <laughs> Don't I feel real? How's that, huh? <laughs> Ed. Ed. Hey, we've, we've got lunch for you, Johnny. <laughs> Mom's making corn fritters. Corn? Dr. Horst, haven't you found anybody? No, Captain. I have nobody. Then you come on home with me, right, Ed? Sure, you bet. Horst, you wouldn't believe it, but it's been 35 years since I had Mom's corn fritters. By George. 35 years. And there's plenty more in the kitchen, so don't hold back, Johnny. You too, Dr. Horst. Well, Johnny, 
You're still in the Navy, huh? That's right, Dad. I'm in command of the ship. We're an old Navy family, Dr. Horst. All three of our boys in the service. Ed was the best pilot in the Pacific. What didn't happen, Ed? Oh, what's the difference? I'm here now. Oh, you know, it's almost perfect. All we're missing is your brother, Will. Then the whole family could be together. Well, it won't be long, Mom. Will's in charge of the XR-54. That's the next rocket coming out to Mars. Well, little Will. <laughs> when does he leave, Johnny? Takeoff's scheduled for September, but it depends on what we report. <laughs> There's no question about that now, eh? Christmas together again. That'll be something, huh? Yes, sir. Well, this calls for celebration. How about a little of the old dandelion wine, eh, Johnny? Now, Father, don't you go giving Johnny too much wine. Oh, he's a big boy now, Mother. Well, sir, isn't everything just fine? Just fine. Well, Dr. Horace, what do you think of my little family, hmm? Very nice. You know, I can't understand why you didn't find any folks here, Dr. Horace. It's just a shame. Everybody else is so happy. I never remembered my family, Mrs. Black. All I know is they were gassed at Dachau during the Second World War. When I was liberated, I was in a delirium three months. I cannot remember anything before then. The psychiatric phenomenon. That's terrible. Isn't there anything anybody can do? I don't want to remember. Oh. I haven't had a pleasant life. I prefer to be free of emotional entanglements. They interfere with a scientific approach. I'm sorry, Dr. Horst. Oh, I'll get it. Hey, that's our ring, along in three shorts. Hello. I remember that. Well, maybe we'd better call it a night. You must be getting tired, Johnny. I'd better be going back to the ship. Oh, nonsense. You stay the night. We insist. Oh, I just couldn't rest thinking of you all alone on that ship. Oh, I'd be all right. Well, good night. Oh, wait a minute, Dr. Horst. That phone message was for you. Me? Yes, that's right. A message from Anna. Anna? I don't remember any Anna. She asked if you were better. Perhaps she's someone you knew at Dachau. Anna? She said she's coming over here first thing in the morning. So you'll have to stay over. Yes, Well, that settles it, then. You stay here, Horst. You can bunk with me in my old room. Oh, but Johnny... We thought you'd like to be with Edward. So you could talk the way you used to. Well, we can't put Dr. Horst on the day bed. I think we'd better share the room tonight. There'll be plenty of time for talking, Ed. I guess so. Well, I suppose I'd better drop back to the ship. You know, Ed, security check. Well, why do you have to do that here? Well, I don't know. There's no good reason, I guess. <laughs> well, I suppose we skip it tonight. Oh, sure. Well, good night, everybody. <laughs> oh, it's good to have you home, Johnny. It's good to be home, Mom. Captain Black, are you asleep? No, no. I've just been thinking about what we were expecting. <laughs> Green-skinned Martians with eyes on stalks. All the time, there was only Mom and Dad and Edward waiting. Ah, it's funny what tricks your imagination can play on you. Yeah, I guess Mars is heaven, Horst. Hmm. I've been thinking about Martians, too. Yeah. <sighs> Captain, just suppose... Suppose there were Martians, and they saw us land. Suppose they thought of us as invaders... What would be the best weapon they could use against our atom bombs? I don't see what you're getting at. They would want to disarm us first. Mm. To wipe out all suspicion. To make us feel at home. Mm. But suppose this house isn't real. Suppose the people are just images. Stolen from our own memories. 
by Martians. Created for us by telepathy. Hypnotism. <laughs> that's the craziest theory I ever heard. Maybe that's why there was no one for me. Because in all my life, there is no happy memory. No real love person. How about that phone call from Anna? Yes. Anna. I don't remember who she was, but I do now. I just remembered. When I was freed from Dachau, sick, delirious, I raved about a wonderful, kind nurse named Anna that took care oh, of me. There you are. It's logical. She's coming to see you tomorrow. But there was no Anna. I'd be nursed by a man. What? Anna was only a dream. And there's only one way they could have learned about her. By reading my subconscious mind. But that's impossible, Horace. Why? The whole crew was thinking of home. Suppose the Martians read our minds. Yes, but if, if there are Martians... If there are, they have us separated. Each man in a different house. Sleeping. Trusting. No one at the guns. I left my pistol downstairs. Do you, do you think there's something to this horse? It's a pet who would suspect his own mother, his grandparents. How easy. Just a knife in the heart of each sleeping man. It's impossible, Horace, but we've, we've got to get back to the ship. Listen. The crickets have stopped. Come on. We don't know when they change back to Whatever they really are. Where are you going, John? Ed, well, we we wanted to drink of water. That's all, Ed. You're not thirsty, John. You don't want to drink. You don't want to drink. His face, it's changing. And his hands, he's a Martian. Run, horse. Run. Get away, John. You can't get away. This way, horse. Can you hear me, Earth? This is Captain John Black, the XR-53, calling from Mars. I've locked myself in the ship, but they've crippled it. I, I can't take off or fire the guns, and they're coming for me now. The Martians. I'm all alone here. All the rest are dead. Hingston, Lustig, Dr. Horse. Poor Horse, he didn't even reach the door. Listen, listen, they're trying to break through the hull now. Edward and Mom and Dad and all the folks. But they're changing now. Melting and changing back into their Martians. Can you understand me? Martians, not men. They made us think that Mars was heaven and we fell into the trap. Can you hear me, Earth? You've got to stop the next rocket. Tell, tell my brother Will. Tell my brother Will not to come. They'll trap him too. They'll kill them all. Hello. Hello. Can you hear me, Earth? This is John Black on Mars. Hello, Earth. This is John Black on Mars. Tonight, Dimension X has presented and transcribed the Ray Bradbury story, Mars is Heaven, adapted for radio by Ernest Canoy. Featured players were Wendell Holmes as Captain Black and Peter Capel as Dr. Horse. Your narrator, Norman Rose. Music by Albert Berman, engineer Bill Chambers. Dimension X is produced by Van Woodward and directed by Edward King. Robert Warren speaking. In a moment, Dimension X. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. Checks, rice checks, and good hot Wilson present Space Patrol! <laughs> High adventure in the wild, vast reaches of space. Missions of daring in the name of interplanetary justice. Travel into the future with Buzz Corey, Commander-in-Chief of the Space Patrol. In today's transcribed adventure, Buzz and Happy have landed on a small planetoid. At this moment, wearing their spacesuits, they're approaching the airlock of a prospector's cave, where a criminal is believed to be hiding. Where did that come from? Someone's firing at us. Here. 
We'll be back in just a moment with today's Space Patrol story, The Magic Space Pictures. Hi, gang. It's nighttime here on the planet Terra. All is quiet. But in just a second, you'll hear news that'll rock this planet like an explosion. Watch out! Here it comes! Yes, sir, the news is out, and here it is. Rice checks and wheat checks now come to you in a brand new package with a big picture of Commander Corey or Cadet Happy on the front. Gang, you can cut these pictures out and paste them in your scrapbook or pin them in your room or clubhouse. And listen, inside of these wonderful new packages of checks, you now get... The Magic Space Patrol Space Picture. Here's how it works. You stare at the Magic Space Picture. Who is it? What is it? It's hard to tell. But when you look into the sky or at a wall, presto! That's where the magic comes in. You suddenly see a giant picture that looks like Buzz Corey himself, or a real flying saucer, or a real rocket ship. Now, gang, there's 24 of these pictures, all different, and you get one in every new package of checks. So start collecting the whole set of 24 today. Just look for the new packages of rice checks and wheat checks with Buzz Corey or Cadet Happy on the front and the magic space pictures on the inside. And now, today's Space Patrol adventure, the magic space pictures. Excitement is high at the Terra spaceport today. Rumor has spread that Commander Corey himself is to blast off for a test flight in the XR-51, the new experimental rocket ship which has been under top security guard for weeks while technicians installed secret equipment. In his central office at Space Patrol headquarters, Commander Corey is now making a last-minute check of charts and technical data as Cadet Happy bursts in. Commander, Commander, somebody's made a terrible mistake. Oh, Excuse me, sir. That's all right, Happy. What's the trouble? Well, I just received special orders from the Technical Training Command. Oh, let me see them. You'll report to Recognition School for a special briefing course at 1100 hours Universal Star Time today. Well, I thought I'd better report the mistake to you right away, sir, so I wouldn't be marked AWL. There's no mistake, Happy. Uh, but, sir, I, I thought that... You uh, thought what? Well, well, you are taking the experimental rocket ship up today, aren't you, sir? Yes, in about an hour. Why? Well, I, I, I figured you'd be needing me, and, and, well, if I have to be at recognition school... I but... put those orders through, Happy. Uh, then, uh, then I don't make the test flight? Not this one. I'm taking with Jeff Fisher. He's been working in the project since it started. Anyway, the whole flight won't take more than an hour or two. I see. Well, sorry I bothered you, sir. In a few days, I'll be starting a whole series of flights in the XR-51. You're going to recognition school, so you'll be able to help me. Oh, oh well, that's different. Here, look at this. Well, just a negative picture of the planet Saturn. Anybody would recognize that. It's a special kind of negative picture, Happy. Look at that tiny spot in the center. Keep gazing at it. Yes, sir. I still don't see anything unusual. Don't take your eyes off that center dot. Well, if this is a sample of what the course is like, it's going to be a cinch. <laughs> All right, Happy. Now look out the window at the sky. What do you see? Nothing. Just a... Uh-oh. Hey, I must be going crazy. What's the matter? Why, Saturn's right out there in space, just the way it looks from a spaceship. You see it, sir? I can't see it, because I haven't been looking at the magic space picture. I don't understand. This is only one of 24 magic space pictures you'll get in the basic training course, Happy. You're going to see a lot of images in space. But how does it work? You'll learn that at the school. Uh-oh, look at the time. I've got to run over to the spaceport now to one of the technicians. Well, good luck, Happy. See you when you get out of class. Oh, Commander Corey, may I help you? Oh, yes, Vanek. I just dropped in to see if Lieutenant Fisher picked up all the equipment we need for the test. It's all in the ship, sir. I checked it myself. Fine. Now, I want every bit of extra image reactor equipment removed from this building and returned to the security lab. That includes diagrams, check sheets, everything. Is that clear? Yes, Commander. Good. Then I'll go over to the ship. I want full security measures observed. Tell your men that, Vanek. All right, Commander. Good luck. Juro Vanek at Station 4, calling Station 6. Station 4, calling Station 6. Acknowledge with Code Y. Code Y received. 
sent three men and a surface truck to Station 4 to pick up some special equipment. Get it aboard my private spaceship before the security lab starts checking. I got Corey fooled. With a little luck, I can blast off for Planetoid 94. Oh, what a day. How'd you get along in class, Happy? Okay, sir, I guess. But I can still see planets and spaceships and special equipment floating in space. Oh, you'll get used to it. They had us look at pictures and... Well, the way I did here in the office. Only we were in front of a sort of brainograph machine. That's right. You've seen how our brainograph screen shows an image of a person's thoughts. Yes, sir. Well, our scientists have found a way to make those images send electric impulses to relays and motors and instruments. Oh, just the way our brain sends impulses through the nerves to the muscles. Exactly. Only the image reactor is much faster. Ordinarily, when you think of an action you want to perform, your hand throws a switch or moves a control. With this new device, your thought throws the switch. Oh, and the purpose of these magic space pictures is to train us to project the correct image at the right time. That's right. Hmm. After you've mastered the technique, Happy, you can maneuver the XR-51 from blast off to landing with your hands tied behind your back. Wow. So that's the big secret of the XR-51. There are a lot of bugs to get out of it before we can equip all space patrol ships with it, but we want a supply of trained pilots ready to take over. Your private space patrol, sir. Space patrol headquarters. Corey here. Oh, yes, Robbie. What? When was this discovered? I see. Space of phone and all planets alarm. I'll blast off right away. Corey out. Come on, Happy. Let's get to Terra 5. Oh, what's wrong, sir? Some of the image reactor equipment and the key designs have been stolen from the security lab. How? All we know is that a technician named Juro Vanek has disappeared. Major Robertson says Vanek blasted off from here about 20 minutes ago. Come on, Happy. We're going after him. Vanek's ship, the patrol sighted, he could be going either to Mars or Jupiter. But in the meantime, he could have changed vector and probably has. Well, Commander, what could Vanek gain by stealing that equipment? He may be planning to sell it, which would be pretty risky, but more likely he's working for someone who doesn't want to see the space patrol become too efficient. Yeah, with those image reactors, our ship could outmaneuver anything in space. Vanek has been with the project ever since it started. He's probably been waiting for months for a chance to make this break. I hope we catch him right away. I don't want to miss any of that course. We don't catch him. The team program might as well be suspended. According to that last report from Major Robertson, Vanek got away with most of the reactor cells. The heart of the whole device. Space Control Terra calling Commander Corey aboard Terra 5. Space Control Terra to Commander Corey. Corey here. Go ahead, Space Control. Commander, Space Patrol Ship T-523 reports an unidentified private cruiser heading for the planetoid belt. Patrol ship gave chase, but the cruiser got away. Do you have the vector for cruiser? An approximate one, sir. 23 degrees, sun-Mars orientation, 300,000 DUs outside the Mars orbit. He's way off the Jupiter lanes. Space control, inform Major Robertson. I'll proceed toward the planetoid belt in Sector J. Corey out. So Vanek isn't going to Jupiter. Well, he can't hide out in the planetoids very long. They're just chunks of rock with no atmosphere and no food. Well, how about all the prospectors who live in the planetoids? Well, even they have to make trips to the nearest planet two or three times a year for supplies. Vanek is probably just trying to throw off pursuit. Yeah, we'll see. Well, Juro, welcome to Planetoid 94. Here, Barrett. Take some of this stuff. And let's get out of this airlock. Why, you have got a load, haven't you? Here, I'll give you a hand. Just set it down. And close that inner door. Sure, sure, sure. Oh, you'll get out of that space suit, and I'll give you some nice hot Venus coffee. Well, this business of being a space patrol agent must be tiring. It is. I got to blast off again right away. But I will have some coffee. Say, that's um, real interesting looking equipment there, Joe. A special secret lock for the outer hatch to your cave. A lock? Why, Joe, I never had a lock on the place at all. So, so you started coming and storing your space patrol stuff here. In fact, last time I went out, I nearly forgot the key. Well, with all this secret space patrol equipment here, it's got to be locked up. Suppose some enemy of the space patrol tried to steal it. Oh. Couldn't have that happen, of course. Mm. And with this new lock, you don't need any key. You just think of a certain image, and the outer door opens. I do what? Uh, think of an image? Yes. An image that only you and I know. Uh, that's too steep for old Trogbear. Not only that, 
But I got some special weapons I'm going to install on the rocks all around your cave. They work on the same principle. Weapons? What in the name of purple comets do I need weapons for? Why, uh, in case space bandits try to steal the space patrol equipment, I'll install a view scope outside. And if anybody lands on this planetoid, we just think of this certain image and the controlled weapons fire at the criminals. Well, you talk like you uh, plan to stay here, Gerald. I will, after I get back from my next mission. But I'm going to install these weapons and the secret log before I blast off. Well, oh, this, uh, this image business, that's uh, worse than a key. Uh, suppose I forget what the image is. Hmm, that's a good point. It ought to be something you couldn't forget. I got it. Your face. Huh? Just think of your own face. Think real hard. And the outer air door will open. I'll set up the image reactor right now and show you how it works. Jero Vanek must be in another part of the planetoid belt, sir. All we've seen in the viewscope are those chunks of rock. Hundreds of them. Happy look at the viewscope to starboard. A spaceship. It was hidden by that planet. He must have seen us. He swerved toward Jupiter. Hey, he's really kicked down the power. Let's get him, Happy. We're gaining on him, sir. He'll crash into one of those planetoids if he isn't careful. Yeah, or we will. Hey, hey, he's going to... Cr- wow, that was close. Did you see him gear away just in time? Yes. I'll say this for him. He's some pilot. Hey, where'd he go? Change vector again. He's trying to keep a planetoid between him and us. I can't locate him, sir. We've lost him. What was that? The rear view scope. Look at There he is. He circled around behind us. He's on our tail. He's firing cosmic torpedoes. Yeah, now we'll have to use evasive action. Raise yourself, Happy. That ought to throw him off. Wow, that was closer than ever. Vanek's nearly as quick as lightning at those controls. He is, Happy. Vanek's ship is equipped with an image reactor. Unless a miracle happens, his next shot will blast us to bits. We'll return to Space Patrol in just a moment. Say, gang, here's big news. Big, big, big news. Remember that picture of Saturn, the one Commander Corey told Cadet Happy to look at? Remember what took place after Hap looked at it? Hap thought he saw the planet Saturn in the sky. Well, gang, how would you like to have some magic pictures that work just like that? Here's where you'll find them. Inside the new Rice Checks and Wheat Checks Packages. The new packages with the picture of Buzz Corey or Cadet Happy on the front. Now, there's 24 of these magic space pictures, and they're all different. And you get one in every new package of checks. Saturn, Commander Corey, Cadet Happy, rocket ships, these and 20 other fascinating pictures appear on the magic space pictures. You'll want all 24. Here's how they work. You stare at the mysterious picture. What is it? Who is it? You can't tell for sure. Not till you look at the sky or at a wall. That's when the magic goes to work. Floating in space is a giant picture that looks like a real rocket or a real planet. Man, oh man, it's lots of fun. So, gang, hurry. Get the new packages of Rice Checks and Wheat Checks with Buzz Corey or Cadet Happy on the front and the magic space pictures inside. And now back to Space Patrol and the magic space pictures. Space Patrol scientists have developed a spaceship control device that reacts directly to the pilot's thought commands. Juro Vanek, a disloyal Space Patrol technician, has stolen several of these image reactor units and hidden them in a prospector's cave, a small planetoid. The prospector, Trog Barrett, innocently believes he's assisting an honest Space Patrol agent. Buzz and Happy suddenly came upon Vanek's ship in the planetoid belt and gave chase. But Vanek, with his image reactor control, executed a series of rapid maneuvers that enabled him to attack Buzz and Happy from the rear with cosmic torpedoes. He's laying those torpedoes closer every time he fires. It's like he knows what we're going to do before we do it. Stand by to fire rear torpedoes. Standing by, sir. We can't use automatic aim and fire because these planetoids will confuse a selector. Fire when you get him in your sights. I missed him a mile. He swerved just as I fired. He certainly didn't miss us by much. I'll try again, sir. Hap, you can hit a big target easier than a small one. This time, aim at one of those planetoids just when Vanek passes near it. I get it, sir. What an idea. I'll hold the ship steady for a few seconds. It'll make us an easy target, but you'll have a chance to aim. Vanek's moving toward one now, sir. Here goes. 
Space going, Hap. At least I hit the planetoid. You got Vennick's ship with some of the planetoid fragments. He's in trouble. Good shooting, Hap. It was just luck, sir. We'll circle back and take him up. There's a chance he's alive. I'll board his ship. Get my space while I join airlocks. Cadet Happy calling Commander Corey. Go ahead, Happy. Are you all right, sir? I'm just entering Vanek's ship now. No sign of him so far. He's got an image reactor control all right, both on his rockets and torpedo fire control. Now, the way he handled his ship, he must have been giving himself private lessons. Uh, it looks like he got away. Got away? Where could he have gone? He probably jumped out in a spacesuit right after his ship was hit. He could be hundreds of DUs from here by now. Coming back, Happy. Notify Space Patrol Jupiter to pick up this wreck. We'll search for Vanek. Hello, Juro. There's nobody on Planetoid 94. I'm not there. Barrett, is this truck Barrett? Yeah, but who'd you think it was? Yeah, Barrett, listen, I'm in trouble. You've got to help me. In trouble? Uh, what happened? I'm in a spacesuit, adrift in the Planetoid Belt. Well, what in the name of Jupiter's moons are you doing out there? Don't ask questions, just listen. I was attacked by space bandits. They went after my ship and it's damaged. They don't know I got away. You got to find me and pick me up before they come back. Space bandits? In the planetoid belt? Yes, yes. Uh, where are you? In my ship. I'm heading for planetoid 867. Uh, I'll pick you up, Joe. Uh, hurry, please. Here are my coordinates as closely as I can give them. I'm approximately in front of my... Just a second. I'll be with you. There, there. Let me help you open that helmet face piece there. There. There you are, Joel. Get back to the control truck. Let's get away from here quickly. Oh, sure, sure. Oh, uh, thanks for picking me up. Oh, that's all right. After all, it's the only neighborly thing to do. Uh, you all right, Joel? Yeah, yeah, I'm okay. Now, let's see. You better take me to Mars. To Mars? Yeah, I'm going to have to pick up another ship and some special supplies. Then I'll come back to Planetoid 9-4. Well, I was going prospecting, but I guess the Space Patrol comes first. I admire your attitude, Barrett. Drop me off at Lowell City, and then you can go prospecting. Uh, remember one thing, though. Yeah? If anyone contacts you, remember you haven't seen me or my ship. Now get me to Mars as quickly as you can. Juro really disappeared. I swear we've covered every cube yard of space he could possibly be in. We must have miscalculated, Happy. Happy, look at that planetoid. Hey, there's a spaceship there. I'll head for it. You turn up the viewscope sensitivity control. Yes, sir. There's a man in a spacesuit near the ship, sir. See? Crawling up that hump of rock? Mm, judging by the type of ship, he may be a prospector. When we land, we'll get the man aboard ship and see what we can find out. How do you do? As you probably know, we're space patrolmen. I'm Commander Corey. Oh, I'm glad to know you, Commander. I'm Trog Barrett. May I ask what you're doing on this planetoid? Oh, doing a little prospecting. Thought I detected a deposit of uh, Illurium over there. Uh, anything wrong in that? Not a thing. Have you seen any other spaceships in this area recently? Oh, I, um, no. No, I haven't. I don't have much company in the planetoid belt, you know. You haven't seen anyone at all or picked up any signals from anyone? Uh, no, Commander. I see. Where do you live, Barrett? On Planetoid 94. I've got me a cozy cave with my own air supply equipment. I see. Oh, thanks, Barrett. He won't keep you from your work any longer, but if you sight any ships, not notify Space Patrol Mars or Jupiter, will you? Oh, you bet, Commander. It'll be nice chatting with you. I hope you'll find that Illurium. All uh, right. Thanks. So long. Close the inner hatch, Happy. Yes, sir. Commander. Did you see what I saw? The back of a spacesuit? Yes, sir. It's a fairly recent space patrol issue with the insignia almost rubbed out. Well, what would a prospector be doing with space patrol equipment? He might have stolen it. 
Still, he seems to be an honest old fellow. Let's blast off. We'll check on Barrett by space phone with both Mars and Jupiter Space Patrol headquarters. And if we find anything suspicious, we can pay a surprise visit to Planetoid 90. Everything's in good shape back aft, Commander. I made a thorough instrument check on the power and air control. Good. I just got a report from Mars headquarters on Barrett. He's got a clean record. But early this morning, his ship landed at Lowell City Spaceport. A man got out, and then Barrett blasted off again. But he told us he hadn't seen anybody. I'd like to know who that man was that Barrett dropped off on Mars. We're going to circle back to Planetoid 94 and find the answer to that question. Howdy, Drew. Oh, oh, what a trip I've had. When did you get back from Mars? Hmm, a couple of hours ago. Hey, that's a dandy new ship you got. Barrett, what are you doing in that spacesuit? Why, I had to put it on to get to the cave from a ship, you know that. But that's my suit. The one I was wearing when you picked me up in space. Hmm, oh, so it is. Same size as mine. Oh, almost forgot some... Space Patrol fellows landed on number 867 and asked me some questions. What? Oh, well, I didn't tell them anything. I said I hadn't seen anybody or any ships. <laughs> You'd have been proud of me, Gerald. What did they want to know? Oh, what I was doing. So I told them prospecting. Then when I told them I hadn't seen anybody, they blasted off. Real nice fellows. Um, Commander Corey was the one I talked Corey. to. Corey? And he saw you in that space suit? Why... Juro, what's wrong? You lundering fool. Juro, what are you getting all upset about here? Get out of the way. Let me turn on the fuse scope. Look, Juro, this is my home. I, I don't like being pushed around even by my friends. Get away and shut up. Look at that. A spaceship. And it's headed for a landing ride near the cave. See what you've done? Well, I haven't done anything. I don't see what you're so steamed up about. Here. Don't I? That's Commander Corey. You let him here, you bungling old fool. Now, you see, he's your commander. You can explain I was helping you there. Shut up. Just wait till oh. Corey gets out of that ship. I'll fix him. I'll blast him off that planetoid. Juro, what are you talking about? Those weapons I rigged to cover the cave entrance from every angle. Why, you're no space patrolman. You learn fast, Barrett. Get your hands off of me. You're not going to harm the commander. I won't let you. I don't said let go. Oh. Now, keep out of my way. After I get Corey, I'll finish with you. And don't try anything else if you value yourself at all. Have your ray gun ready, Hap. I'll see if I can open the cave airlock. Yes, sir. Hey, where did that come from? Someone's firing at us. Hey, that one came from the other direction. Quickly, run for the cave. They're getting closer. One chunk of rock nearly hit me. The airlock won't open. Whoever's controlling those weapons can keep on firing till they get us. We've no protection out here. We're trapped. Hap, there's an image reactor unit here. Then Juro Vanek's inside. Yes, watching us through a view scope. Yeah, if we only knew what image would unlock this hat. He's got us bracketed now, Hap. If we don't get in the cave, the next one will get us sure. Think of me. Think of me. Hey, who's that? Someone's on our suit's face upon frequency. This is Tog Barrett. Think of me. What's he talking about? Barrett! Barrett, what do you mean? Happy, he's telling us how to open the airlock. Think of what Barrett looks like. Think hard. Oh, gee, I only saw him once. I don't remember, except that he had a beard. Let me in front of that reactor, Happy. Let's see. Gray beard, blue eyes, space tan face. Commander, it worked. The airlock's open. Get in quickly. Close it behind you. Hurry. Wow, that was close. Through the inner door. I got there, Barrett. They were right in the line of fire when I... Corey, that's right, Bannock. Drop that ray gun. Stand back, Corey. Hey, nice going, Commander. Bannock, you don't seem to do so well when you have to depend on your own reactions. All right, get up. Commander, you, you made it. Yes, Barrett, thanks to you. I tried to stop him from firing at you. Thanks, Barrett. We'll take care of you from now on, Bannock. Get up. Okay. Okay. How did you get into a cave, Corey? Barrett's space phone us the right image to use. You... 
You worked the image reactor after seeing Barrett only once? That's right, Vanek. I wouldn't expect you to know this, but a person can get in most anywhere with an honest face. That's my commander. <laughs> an action preview of next week's exciting Space Patrol adventure in just a moment. But first... Commander. Commander, look at how fast that boy is running. Hap, that's the fastest running I ever saw. That boy's running to the grocery store, Commander. He just heard the big news. You mean the big news? Rice checks and wheat checks now have a brand new package with a big picture of the Commander and me on the front? Yes, sir. Plus the news that inside of each of these brand new packages, you now get a magic space picture. Hope you'll follow that boy to the grocery store, gang. I'm mighty proud of those new packages of checks with my picture on the front. Hope you'll cut my picture out and paste it in your scrapbook. And hey, gang, you can also get rice checks and wheat checks now with my picture on the front. You can cut out my picture, too, and hang it in your room or clubhouse. That sure would make me happy. <laughs> uh, don't forget, inside every one of those new packages of checks, there's a magic space picture. You stare at them, look in the sky, and wow you, you see a big rocket ship floating in space, or a speeding jet car, or whatever the subject of your magic space picture happens to be. There's 24 of them all together, and they're all different. And you get one in every new package of checks, so... So start collecting the whole set of 24 magic space pictures today. Just bring home the new packages of rice checks and wheat checks with Buzz Corey or Cadet Happy on the front and the magic space pictures inside. And now, an action preview of next week's exciting space patrol adventure. Buzz and Happy are in a magnetic tunnel car. A tunnel car in a mine shaft deep below the surface of the planet Venus. As they rise toward ground level, Happy prepares the weapons they hope will enable them to rescue Tonga from two criminals. Hey, what was that? Explosion. Dratcher has blown up the entrance to the tunnel. We're sealed in. Oh, brace yourself. Our tunnel car is going to crash right into the debris. Be sure to be with us next Saturday for the exciting story, The Caverns of Venus, when Wheat Checks, Rice Checks, and Good Hot Ralston again bring you Space Patrol! <laughs> Space Patrol, an original Mike Moser production starring Ed Kemmerer as Commander Corey and Lynn Osborne as Cadet Happy, was written by Lou Houston and directed by Larry Robertson. <laughs> Other players were Norman Jolly and Bela Kovach. Dick Tufel speaking. Now, don't forget to tune in next Saturday and every Saturday when Wheat Checks, Rice Checks, and Good Hot Ralston again present the new exciting Space Patrol. And be sure to see another exciting Space Patrol program on your local ABC TV station. Consult your newspaper for time and channel. Mother's, an invitation from your grocer. See his special peach coronation salad display. 1953's most beautiful salad. Canned cling peaches from California. Creamy cottage cheese. Serve with rye crisp. Mmm, mmm. Space Patrol came to you transcribed from Hollywood. This is ABC Radio Network. Quiet, please. Quiet, please. The American Broadcasting Company presents Quiet, Please, which is written and directed by Willis Cooper and which features Ernest Chappell. Quiet, Please, for today is called Other Side of the Stars. I remember Mount Wilson and the 100-inch telescope. Then I remember the astronomer Van Dyke and the little house of galvanized iron on the very edge of the summit. That was the house that had nothing inside it. The absence of everything. Now, I have no explanation of it. I think perhaps Van Dyke knew something about it. Up there where you used to be able to look down at night on the lights of six dozen cities and towns. You could look up, too, with the stars and the planets that seem so tantalizingly close above you. If you wondered about them, well, maybe Van Dyke might tell you about them. Maybe. Remember that flying saucer craze about a year ago? 
Well, then Dyke could probably tell you something about that, too. If he wanted to. <laughs> I don't know why I'm laughing. I've got plenty of reason not to laugh. Why well, don't you grin at me? You and I are both in the same boat. You and I and everybody else. Up that old crick without oars, friend. You know, I'm not a refugee from stupefying stories magazine. My name isn't Glob Glodge, XB314, and Tars Tarkus, Jeddak of the Tharks, is still Edgar Riceboro's personal property as far as I'm concerned. Now, I'm not even the eagle-eyed, needle-nosed mad scientist with the two heads. Now, I'll take that back. Maybe I have got two heads. But I know something you don't know. Yet. I know what's out there on the other side of the stars. Or shall I say I know what was out there? Oh, excuse me. What do you want, young man? Excuse me. People come barging in here. Isn't that on the air sign turned on out there? Huh? Well, can't people see we're busy in here? Can't you do something about keeping them out of here? I've only got a... All right, all right. Where was I? I said I know what was on the other side of the stars. And I know where it is now. Or I think I know. That's what I'm here to tell you about. If people will stop bursting in here while I'm talking, get out of here, you! I'm sorry. Well, wait a minute. You might as well come in and hear what I've got to say in here. You'll keep opening and shutting that door. Sit down there. No, no, there, there. Just sit down and keep quiet. Yes, sir. Who are you, anyway? I'm... I'm Dorothy's brother. What's your name? I'm her brother, Steve. Yeah, she did have a brother named Steve. Steve, that's me. Now, what do you want? I just want to hear this. What, you know, what you're going to say. How did you know I was... I heard about it. Well, I've known Dorothy for more than 20 years. She... Your name is Esau, isn't it? Yes. Esau. Excuse me. I met Dorothy more than 20 years ago. I met her when I was at Peach Springs, Arizona, before I started off up in the Yavapai Indian country looking for the well. Before Steve here was born. Uh-huh. Peach Springs, 20 years ago. I don't know what it's like now. I haven't been there since 1928, September. Then it was a stop-off for the transcontinental buses, such as they were. General store on the edge of the Yavapai Reservation. They were so proud of their new frigid air. Yeah, right alongside the general store there was a corral where the Indian cowboys seemed always tangling with raw-back range cattle. Not very far away from the Grand Canyon. Remember it well. Dorothy told me about the well. I was looking for the gold, of course. For the old map that showed where the well was, the old map with the Spanish words and the mark like the planet Saturn, complete with rings. Marked Poso Tel Cielo, well of the heavens, well of the sky. And the other words alongside it in the crabbed soldier's handwriting. Lleno de oro y plata. Full of gold and silver. Full of gold and silver. And I was the first man who'd seen that map since... I think it was 1542, maybe 1543. There wasn't anybody in the world who'd seen it for nearly 400 years till I got hold of it. Went looking for it. For the gold and silver. Was that the well where... Dorothy got off the bus from Los Angeles when I did there at Peach Springs. I wasn't aboard it when it started off again. And that was she. Then she went with me looking for the well of the skies. It was just that simple. Dorothy was working for some museum of... She was investigating prehistoric Indian dwellings. Uh She was going north and so was I. Oh, it was all right. We'd been walking about an hour through the mesquite and talking. There was a rattlesnake, a big sidewinder. Dorothy produced a gun from somewhere and very casually shot its head off at 15 feet. I stopped talking, I remember, and Dorothy put away the gun. I know how to use a gun, she said very coolly. See what I mean? I saw. <laughs> yeah, well, let's get on. That time's a waste in there. There wasn't any gold, and there wasn't any silver in the well of the stars. You found that out right away? We found that out right away. 
There wasn't anything except a skeleton and some very well-preserved pieces of 16th century armor, including a beautifully engraved steel cap, Marion, I, I think they call them, Marian. and a sword. Rapier started with a basket hilt. You've seen them in pictures. Why don't you tell it all? I'm going to. I think it would be better if you don't mind. I'll tell it all. I'll tell it all. About the music. I've got to tell about the music. Dorothy said when she came up... There were foot holes cut to the sides of the well. She went down first because she said she wasn't as heavy as I and I could hold the rope better in case she fell. She went down as far as the rope would reach, about 15 feet from the bottom. She stayed down quite a while. Finally, when she came up, she said she heard music down there. Didn't you... I wish you'd stop prompting me. Excuse me. That was all. Just music. In a hole in the ground that was at least 400 years old that nobody had seen since 1542 or 3. Nearly 100 feet deep. Music. That's all. Just music. You know how far away the stars are? The stars, not the planets. The planets are close. The planets of our sun, I mean. The stars, and their father. They're so far away that astronomers measure the distance to them in what they call light years, just to make it simpler. A light year? Well, light travels 186,000 miles a second. A second, 186,000 miles. There isn't any such distance, not on this Earth anyway. Around 25,000 miles around the Earth at the equator, that's the farthest you can go, if you're a human being. Anyway, try and think of 186,000 miles. Then you multiply that by 60 for the distance light travels in a minute. Then by 60 again, and that's how far it travels in an hour. Just light, see? Then if you can still figure, multiply that by 24. That's the distance light travels in one day. And 365 times that is how far it travels in a year. That's a light year. In round numbers, 5,829,196,000,000 miles. And the nearest star is more than four times that far away. Alpha Centauri is its name. You could look at it some night, maybe. And the light, you see, started from there more than four years ago. Alpha might be bright purple now, and you wouldn't know it. Not for four years. That's what Van Dyke, the astronomer, told me, and Van Dyke, the astronomer, knows just about everything. The well. You were talking about the well. What? And Dorothy. Well, I have to tell the whole story, don't I? Pardon me, I... I mean, pardon me. You just shut up, Dorothy's brother. You just keep still and don't say anything. The hand on that clock just keeps going around. The first thing I I'm know... I'm sorry. Of... It was dark night when I finally climbed up out of the well. It was just like Dorothy said it was. The rope was too short to get all the way to the bottom. And when I came up, it was dark. And there wasn't a sound to be heard, except once in a while a coyote howling somewhere way off in the distance. The music. Tell about the music. I heard the music, too, while I was down in the well. I didn't say anything for a couple of minutes after I climbed out over the rim. Finally, Dorothy said in the dark, did you hear it? I thought for a minute. I wondered if I had heard it or... You see, there wasn't a sound up there on the ground, like I said. And I thought for a minute, and finally I said, yes. Yes, I said, I heard it too. I don't hear it now, though, I said. Listen. Do you... No. I don't hear anything. Well, what do you suppose? I don't know. I never heard anything like it before. Echo, maybe? No, it wasn't an echo. It came from... Where? Up above. Uh-huh. Nothing here to make any music, though. Indians? Uh-uh. Not like that. Esau. What? Build a fire. Yeah, I guess I'd better. Go ahead. All right. Well? Listen. 
What? Well, listen. I'm... Honest, I'm scared. Uh, what? So am I. You've got that gun. I don't... I'm not sure that gun would be much use. I... You think there's something down there? Do you? I don't know. Maybe we ought to go back to Peach Springs. We ain't break our necks in the dark. I don't know which way it is either. Go by the stars? No. I'm cold. Blankets. You got blankets too? Yeah. Esau. What? What do you think it? Oh. No, what? Look there. At the mouth of the well. What? You see a kind of light? No. Well, don't look right at it. Look kind of to one side. I don't see anything. Do you hear anything? Do you? Do you? Nothing. Moving. Listen. I hear something. Something in the well. Nothing down there. Nothing but that skeleton and the armor. And when the ice had finally melted away from my heart and I could move at last, I aimed my flashlight toward the well's mouth and in the bright beam I saw a poor harmless lizard choking its little life away half a foot from the lip of the well. Dorothy and I looked at each other in the dark. I guess she laughed first. In a minute, we were both practically in hysterics at the senseless fright that had gripped us a moment before. Finally, Dorothy said, I'm going to sleep. She pulled her blanket up over her head and leaned back against a rock. After a while, I did too. Still chuckling to myself. But just before I drifted off to sleep, I looked up at the stars. And they seemed so horribly close to us. And then I was asleep and I dreamed of music that came either from them or from the well that yawned there beside us. And when I woke up, I was all alone. There wasn't a sign of anybody as far as I could see. And I've never seen Dorothy. From that day to this. You, you talked to her. What? Yes, I've talked to her. Yes, I've talked to her. That's what I wanted to tell about. Van Dyke, the astronomer, told me a lot of things when I talked to him. Van Dyke knew what that well was. And he knew about the music. He knew where that came from, too. Music. Yeah, I'd better tell you about it. I never heard music quite like it before. I couldn't place it. Sounded something like, well, like somebody talking, only whoever it was used music instead of words. You could almost understand it. After a while, I did understand it. Tell about trying to find Dorothy. The first thing I thought about, of course, was she'd fallen. I wasn't very enthusiastic about climbing down in that well, naturally. But there wasn't anything else to do. She wasn't down there. The skeleton was still there on the bottom of the well. When I got to the end of the rope, I jumped on down. There wasn't anything at all except those old bones and the pieces of armor he'd worn when he was alive. And at last, in the light of my flashlight way down there, a hammered silver bracelet. A hammered silver bracelet I'd seen the day before on Dorothy's left wrist. But there was something else down there. What? What did you say? Something else. How did you know? I know. Yes. There was something else. I didn't know it at the time. If I'd known it was there. But I didn't. I didn't know about it till after I'd talked to Van Dyke and it was too late. I should have known it all falls into place. Now. The name of the place, Poso del Cielo, Well of the Skies. The music that came from nowhere. 
I know what you mean, but, but I don't think they do. Excuse me. We think about this Earth, we think it's the most important place in the solar system. It isn't. The solar system is not very important either. Will you keep quiet? I'm sorry. No, the solar system isn't very important either. It's only a tiny little bit of the... Universe? Not universe, it's plural. We're all part of what we call a Milky Way, billions and billions of universes. As far as anybody could see with the biggest telescope ever invented, and the people in the other universes are just as ignorant of us as we are of them, just as uninterested. Except a few of the scientists. Now, let's not talk like one of those magazines, young man. Uh, Steve... The chances of an intelligent being from another universe even seeing this one of ours is pretty remote. What? Certainly there are intelligent beings in the other universes. Don't be so self-important. No, they're not necessarily like us. They aren't like us, as a matter of fact. Why should they be? Who are we? Just leave it like that. There are intelligences other than the so-called human race. Hate us? Don't be silly. Most of them don't know we exist. Afraid of us? <laughs> it's sillier yet. The well. Oh, that's right. The well. You don't think the so-called human race dug that well, do you? You don't flatter yourself that that music was produced by human beings, do you? You don't think Dorothy disappeared through any human means, do you? The only answer in each case is no. The human race didn't have anything to do with it. Why? The thing told me. The thing at the bottom of the well. The intelligence from the other side of the stars, friend. Van Dyke told me all about it. Van Dyke knows an awful lot. Sometimes I think Van Dyke is... Not human... How would any human being figure it all out and be so right? Because he's right, all right. Tell it. The well, Van Dyke said, was a kind of telescope. Yeah. Telescope isn't the right word, but it was a, the same thing as a telescope, only... You know, astronomers just look at the stars. The silent stars, the stars that never make any sound. You just see them. You don't hear them. What... If you had a telescope for sound. Why should the stars be silent? I'll tell you something. They're not. They're just so far away we can't hear them. Yeah, talk all you want about having to have atmosphere and stuff to be able to hear sound. That's human reasoning. And these people, the stars... They know one or two things we don't know. Stars? People? Certainly the stars are alive. Certainly what's on the other side of them is alive. Well, go right ahead and laugh. I don't care what you think. You'll find out different. Only it'll be too late, see? You? About Dorothy? I have a couple of other things to say first, Steve. Then Dorothy. It was 20 years ago that I first saw the well of the skies and heard the music. It took me 16 years nearly to get the story all wrapped up from Van Dyke and from my own researches. I even took Van Dyke to see the well. He listened to the music, and he laughed. You don't know Van Dyke. You never heard him laugh. Oh, gives me the creeps. A little more than six years ago, he gave me the machine. You've heard of the electrocelegraph. A machine that does something about recording thought waves, brain waves, works, purely scientific, hard facts, all that. This thing is something like an electrosolograph, Van Dyke said. Put on these earphones, turn it on, watch the dials. That's all. Understand the music? That's right. Understand the music. Translates it into thoughts. Translates it so you can understand it. The music, the conversation that comes from the stars and the other side of the stars. And from the thing in the well. The thing in the well. And Mike told me what to look for. Too bad this isn't television. You could see it. 
goes with me everywhere I go. Well, you can hear it anyway. That's it. That's the first intelligent thing from the stars, the other side of the stars, that anybody on this earth has ever encountered. Just a little sphere, just like a ball. Feels like an egg, kind of, except it's not hard and brittle like an egg. Warm to the touch, moves, thinks, does whatever it wants to, talks by music. No, I don't know much more about it, except it's alive, very highly alive. Tells me it's closer to plant life than to our kind of life. Color? It's kind of grayish green. Very undistinguished to look at. Do? Well, it came from the star Alpha Centauri. I told you Alpha Centauri is four light years away. It took four years for this thing to get here at the speed of light, 186,000 miles a second. And... Here to stay. That's right. Here to stay. Found this earth by sheer accident. Curious about us. Do anything it wants to. It can do anything it wants to. Yes. Maybe you'd like to hear it. Hold the microphone over here close, Steve. Here, closer. Yeah, that's it. Wait. Yes, of course, over here, but I forgot it. Thank you. We let you hear it through the machine now, so you can hear, so you can understand what it's saying. Just a second, I'll turn on the machine. Steve, move the microphone over here closer to the earphones. Yes, so. Now. Just a second for the tubes to warm up. Now we adjust this dial, this one. Listen. Lisa, I was told you almost enough, but there is still Don't more to be told. His voice. I found it very useful to absorb, Dorothy. It is very difficult for me to form impressions of you human beings without much closer contact without making your physical being a part of my own. There was only one other in all the time since I came to this universe, a Spanish the soldier. The armor. And then when you and Dorothy came, it was necessary to know more about current conditions. All I knew about human beings was what I found in the mind of the Spanish soldier. You have made a few steps forward since his time. The rest of us will be interested. Move the microphone, Steve. You see? That's what became a Dorothy, Steve. Dead? No. No, Steve, Dorothy isn't dead. Dorothy's a part of that. Just like we're all going to be a part of the others. Excuse me. I mean... I was out in California two weeks ago. Van Dyke, uh, he's still at Mount Wilson. He wouldn't go to Palomar. There's something about Mount Wilson and the 100-inch telescope and the little house on the mountaintop that's got nothing in it. I told you about that. Now, Van Dyke doesn't want to leave. Van Dyke showed me a photograph made through the 100 inch on the 3rd of March. Yeah, let me show it to you, Steve. Stars. You describe it, Steve. This picture was made toward Alpha Centauri. Yeah, that's, uh, that's Alpha Centauri there. Yeah, there. You describe what you see, Steve. I, oh, no. Go on. Stars, millions of stars. Hmm. And this? Cloud. A cloud blotting out the stars from a sixth of a light year away. Two months ago, sixth of a light year. Now, this photograph, made April 7th, Steve. Steve. The cloud. It's bigger. A twelfth of a light year closer to the Earth, Steve. They're coming. I don't know. Put the microphone over here closer. Yeah, by the machine. Here, listen now. Here is the word from the other side of the stars. 
Here is the word from the beings, the intelligences, the things from Alpha Centauri. Listen. Welcome. Welcome to this place. Welcome to all of you. This place they call the Earth. It is not bad. It is an interesting place. I am glad you have come after all this time. The inhabitants will give us no trouble, whatever. They are very inferior grade of intelligence. Is that... What can we do? I mean... It's too late now, Steve. Much too late. At the speed of light, we're less than a day away. But they... From the other side of the stars? That's right, Steve. They've come to take over the Earth. Today's Quiet Please story was The Other Side of the Stars. It was written and directed by Willis Cooper, and the man who spoke to you was Ernest Chappell. And Jane White played Dorothy. The young man was Mark Forbes. As usual, music for Quiet Please is by Albert Berman. Now for a word about next week, our writer-director, Willis Cooper. Thank you for listening to Quiet Please. Next week, I have a love story for you, for a change. It's called The Little Mornings. And so until next week at the same time, I am quietly yours, Ernest Chapman. take any chances with your family's health. Each year, be certain that you and the others in your family have a chest x-ray to determine whether or not you have TB. Chest x-rays are available at your local tuberculosis clinic. Please take no chances. Have a chest x-ray. Help wipe out tuberculosis. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. This is WJZ, New York's first station, and WJZ-FM. For the inside version of the news, the factual highlights that lie behind the headlines, listen for Drew Person coming up next. Stronger, shock-resisting, yes. And now, Peter Paul Mounds, Almond Joy, and Cadbury Chocolate Bars presents Alien Worlds. This is Lee Hansen. The next two episodes of Alien Worlds will not involve Star Lab or our friends in the ISA. This week, Alien Worlds pursues a new horizon. We're going to take you on a mystical journey through a science fiction fantasy adventure that explores the intergalactic origins of spiritual evil and how the inhabitants of the ancient planet of Alithia set out to neutralize that evil over 2,000 years ago. Here then are Olin Soule, Loreen Tuttle, Rusi Taylor, and Roger Dressler in part one of our special presentation, Earthlight. <laughs> Something silent fractures the Elithian midnight clouds, and they slowly puzzle apart, releasing the ghostly radiances of three white moons. Brilliant lunar light shimmers down onto Elithia's night side. Darkness dissolves as far north as the ion refineries at Lahelia, as far south as the Aviara Sun Tower complex, as far east as the Lusa Canal intersect, as far west as the domed windship port at Darmus. Huge cloud 
fragments break away and drift past the moons. There is a sudden eclipse of light. Then the cloud fragments narrow to smoky splinters, curl up into the fluorescent winds of the aurora sphere and vanish. The moonlight returns, intensifies, expands. It sweeps across the starflight complex at Kalava, illuminates the celestial laboratories at Somari, seeps down to the Penumbrian shadow forest, and brightens the pyramid of Deus, which rests at the forest's perimeter. A canal of dark water flows between the pyramid and the forest. Iridescent nova blossoms on the canal bottom sense the moonlight and rise to the surface, the translucent petals shimmering with color. Docked at the edge of the canal is a slender Elithian wind ship. Its triangular sails fold, its 30-foot-long transparent metal hull low in the water. The huge main chamber inside the pyramid is illuminated by the pale yellow flames of a hundred thick white candles. Moonlight streams in through the stained glass sky windows at the chamber's peak. Delicately woven tapestries and intricate mosaics decorate the angled walls. Beneath the sky windows sits Deus, the father, Elithia's most highly evolved divine scientist. On the carved wooden table in front of him is an ancient voice book, its pages embossed with complex hieroglyphs. As he moves his fingertips over the hieroglyphs, the book voice tells him the future, reaffirming his dream about another expedition to the planet of Terra Lu. A beautiful woman is blinded by visions of immortality and falls to sleep in the flower field. A star machine floats down into the scented void of summer. A child is born. A healer of spirits walks across the deep currents of the faraway sea. The suffering are comforted. The dying are healed. The dead are reborn. The healer of spirits ascends to the stars. Terra Lou sinks below the fiery horizons of an alien sun. Faces look up. The sky stands still. Terra Lou. So many expeditions. So little progress. So many of our sons and daughters lost. A thousand years and it's just beginning. Deus? Ah, oh, come in and sit with me, Sibella. Have you seen the sky, Deus? The clouds are gone and the moons are out. It's a perfect night for star flying. Mm-hmm. The book said it would be. Has the book reaffirmed that we're returning to the Veda sector of Terra Lu? Yes, and it told me about the woman. Her name is Aram. She's young and strong and beautiful. And she's never known the Darkbringer virus. Elisha Bai had never known the virus either. Do they share the same blood? Yes. And because they do, the embryon child implanted in Elisha Bai during the last expedition and the embryon child of this expedition will share the times to come. <laughs> the times to come. How are things progressing at Kalava? The ship was moved to Dome 3 at sunset for fueling and ancillary pre-flight maintenance. Has Aram's embryon child been taken aboard? Yes. Lyria took him into the ship's nucleus chamber at moonrise. She's holding him in the secondary genesis tank while Karmas finishes refocusing the convection lenses on the primary. And what about Zuriel? Has he installed the new Paratron refractor? He's still working on it. He would have finished by now, but there was a technical setback. Oh? When Zuriel examined the new refractor, he found that two of the waveform links were flawed. There wasn't time to send it back to Sumare, so he's correcting the flaw with a series of Nimbus filters. 
Nimbus filters. I wasn't aware that such things existed. They didn't until now. Zurio synthesized them in the Spectrum Laboratory in Dome 6. <laughs> Is this the beginning of a new era in the lithium technology? <laughs> Well, Zuriel seems to think so. You know how he is when he does something especially inventive. Yes. Yes, I know. Deus. Hmm? When Aram's embryon child evolves to his final form and begins his work, will he be alone? He will at first. But eventually there will be a multitude. How will it end? Tears. Blood. A heart. Pierced with metal. And what will become of us? Will we return to Elysia? The book didn't know, Sibella, where the journey back should have been. There was only silence. Alien World's special presentation of Earthlight will continue. This woman saw Keeping you guessing You never know what I'll do That's why I'm here confessing It's because Sometimes I feel like a nut Sometimes I don't I'll enjoy that nut Mounds don't I'll enjoy that chocolate Coconut and monkey next to presentation of Earthlight continues. Deus, was the book able to calculate the time lapse between our departure from Elysia tonight and our penetration of Terra Lu's gravity veil? Yes. Eleven solar days, nine phenomeners. When will we make contact with Aram? Three phenomeners past sunrise on the morning of the twelfth day. She'll be alone in a field near her village gathering red and white flowers. Red and white. Blood and purity. Yes. The two elements that will haunt Aram to the end of her days. Well, it's getting late, Sibella. We'd better start for Kalaba. As Deus and Sibella walk down the luminescent gemstone path leading to the canal, a swarm of fluorescent blue spider moths stream out of the shadow forest circle the canal's reflection of Olympia's three moons and streak away into the flower-scented night. Sibella and Deus board Sibella's windship, move to the deep circular cockpit just behind the bow and settle into thickly cushioned contour seats. Between the two seats is a narrow transparent black systems console its surface glittering with multiple rows of brightly colored control prisms. Sibella touches three of them, interfacing the windship's guidance system with the central canal link encoder at Darmus, the huge domed windship port which lies 75 demivectors south of the pyramid. Your request for automatic guidance parameters has been received, Sibella. Your vessel will proceed from the Avatar Pyramid tributary through the Lusaw Canal intersect to the Daniel Embrya tributary arch. Automatic guidance will be terminated and manual control returned as you pass beneath the arch and approach the Kalava subcanal. Tiny wheels fold open the windship's thin metal masts, releasing a quiet, magnetically generated wind which swells the translucent yellow sails. The small, graceful ship drifts out into the center of the canal, 
turns 45 degrees and moves forward to the clean, clear water. Nova blossom particles flaring in its wake. Deus, what is calorescent spectrocyte? I overheard Zuriel mention it to Karma. Spectrocyte was the liquid light fuel that powered our first starships. We terminated its use long before you were born. Why? Wasn't it efficient? Yes, it was the perfect experimental fuel, Sabella. Efficient, highly unstable, and extremely dangerous. During the third expedition, we killed 9,000 inhabitants of Terra Lu with it. 9,000? Deus, what happened? An accident. A circuit malfunction caused a fuel bay hatch to open, and an armed spectrocyte fuel pod was ejected. The pod exploded on impact between two wilderness cities that stood near the shore of a dying inland sea. When Carmus and Lyria went down in a lander to look for survivors, all they found was a young female in the nearby hills. Was she alive? No. Spectrocyte radiation had transformed her into a pillar of white ionic stone. She stood like a statue, looking back at where the two cities had been. <laughs> shadow forest slowly fades into the night as the winged ship leaves the Avatar Pyramid tributary and sails out into the Lusar Canal intersect, the vast artificial lagoon where all of Alithia's equatorial waterways convert, wills himself into a memory trance. A chill surges through his body. The nuclei of his secondary blood cells divide, releasing the organically stored experiences of another time. Then a bright rushing sound only he can hear takes his mind 1,000 years into the past. Sunlight and warm winds touch his face. He glides over the sea of echoes in a small windship. In the bright, pale green distance is Reliva Island. On it stands the great white dome of Elithia's Exobionic Observatory. The observatory has been receiving and analyzing scan tracings from two drone flyers, which are exploring the void of the nine worlds in the far galaxy of Sirisius. Both flyers have discovered something unexpected and ominous. The Abbas, the observatory matriarch, is concerned. Have you confirmed it, the Abbas? Yes. Sit here beside me, Dales. I'll transfer the visual data to the wall screen. An abstract three-dimensional scan pattern fluoresces onto the large triangular wall monitor and slowly becomes a geological image of multi-layered earth and volcanic rock. Embedded in one of the layers are the mummified bodies of three nude humanoid women. Next to them are five black skeletons whose grotesque skulls resemble the heads of ebony gargoyles. Each skeleton lies against a secondary pattern of thin black bones, the bones of what were once large, bat-like wings. Another world contaminated by Darkbringers. Is it a planet in this star system? No. It's in the Sirisius galaxy. Terra Lu, the only inhabited planet in the void of the Nine Worlds. Drone flyer Septus began transmitting these substrata images seven days ago. Was it a full-scale invasion? No. It was confined to a relatively small area near Terra Lu's equatorial meridian. When did it happen? Nineteen light eons ago. Just as Terra Lu was entering its third neuroevolution. They lived in caves, Andeos. And ate the flesh of things that crawled and flew. How large was the attack force? One Darkbringer Legion, probably an inquest unit. They invaded the cave settlement, killed the males and children, and then attacked the females. 
the same assault method they used here, and on Anianus and Telluria. Why didn't the assault extend beyond that one area? The region was destroyed during the attack by a first magnitude strata convulsion and volcanic eruptions. An enormous chasm reached open, and the entire settlement collapsed into it. The Dark Ringer Armada was probably in an observation orbit during the assault. But when they saw the instantaneous destruction of an entire legion, I think they became frightened and moved out into deep space. Yes, you're probably right. They always did become blind with confusion in the presence of unexpected planetary convulsions. Have the reproductive organs of the dead females been analyzed? Drone flyer Erebus transmitted its scanner analysis last night. The bodies of all three females contain traces of calcified Darkbringer insemination fluid. Have you received a retrospective survival projection? Yes. According to the residual biotime scan from Drone Erebus, there were over 800 female survivors. All of them inseminated during the assault. None of their newborns had any physical Darkbringer characteristics. But they all emerged from their parent mothers, saturated with the Darkbringer anti-light virus. Has the virus evolved with them? This morning, from an orbital distance of 300 demovectors, Joan Septus hemo scanned the entire population of Terra Lou. It saw the virus in the blood and bone marrow of every male and female, regardless of tribe or age. And has the virus affected them in the same way it affected us? There are variations, even some resistance at first. But in time, the virus flourishes, and the inner light grows dark. Without any evolutionary interference from us, how much longer will the virus control Terralo? A minimum of 500 centuries. But by the end of that time, the entire Sirius galaxy would be contaminated. There's only one choice, isn't there? Yes, an expedition. We know the inner light can be resurrected through induced evolution meditations. We've proved that here. We've proved it on Anianus and Teluria. Diavis, do you see any reason why our spirit magicians couldn't teach the meditations on Terra Lou? I see two reasons. The anti-light disease wasn't as advanced on those planets. And where Anianus and Teluria were both entering an age of radiance, when the invasions came, Terra Lou is still hyper-primitive and superstitious. It would be impossible to land ships there without terrifying. Our teachers will have to come to Terra Lou from within, not from without. Embryons? Yes. Created from your blood and implanted in their females. It would take time. It would be difficult. It would be dangerous. But in the end, the virus would be neutralized. The light would be resurrected. And Terra Lou would no longer be divided against itself. Terra Lou. Terra Lou. So many expeditions. It will take time. So little progress. It will be difficult. So many of our sons and daughters lost. It would be dangerous. A thousand years. But in the end, the virus will be neutralized. The light will be resurrected. And Terra Lou would no longer be divided against itself. I was just remembering an old friend and a hundred other nights like this and a hundred other expeditions. So much time has passed. So many of Alithia's sons and daughters have been lost. A thousand years. And it's just beginning. Alien World's special presentation of Earthlight will continue. Uh, pardon me. Isn't that a Cadbury chocolate bar? I've never tried one. Oh, that's too bad. Do you mind if I have a teensy piece? Hey, 
You took my bar. I'll just take a little bit. It was for my wife and me. Oh, she'll love it. See, this is great. You know you can get carried away with this stuff? Yes, I've noticed. Oh, come on. It's a big bar. It's getting smaller. When people get a taste of a big, thick Cadbury chocolate bar, they get very carried away. Because only a Cadbury bar is so rich, so creamy, so Cadbury. And with the big size Cadbury chocolate bar, you get a big choice. Cadbury fruit and nut, Cadbury almond, Cadbury caramello, and of course the big favorite, Cadbury milk chocolate. So remember, when you get your Cadbury, be careful. Because with Cadbury, people can get very carried away. Uh, can I have my Cadbury back now? Your Cadbury? Oh, well, I guess I got carried away. You'll get carried away with Cadbury. Alien Worlds special presentation of Earthlight continues. What did you do after the Darkbringers killed your parent, mother, and father? I escaped into the wilderness of Bas with a group of scientists and technical magicians from the city of Tia Lin. We thought we'd be safe there, but three days after the initial attack, Darkbringer annihilation squads began saturating the atmosphere and waterways with the virus. Eventually, we all became infected to some degree. The effects of the anti-light disease have never been described to me, Davis. What actually happens? It begins with an underlying discontent with the ceremonies and celebrations of life. Intelligence is corrupted. Emotion displaces logic. Imagination ceases to evolve. The ability to separate the symbols of existence from existence itself disappears. And so does the belief that all life is sacred. The effects are irresistible and inescapable, even in the unconscious sanctuaries of sleep. How long were you in the wilderness? Twenty-five years. Do you know the story of Vershila? Oh, some, but not all of it. Vershila was a mantric high priest who came to us in the wilderness during our 25th year of exile. He told us he had cured himself of the anti-light disease through a series of induced evolution meditations. He had discovered the meditations in the Persana Utvalya Jewel, the ancient Alithian poem of creation. He taught us the meditations and we healed ourselves. Then we went out from the wilderness and secretly taught the meditations throughout Alithia. And the revolution against the dark bringers began 50 years after that? Yes. Our technical magicians built secret subterranean laboratories where they created ships armed with powerful liquid light injectors. One year after our ships rose up against them, the dark bringers abandoned Alithia and the Age of Radiance began. As the winged ship approaches the Tamir Imbria tributary arch, it passes a Sun Tower complex construction site on the lagoon's northern shore. Polished metal, saucer-shaped hover drones lower huge white Sun Tower obelisks onto thick pads of fluorescent synergite. Giant constructor tripods stand in front of the huge synergite blocks, their long, flexible arms coiled around the 400-foot-tall Sun Towers, guiding them into place. The complex is surrounded by multifaceted solar energy domes and power dispersion pyramids made of thick white crystal. Did you see Shiva today? Yes, we walked in the forest this morning. How does she feel about the new sun tower complex? It looks as though it's nearly finished. She's delighted with its progress. The iron refineries at Lahelia and the floral hatcheries at Vianatet are already drawing power from it. She estimates it'll be fully operational in another six days. Hmm. We'll be halfway to Terra Lou in six days. Sibella, are you concerned that the book didn't know if we'd be coming back? What will become of Asteus if the ship should fall into a star? The prospect of death doesn't disturb you, does it? No. No, I thought not. Then... What does? Rebirth. Have you ever imagined 
what it would be like to be reborn on some other planet, one that wouldn't care about our secrets or understand our ecstasies or forgive our failures? There is no such planet, Sabella. Not in this universe. Part one of Earth Life was written by Ron Thompson and starred Olin Soleil as Deus, Lucy Taylor as Sibella, and Loreen Tuttle as Diabas. Associate producer, Ron Thompson. Engineer, Stu Jacobs. Music director, Tom Rhines. Assistant to the producer, Jim Cook. Technical consultant, Peter Skye. Alien Worlds was created, produced, and directed by Lee Hansen and was distributed by Watermark Incorporated. And so, until next week, this is Roger Gressler inviting you to join us for the conclusion of Earthlight from the elsewhere and elsewhen of Alien Worlds. Peter Paul and Cadbury Chocolate Bars hope you've enjoyed Alien Worlds. And now, Peter Paul Mounds, Almond Joy, and Cadbury Chocolate Bars presents Alien Worlds. This is Lee Hansen. Again this week, we continue on our mystical journey through a science fiction fantasy adventure that explores the intergalactic origins of spiritual evil and how the inhabitants of the ancient planet of Alithia set out to neutralize that evil over 2,000 years ago. Here, then, are Olin Soule, Lorene Tuttle, Rusi Taylor, Mel Wells, Byron Kane, Susan Silo, and Roger Dressler in part two of our special presentation, Earthlight. <laughs> Inside his pyramid on the ancient planet of Alithia, Deus, Alithia's patriarch, listens as the voice of a sacred dream book reaffirms his sleep visions of another expedition to the planet of Terra Lu. A beautiful woman is blinded by visions of immortality and falls to sleep in a flower field. A star machine floats down into the scented voids of summer. A child is born. A healer of spirits walks across the deep currents of a faraway sea. The suffering are comforted. The dying are healed. The dead are reborn. The healer of spirits ascends to the stars. Terra Lu sinks below the fiery horizons of an alien sun. Faces look up. The sky stands still. Terra Lu. So many expeditions, so little progress, so many of our sons and daughters lost. A thousand years, and it's just beginning. Deus? Ah, oh, come in and sit with me, Sibella. Has the book reaffirmed that we're returning to the Veda sector of Terra Lu? Yes, and it told me about the woman. Her name is Aram. She's young and strong and beautiful. And she's never known the Darkbringer virus. Elisha had never known the virus either. Do they share the same blood? Yes. And because they do, the embryon child implanted in Elisha during the last expedition and the embryon child of this expedition will share the times to come. How are things progressing at Kalava? The ship was moved to Dome 3 at sunset for fueling and ancillary pre-flight maintenance. Has Aram's embryon child been taken aboard? Yes. Lyria took him into the ship's nucleus chamber at moonrise. How will it end? Tears. Blood. A heart pierced with metal. And what will become of us? 
Will we return to Alethea? The book didn't know, Sibella, where the journey back should have been. There was only silence. Well, it's getting late, Sibella. We'd better start for Calava. At the edge of the wide canal that flows past the pyramid, Deus and Sibella board a slender, transparent metal wind ship and settle into the deep cockpit behind the bow. Touching three small fluorescent prisms on the control console, Sibella interfaces the wind ship's guidance system with Alithia's central canal link encoder. Your request for automatic guidance parameters has been received, Sibella. Your vessel will proceed from the Avatar Pyramid tributary through the Luzon Canal intersect to the Tapio Embryo tributary arch. Automatic guidance will be terminated and manual control return as you pass beneath the arch and approach the Kalava sub control. Half an hour later, the wind ship sails out into the Nusa Canal intersect, the vast artificial lagoon where all of Elithia's equatorial waterways converge. Deus settles back in his seat, looks up at Elithia's three moons, and slowly wills himself into a memory trance that takes his mind 1,000 years into the past. Two Elithian drone flyers have been orbiting Terra Lu, the only inhabited planet in the void of the nine worlds. During their 13th orbit, the two laboratory drones have discovered something unexpected and ominous. Deus is called to Elithia's Exobionic Observatory, where scanner data from the two flyers is being decoded and analyzed. Have you confirmed it, Diavas? Yes. Sit here beside me, Deus. I'll transfer the visual data to the wall screen. A geological image of multi-layered earth and volcanic rock fluoresces onto the large triangular wall monitor. Embedded in one of the layers are the mummified bodies of three nude humanoid women and the remains of five long black skeletons. Each skeleton lies against a secondary pattern of thin black bones. The bones of what were once large bat-like wings. The skulls resemble the heads of ebony gargoyles. Another world contaminated by darkbringers. When did it happen? Nineteen light eons ago. Just as Terralu was entering its third neuroevolution. They lived in caves then, Deus. And ate the flesh of things that crawled and flew. How large was the attack force? One Darkbringer Legion. Probably an inquest unit. They invaded the cave settlement, killed the males and children, and then attacked the females. Why didn't the assault extend beyond that one area? The region was destroyed during the attack by a first magnitude strata convulsion and volcanic eruptions. Have the reproductive organs of the dead females been analyzed? Drone flyer Erebus transmitted its scanner analysis last night. The bodies of all three females contain traces of calcified darkbringer insemination fluid. Have you received a retrospective survival projection? There were over 800 female survivors. All of them inseminated during the assault. None of their newborns had any physical Darkbringer characteristics. But they all emerged from their parent mothers, saturated with the Darkbringer anti-light virus. Has the virus evolved with them? This morning, from an orbital distance of 300 demovectors, Don Septus Hemo scanned the entire population of Terralu. It saw the virus in the blood and bone marrow of every male and female, regardless of tribe or age. And has the virus affected them in the same way it affected us? There are variations, even some resistance at first. But in time, the virus flourishes and the inner light grows dark. There's only one choice, isn't there? Yes, an expedition. We know the inner light can be resurrected through induced evolution meditations. We proved that here. 
We proved it on Henny Giannis and Teluria. Diavis, do you see any reason why our spirit magicians couldn't teach the meditations on Terra Lou? I see two reasons. The Anilite disease wasn't as advanced on those planets. And where Anianus and Teluria were both entering an age of radiance, when the invasions came, Terra Lou is still hyper-primitive and superstitious. It would be impossible to land ships there without terrifying. Our teachers will have to come to Terra Lou from within, not from without. Embryons? Yes. Created from your blood and implanted in their females. It would take time. It would be difficult. It would be dangerous. But in the end, the virus would be neutralized. The light would be resurrected. And Terra Lou would no longer be divided against itself. The Alphys. The Alphys. Deus. Deus? Ah, oh, Sabella. I was just remembering an old friend and a hundred other nights like this and a hundred other expeditions. A thousand years. And it's just beginning. Alien World special presentation of Earth Night will continue. Pardon me. Isn't that a Cadbury chocolate bar? I've never tried one. Oh, that's too bad. Do you mind if I have a teensy piece? Hey, you took my bar. I'll just take a little bit. It was for my wife and me. Oh, she'll love it. See, this is great. You know you can get carried away with this stuff? Yes, I've noticed. Oh, come on. It's a big bar. It's getting smaller. When people get a taste of a big, thick Cadbury chocolate bar, they get very carried away. Because only a Cadbury bar is so rich, so creamy, so Cadbury. And with the big size Cadbury chocolate bar, you get a big choice. Cadbury fruit and nut, Cadbury almond, Cadbury caramello, and of course the big favorite, Cadbury milk chocolate. So remember, when you get your Cadbury, be careful. Because with Cadbury, people can get very carried away. Uh, can I have my Cadbury back now? Your Cadbury? Oh, well, I guess I got carried away. You'll get carried away with Cadbury. Alien World's special presentation of Earthlight continues. Was the book able to calculate the time lapse between our departure from Olivia tonight and our penetration of Terra Luz Gravity Veil? Yes. Eleven solar days, nine phenomena. When will we make contact with Aram? Three phenomena past sunrise on the morning of the twelfth day. She'll be alone in a field near a village, gathering red and white flowers. Red and white. Blood and purity. Yes. The two elements that will haunt Aram to the end of her days. Deus, Sabella, you are now approaching the Taniel Embria tributary arch. As you pass beneath it, automatic guidance will be terminated, and manual control of your wingship will be returned. May the spirits of the twelve lords of light be with you on your journey to Terra Lou. As the canal link override terminates, Sabella touches a control prism, which activates a triple row of bright rectangular lights in the bow. Then she steers the windship through the wide Tanil Imbria tributary and enters the narrow Kalava sub canal. A few moments later, the slim, transparent vessel glides across a small lagoon and docks at the edge of the Kalava Starflight Complex. The complex is a vast, circular plain, flawlessly paved with interlocking triangles of white gemstone and red fire crystal. 
Hundreds of hexagon-shaped lamps free float around the perimeter, focusing brilliant light on six enormous copper-colored domes, a triple row of sun towers, and a primary launch arena. At the Calava dock, Deus and Sabella secure their windship and board a small hover drone which takes them across the gemstone and fire crystal plain to Dome 3. Inside the dome's airlock, Deus and Sabella remove their long dark cloaks and fold them into a small compartment in the wall. Later, they enter the dome's asepsis chamber and close their eyes and stand motionless as antiseptic light and sound sterilize their hair, skin, and outer garments. Then, a large circular hatch irises open in front of them and they step through into the dazzling light of the dome's interior. In the center of the dome is Alithia's most powerful and complex starship, a huge overloid spacecraft created from organically grown metals. It rests heavily on three massive pneumatic parking spheres and dwarfs the 50 technicians who move over its seamless polished metal surface. Parked in front of the starship are three teardrop-shaped tug crawlers. The transparent canopies slid open. Six technicians string thin metal cables between the rear of the crawlers and towing rings on the ship. What do the inhabitants of Terra think happens to them after death? They believe that if they live lives of kindness and affection, their dream selves transmigrate to the serenities of Empyria. And if they live negative lives? Then their dream selves transmigrate to the fires of Stygia. But those regions were destroyed during the subvoid annihilations. The Darkbringer Archipelago had its genesis in the fires of Stygia long before the annihilations. But as life was evolving on its surface, the archipelago left its orbit and passed through Empyria. And in this passing, Empyria's light began to destroy the Darkbringer primitives. But they survived and continued to evolve under the delusion that physical and spiritual light were their deadliest enemies. In the center of the starship's nucleus chamber, the primary genesis tank floats one meter above the floor. Inside the transparent egg-shaped tank, suspended in a shimmering mist of chill vapor, is the tiny embryon child. He floats on his side, Delicate fingers curled against his face, eyes closed, dreaming of the warmly scented summer voices that lie ahead, and the beautiful woman who will end the chemical winter in which he sleeps. Just look at him, Sabella. He's beautiful. He takes after his father, Dave. Lyria, is 12 solar days still the maximum span he'll be safe in cryosleep? I was able to extend it to 15 days by altering the inversion factor of the chill vapor crystal. Uh -huh. But 15 is the zero time maximum. Any longer and the altered crystals will begin to neutralize his cellular divinity. Zurio, have you calculated our time to Terra Lure's gravity veil? 11 solar days, 9 phenomenas. Is that... An absolute calculation? Absolutely. Why are you so amused, Deus? Eleven solar days, nine phenomena is precisely what the book said. It also said we're returning to the Vita sector for an encounter with a beautiful young woman named Aram. Suriel, have you synthesized a copy of the book? I don't synthesize books, Sibella. I only synthesize Nimbus filters. <laughs> so I've heard. Suriel, how did you know about Aram and the Vita sector? Aram's Neuropulse is the only one in the bio-index terminal free of viral contamination. When I scanned the pulse, I found a first-magnitude Vita sector imprint. It seems you've finally become as wise as the book, Suriel. Suriel, 
Are we coming back from this expedition? I don't know. You're right, Lyria. He has become as wise as the book. He didn't know either. <laughs> Deus, may I see you for a moment? Yes, Carlos. Where are you? I'm in the system's index chamber. Zuriel, you and Sabella go into the guidance chamber and begin the pre-launch procedures. Lyria, we'll have our usual talk after void entry. Is there a technical problem, Carmen? No. The problem isn't technical, although technology was involved. I don't understand. I know we're returning to the Vita sector of Terra Lu, and I know the woman's name is Aram. Mm. Zuriel? No, I... I knew before Zuriel did. I was so curious to know where we were going that I got carried away and synthesized a copy of the book last night. <sighs> Carlos. Yes, Deus. Is nothing sacred. <laughs> Alien Worlds special presentation of Earthlight will continue. From Peter Paul. Cool as the snow falling light on the trees. Just take a bite for a cool mini breeze. Get a yacht, government pay, and get the sensation. Get the sensation, the cool combination. Drop the element. Drop the element. of Earthlight continues. Inside the dome, the three tug crawlers inch forward, tightening the thin towing cables that connect them to the ship. A huge section of the dome wall slides open. The tug crawlers move through the opening toward the brightly lit launch arena. Behind them, the giant starship rolls forward on its massive parking spheres. guidance chamber, Deus, Sibella, and Zuriel sit in cushioned pod chairs, facing a massive instrument console. Its dark metal surface, alive with control prisms, regulator diodes, sequencer jewels, interface crystals, and iridescent decoder keys. Start the pre-emanation cycle on the artificial gravity radiator, Sibella. Interior gravity is stable at E.3. Grav factor links are sequenced to convert to E.9 during corridor penetration and E.12.1 at void entry. Deus, an ion storm is forming in the penetration corridor over Illyria. Carmos, we need a revised launch velocity. Just a moment. A launch velocity of KPS 0 0.660 will take us through the storm before its primary spectrum collision phase. KPS point six six zero. Sibella, engage the exterior hyperlight coils when we launch. Ion storms are too unpredictable not to take precautions. Yes, Deus. The ship is in position, Deus, and the towing vehicles have cleared the launch arena. Engage the ancillary pulse drive reactor, Sibella. Reactor engagement confirmed. Solar power matrix is stable at multiple sublinks 8, 18, and 80. All ship register encoders, guidance optics, and inverter grids are hyperlinked and scanning. Release the parking spheres, Sibella. A 
hexagon-shaped hatch irises open in the bottom of the ship, and a huge gleaming tripod slowly telescopes down. Thick metal flex shock pads unfold from the tip of each tripod leg and press against the launch arena's white gemstone floor. The ship raises slightly, releasing the parking spheres which slowly roll away into the anchoring depressions at the arena's perimeter. Podchair emergency ejection hatches are armed. Podchair floater cone nozzles are in phase. Rem scale time to launch is Tricon 0.3.1. Retract the tripods, Rail. The bright metal tripod withdraws into the ultraviolet glow of its storage bay, leaving the huge lithium starship suspended 25 meters above the arena. Nine round ports iris open around the concealed tripod hatch, releasing thin beams of dazzling white light. Lubricant exhausters blast raw magnetic waste against the arena floor, raising a translucent wave of fine white dust, which rolls out over the anchored parking spheres. Reactor interlock at binary 2.3.1. Three ribbons of crimson hyperlight blink on around the edge of the ship. Then the huge spacecraft slowly rotates 90 degrees and begins its majestic ascent. of 30 demo vectors, the ship is a tiny overloid shadow and nine pinpoints of light. At 120 demo vectors, the starship banks 18 degrees, and goes up and races toward the penetration corridor over Illyria. Suddenly, as it began, the crisis is over, and the ship accelerates out through Elithia's shimmering aurora sphere into the starlit serenity of deep space. Is our embryon child safe, Lyria? Yes, dear. Safe and sleeping. Have you decided what his name will be? His name is the word the ancient thought magicians used to describe the power of the inner self. The word is Jesus, and it means I am become the healer of worlds. and starred Olin Soleil as Deus, Lucy Taylor as Sibella, Mel Wells as Carmus, Byron Kane as Zuriel, Susan Silo as Lyria, and Loreen Tuttle as Diabas. Associate producer, Ron Thompson. Engineer, Stu Jacobs. Music director, Tom Rounds. Assistant to the producer, Jim Cook. Technical consultant, Peter Skye. Alien Worlds was created, produced, and directed by Lee Hansen and is distributed by Watermark Incorporated. And so, until next week, this is Roger Dressler inviting you to join us for our next adventure, The Seeds of Time, from the Elsewhere and Elsewhen of Alien Worlds. Peter Paul and Cadbury Chocolate Bars 
Hope you've enjoyed Alien Worlds. Wheat checks, rice checks, and good hot Ralston present Space Patrol! <laughs> High adventure in the wild, vast reaches of space. Missions of daring in the name of interplanetary justice. Travel into the future with Buzz Corey, Commander-in-Chief of the Space Patrol. In today's transcribed adventure, Buzz and Happy, in their spacesuits on a tiny asteroid, are approaching a criminal who has stolen evidence that's needed to convict a crime syndicate. He's got the metal box, sir, with the evidence. All right, Chura, come out of that crater and get into our ship. I'm getting into my own ship, Corey. And you're not going to stop me. All right, we'll come down and get you. Take one more step and I'll use this gun on you. All right. Have it your own way. I I warned you. Drop heavy. Wow, that was close. That ray gun knocked a hunk of rock loose as big as your head. Don't move, Hap. I think Chura means business. He sure does. And it isn't funny business either. We'll be back in just a moment with today's Space Patrol story, The Search for Asteroid X. Say, did you hear that, gang? That was the Terra Express train trying to get up speed on ordinary fuel. Not very speedy, was it? But now listen to that same train with super fuel in its tank. And that train is really traveling now because it's supercharged with super fuel. Now, gang, without a good breakfast, you can't go very fast either. But with super fuel in your tank, you're supercharged. Here's how Buzz Corey gets up ahead of steam in the morning. He has a good breakfast with rice checks or wheat checks, the super cereals that helped us supercharge you. For taste, they're terrific. For size, they're perfect because they both have that modern bite-sized design. So, gang, get off to a quick start of the morning the way Buzz Corey does. Get supercharged. Just eat a good breakfast with the checkerboard super cereals and get them today in the red and white checkerboard packages. Rice checks, wheat checks. <laughs> After months of careful investigation, Space Patrol agents have gathered evidence against the leaders of the notorious Saturn Syndicate. This gang, for months, has been victimizing honest businessmen on the outer planets of the solar system. Commander Corey has been awaiting the arrival of an agent with the evidence that will convict the leaders of the Syndicate. Now, Buzz grimly enters his central office on Terra, where Cadet Happy is decoding spacegrams. Lock those messages in the file, Happy. You can work on them later. Well, is something wrong, Commander? Well, there certainly is. I just received a report that Fraser's in the hospital. All the evidence is gone. What? Somebody jumped Fraser while he was on his way here in a surface car. He was knocked unconscious. Every scrap of evidence was stolen. Documents, microfilm, everything. Do you have any idea who did it, sir? No, I understand the doctors won't let our security people see Fraser yet. Is he badly hurt? Fortunately, no. The loss of that evidence puts us right back where we started three months ago in the Saturn Syndicate investigation. Come on over to the hospital with me. As soon as the doctor's okay, I don't want to ask Fraser some questions. Cut your speed and go lower, Hundley. I think I see something down there. Where? Right near that small pond. Uh, isn't that a building of some kind? Hey, you're right, Chura. Well, I hope it's occupied. Say, uh, there is a man down there by the pond. That's surprising to find anybody in this part of Mars. Set the ship down. We'll load up with food and water. Suppose this guy won't give us any? Well, then he'll get what our friend, the space patrol agent, got. Do you think you finished that guy, Chora? Who cares? We got the evidence. Yeah, but I won't rest easy until we get it hit on Asteroid X. Kick on the repeller ray. Repeller ray on. Well, we're done. If we get enough supplies here, we can go into free fall near the asteroid belt till we decide what our next move is. I wonder who this guy is. (laughs) He sure must like solitude. Now, we don't want any trouble if we can help it, Hundley. Let me do the talking. Don't you always? <laughs> all right, all right, let's go. Now the outer hatch. Hi there! Uh, he looks good-natured and not very bright. 
Just what we ordered. Uh, hello, friend. Having trouble with your ship? No, but we're out of supplies, yeah. food and water. When we left Lowell City, we thought we had enough to get to Neptune, but looks as though I miscalculated. Well, I got plenty here, gentlemen. Come on in, take what you want. We'll pay you for it. Oh, no, no, I got plenty. Come on in the house and help yourselves. All right, that's mighty generous of you, Mr. Uh... Noonan. Marty Noonan. By the way, I don't believe I got your names. Well, I'm Steve Chura, and this is my friend Wally Hundley. Now about those supplies. Oh, sure. Sorry, you folks are in a hurry. But uh, since you are, just come with me, gentlemen. I brought this extra box of rations, gentlemen, just in case of emergency. Here, I'll pass it up to Chura. All right, Hundley. Come aboard. Hey, uh, sure wish you fellas could stay a while. Don't get many visitors. So do we, Mr. Noonan. But we got to get going. Well, I understand. Well, very much obliged, Noonan. Oh, no trouble at all. So long. Take care of yourself. Goodbye. Better stand back and watch our rockets. We're going to blast off. Yeah, sure a couple of swell fellas. Gee, what's this? Little box. Oh, they must have dropped it. Uh, uh, hey, wait! Oh, this looks pretty important. Microfilm Reel 14B Property of Space Patrol. Investigation Squad Number 3 Space Patrol Headquarters, Terra. Guys, they're space patrol agents. I'd better call headquarters right away. Commander, will you take the space phone call? It's something about a can of microfilm a fellow found on Mars. All right, Happy. Corey here. Go ahead, please. Commander, my name is Noonan. Yes, Mr. Noonan? A couple of your agents dropped a can of microfilm on my land. I uh, want to know how to go about returning it. Well, what does it say on the label? Real 14B Investigation Squad Number 3. Oh, just a minute. You say Space Patrol agents dropped it? Yes, sir. I think it fell out of one of the men's pockets. Happy. Squad 3 was on the Saturn Syndicate case. Mr. Noonan, what were these agents doing on your land? They ran out of supplies on the way to Neptune. Did you see their credentials? Uh, no, I didn't. Just figured they were agents when I found the film. Said their names were Steve Chur and Wally Hundley. Did you ever see these men before? Why, no, Commander. Where are you now? At my place. Uh, sector 17H on the Martian plain. Uh, about... Four and six tenths DUs directly northwest of Lowell City. Got that, Happy? Yes, sir. What kind of a ship did these men have? Was it a space patrol ship? No, didn't have any insignia at all. But I don't know what kind it was. Mr. Noonan, hold on to that microfilm. I'm coming after it. Right, Commander. And don't give it to anyone else, is that clear? Yes, sir. Thanks for your cooperation. I'm on my way. Corey, out. I've just checked, sir. We don't have any agents named Chura and Hundley. Not on Squad 3, anyway. Well, chances are those are the men who knocked out Fraser. At least they have the evidence, or I should say, had it. But Fraser didn't get a look at the men who attacked him. Well, I'll blast off from Mars and get the film happy. Maybe we can get some more information from this man, Noonan. I finished decoding the patrol unit messages, sir. Good. Will you read them, Happy? Yes, sir. Quote, to Commander-in-Chief aboard Terra-5, Jupiter Patrol searched Mars to Neptune orbit. No suspicious craft sighted. Unquote. From Saturn Patrol, same, negative... Neptune Patrol also replies a negative. Any more? Well, Patrol Ship 34A, asteroid belt, picked up an unidentified object in their view scope. They're investigating it. Happy? We're going right into Lowell City. And how about the microfilm at Noonan's place? Yeah, you can go after it in an atmosphere ship after we land. I'll call Noonan, describe the credentials you'll present to him to relieve him of my original order. All right, sir. See how much you can find out about those men he saw. Get a full description. Very likely their right names aren't sure and Hundley. It's almost certain they lied when they told Noonan they were going to Neptune. Shall I bring Noonan back to Lowell City? If you think he can give us any useful information. Yes, sir. Well, uh, we'll reach Mars in 20 minutes, sir. I'd better check Lowell City space control. Better get the evidence ready. We're nearly to Asteroid X. All right, sure. <laughs> what a terrific place to hide it. Even if somebody knew it was on an asteroid, how would they know which one? Uh, now, remember, Hunley, when we get to the asteroid, be sure to mark the exact universal start time to the tenth of a second. Why? Well, otherwise, the orbit computer can pinpoint its location when we want to find the asteroid again. Yeah, yeah I get it. Have you got the evidence ready to unload? Yeah, I'll accept... Uh-oh. What's the matter? A reel of microfilm. I had it in my pocket. It's gone. Huh? Uh, what was it doing in your pocket? That spilled out when we took the stuff from the agent's surface class. I just stuck it in my pocket. Oh, well, probably doesn't matter. What do you mean it doesn't matter? That reel might be just the one to convict the boss. And us. 
How did you happen to lose it? I don't know. Oh, wait a minute. Back at Noonan's. Huh? Yeah, I may have fallen out while I was bending over to pick up the box of food or water containers. Eh, how could you be that careless? Well, at least noon is alone. We got to go back and look for it. There is nothing else to do. Hi there. Are you Marty Noonan? Yep, that's right. Uh, I'm Cadet Happy. Here are my Space Patrol credentials. Mighty glad to know you, Cadet. Commander Corey called me about you. Oh, and uh, here's your microfilm. Oh, thanks. Uh, there are several questions Commander Corey wanted me to ask you about these men. Chura and Hundley? Well, I'll tell you what I can. Suppose we go in the house and have a bite to eat while we talk. All right, fine. It's a mighty fine-looking little atmosphere ship. How fast will she go? Oh, probably 1,200. On this trip, though, I averaged about 832. From old city to here, nine minutes and 54 seconds. Say. Hey. Yeah, about that. Let's see. I took off at... Hey, how did you figure that out so quick? Oh, I don't know. Answers just sort of come to me. Don't have to think about it. It's lucky, too. Because if I had to tell you how to do it, I'd get all confused and come up with the wrong answer. <laughs> I have to figure everything out on paper or use the electronic computer in the ship. Well, first, Mr. Noonan, uh, can you give me a, a description of these two men? Well, Chur is about 45, 6 feet tall, weighs about 210 Earth standard. Well, Mr. Noonan, you've given me a very complete description of these crooks, and their ship was very likely a Class C private cruiser from the way you describe it. Uh, could you come to Lowell City with me, Mr. Noonan? I think Commander Corey would like to question you further. Why, of course. I'd like to get back as soon as possible. Uh, do you mind if I use your space phone? Okay, I... Noonan. Uh, you two cadet, get your hands out. Sure, and Hundley. That's right. Don't make a move for your gun, cadet, or I'll use this one. Okay. Which one of you has the microfilm? What microfilm? You know what microfilm. Noonan must have found it or you wouldn't be here. Hundley, take the cadet's ray gun and search him for the tape. Sure. The film's in my jacket pocket, and it's going to stay there. Oh, you want to play rough, eh, Cadet? You let him alone. You keep out of this, Noonan. Sure, oh, uh, help me. All right, I'm coming. All right, Cadet. Uh, he nearly got the gun away from me. Well, after this, don't be so careless. I got him. Here's the microfilm. All right, let's get back to the ship. Oh, oh. Uh-uh. The cadet's oh. coming, too. And I got an idea. We're going to take him with us. What for? Let's finish him here. Oh, not till we find out how much he knows. Come on, cadet. Come on, on your feet. You got a nice long walk. Walk? Where to? To our ship. What about Noonan? Oh, that stupid oaf. Leave him here. Smash his space phone. And the one in the cadet's atmosphere ship as well. Okay. Where are you going to take me? Never mind. But I'll tell you this much. You better enjoy it because this is the last trip you ever gonna take. We'll be back with Space Patrol in just a moment. Gang, this is Space Patroller Dick Tufel, and boy, am I excited. We have a new machine here at Space Patrol headquarters, and it's terrific. It's the flavor meter for testing the flavor of food. Now, I have a plain, ordinary cereal right here, so let's test it. The better it tastes, the louder it'll ring the bell. Now, all I do is place the cereal in this slot and push the button. Hmm, not much flavor there, is it? Uh, let's put in some other ordinary cereal and see what happens. Why, not even a tinkle. Now, gang, here's a couple of uh, super cereals I'd like to test. I'll put them both in. Wow, that's it. Those cereals really ring the bell for flavor. You bet. They were rice checks and wheat checks. Checks, the cereals with that modern bite-sized design. Checks, the super cereals that help to supercharge you. Test them yourself, gang, in your own cereal bowl. And believe me, they'll really ring the bell for flavor. Rice checks, wheat checks. <laughs> Commander Corey has sent Happy to Marty Noonan's isolated dwelling on the Martian plain to recover some stolen evidence, a roll of microfilm. Noonan and Happy were surprised by Chura and Huntley when the thieves returned for the film. After smashing Noonan's spaceophone, the criminals have taken Happy to their ship, leaving the unconscious Noonan locked in his house. Meanwhile, Buzz, in Lowell City, has tried in vain to contact Happy or Noonan by spaceophone. Commander Corey to Space Patrol, Lowell City. Space Patrol, Lieutenant Barton here, Commander. Lieutenant, 
I've been unable to contact my cadet on any of the space patrol frequencies. And Noonan doesn't answer either, so I'm blasting off to see what the trouble is. Would you like an atmosphere ship, sir? No, a spaceship in case I need it. I'll go on Terra 5. Keep monitoring those frequencies. If you hear from either Cadet Happy or Marty Noonan, notify me in my private frequency immediately. Hello there. Are you Marty Noonan? Yes. I'm Commander Coring. Where's Cadet Happy? Sure, and Hundley. They took him away, and they got the microfilm. I tried to stop him, Commander, but they knocked me out. They smashed my space phone, and, and the one in the cadet ship there, too. Do you know where they took him? No, by the time I came to and broke out of my house, they'd blasted off. They'd locked me in. Did you hear anything that would give us a clue as to where they were going? No. All I remember was that one of them said we ought to be able to get there by 1,500 hours, but I don't know where they meant. How long ago did they blast off? About an hour and a half ago. Say, uh, Commander, I'd like to help you find them. All right, come aboard. Thanks, Commander. Maybe with the astrogation charts and the computer, I can figure out an approximate radius of where Chura's ship might be by 1,500 hours. Well, if they're going to any planet, it'd have to be Jupiter. Well, why do you say that? Well, considering the speed of spaceships and the present positions of the planets, and the approximate arrival time of 1,500 hours, it uh, just has to be Jupiter. Oh, it does? Yes, it wouldn't need that much time to get to any of the inner planets like Earth and Venus... And they'd need much more time to get to Saturn. You may be right, but as a double check, I'll work it out on the computer. The computer will give us the answer in a few seconds. Now, here we are. Now, let's see. Well, what do you know? What'd you say, Commander? Mr. Noonan, this is amazing. Either you made a very lucky guess, or you must know the exact distances and positions of all the planets relative to Mars. Oh, I do. Make a hobby of remembering data like that. Jupiter comes nearer to satisfying the equation than any other object in space. How do you do it? I don't know, Commander. If I know a formula and the data, I can get the result. But if I stop to think how I do it, I get all confused. There's only one thing wrong. They couldn't quite reach Jupiter by 1500. Of course, they may be heading for one of the moons. I'll check the astrogation chart again. Could be Ganymede, Commander. Assuming we're right on the time factor. Yeah, we'll see. Mr. Noonan, you've hit it again. The astrogation chart puts moon number three, Ganymede, very close to the vector. Ganymede's a good-sized moon. There are a lot of places to hide on it. The most we can hope for right now is that we're headed in the right direction. I just talked to the boss. What'd you tell him? Just that we got the evidence against the gang away from the space patrol. And that we're on Ganymede. And the boss is going to stay on Saturn now that he's safe from prosecution. How long do we stick on Ganymede? Uh, until the excitement over, the stolen evidence dies down a little. Say, where's the cadet? All right, sitting over there, Nick. He's gone. I told you to watch him. Uh, the space phone. Look in the next room, quickly. And I'm being held on Ganymede, Sector 9J. Hey, Cadet get away from the space of phone. Grab him on the list. Sector 9J. Hey. I'll teach you, Cadet. Now, watch him after this. That was happy. He was cut off. Sounded to me like somebody hit him. Sector 9J. That pinpoints location, Mr. Noonan. We'll make a slow glide approach and land with the repeller ray. Maybe Chura and Hundley won't hear the ship. <clears throat> All right, Cadet. We could keep this out for hours, but I'm tired of playing games with you. Does Commander Corey know who knocked out the space patrol agent? Now, come on, answer me. Oh, you're wasting your time, Chura. I'm all for getting rid of the cadet right now. After that space phone call he tried to make a while ago, he's too much of a risk to have around. I'm afraid you're right, Hundley. We'll take him away from the building and use the ray gun on him. Now, let's get at it. Get your hands up, you two. Corey! Commander, you got here just in time. Mr. Noonan put me on the right track, then we heard your space phone call. Chura, where's the Saturn Syndicate evidence? It's where you'll never find it. They put it on an asteroid, sir, somewhere in the asteroid belt, but I couldn't tell you which one. There are thousands of them. I'll untie your hands, cadet. Oh, thanks. Oh, look out, Noonan. Too late, Corey. Shoot, Commander. I can't. He's holding Noonan as a shield. So long, Corey. Are you all right, Noonan? I'm sorry, Commander. That's okay. After him, quick. He's locked the door. Hundley, have you got a key to this door? Sorry, Commander. Chura has the only one. Search him. I'll see if I can smash the door. I've got my hands loose now, Commander. I'll help you. All right, Happy. 
Can't find a key on him, Commander. Just this slip of paper. Uh-oh. It's Shura's ship. He's getting away. <laughs> well, we still have you, Hundley. Hey, Mr. Noonan, don't throw that paper away. That's the coordinates of the asteroid. Oh, all right, you did. I'll hang on to it. Once more, Happy. <laughs> the door's giving. <laughs> there she is. Escort our friend Hundley to the ship. Come on, let's get after Chora. No sign of Chura's ship in the viewscope, sir. Hundley, you must know where he'd be most likely to go. Really, Commander, I haven't the slightest idea. He's probably heading for that asteroid to pick up the evidence. Mr. Noonan, let's see that piece of paper. Here it is, Commander. Yes. His coordinates are for a point somewhere in the asteroid belt. Yes, sir, but the asteroid has moved thousands of DUs by now. Yes, but the time is down here to the second. Oh, you mean the time the coordinates were taken? Yes. So by using the computer, we can tell just where the asteroid will be at any future moment. Commander, look at Hundley. Hey, get away from that computer. Get him, Happy. All right, Hundley. Quiet down or I'll knock you cold. Look what he did to the computer. Put it completely out of commission. Yeah, now let's see you find Asteroid X. Well, what are we going to do, sir? We can't possibly locate that asteroid until we get another computer. I know. There are thousands of asteroids in that belt. Um, Commander, could I see that piece of paper? All right, Mr. Newman. Mm, 16 degrees, 23 minutes, 7 seconds. Sun Arcturus orientation, 123 million DUs from Sun Center. Commander, I think I can give you the approximate location of that asteroid. You can work out that orbit equation in your head? Already have, sir. If you show me an astrogation chart, I'll mark down the coordinates. Smoking rocket. That's impossible. Nobody could solve an equation like that so quickly. Not in his head. I've seen Mr. Noonan work, Hundley, and I think you're in for a surprise. Here's a chart, Mr. Noonan. Center that asteroid in the viewscope, Happy. Yes, sir. It's the approximate location you gave us, Mr. Noonan. The question is, is that asteroid X? Yeah, there are hundreds of asteroids in this region. Yeah, but look, there's a spaceship circling it. Hey, it's going to land. Mr. Noonan, it looks as though you pinpointed the right one. Sheer luck. Increase our velocity, Happy. You may be able to catch Chura before he leaves the asteroid. Yes, sir. Mr. Noonan, will you go to the locker and get a couple of spacesuits for Happy and myself? Sure will, Commander. When we land on the asteroid, I'll leave you in the ship to watch Hundley. There's Chura, sir, in that small crater. He'll set down between him and his ship. Cut rockets. Rockets out, sir. Hit repeller ray. Repeller ray on, sir. Landing secured, Commander. All right, Happy. Let's get out there and grab Chura. Mr. Noonan, here's a ray gun. Hold it on our friend Hundley. Very happy, too, Commander. He's got the metal box, sir, with the evidence. All right, Chura. Come out of that crater and get into our ship. I'm getting into my own ship, Corey. And you're not going to stop me. All right, we'll see about that. Now, take one more step and I'll use this gun on you. I warned you. Drop that. Oh, that was close. That blast knocked loose a hunk of rock as big as your head. Next time, I'll widen the angle. And I won't miss. Shall we rush him, sir? Don't try it. Move one inch closer, Corey, and you're finished. There's nothing we can do. Back to the ship, Happy. Yes, sir. Commander, isn't there any way we can get him? Just get into the ship. Close the hatch. Yes, sir. Well, he can't hold out there very long without food and water, sir. Do we just wait? He'd have to give up eventually. But he destroyed the evidence before he surrendered. I guess there's nothing to do but blast off. Turn your transmitter signal to low output so Chura can't hear us. Yes, sir. All set. Hey, Commander, he'll have to pass right by this hatch to get to his own ship. Yes, there's one weapon that might work. Right here in this container. Liquid air. But but how... Unfasten the bracket. Well, yes, sir. Now, as he passes the hatch, open it as quickly as possible. And I'll open the valve and the nozzle. We'll squirt a jet of liquid air at Chura. But what good will that do? Is the pressure strong enough to knock him down? No, but the temperature out there in that asteroid is minus 240 degrees. Liquid air freezes at minus 218. Yeah, but I still don't see... There he is. Open the hatch, Happy. Quickly. Good shot, sir. It's hitting him. I'm trying to spray it over his hand. Hey, Corey, what are you trying to do? Fight with a water pistol? There, I got his hand. Turn it off, Corey, or I'll put a blast charge into your ship. Well, I I can't raise my arm. That's right, Chura. Your gun hand is encased Uh, in a mass of frozen air. Yeah, that'll hold him, Happy. Hey, he's just standing there like a statue. Let's go out and bring him into the ship. He's harmless now. <laughs> well, what's funny, huh? He, he thought he was hot stuff, but now he'll have to be defrosted. <laughs> <laughs>
We'll be back with an action preview of next week's exciting Space Patrol story in just a moment. Say, gang, did you ever hear the robot mastermind work? It's the amazing space patrol machine with a mechanical brain. It knows the answer to everything. Listen while I ask it some questions. What's the only hot cereal Buzz Corey ever eats? The hot wheat cereal that helps to supercharge him. Instant Ralston. Right, Instant Ralston. The hot super cereal that helps to supercharge you. And when you want a hot cereal that's really delicious, what do you ask for? Instant Ralston. Right, Instant Ralston. And when the morning's cold and you want to warm up your motor? Instant Ralston. Yep, the robot mastermind is right on the beam. So remember to get supercharged, eat a good breakfast with... Instant Ralston. Hey, the robot mastermind answered for me. Instant Ralston. I, I can't stop it. Instant Ralston. Instant Ralston. But the robot mastermind has the right idea, so get it today. Instant Ralston. Instant Ralston. Instant Ralston. Instant Ralston. And now for a preview of next week's exciting Space Patrol story. Buzz and Happy have been locked in a building by two criminals who have blocked their only means of escape by pouring sodium potassium alloy on the stairs. The liquid metal has burst into flame on contact with the air. Commander, the heat is terrible. We're going to face something worse than heat when the automatic fire extinguishing system starts to work. But, sir, the the water will put the fire out and we can escape. Not with this alloy, Happy. It burns in air, but when water hits it, it explodes. What? The second that spray starts working, this whole building will be blown to bits. Smoke and rockets, unless we find a way out, that means we'll be blown to bits, too. Be sure to be with us next Saturday for the exciting story, The Lady from Venus, when Wheat Checks, Rice Checks, and Good Hot Ralston again bring you Space Patrol! Now, gang, a word from Commander Buzz Corey. Can you answer this question? What group of boys and girls are doing all they can to get grown-ups to donate more blood? These boys and girls are helping their country and having fun, too. They're my Space Patrol blood boosters. And I'd like you to join them today, right now. And here's something else I'd like you to do, too. Tell your mom and pop to buy the Christmas seals that the National Tuberculosis Association mails out. Christmas seals help fight TB. Uh, Just think, TB kills one person every 17 and a half minutes. So join the fight. Buy the beautiful Christmas seals of the National Tuberculosis Association. Space Patrol, an original Mike Moser production starring Ed Kemmer as Commander Corey and Lynn Osborne as Cadet Happy, was written by Lou Houston and directed by Larry Robertson. Other players were Bela Kovach, Ken Mayer, and Norman Jolly. Dick Tufel speaking. Now, don't forget to tune in next Saturday and every Saturday when Wheat Checks, Rice Checks, and Good Hot Ralston again present the new exciting Space Patrol! And be sure to see another exciting Space Patrol story on your local ABC television station. Consult your local paper for time and channel. Space Patrol comes to you transcribed from Hollywood. This is ABC Radio. Suspense. And the producer of radio's outstanding theater of thrills, the master of mystery and adventure, William N. Robeson. Man proposes, but God disposes. Always, always the question yet to be solved, the horizon yet to be reached, beyond which ever and ever there are further horizons and never the answer to the question. Was the wealth of the distant Indies lying beyond the curve of the earth the answer to the Spain of Ferdinand and Isabella? Was Sutter's gold lying beyond the high and forbidding western mountains the answer to the America of a hundred years ago? Is the shiny electronic basketball, the soon-to-be-launched satellite, the answer to mid-century man who proposes without consulting him who disposes? We do not know, nor do we presume to guess. But we do make so bold as to give you pause for thought. Listen, then. Listen as Frank Lovejoy stars in The Outer Limit, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. Zero minus 25. Zero minus 25. All right, men, settle down. 
Now, let's settle down. You too, Bill, that book you're reading. Put it away. Anything you say, Colonel. No doubt you're wondering why we got you out of whatever warm beds you were in. Well, we've got a reason, a very good reason. This morning, we take the wraps off the RX-3. Now, most of you have heard Scuttlebutt that she's been modified. Well, she has. She's powered by eight rockets now. That's what I said, eight rockets. Designed to take man into areas of space that have never been explored before. And at a rate of speed to which no pilot has as yet been subjected. Now, Bill Westfall is going to take her up this morning as far and as fast as she can go. Joe? Yes, Colonel. You'll lead the 102s. You and your wingmen will be Bill's chase planes. We want observation at 40,000 feet. Yes, sir. Okay, here's how it plays. Pull the curtains on the map, Sergeant. Yes, sir. Now, you see it's circled here. Your rendezvous point we designated as point X. Zero hour is 0900. Joe, you and your red tails will take off at zero minus 15. Have you got that? Yes, sir. You'll make conventional climbs to 35,000 feet, rendezvous at point X. Call into me at control at 40,000 feet. Right, Joe? That's got this, Colonel. Well, not quite. Now, let's take a look at the weather. Pete? Yes, sir, Colonel. Uh, the weather is very pretty, our boys. All clear, ceiling unlimited. Uh, winds aloft at 10,000, 80 miles per hour to 165 degrees. At 25,000... Hold it, Pete. Major Westfall. Yes, Colonel. This is primarily for you. Well, I don't fret, Hank. I'm getting it. I just wanted to make sure, Bill. Go ahead, Pete. Uh, ground temperature is 60, estimated at 45 below at 40,000 feet. And we expect no change for three hours. That's it, sir. Hang up. Okay, Joe, you and your boys go unwrap your 102s and have a nice time. <laughs> oh, Bill, stick around. I want to talk. How are you feeling, Bill? I feel real good. How are you feeling? Oh, what about Molly and the kids? Are you worried, Hank? Don't worry. Well, I just want to know just how they are, that's all. Well, an hour ago, Molly wiped her hands on her apron, kissed me goodbye, and the twins want to be firemen this morning. Zero minus 20. Now, what are you... Zero minus okay, 20. Okay. Look, Hank, I've flown it a dozen times before. I know, but never for this speed and never for this altitude and never with eight rockets. The engineers are hitting you could break out of the stratosphere in this plane. Yeah, I heard. Now, get it out of your head. This is just routine. Well, look, Hank, I've studied the blueprints. I know them like a prayer. My brain is crammed with detailed specifications, estimated performances, and I know all the safety vices to keep me alive. You happy? All right, come on. Let's go. Let's get out of here. Okay. I I've got to say it, Bill. You know it better than I do, but I've got to say it anyhow. All right, you be a commanding officer, Hank. You know, you go ahead and tell me. Keep your throttles uniform or you'll wind up against the mountain. Yeah. Retract landing gear as soon as you're airborne. Maneuver for maximum rate of climb and a heading of eight, seven degrees, which should bring you to 40,000 in less than two minutes using JATO, approximately one mile north of Rendezvous Point. Uh -huh. From there on, you'll be on rockets. Uh-huh. Zero minus 17. Well, go ahead. Zero minus you're 17. Doing fine. Oh, Bill. Come on, outside. Let's go to the hangar. Bill. Yeah. You've got ten minutes of rocket fuel. Now, get rid of those Jado bottles before you fire the rockets. Fire, fire only, only one, one rocket. rocket at a time. Now, uh, <laughs> no, I think you did just fine. I'm going to fly that baby higher and faster than anybody ever did before, just like you said. I'm going to take it up and bring it back. And then you come home and have dinner with me, huh? Yeah, sure, I'd like to. There she is, Bill. Yeah. She's real pretty, isn't she? I'll be listening in a control. I won't bother you until you're airborne. It'll be between you and the tower until then. See you later. Good luck. Zero minus three. Zero minus three. Good morning, Colonel. Oh, Mr. Hargrove, you'll be here at control with me? It's all right with you, Colonel. Well, I wouldn't have it any other way. You check the communications equipment, Sergeant? Yes, sir. And Major Westfall has been assigned a special radio frequency of 3970. Good, nine. good, good. You'll take good care of it, Sergeant. We don't want it to poop out or anything like that, do we, Sergeant? Oh, yes, sir. Yeah. Well, no, sir, sir. Hargrove, I've, uh, I've got a thing on my mind. That boy in the plane you geniuses designed, he's my best boy. It's our best plane, Colonel. It better be. Well, now it's your turn. What have you got on your mind? 
Everything's in proper order, Colonel. The electronic brain, the recording equipment, the television cameras in the cockpit, everything. Every known scientific device, even some unknown. They've been... We're talking about a man. That's all I really want to get back out of this. What about the man? There may be one difficulty. Well, tell me about it. I'd like to know. The takeoff with all that load, the jets, the rockets, all at maximum fuel capacity. It's never been tested that way before. Go on, Mr. Hunko. It's just that Major Westfall has only 10,000 feet to get his ship airborne. If he accelerates from zero to 300 knots in 10,000 feet, he should be airborne in less than seven seconds. Seven seconds. That makes it zero plus G. Yes, Colonel. Beyond zero plus G, beyond that we don't know. We just don't know. Oh, thank you. Thank you uh, for everything, Mr. Hargrove. Sergeant, flip your switch on Major Westfall. I hear he's got a swell program. Flip them all, Sergeant. Yes, sir. From RX-3, any change in weather? RX-3 from Tower, barometer reading 29.7. Set your altimeter accordingly. Roger. Wind 15 miles from south. Zero Zero minus 130. Zero minus 130. Got it. Control from RX-3, over. Control to RX-3, go ahead. Control to RX-3, this is uh, just for you, Hank. Cabin pressure... Okay. Oxygen pressure, okay. Hydraulic flight control, okay. Fuel pressure safety lock. All right, all right, all right. Get off the dime, kid. <laughs> Take a mill. Zero, zero minus one. Zero minus one. Chief from RX-3, over. Go ahead, RX-3. I am ready to fire. Hold it. Okay. All set to fire. Clear? Clear. Starting starboard jet. Starting port jet. Zero minus 30 seconds. RX-3 from tower. Come in, tower. Western Airlines Flight 303 reported over San Jose southbound. Navy interceptor on home leg in San Diego. United Airlines eastbound 4010 at 18,000 over Salt Lake City. No other aircraft aloft in the area. Zero minus Roger. 11. Tower Ten. from RX-3. Nine. Ready for takeoff. Eight. RX-3 from tower. Seven. This is control. Go ahead, Bill. Everything's great, Hank. She's a doll, baby. You were kidding with that takeoff, weren't you? It took that long to get it off. That makes it a takeoff, Hank. How fast are you climbing? Airspeed 690, approaching Mach 1. She's buffeting some. Bad. I'm still flying it. Hank. Hank. Yes, Bill. I just went through Mach 1. Speed of sound, straight up. She shake bad. Not a shudder. Boss waist is a big help. She's a doll baby, Hank, a living doll baby. How do you feel? I like it here. Control from Red Tail 1. Control from Red Tail 1. Go ahead, Red Tail. RX-3 over rendezvous point at 50,000. Get ready to turn, Colonel. On schedule, Joe? On schedule. Control from RX-3. Go ahead, Bill. 55,000, Hank. Still a doll, baby? Still is. Hank, can you hear me okay? You're coming in clear, Bill. Rocket system primed. Dropping right jet. Dropping left jet. All clear. Good luck, Bill. Firing number one rocket. Fired. <laughs> Waking back. Firing number two rocket. Hey, Hank. Yes, Bill, what is it? Bill? Bill, are you receiving me? RX-3 from Control, come in. Come in, RX-3. Hello, Bill, come in. Red Tail Leader from Control, Red Tail Leader from Control, come in, Red Tail. Go ahead, Colonel. What about it, Joe? RX-3 overhead at approximately 70,000 feet. 
Maintaining a heading of north northwest. I can barely make him, Colonel. Try calling. Roger. RX3 from Red Tail Leader. RX3 from Red Tail Leader. Come Mr. Hargrove. RX3. Yes, Colonel. Come in, Share RX3. it with me, Mr. Hargrove. Sit here and run your fingers through your hair and wait and think about it and share it with me. Control from Red Tail Leader. Go ahead, Red Tail. We've lost him, Colonel. Stay up there, Joe, as long as you can. What do we do now, Colonel? I just told you, Mr. Hargrove, we wait. You and me. We wait. You haven't lost me, Joe. I can hear you. Stay up there, Joe, as long as you can. Hello? Hello, Joe. I will try another frequency. Red tail from RX-3. Can you make me? Red tail from RX-3. Can you make me? I still can't get you, Joe. I will keep sending Firing number seven rocket. Fired. Firing number eight rocket. Fired. Oh, brother! This is RX3 broadcasting to whom it may concern to all you people. This is Bill Westfall approaching 210,000 feet at Four times the speed of sound. 210,000 feet. That's 40 miles straight up in the air to all you people. And that's where I am. You never saw anything like it. No clouds. And a color no one ever named before. Otherwise, there's nothing. There's, there's no sound except my instruments. Nothing. Nothing. Nothing at all. Wait a minute. The, there is some... Something at two o'clock high, really something, brother, and it, it's not a flying saucer either. This one's egg-shaped, it's huge, it, it's spinning like a top and it's coming toward me. Can you hear me? Can, can you hear me? Listen. Listen, something has just happened. Something, a missile, something, a, a, a shot. Maybe through, through my canopy, the pressure is going down. Something is happening to me, that egg-shaped thing I'm being pulled toward it. I have lost and Oh, Chip, I have no control. I am I'm going to be in place. I'm on the verge of consciousness. I'm flying through the heart. We continue with Suspense. Every Sunday, right triumphs over wrong dramatically in Indictment, the unusual dramatic series that is based on stories of the criminal law with authentic procedures as they are followed by the office of an assistant district attorney. For the kind of excitement that is generated when justice goes into action, hear Indictment just a few minutes from now and every Sunday over most of these same stations. And now, we continue with The Outer Limit, starring Mr. Frank Lovejoy, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. We've waited a long time, Colonel. Well, we'll wait some more. But there's no point to it. May I make a suggestion, Colonel? What? Give it up. Make your report to Washington. And what about you, Hargrove? To be frank with you, Colonel, in another 16 months, there'll be another plane, the RX-4, and the Air Force will give us another man to fly it. Until we're certain about this man, and we're not certain. What do you propose to do? The things that are in the manual. We'll organize search parties. We'll put spotter planes up in the air. Maybe Bill came down in the ocean. We'll call the Navy. Colonel, if the RX-3 came down on the ocean, it would sink in five minutes. It had no life preserver equipment on it. The added we'll weight... call the Navy in, Mister Hargrove. Whatever you say, Colonel. But my guess is what's your guess, Hargrove? My guess is that sometime, somewhere, on some beach or in some field, someone will pick up a ball of cooled metal. That someone will be holding what's left of the RX three. Now, 
Communication with him, Commander, on frequency X29. Good. Proceed as ordered. Yes, Commander. Earthman, your brain is in turmoil, is it not? It has great difficulty in accepting what you see. Yeah, that's right. Accept it. What you see here exists. This, this exists? It exists, Earthling. The spaceship you're on exists. Those jet dynamos you see before you exist. Jet dynamos driven by the harness power of a thousand suns. Listen, Earthman. Listen to them. Do you know what happened as you listened, Earthman? We have flung ourselves 10,000 miles into space. What do you say to that, Earthman? I don't know what to say. It is beyond the conception of your earth brain. Then conceive this. Try to move, earth man. You're not bound in any way. Try to move. Don't strain. It's impossible for you to move. There is a screen of force aimed at you. Now you may move about, earthling. Proceed, Zeglon. Yes, Commander. Earth man, I perceive that your intellect now accepts the fact. You are aboard Space Patrol Ship S2J3. I am Captain Zeglon of the Galactic Guard. The Galact Galactic Guard? The Guardian of the Galaxy. The Guardian of the Universes. The instrument the Brotherhood of Worlds has set up in defense against such a world as yours. What puzzles you, Earthman? I, I can't see you. I, I can feel that you're here, but I, I can't see you. There is no necessity for you to see us. It is sufficient that we communicate with each other. But talking to you is like... Well, it's not like talking. It's, it's as if it is all happening inside my brain. It is. That is how I'm reaching you. Not through your ears, but inside your brain. Do you remember what happened to you before you blacked out? I think so, that there was a sharp sound like a bullet hitting the canopy. It was not a bullet. It was a ray. It was necessary to stop your flight. We have so much to tell you. Well... First, tell me about my ship. Is it lost? No. It is being repaired. It will be returned to you. And you will return to Earth because you are the Earth's only hope of survival. Hope of... Survival? What do you, what do you mean? I will show you. <laughs> what you see before you is a panorama of your own universe. Far greater in scope than any Earthman has ever seen before. Observe. Observe where the line is pointing. Star 5, Galaxy C, Sector K. Is that the Earth? That dot, that speck you see revolving in the vastness, is your sun. A star whose surface is 12,000 times that of your Earth. Your Earth is not even visible here. How, how did you know we even existed? That was our problem. We first became aware of your planet when we found atomic dust containing strontium-90 in the upper atmosphere. We traced it to your Earth. It was that important to you? Quite. We determined that you were setting off thermonuclear explosions. That's why the Galactic Council has quarantined you. Quarantine? I, I don't understand. How? How are we quarantined? We have sealed off your planet from the rest of space. We have surrounded it with a force screen. When that screen has accumulated enough particles of atomic dust, your Earth will explode. Listen to me, Earthman. Listen. We have had our own wars. Wars that almost destroyed our civilization. Now we have outlawed war throughout space. And we have outlawed your world. If there is another thermonuclear explosion, you will destroy yourselves. Take this back to your planet. Warn them, Earthman. Release him, Zeglon. Yes, Commander. Earthman, you will open that door. There is your ship. Get into it, Earthling. Uh, 
Are you ready, Earthling? Yes, I'm ready. You will be propelled into space. Close your canopy. Open aperture. Warn them, Earthman. Warn them. Fire! Howard, a funny man. Are you loaded, kid? How did you get in on this frequency? Listen, this is RX-3. RX-3, coming in for landing. Give me landing instructions. Howard, a funny man. Impossible to draw RX-3. Now get away from the area. The area cleared for interceptor practice approaches. Howard, this is Major Westfall in RX-3. Now come on, give me landing instructions. I am fresh out of rocket juice. Yeah, o- okay, Major, in just a minute. Uh, tower to all aircraft in the base area. Tower to all aircraft in the base area. We have an emergency. All aircraft hold present altitude and proceed on a course of 180 degrees until advised. Radio silence will be maintained until the emergency is over. Okay, RX-3, go ahead. I approximate my position 20 miles north of field at 10,000. Estimate six minutes to land. RX-3 from tower. You are cleared to land. Runway 9. Wind, east, southeast, 15. Roger. Coming down. Give me a hand. Bill! Bill, what? Just help me off this plane, will you? Yeah. Tell what happened. Hank, Hank, now listen, you won't believe it, but you've got to. Before I tell you anything, you've got to promise to believe me. You've you got to. Look, what did you write? Oh, before this? anything, Hank. Now, now, promise me. We'd better have you looked over, kid. No, no, I'll, I'll be all right. Now, just listen to me, Hank. Hank, they said the earth would explode. They said it was the end for us. They said that? Bill, come on, let's get over to my you, office. You don't believe it. Read it like an order, Bill. My office. What, uh, they, what, uh, they are you talking about? Hank, I chased me a spaceship, and I caught it, or rather it caught me. I was cruising nicely, about 200,000 feet, that's where I spotted it. Hank, Hank. Oh, uh, you kid, you don't have no, to No, no, I, I've, I've got to tell you. They said I had to tell you. Well, don't you understand, Hank? I saw this thing. I saw it coming at me. I thought it was going to be the biggest smash, and it wasn't. I, I came to. Inside their ship, Hank. Hank. I think I need a drink, an office call drink. Well, that can wait, too. I I want Major Donaldson to look at you. Psychiatrist? Well, what for? To test my jerks? Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it's something like that. Well, that's the story, Major Donaldson. Hank. Hank, you believe it, don't you? Just keep flying down there, Bill. Major, what do you think? Oh, I'm not sure. Now, Bill, these men from Mars... I didn't say they were men from Mars. Now, did you hear me say that they were men from Mars? No, 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 you didn't. All I'm trying to tell you is this. Whoever those people were, they know all about us, everything. About our wars, about our big bombs. They've got us... They have got us quarantined. Quarantined? Yes, quarantined. They've sealed us off from the rest of space. We have wars... We're sick, and we're going to die. They've seen to it that we will die. Well, go ahead, Bill. Well, there's nothing more to go ahead with. Another H-bomb, and that's all. One more bomb, and we're going to have the juiciest galactic Fourth of July of all time. Explode. Like that. Well, how do you like it? All right, Bill, roll up your sleeve. Now, just forget it, Major. All I need is a couple of drinks. Sorry, Bill, not right now. Let the Major give you a hypo. Uh, Hank, I've got a drink coming. A a, a lot of drinks. And I want to see my wife. Yeah, later. I'll call Molly. Right now, you've got to get a little sleep. Go ahead, Major. All right. Come on, Bill. Let's leave. All right. All right. If it's in order, go ahead. Ah, there. You'll be okay in a few hours. I am... Okay, now. Sure, sure. We'll leave you here, Bill. It's all right if Bill sleeps in here, isn't it, Colonel? Sure, sure. But when you wake up, I'll have Molly here, and we'll have that drink together. Yeah. Well, maybe she'll believe me. Maybe you'll believe me then, Hank. You'd better... Come on, Major. Hello? 
He'll be okay by himself, Major? Well, he's been under a strain, but he'll sleep for quite a spell. I see. Well, we better get some sleep, too. Right. And don't worry, Colonel. He's a strong boy. Best nerves I've seen in a long time. I'd say things will be all right. Uh, delusions like Bill's latched on to. Well, delusions like this. Major. Yes, Colonel. Major, when you make your charts out for Bill and diagnose him and treat him and do all the things that you have to, when you do that, Major, consider this. Yes? Yeah? How did he keep that plane in the air for ten hours? For ten hours, Major. When he had fuel to last him only ten minutes. Frank Lovejoy starred in William N. Robeson's production of The Outer Limit by Graham Dorr. Listen. Listen again next week when we return with another tale well calculated to keep you in... Suspense. The Outer Limit was adapted for radio by David Friedkin and Mort Fine. Supporting Mr. Lovejoy were Stacey Harris, Barney Phillips, Jack Crucian, Larry Thor, Sam Pierce, Jay Novello, Hans Conried, and Joe Kearns. The musical score was written by Lucian Morawieck and conducted by Wilbur Hatch. Sound patterns by Tom Hanley and Bill James. Like to laugh? Then you'll like listening to Eve Arden as Our Miss Brooks on CBS Radio later today. With Cupid taking pot shots at her from one side and Mr. Conklin, the school principal, badgering her on the other, our lovelorn school marm has a tough time tracking down her favorite mayo, Mr. Boynton. But since all of her difficulties are comic... Every episode of Our Miss Brooks, starring Eve Arden, offers immediate insurance against the blues. What can you lose? Hear Eve Arden as Our Miss Brooks on CBS Radio every Sunday over most of these same stations. This is the CBS Radio Network. After the brutal war of 2204, in which the superpowers of Earth stopped just short of annihilating each other, an uneasy peace settled over what was left of civilization. During the next 50 years, governments of the United Peoples of Earth struggled to rebuild. Prosperity was just beginning to return. That's it, honey. Let out the string. The wind will do the work for you. Look at my kite, Daddy. It looks so pretty. Wish I could fly above the trees. Wild and free. Daddy, what's happening to the sunshine? Daddy, I'm scared. The whole of the planet Earth grows dark, darkened by the shadow of thousands of unidentified warships. Suddenly and mysteriously multiplying in the heavens, like a massive plague of locusts. Where did they come from? Who are they? We are Dominion. In the name of the leader and his council of the seven, we claim Earth and its galaxy for our own. Escape is impossible. Resistance useless. Your weapons can do us no harm. Surrender, and you will not be killed. Military reaction is immediate. Ten. Nine. Deadly oh, missiles from all nations are launched yes. to seek yes. and destroy this unidentified threat. Dos. Uno. <laughs> Your feeble attempts are noted. You were warned. Now you will feel the power of dominion. The missiles, Earth's last desperate hope, zero in on the dominion warships. But before they can reach their target, the missiles smash into an 
visible energy force field spread out across space. Peoples of Earth, hear me. If you continue to resist, there will be pain and death. All resistance ended. The governments of the United Peoples of Earth surrendered to the dark reign of the Dominion. The game begins. Dominion. Origin, unknown. Power, awesome. Its rule, evil and cruel. Dominion conquered Earth in one brutal master strike, destroying all freedom and justice. Mankind descended into slavery. But Dominion is not invincible. There is a major flaw in its plan. A secret that can be used to destroy it. But can the secret be found in time? This is the story of that search and the rebels who lead it. This is the secret of Dominion. The year is now 2294. For over 35 years, the Dominion has prospered. Where freedom once flourished, the Dominion now rules. A continual state of war exists, and Dominion warships, heavy with arms, patrol interstellar space. No quarter is asked, none is given. Inside the lead fighter of a Dominion squadron, Colonel Stephen Richards notices one of his pilots drifting off course. Richards to Protogen 6. Want your vectors, Lipton. Sorry, Colonel. Ignition activators are malfunctioning. Try to hang on, Lipton. Yes, sir. I'll try, sir. Colonel Richards, we're coming up on the rebel planet Cygnus 3. It's on my scanners, Major Connors. Closing on Cygnus 3 at 300 kilometers. Hold it. Lieutenant Lipton, you're out of formation again. Sorry, sir. Can't seem to hold course. Warning lights. Antimatter fuel leaking into the prime chambers. Request permission to break off and return to base. Permission granted. But tell maintenance I want some answers when I get back. Yes, sir. Lipton out. General Derek doesn't approve of your attitude toward maintenance, Colonel. Connors, my men put their lives on the line every day. I mentioned this problem for your own good, Richards. A word to the wise. Go it, Connors. You're just a humanoid. Your threats don't impress me. Dominion Corps Command expects us to conquer new worlds with fighters one bolt away from the scrap heap. Your words are close to treason, Richards. This isn't the time or the place for this discussion. I merely follow my programming. All right, gentlemen. Time to go to work. 200 kilometers. Insert disc 7 into your trigger pulse systems. Geo scanners show 20 seconds to assault run. Arm your Nissan cannons. We're entering Cygnus 3's atmosphere. Full power to modulators. Ten seconds. Mark. Colonel Richards, scanners indicate a rare target of opportunity. A rebel hospital. An excellent chance to increase our kill ratio. Forget it, Connors. I won't be a part of that and you know it. All units, stay with your Cygnus 3 assault plan. You've got a bloodlust, Connors. Commence firing on my command. Three, two, one, fire. Sir, they aren't sending up any fighters. Caught them completely by surprise, McGee. Most of their fighters are burning below us. Stay in assault mode. We'll take out their control. Incoming enemy fire. Two o'clock. That was close. McGee! Your approach is too low. Can't control it, Colonel. Power level reading shows activation has stopped. Switch your energy flow to alternate. I'm trying. Negative. My circuits are burned out. McGee, go to reverse thrust. Blast your way out of the dive. You've got to slow down. It's no use. Jumping like crazy. Buffeting. Starting to break up. I can't do it. 
Break off. Break off the attack. Get out of range. Assemble in Sector 9 or 17. Kick in hyperspace. Now. Connors, how many fighters did we lose this time? Three, Colonel. One to enemy fire. Two to malfunctions. If we're going to die in combat, I'd like to think we had protogents that at least gave us a chance. Let's get back to base. Your beloved General Derek and I are going to have a very distasteful discussion. Colonel Richards, come in. Sit down. I prefer to stand while I say what needs to be said. And just what needs to be said? General Derek, over the past month, 15 of my men died simply because their protojets were unfit for battle. Because your technicians failed to do a proper job of maintenance. Lower your voice in this room, Colonel. You are not in a debating chamber. You are in my office, and you will behave accordingly. My men are my only concern. Colonel Richards, I wouldn't risk a court-martial over this. Now you listen to me. I can guarantee you new protojets by the end of the month. Your guarantee comes a bit too late for men like McGee. Who? McGee! He died today while you sat there behind your desk. Be very careful, Richards. Don't go too far. I don't believe we have anything else to say to each other, General. If you don't mind, I've got to check on repairs. You do that. Good day, Colonel Richards. Good day, General. You can come out now, Connors. Giving orders not to be disturbed, General Derek and her humanoid begin a curious ritual. Go into recept mode, Major. Receptors operational. Access file TX-10. TX-10, open. General Derek's eyes only. File title, evidence against Stephen Richards. Is the file up to date? Completely, General. All mission observations, all conversations in this room, including the one that just took place, there's damaging evidence against Richards. Good. I want him out of my way, Connors. I've never trusted him. But his background... I've told you he's not one of us, haven't I? It's in the file, General. He's a threat to my absolute authority in this sector. But I won't have it. I've heard him threaten you, question your orders, and now the maintenance demands... Yes, but to bring him before the Council of the Seven, insubordination won't be enough. The file must prove Richards is a traitor. Perhaps the hospital reference in today's mission report will be helpful. Hospital? What are you talking about, Major? An unprotected rebel hospital came up on the scanners during the assault run. Richards refused to destroy it. Acting against my direct recommendations, he gave orders to bypass it. It's all in the file. Any loyal Dominion officer would never hesitate to wipe out a rebel target. Good, Major. Very good. One more nail in his coffin. Seal the file. TX-10, seal. Further instructions... Watch him, Connors. Continue the file. One day soon, Richards will make a mistake, and then I'll have him where I want him. Watch closely, dear one. I will, General. You can count on it. On board the Dominion command ship, Colonel Richards is on his way to inspect his squadron's protojets. When a stranger beckons to him from the shadows of the maintenance bay. Colonel Richards, over here. Who is it? What do you want? My name is Carl Phillips, and we need to talk. It's important to both of us. Well, come out from behind that blast guard if you want to talk. I can't be seen with you, Colonel. There's no time to explain. Just look at this image, please. What? It's my father and... And me. Over 35 years ago. You knew my father? The people who raised me told me he was a hero. He was a hero, but on the rebel side. I know. I was there. That can't be true. You're crazy. Your parents were a brilliant scientific team. 
they developed the plasmonic diversity drive, the basis for the first rebel fighters. My parents rebels? Listen to me. I'm risking my life to convince you that you're fighting on the wrong side. What happened to my parents? When the Dominion overran the main rebel base, I got away. But your parents were captured and killed. How do you know all this? I can't tell you that. But proof is on the star system Canis Minor. That star system went supernova over two years ago. Every planet was burned to a crisp. The ice moon Centiga survived. But it could only last a few more days before the power of a black hole pulls it in. Centiga? It's nothing but ice. Go there. In the research lab, under the floor, you'll find a holographic recorder. It contains a message for you from your parents. It's important. An incredible story of true, but you could be a fantastic liar. I'm not lying, Richards. You haven't much time. Phillips, I'm going to stick you in the base stockade on some trumped-up charge. But and then I... I'm going to the Ice Moon Santiga. If I find out this story of yours is a lie, you'll pay for that lie with your life. Deep inside the Dominion command ship, General Derrick enters the cold metal interior of the interrogation room. Connors, why did you bring me down here? And who is this? This piece of human garbage was in the stockade. I thought we could conduct his interrogation more discreetly down here. Ah, he has useful information for us. I'm sure of it. He is not what he pretends to be. Speak plainly, Connors. I have no time for humanoid riddles. But traitor Richards left a few hours ago, General. Destination unknown. He put Phillips here in the base stockade, charging him with striking an officer, a Lieutenant Green. I still don't see your point, Connors. Richards lied. Lieutenant Green is no longer on this base. How do you know that? I couldn't resist running the name through my memory banks. Green died in space a week ago. Well, well. Perhaps Richards has made his mistake, my pet. Release the restraint on the prisoner. Now, Phillips, what do you have to say? I refuse to speak. Don't worry. He'll tell us everything he knows after I give him this. What is it? Twenty milligrams of phenoparaglycide. Phenoparaglycide? Why, that's... That's the truth, drug. I'm going to do a complete mind probe. But you'll rip his brain apart. Is that necessary? Yes. But before he dies, General, he'll tell us about Richard's unauthorized little trip. This is your last chance, Phillips. Tell us what Richards is doing. Tell us. You won't use the truth, drug. It was outlawed years ago. You're wrong, Phillips. You're hiding something. And I mean to know what it is. Connors, give him the injection. No, no. Quiet. Hold still. Now, Phillips, let's hear your secrets. All of them. Nine hours have passed. Richards is deep in space. Suddenly... There it is, the ice moon Santiga. And the black hole is pulling it in. I must be crazy coming here. Wait, what's that? A building jammed into an ice wall. Power hover. Could be the base station. Maybe, just maybe, Phillips was telling the truth. Atmosphere probe extended and on green. The air's breathable. This must have been the research lab. Space observation equipment over there. Old trophone tubes. Phillips said the recording device was under the floor. There it is. Now, how do you operate? This recording is for my son, Stephen Richards. Three second delay until the start of message. Son, your mother and I are about to try and rescue you. One of our friends, Carl Phillips, has already escaped. He will find you, Stephen. Trust him. We have uncovered a secret while working on Emerald Tree. The secret of the Dominion. If we fail in our mission to rescue you, you must know it. Hurry, Robert. They're coming for us. Tell him about Emerald Tree. There's no time. 
We're done for. No, not yet. Stephen, the secret is in the Emerald Tree. To destroy Dominion, first you must destroy the... They're gone. To get off this piece of ice, the black hole is pulling it in. There. Set for blast off. Come on. Pull together. I'm moving backwards. The black hole is pulling me in. Got to break free. Hyperspace. The ice moon. It just disappeared. What were my parents trying to tell me? Secret of dominion? In an emerald tree? Communications link on Flasher. Should I answer? Of course, no one knows where I've been. Colonel Richards, awaiting message. The message is from me, Richards. I'm right behind you. Connors, Derek's henchman. What's he doing out here? Oh, well, Major Connors, an unexpected surprise. That's right, traitor. And I brought some friends along with me. The odds are five to one against you. What are you talking about? The general and I had a long talk with someone named Phillips. He was a spy. Can you imagine it? He told us all about your little jaunt to the ice moon Santiga. He died, Richards, trying to remember how to scream. You killed Phillips? Of course. But you're the one marked for elimination now, Richards. General Derrick gave the order herself. Corps Command wants you dead, traitor. I might prove more difficult to kill than you think, Connors. I sincerely hope not, because the moment you die, I become Squadron Commander. A pity... A brilliant career, and you throw it all away to find your rebel father's memory. Any brave last words, Colonel? No, Connors. No more words. Vector's set. Shields extended. Trigger pulses armed. Bravo! He's right behind you! It's four to one now, Connors. You'll have to do better than that. Red line! Red line! Power boosters aren't responding, Major. Breaking off to return to base. I'm tired of these malfunctions, Lifton. Get it taken care of this time. Daniels, take Lifton's place in formation. Three to one, Connors. Turn inside him, Daniels. You got him. Fire, Daniels. Fire. Good shooting. His starboard engine is torn apart. Yeah, real good, Daniels. Too good. Gotta find a way out. Power re-entry. He's trying to escape. Heading for Cygnus 3. I'm right behind you, Richards. Can't miss at this range. Cease fire. Readouts confirm. There is no way he can survive the crash. Mission final. Protojets return to base. Connors. Well, 25,000 meters left, falling at about a thousand meters a second. There's a forest below. If I can make the angle shallow enough, I just might have a chance. Manual crash shield in place. I'm going in. Use my left arm. What's that? Hover jets? Hold on a bit longer. Help me. Please. Help me. The secret of Dominion. Have you discovered it? And what is Emerald Tree? More clues follow in Episode 2, Rebels Roused.
Among the standard charts of the solar systems, chart R94 shows a small planet known as Cygnus 3. It orbits its sun every 20 hours. The temperature, geography, even the atmosphere are similar to Earth's. In the year 2294, this planet serves as the base of operations for a courageous band of rebels led by General Aldous Zane. When Earth was conquered by the mysterious Dominion, these brave resistance fighters fled to nearby star systems. Cygnus III became their command center, and for over 30 years they have desperately opposed the Dominion. As our story begins, the General's daughter, accompanied by her personal robot, is on her way to Launch Bay. Testing is about to start on two protojets captured from the Dominion in a daring raid. As usual, the robot Beta has something to say. I really don't think you should try the hyperspace system today, Christina. We don't know the protojet's command center well enough, if I may say so. You may not say so, Beta friend. I won't have you second-guessing my command decisions. Now, I've already given the order. We test hyperspace today. Well, I didn't mean to question your... Good. Just... Then there's nothing more to discuss, right? Right, but oh, I... But what? It's really nothing, I suppose. Forget I mentioned it, Christina. Oh, wait a minute. Don't walk away like that, Beta. You can't just leave me wondering what you were going to say. Uh, do your sensors warn of some danger? Are the Dominion fighters sabotage? Oh, no, no, nothing like that. Then what is it? Beta, are you all right? Hmm. I'll put it to you straight. I didn't want to worry you, but... I think I'm getting a case of Traga measles. Measles? <laughs> Wait a minute, Beta. You can't get Traga measles. You're a robot. Easy for you to say. I have the same red spots you had when you were seven. It's all in my memory banks. See for yourself. They're popping out everywhere. So now, just let me have a look at you. Oh, Beta, that's rust. Rust? Yes. You mean I'm not going to be forced into downtime? <laughs> Don't worry, Beta. We'll take care of those spots with a nice hot oil dip uh, right after we test those protojets. A lube bath? Now that's luxury. Oh, I feel better already. I thought you would. Oh, here comes the terrafoil. Looks like the generals. You two need a lift somewhere? Thanks, Father. We're on our way to Launch Bay. You know, you and Beta make quite a team, Christina. That's true, Father. Very true, sir. An excellent team. Perhaps even better than excellent. Quiet, Beta. Oh, there are times when I wish you hadn't programmed his memory banks with my life history in, in such detail, Father. It seems to confuse him about his operating condition. <laughs> I'll bet he's the only beta model with a bad case of hypochondria. General, I must protest. I have difficulty diagnosing my own symptoms, that's all. It's not my fault I've been programmed to be as human as possible. Now, don't get upset, beta friend. I'm not upset. <laughs> you two be good to each other, hear me? Christina, your whole squadron did great work capturing those protojets during the raid on Argon. We just happened to be in the right place at the right time. It was luck, really. Lieutenant McCormick and I will complete the checkout flights today. Maintenance still has a few modifications. Then the final insignia changes. The protojets will be mission ready soon, General. Dominion protojets will make a big difference for us in the field, Father. They're, they're state of the art all the way, including hyperspace capability. We might be needing them sooner than we think. Sector 2 Recon filed a report noting a significant increase in Dominion fighter activity near the planet Ventress. They've requested backup firepower to safeguard their freshwater reservoir. We are indeed lucky to have our own water source on Cygnus 3. Many of the rebel planets depend on the Ventress reservoir for all their fresh water. Dominion interest. Hmm. Doesn't sound good, does it? Come on, Beta, we've got work to do. If Ventress needs support, Father, we'll be ready. Their water supply must be protected at all costs. General Derrick waits impatiently for the results of Major Connor's mission. The shooting down and killing of former Dominion Colonel Stephen Richards. Bridge, this is General Derrick. 
Has Major Connors returned from his uh, search and destroy mission? No, General, but we have a coded transmission just in from him. Decoded for me. It's already done, sir. Log 6382 reads as follows. Richard's fighter located and downed. Survival estimate, zero. We have sustained some damages. Returning to base. That's the entire transmission, General. Is there a reply, sir? No. Just tell Major Connors I'll need a full report when he returns. I'll see that he gets the message, General. Bridge out. Richards, I never really trusted your rebel heritage. It was bound to claim your allegiance someday. And your humane concerns were becoming an annoyance. You made a mistake, Richards. And I intend to capitalize on it. Now that you're dead, my precious humanoid Connors can at last be put into a position to advance my ambition. But Stephen Richards is not dead. He lies severely wounded deep in a heavily forested area of Cygnus III, his Dominion fighter a blackened mass of twisted metal. Inside the wreckage... I'm bleeding. I got to get out. No, I can't make it. Concentrate, Richards. Stay awake. Strange. Trapped on a rebel stronghold after what I've just learned about my parents. My crash must have been detected by someone. The crash of Stephen Richards' protojet has been detected on Cygnus 3. Red alert conditions have been sounded. Security brief. Red alert. This is an emergency. Penetration of Cygnus 3's atmosphere has been detected. One intruder now down on the planet's surface. Pilot to your hovercraft. Immediately. To your hovercraft. Immediately. Orders, General? McCormick, you and Christina begin the search at once. Any word from intelligence, Father? According to the radar platform in Sector 2, several fighters entered our outer atmosphere. A single lead fighter, followed by two or three others. Whose fighters, Father? There was a positive ID. Dominion protojets. But the mystery is, they were in pursuit formation appearing to fire on one of their own craft. But that, that doesn't make any sense at all. Shooting down one of their own people? Maybe it was a mistake. Maybe. Maybe it's a decoy, McCormick, to throw us off the real target. Find out. Locate the craft and report back. But be careful. It could be a trap. On the Dominion command ship, Major Connors reports... Come in, Connors. At ease. Now tell me, you're certain Colonel Richards was disposed of properly? Scanners indicated direct hits to his power system. He definitely lost all ability to maneuver his fighter, and no one could have survived that crash. It was beautiful. So much for Richards. Let's move on to more important things, like the data on screen two, Connors. What do you make of this? Those are the locations of rebel planets, along with the resources on each. Food, fuel, water, power plants, minerals, and so on. A very detailed list, General. Those planets are the key to Dominion's total control of the galaxy. If we cannot convince them to become our allies, then we will have to destroy them one by one. A most ingenious plan, General. But where do we begin? Oh, use your higher functions, Connors. Don't be so human. I pose a question. What is the one resource the rebels must have to continue their fight? The answer is water, General. All data confirms it. Of course. Fresh water. 
Which of these planets holds the rebels' largest supply? Ventress, General. In the star system Gamma Penta, it is the main source from which almost all of the rebel planets get additional water supplies. Oh, excellent. Then Ventress will be our first target. You will prepare the assault plan. Priority one, Connors, is the water. Destroy it or the planet, whatever gets the job done. Right away, General. Oh, and Connors, your good work in that Richards matter just completed has already been noted in the right places. I've seen to that, Colonel. Colonel? Why, General, I'm flattered. Don't be. I arranged your promotion to make me look good. After all, you are my creation, you know. Yes, General. Is there anything else? Call me when the assault plan for Ventress is ready for my approval. And it better be foolproof, Connors. Is that understood? Perfectly, General. Perfectly. Over a densely forested area on Cygnus III, Rebel Hovercraft search for the Down Dominion fighter. We're in Sector A-17, Beta. Are we near those coordinates radar control gave us? Coming up on that area. I'm going to need your good eyes, Beta. I can't see much through all this foliage. Keep scanning. That wreckage must be here somewhere. Radar scans operational. Colonel, I may have spotted something. There's a large area of broken trees to my right. Where are you exactly, McCormick? Uh, uh, 60 degrees off your port side, Colonel. Hovering about 100 meters off the ground. Get Beta over here for a look-see. Roger, we'll be right there. What do you think, Beta? Spot anything yet? Yes. There. I'm zooming in now. Positive ID. Dominion protojet. Badly damaged. Do a med scan, Beta. Definite life form. Human. Vital signs extremely weak. But I think we're in time. Can you put us down here? With all these trees, there's not much room, but I can do it. McCormick, lock your controls into auto-assist mode 2. I'm taking over. Roger, Beta. Auto-assist mode 2 and locked. A bit tricky bringing two of these down at once, but here goes. Nice work, Beta. I'd say satisfactory. Okay, McCormick, let's get out and see what we've got. Laser pistols on stun. On my way, Colonel. his fighter tore through those trees. Imagine, someone's alive in there. I'm surprised it didn't explode. Can you spot any movement? A little closer and I could do a full med scan on the human inside. Be careful, Beta. This could still be some sort of trap. This is close enough. Beta, what does the scan indicate? Human life form. Severe concussion. Broken right leg and left arm. Fractures of the third, fourth, and fifth ribs. Possible internal hemorrhaging. He moved. Did you see that? Yes. His insignia shows he's a Dominion colonel. Should I contact Dr. Michaels back at base? Affirmative. Order a medical transport to these coordinates and tell them to hurry. I don't understand. Shot down by your own people? Why are you here, Dominion Colonel? Why? In the briefing room on board the Dominion command ship, the plan for a strategic attack on Ventress is being reviewed. The plan is quite simple, General, but very effective. With Lieutenant Lipton leading the assault on Ventress, a total of five protojets will be deployed. Lieutenant Lipton? Thank you, sir. We'll rendezvous over the planet's main water supply. Each fighter will have six half-ton canisters of the water-soluble poison cynivore on board. They'll be released into the main channel of the River Oros, disintegrating on contact. Simple, effective. There's no way it can fail, General. The water supply on Ventress will be ruined for generations. I like the plan, Colonel, but it will require pinpoint Accuracy to be completely effective. Isn't that so, Lipton? No problem, sir. After Colonel Connors outlined his plan, 
we locked onto the target area coordinates the last time we were over the planet. I'm certain we can complete the mission. Well, then the rebels are aware of our interest there. The element of surprise is lost. General, the rebel defenses on Ventress are totally inadequate. I don't believe they'll give us any trouble. You're sure about that, Connors? Because you're gambling your future on those assumptions. Remember, Colonel, you serve me well, or you cease to function completely. I assure you, General, absolutely no one knows of our plan. Major Connors is wrong. At this moment, a message from the planet Ventress is being transmitted to mission control at the Rebel base. Attention. Attention, Cygnus 3. Only time to say this once. Dominion fighter craft transmissions picked up on high energy probes during practice assault run this planet. Dominion plans to poison water supply with cyanovore. Situation desperate. Help requested. A short time later, in a hospital corridor on Cygnus 3, Dr. Adrian Michaels refuses General Zane's request to interrogate the Dominion patient about the Ventress message. I'm afraid the severity of the concussion has made him delirious and incoherent, General. He's semi-conscious and heavily sedated. It's no use, sir. Nothing he could say would make any sense. Just listen to him. Ah, uh, secret. Destroy the emerald. Oh. Just a minute or two, Dr. Michaels. We're wasting time, General. If you want this man to survive for future interrogation or exchange, you've got to let me operate. What did he say a a about a secret? Has he mentioned the planet Ventress? No, definitely not. Oh, first destroy the uh, secret emerald tree. You're right, Doctor. He's not making any sense. Orderlies, move the patient into the OR and prepare him for laser surgery and bone fusion. Let me know the minute he regains consciousness and keep an armed guard outside his recovery room at all times. Affirmative, General. But I can assure you, this one's not going anywhere for a while. I was hoping for some inside intelligence information on the Ventress assault. Well, he was, he was only partly conscious, Father, and in too much pain. Christina, your squadron is ready for launch. You and McCormick will use the captured Dominion protojets. Remember, cyanobore poison cannot be allowed into the water system on Ventress. The Dominion must be stopped. Fighters cleared for sequential launch in five seconds. Three, two, one, launch. All fighters, stay on frequency 7. Check in, McCormick. Checking in, Colonel. We're all in formation. Myself, Lieutenants Chernick, Baker, and Donaldson. Okay, let's run over this once more. Timing is everything. Beta? Intelligence reports show five Dominion fighters already on their way to Ventress. Christina and I will go in first. We'll take out the lead fighter before he gets to Ventress atmosphere. I come in on the left, and Baker takes the right. Chernick and Donaldson will cover the escape route. Remember, they're carrying deadly poison. We can't let them near the River Oros. That's the priority, gentlemen. We've still got a long way to go, Christina. But my long-range scanners show five Dominion fighters carrying heavy loads closing in on Ventress. We won't be able to intercept them in time at normal speed. All right, McCormick, you and I will use hyperspace. Baker, make sure the rest of you rendezvous at Ventress as soon as possible. Roger, Colonel. Setting coordinates. Coordinates set. Ready, hyperspace. Ready, Beta? Ready. On my mark. Three, two, one, hyperspace. Coming up on the backside of Ventress, Beta. Estimate contact with Dominion fighters in less than five seconds. Coming into sight. I've got a visual. Starting our assault run. Lead fighter neutralized. He's turned back. Colonel, we've been spotted. They're coming directly at us. Take the one on your right, McCormick. Beta, we'll target the two on the left. Target's plotted. Vector's coded. Let's go. Good job, Beta. Perfect, if I may say so myself. 
Mayday, mayday. Hit and losing power. Damage to both lasers. Dominion fighters closing. Using evasive maneuvers. Get out of here, McCormick, and that's an order. Watch it, Colonel. You can't get those Dominion fighters by yourself. I'd better before one of them gets me. You won't have to, Colonel. The cavalry has arrived. Baker, your timing's impeccable as usual. I'm right alongside you, McCormick. You heard the order. Give way to the fresh troops. With pleasure, Hotshot. These last two clowns are all ours, Colonel. Come on, let's go get them, Turnick. <laughs> I like your style, you two. McCormick and I owe you one. See you back at base. Roger. Baker out. <laughs> a most satisfying way to spend a day. Glad you enjoyed yourself, Beta. Uh, oh, goodness. Oh, my. Something's happening to me. What's the matter now? Auto sensors indicate I have a raging fever. 105 degrees, Christina. It must be Mergon fever. These are the same symptoms you had at age 12. And it was Mergon fever. I remember it. Oh. Nonsense, Beta friend. You're a robot. You can't get Mergon fever. Uh, you probably just need a new thermal shield. Trust me. Well, Mergon fever or not, there was something the matter. But you're probably right, Christina. I've adjusted my internal temperature control and... I'm feeling better already. <laughs> A bit hot under the sockets there. <laughs> Head us back to Cygnus 3, Beta. Maybe the Dominion prisoner has regained consciousness by now. I'm more than just a little curious about him. He's got a lot of questions to answer, and his answers could prove to be extremely interesting. The Secret of Dominion. Have you discovered it? And what is Emerald Tree? More clues follow in Episode 3, The New Allegiance. Dominion Homeworld is located on Vega, a planet of hot lava sulfuric geysers and deep protected caverns it reeks of the death it cultivates throughout the galaxy the leader and his powerful forces choose to headquarter in this place they are comfortable here in recent months several dramatic setbacks have plagued dominion corps command general derrick has been summoned for an explanation before the disciplinary council of the seven headed by the cruel and powerful Igra Thor. General Derek, you may sit down if you wish. Thank you, Igra Thor. I prefer to stand. I speak for the entire disciplinary council of the Seven. You have been brought here to explain your recent mission failures. What have you to say in your defense, General? I need no defense, Igra Thor. My sector has produced more conquered planets in the galaxy than any other command. You are bold, my dear, and ambitious, too. Traits the leader admires and encourages. But results are what we want, General, and your recent losses are not to be condoned. Does the Council make its position clear? I will get the leader all the results he desires. You can count on me, as you always have in the past. That's good to hear, General. But words are cheap. The leader demands immediate improvement in your sector, or your command position will be in jeopardy. Dismiss. Stephen Richards lies in a hospital bed on the rebel planet Cygnus III. His protojet was shot down on orders from Corps Command. Now the rebels want answers. Who is this Dominion Colonel? And why is he on Cygnus III? Dr. Michaels, is the patient well enough to answer some questions? The surgery was a complete success, General. But there's still the danger of concussion, so keep this interrogation short, please. If you need me, I'll be on rounds. Now, Colonel... Do you know where you are? 
Before I crashed, my readouts placed me over Cygnus III. Do you know who I am? You're probably General Aldous Zane, the rebel leader. I must say, I never thought I'd be face to face with you, sir. This is my daughter, Colonel Christina Zane. She led the recon force that located your protojet. I owe you, Colonel. Then repay me with truthful answers to our questions. Let's start with your name, Colonel. And why your protojet was pursued and shot down by your own Dominion forces. First, I have to ask a question of my own, sir. Did you have an operative named Phillips inside the Dominion? What about Phillips? He contacted me. Told me an amazing story about my parents. He sent me to an abandoned rebel base for holographic confirmation. It's not possible. Your name, young man. If it's what I think it is, hope it is. Our search is over. What search? Are you Stephen Richards, the son of the rebel scientist, Professor Robert Richards? Why, yes. But how did you know? We've been looking for you, Richards. I knew your father. Worked with him before he and your mother were killed by the Dominion. We sent Phillips to try and find you to see if you would join us in our fight. But how did you know where I was? We knew that as a boy you were raised by Dominion people. I always felt I owed it to your father to try and contact you, but the years went by in silence. We were never even certain you were alive. Then a Dominion prisoner, during routine interrogation, told us the commander in his sector was a Colonel Stephen Richards. Phillips' mission was to follow up that lead. So you sent Phillips to convince me I was fighting on the wrong side. Speaking of Phillips, where is he? Phillips is dead, Colonel. Dead. I put him in the base stockade on a trumped-up charge until I could check out his story. He was found out somehow, tortured and killed. Oh no! He was a good man. I'm sorry, General. I feel responsible for his death. Phillips knew the risks involved. General, the patient needs to rest. Uh, just one more thing, Doctor Michael. Please make it short, General. His signs are weakening. Richards, were you shot down because of what Corps Command learned from torturing Phillips? All I'm sure of is that before he fired at me, the squadron leader called me a traitor, a threat to the Dominion. I got the distinct impression my services were no longer required. Then the Dominion thinks you're dead. Well, that could be very useful to us, Father. Yes. Join us, Richards. Your father and mother would have wanted you to. Think about it, because you can never go back to the Dominion. General, your paid informant from the planet Proton is outside. Ah, the alien called Krieg. I've been expecting him. Open the door, Connors. Yes, General. Come in, Krieg. You have something for me. First, we agree on the price, General. What I know this time is worth much.、Oh, that's what I like about you, Krieg. No sentiment to get in the way of business. Very well. Fifty gold standards. Two hundred, and not a standard less. We could get the information out of you other ways, alien. I deal with you, General, not with this slimy excuse for a Dominion Colonel. Pay no attention, Connors. All right, Krieg. Two hundred gold standards. But this information had better be worth it. Yes. You know the planet Nitra. Of course. It's a repair station for rebel transports. We've tried to destroy it many times, but their defenses are seemingly impregnable. Not anymore. Tomorrow, at exactly ten hundred hours, Nitra is going to experience a most unfortunate loss of power due to sabotage. Yours? Mine. The planet's defense shields will be down for about two minutes before their backup power source can be activated. Enough time to blast all those Cygnus Three transports to little specks of cosmic dust. How can you be certain this power failure will happen so conveniently, Krieg? I just know. Take it or leave it. Will you have inside help? Let's just say money speaks with an alien tongue too. Some of the proton workers on Nitra have expensive tastes, like mine. You have no taste at all, Krieg. Quiet, Connors. I'm curious, Krieg. What do you get out of this beside my two hundred gold standards? That's what I like about you, General. 
Let's just say that while those defense shields are down, the alarm on the payroll vault won't be working either. Very nice. So, both of us benefit. Now I feel I can trust your information to be correct. It's always a pleasure doing business with you, Krieg. Thank you, General. Connors, this is my chance to prove to the leader and to the Consul of the Seven that my sector is still the strongest link in Corps Command. Yes, the assault on Nitro will destroy every Cygnus III transport there. Then we'll follow up with an all-out attack on the Rebel Command Center. We'll crush the Rebel forces on Cygnus III once and for all. 900 hours on Cygnus III. The Rebels anxiously await the decision of Stephen Richards. His knowledge of Dominion plans, strategy, weapons, and defenses would be invaluable to them. General Zane and his daughter discuss the situation before going in to see Richards. I just wish Phillips were here to back up Richards' story. Getting shot down right into our laps on Cygnus III seems almost too convenient, Father. I know. But we do have one source of confirmation. Beta, stay outside the door to Richards' room and use your sensors to find out if he's telling the truth. Remember, General, all I can do is monitor his tension levels and tell when he's not completely at ease with his answers. Well, that'll be a big help, Beta. Let's go in. Good morning, Colonel Richards. Dr. Michaels tells me you're much better today. Did you have a chance to think about joining us? That's all I've been doing, General. My head feels like it's about to explode. Colonel, are you absolutely certain that you were shot down in order to execute you for treason? Believe me, Major Connors left no doubt in my mind. The Dominion no longer trusted me. How do you feel about your parents? I still find it hard to believe they were rebels. But I don't doubt it anymore. Have you made up your mind, Richards? Yes. Thinking about Philip's death, the message from my parents, I've decided to join the rebel cause. A wise decision, Richards. You see, my parents told me they found the secret that could destroy the Dominion. Something about an emerald tree. I want to find it for them. Emerald tree? It means nothing to me. Oh, Father, excuse me for a moment. Uh, I have to check on a friend. Where's she going? What do you think, Beta? Christina, monitoring his tension levels Ooh, convinces me he's telling that the truth. The door. Oh, that's Beta. You'll meet him later, I'm sure. Ah, Christina, what does Beta say? What we all say, Father. Welcome to Cygnus Three, Colonel Richards. Pilots, our assault on Nitra will commence as soon as fighters are cleared for launch. I want every Cygnus Three transport destroyed. Synchronized digitals. Nine hundred hours exactly. Good hunting. Ready when you are, Lieutenant Lipton. Squadron is on green lights. Right, Barbo. Ready hyperspace on my mark. Program to Sector 116, the planet Nitra. Roger. And locked. Three. Two, one, mark. I have a visual on the planet Nitra. Probes continue to read full defensive shield power. There's still a couple of seconds to go before 1,000 hours. Sure hope those alien saboteurs down there haven't changed their minds. That's it, Lieutenant. Probes show no defensive shield. All power is out. We have two minutes. Fighters flank me at four, six, and eight o'clock. We're gonna take out every transport on those pads. Target area in sight. All fighters ready. Lasers, steady. Fire. Good work. The transports are vaporized. The whole area is a mass of flame. Let's get out of here before our two minutes are up. All fighters, back to the command ship. Lipton out. On Cygnus Three, General Zane notices a problem with Nitra's communication channel. Unusual. No signal from Nitra. Simmons. Yes, General. I'm getting no signal from Nitra. Check the beam strength. 
Why, it's a straight line on the scope, sir. There's nothing there. Something has happened. Calling Nitra. Nitra Control. This is General Zane. Do you copy? Still a straight line, sir. Wait. I've got something. It's coming back. And keep it online. This is Nitra. Can, can anyone read me? This is General Zane on Cygnus 3. What's happened? Power source was out. Sabotage. We're sure of it. Dominion fighter attack was timed to the second. All shields were down. Nitra, what was the exact target of the Dominion fighter? The transports on the maintenance pads, General. They're all destroyed. Are you on backup power yet? Affirmative. Defense shields are back in place. Is there anything we can do to help? Negative, General. Our security people and disaster crews are on the scene. We'll handle it. Sorry about those transport signals, three. Nitra out. Christina, you and Lieutenant McCormick get the rest of the officers together and meet me in the briefing room. I have a feeling the Dominion isn't through with this. This could be the start of an all-out assault. The mood in the briefing room on Cygnus 3 is a somber one. The loss of the transports leaves the rebels open to a devastating attack. All right, all right, everyone, let's have some order. I know I'm new here, General, but I may just have the answer to your transport problems. Let's hear it, Colonel Richards. I have a friend on the planet Opergia in the neutral Cygna Hydra system. She controls weapons, men, and ships, including transports. Her name is Duchess Bianca Azizi. Yes, she's advised us several times in the past. Advice is one thing, General, but if she wants to stay neutral, weapons would be out of the question. Well, McCormick, the Duchess and I have been friends for a long time. I saved her life once. Do you think if you asked her personally that, that she would give us the transports we need? It's worth a try, Colonel. Then we'll do it. McCormick, I want a long-distance scout ready for launch to the Cigna Hydra system by 1,200 hours today. On board the Dominion command ship, the plan for an all-out assault on Cygnus 3 is taking shape. So far, Connors, you've outlined a rather uninspired fighter assault on Cygnus 3, and I am disappointed. But the wave of fighters is just a decoy, General. When the rebels think the worst is over, out of sector for our heavy battle cruisers blast their way in. Ah, oh, that's more like it. Excellent, Connors. Unpredictable and very deadly. When Cygnus 3 is destroyed, the rebels will lose most of their ranking officers and their command center as well. They will be like a snake without a head that can no longer strike. A lovely thought. When will the attack take place, Colonel? Battle cruisers need time to get into position, but we should be ready within 24 hours. You have my approval, Colonel Connors. I await the results with eager anticipation. But even as Connors speaks, a rebel scout is on its way to the Cigna Hydra system to seek help from the Duchess Azizi. I don't believe we've officially met Colonel Richards. I'm Beta, Christina's protector robot. Nice to have you on board. Well, nice to meet you, Beta. A protector robot, Colonel Zane? One of the best. Beta, how much further to the Cigna Hydra system? We're almost there, Christina. I'm picking up a warning signal on the auto scan system. Well, Pergian command crews are coming into view, Colonel Zane. Doesn't exactly look like a welcoming committee. Are you sure you know these people, Colonel Richards? Don't worry. Activate the communication channel. Operational. This is Colonel Stephen Richards to Opergian Cruiser. This is Opergian Command. You are violating neutral space. Bring your craft alongside immediately. That warning shot was to convince you we mean what we say. Bring your craft alongside. Request contact with the Duchess Azizi. This is Colonel Stephen Richards. Stephen Richards? Is that really you? Cease fire, men. What are you doing in a rebel scout? It's a long story, Bianca, but I think you'll like it. Request permission to come aboard. Permission granted. See you in my quarters, Stephen. Out. Rebel craft, you 
Liverpool Dock on level 3, Bay 4. So, Stephen Richards had rebel parents. I like it, but I still find it hard to believe. The story is true, Bianca. All of it. I told General Zane I'd come here to ask for your help. I understand, Stephen, but I must be very careful. I cannot expose my people to unnecessary risk. Supplying weapons to rebels is very dangerous. What about heavy transports? We'd only use them if we absolutely had to. Bianca, I don't want to pressure you. Stephen, but... you're here to pressure me. All right. I'll give you four unarmed automated transports. Even this is dangerous for us. I don't know how to thank you, Bianca. It's not necessary. What you are doing is right. Good luck to all of you. Nearly 24 hours have passed since Major Connors drew up the attack plan for Cygnus III. On board the Dominion command ship, General Derrick watches final preparations. I've waited a long time for this moment. And it's every bit as sweet as I imagined. Punch up visual scan of Cygnus III. Online, General. Our fighters are maneuvering into final positions for a Code 5 attack. The assault will be underway any moment now. And so, it begins. Colonel Zane, I have a visual on the Dominion lead ship. I see it, McCormick. Colonel Richards, you know more about Dominion attack formations than any of us. Take over command, and we'll back you up. But I'm not up on rebel systems yet, Colonel. Take over. That's an order. Roger. Richards to all squadrons. Lock all sensors and weapons into attack mode beta. I beg your pardon. Correction. All fighters go to attack mode 34. Keep going, Richards. I'll interpret. Sorry about that. Switching to frequency 1502, the Dominion Battle Channel. Useful bit of information, Colonel Richards. And lock on. All fighters prepare lasers for activation. We will... Sorry to spoil your party, Connors. Richards? I can't be. You're dead. I, I shot you myself. You must have done something wrong, Connors. I'm still here. Traitor, this time I'll make sure you're dead. We'll see about that, Connors. Out. All fighters ready for Dominion attack, Colonel Richards. Remember, their antimatter storage tanks should be our prime targets. Good luck. <laughs> Colonel, they're throwing their heavy battle cruisers into the action from Sector 4. We won't be able to outfire those monsters. There's only one thing that would outfire battle cruisers the transports that were destroyed on Nitra. We'll use the Opergian transports. But they're unarmed, Colonel Richards. The Dominion doesn't know that, do they? Richards to Opergian transports, start your move from behind Cygnus 3 now. Affirmative. Let's find out if they're taking the bait. Switching back to Dominion Frequency. I'm back, Connors. Ready to give up yet? Give up? Your pilots are good, Richards, but not that good. And the game has changed. Dominion battle cruisers have joined us. Very frightening. But a single armed transport could take out three battle cruisers. Oh, I agree. But all rebel transports were destroyed on Nitra. Are you absolutely sure of that? Check the horizon, Connors. You have transports. Why did you get them? Going up against those transports would be whistling in the wind, Connors. You may have won this time, traitor, but I'll be back. All Dominion attack units, break off. Return to base. Connors, up. Nice job, Colonel Richards. Congratulations. Not bad for a first effort. When Connors tries to explain all this to General Derrick, you'll be lucky if she doesn't have him deactivated and used for spare parts. Really? Colonel Richards? Watch your language. This is Colonel Zane to all rebel fighters. Let's head for home. The Secret of Dominion. Have you discovered it? 
And what is Emerald Tree? More clues follow in episode four of Spiders and Webs. The Orion Corridor is on the outer fringe of Dominion's territory. The corridor is formed by a double row of planets listed on the standard charts as the Orion system. Almost all of these planets are uncolonized. Their atmospheres harsh, hostile, barely tolerable to human life. Orion 4 is no exception. There is no permanent population here, only the hidden caves of space pirates. Renegades who plunder the space lane freely and greedily, preying on Dominion, Rebel, and neutral ships alike. Hiding out on the deserted planets, the raiders wait for an opportunity for profit. Weasel! Yo! Get me another drink! Coming up? I'm blasted bored. Orion 4 used to be right in the thick of things. Transports, gold shipments, weapons transfers. No more. Haven't had a bit of action in this lane for weeks. Relax, Spider. Our luck will change. It always does. My men are restless, Weasel, and that's not good. If they don't get action soon, they'll leave me for Strega's camp. Blast him and his luck. That payroll scout they picked off last week was rich. Well, we could chance a fake signal, boss. It's never failed to bring something down to Orion 4. <laughs> the fake distress signal. My favorite, Weasel. But it's always dangerous. It pinpoints our hideout. But that's only important if they live to tell anyone. <laughs> right. And they don't, do they? Let's set it up, Weasel. We'll see what the spider can lure into his web today. <laughs> On board her command ship, General Derrick has been called to the communications bridge to receive an urgent message. A transmission for you from Dominion Homeworld, General Derrick. Ready to receive. Go ahead, Homeworld. Greetings, General. Is there something we can do for you, Igrathor? As a matter of fact, there is. In a short time, a Dominion tanker loaded with fuel for the leader's war effort is scheduled to pass through the Orion Corridor on its way to Homeworld Command. You're requesting an armed escort for the tanker, Igrathor? Exactly. Your orders are to get the Dominion fuel through that pirate-infested corridor without incident. Is that understood, General? Perfect. I will see to it at once. And, General, no mistakes this time. Homeworld out. General, General, I think you should know... We've been monitoring a strange, unidentified signal from the Orion Corridor. What sort of signal, Colonel Connors? It is very weak and does not match any code or message that we know. Could it possibly jeopardize the tanker escort mission? I don't think so, General. But we'll keep monitoring it as we get closer to the Orion planets. It's probably just a satellite malfunction. Well, you have the assignment. I expect you to handle it personally. Yes, General. I'll see to the launch at once. And Connors, remember what Igrathor said. There will be no mistakes. The same distress signal is also being picked up at Mission Control on Cygnus 3. General Zane and his officers are trying to lock on to the exact origin of the signal. Any change, Christina? No, Father. We've been monitoring the signal here at Mission Control. It's still very weak and breaks up continuously. Beta, can you make anything more out of it? My readouts confirm Mission Control's findings. A repeater signal, no verifiable code, origination planet unknown, but definitely in the Orion Corridor. Colonel Richards, when you were with the Dominion, 
Did you do recon as far out as the Orion planets? Yes, General, that was, and I'm sure still is, a Dominion patrolled corridor. But there's always been pirate activity there. That signal could mean anything. The Orion planets have atmospheres hostile to human life. If someone is trapped down there, they could need our help. Maybe we should send out a small scouting mission, Father. At least get close enough to find out where the signal's coming from. I could decode the signal at closer range. General, one of your scouts alone in the Orion Corridor is just asking for it. The pirates would have it stripped and sold before we knew it was gone. At least send an escort or two with some backup firepower. Christina, you and Richards take out a small recon squadron as soon as possible and find out where this signal is coming from. But be careful. Don't do anything else before reporting back to Mission Control. We're on our way, General. As the Rebel Scout mission closes in on the Orion system, the unidentified signal continues to grow stronger. On board Colonel Zane's craft, Beta tries to decode the signal and find its origin. Beta, what can you tell us now? We're almost over the strongest point of the signal. My readouts confirm the signal is coming from the planet Orion 4. Code's still not decipherable, I'm afraid. Beta, what information do you have on Orion 4? Star catalogs show Orion 4's atmosphere to be barely tolerable for humans, planet uncolonized, landforms consist of swamps and sinkholes, no arable soil, Temperature averaging 105 degrees Fahrenheit. Humidity constant at 100%. Not exactly a vacation paradise. Richards, you and the others stay in recon mode. Beta and I are going in for a closer scan. Uh, Colonel Zane, the general told us to report back first. I'll do that as soon as I have something to report, Colonel. But we... We're going in. Zane, out. Locking on signal origin, Christina. It seems to be coming from those cave-like structures on the surface. I've got a visual on it. Oh, what a galactic hole this place is. I've lost the signal, Christina. And, and I'm picking up three spacecraft moving in fast, unidentified, surrounding us. Take evasive maneuvers, Beta. I'm afraid it's too late for that, little lady. May as well go quietly. You're boxed solid. No vector points. Who are you? What do you want? We're here to answer a distress signal. We're here to help. How nice of you to accept our invitation. As to what I want, that depends on what you've got. Come on, Weasel. Let's see what prize the spider has suckered in this time. <laughs> Back at Mission Control, General Zane gets a report. I repeat, General... All we know is that Colonel Zane took her scout down to Orion 4 to locate and decode the signal. A few minutes after she entered the atmosphere, she disappeared from our scope completely. Did you try and contact her on Comlink? Affirmative, General. All channels have been jammed. Richards, I'm going to send McCormick's fighter group in as soon as they can launch. Stay there and try to pick up Beta's signal on frequency 13F. 13F, sir? That's correct. Beta's programmed to send whenever Christine is in trouble. If you can get close enough to zero in on it, it just might save her life. This is Colonel Connors to General Derek. This is Derek. Escort Fighter Squadron reporting in. We're about to enter the Orion Corridor, sir. We should rendezvous with the Dominion tanker at 1,200 hours, as planned. What about that signal, Colonel? Communications lost it completely. The signal is gone, General. It disappeared a short time ago. No doubt just satellite interference, as I thought. Very well, Connors. I want to know the moment you've successfully completed this escort operation. I want to pass it along to Igrathor personally. Don't fail me, dear one. Never, General. Connors, out. With Christina kidnapped by space pirates and forced down on Orion 4, Richards and McCormick organize a rescue mission. Colonel Richards, this is McCormick on your port side, along with Lieutenants Baker, Collins, and Stanwyck. What's the situation, sir? 
I've picked up beta signal on frequency 13F. It's coming from the planet's surface. Are we going in, sir? I've been thinking about Colonel Zane's chances, McCormick, and something tells me the less attention we draw, the better. Baker and I will go in alone. The rest of you wait here for further orders. Give us one hour. Roger, Colonel. But if you're not back in exactly 60 minutes, we're coming in. The general will have my hide if I let two of his colonels disappear. Sounds good to me, McCormick. Ready, Baker? I'm right behind you, Colonel. Then let's go. Head for the open area next to that marshland, Baker. And take her in easy, Lieutenant. We want to be able to get out, too. Roger. She'll go down like a feather. Don't forget the rescue gear, Baker. Roger, Colonel. Oh, it's hot enough to melt an asteroid. These marsh fighters are eating me alive. Footing's not too firm, Colonel. Watch where you step. I'll switch on 13F. Beta signal's coming from our left, Baker. Let's get moving. Now stay a few paces behind me and watch out. We can't afford to be caught. This knot is over my ankle. It's getting harder to walk. I'm... Baker! Baker, watch out! It's a sinkhole! Help me! I'm going down! Baker! Hidden in a cave on Orion 4, the prisoner Christina Zane is interrogated by the pirate leader. Well, my web has snared a rich prize. Colonel Christina Zane. You look surprised that I decoded your ID tags. Don't believe there's one in the whole galaxy I haven't broken. It's a business necessity. I hope you find the accommodations to your liking, my dear. This whole planet is disgusting, and you and your people blend right in. These ropes are too tight. I demand to be released. Ah, the little lady has some fight left in her. Good. I like that. It should be worth a great deal to the legendary General Aldezane to get you back all in one piece. What have you done with Beta? Beta? My droid, you idiot. Oh, I'm afraid your beta has been deactivated and is awaiting immediate sale. He'll bring a very good price. Boss! Yes, Weasel, what is it? Can't you see I'm busy entertaining our guests? Yes, yeah, sorry, Spider, but Kruger just came in from the space lane. He reported sighting an unarmed automated Dominion tanker trying to run the Orion Corridor. Is she full? What type of escort does she have? <laughs> She's riding slow and heavy, Spider. With just an armed escort of Dominion fighters, nothing we can't handle, boss. Weasel! This is our lucky day. A famous prisoner to ransom and a Dominion tanker. That fuel will convert into a ton of gold standards. We'll be rich! <laughs> uh, what do you want to do with the girl, Spider? Yes, that is a bit of a problem now. Using that fake distress signal has made Orion 4 too conspicuous for the time being. After we steal the tanker, we'll need to move on to a new base. We'll take her with us. I don't like having a female along in the raid, boss. It's bad luck. Marsh gas has fried your brains, weasel. Don't question my orders. Just tell the men to get their gear together. Be ready to blast off at my command. But, Spider... Do it, weasel. Do it. Meanwhile, Colonel Stephen Richards is being pulled deeper and deeper into the sinkhole on Orion 4. Hurry, Baker! This slimy muck is up to my chin! I'm going to throw this grappling line so the hook lands behind your head. Grab the rope and I'll pull you out. Ah, got it. Harder, Baker. Pull harder! Don't struggle, Colonel. You're not making this any easier. Just a few more feet. Thanks, Baker. That was close. But we've lost valuable time. Come on. We've got to find Beta and Colonel Zane. Well, will you look at that? Somebody's been collecting scrap metal and spare parts to sell. What a pile of junk. Sam, isn't that Beta, sir? Heaped up with those other droids? Yes, 
He looks okay. Turn that signal off, Baker. We'll alert every guard in the place. I hate to say it, but I think Colonel Zane's been kidnapped by raiders, sir. That's what it looks like, Baker. We've got to get Beta moving again. Oh, no. They've removed the activator core. Well, I guess that does it. Let's get him back to the ship. Well, not so fast, Colonel. I believe it's Lieutenant Baker to the rescue again. You see, each member of the squadron carries spare parts in case Beta has an emergency just like this. Oh, the General's very particular about that. Let's see, I've got an activator core somewhere. Yeah, here it is. Amazing, Baker. The General seems to think of everything. I'll just put the new core inside this slot. There. A, B, B, Beta, 1, 0, 0, 1, 10, 100, 1,000. Oh, Colonel Richards, Lieutenant Baker. I was certain my circuits would never work again. Beta, we need your sensors to find out where Colonel Zane's been taken. I'm not feeling quite normal yet, but I'll certainly try. Christina's not on Orion 4 anymore, Colonel Richards. She's not? Where have they taken her? Coordinates indicate Christina is above the planet. Above Orion 4? Well, the pirates must have evacuated for some reason, sir. That would account for no guards being around, no sign of anyone. They must have been in a big hurry to leave these droids behind. This is a valuable pile of junk metal and parts. Really, Colonel Richards? <laughs> I wasn't referring to you, Beta. What was that? Contact McCormick and see what's going on in the corridor above us. This is Baker on Orion 4. Do you read me, McCormick? McCormick here, I copy. Have you found Colonel Zane? Negative, but we did locate Beta. He tells us Colonel Zane is in your area, McCormick. What's going on up there, Lieutenant? We've got a Dominion fighter group escorting a tanker down the Orion corridor. They've been jumped by space pirates. We're out of range. Good fight, though. McCormick, Colonel Zane is on one of those raiders' ships, probably the leader's. You say they're in a dogfight for a large Dominion tanker? Affirmative, Colonel. And so far, I'd say it's Raiders 2, Dominion nothing. I think the Dominion may have just given us the answer to getting Colonel Zane back. McCormick, here's what we'll do. Bravo! Space Pirates! All units go to Code 5 Assault Sequence. Affirmative on Code 5. Scum like this will not be allowed to capture a Dominion tanker. But there's so many of them. Where did they all come from so fast? This is Barbeau. We've lost Butler. Wait. Additional fighters coming at us from 9 o'clock. But these aren't pirates, Colonel Connors. The markings indicate a rebel squadron. Rebels, here? Am I having a malfunction? I do not understand. Ian's fighter is down. The pirates plus the rebels outnumber us five to one, sir. Connors, the remaining fighters, break off the attack. We'll have to abandon the tanker. We cannot take another direct hit. Hyperspace, let's get out of range. Fire! Okay, McCormick. So far, so good. It's time for the second half of the rescue plan. This part's a bit more tricky. Form up around the tanker. Forming up is ordered. Standing by for further orders. Lieutenant Baker, you've got Beta with you. Is he able to pinpoint the location of Colonel Zane? He's working on it, Colonel. I have a lock, Colonel Richards. Sensors confirm Christina is in the lead pirate ship. Thanks, Beta. This is Colonel Stephen Richards, Rebel Forces, requesting communication with the leader of the raiding convoy. Do you read me? I don't know whether to thank you, Colonel, or blast you out of the galaxy to teach you a lesson. This is my territory, and I don't like to feel crowded. We have no wish to fight you for this tanker or anything else. Tell me what you want, Rebel. I'm losing patience. I'm proposing a trade. We have something you want... And you have someone we want back. The tanker for Colonel Christina Zane. Is it a deal? 
<laughs> Deal? Give me one good reason why I shouldn't have both. The lady and the tanker. Every rebel spacecraft you see has its Mison cannons and lasers locked onto the same target. Your Dominion tanker. One move to take us out and we'll blast firepower at it like a hundred launch towers. We will do it. Count on it. You're bluffing, rebel. You wouldn't risk an explosion in space so close to your own people. If you're sure this is a bluff, then call it. But if you've guessed wrong, pirate, your profit will be space ash. Can you afford to waste such a valuable prize? It's up to you, Raider. You got guts, Rebel. Your precious lady is worth much. But the tanker... Ah, the tanker is worth more. I believe they call this a standoff. Do you agree, then? The tanker in exchange for Colonel Zane. All right, Rebel. Agreed. But bring one fighter alongside my ship. Transfer will be made to the port airlock. But don't try anything funny. The lady is no use to you dead. Coming alongside to dock. Docking in five seconds. Three, two, one. Locking on. Colonel Richards, Steve. I don't know how you did it, but I'm sure glad to leave that place behind. Thanks. Let's get out of here before that thief changes his mind. Richards to lead Raider. His name is Spider. Wonderful. Colonel Richards to Spider. The tanker's all yours. The rebel fighters will release it as soon as I give the command. I'll be waiting. Goodbye, my dear lady. For now. But don't be surprised if we meet again someday. You're a prize worth chasing. <laughs> Christina, are you all right? Just fine, Steve. McCormick, release the tanker. Our business is finished here. Roger. Nice to have you back, Colonel Zane. McCormick to all fighters. Break out of tanker escort formation. Regroup under Code B. Returning to Cygnus 3. Colonel Christina Zane's rescue from the space pirates will be cause for celebration on the rebel planet Cygnus 3. But for the humanoid, Colonel Connors, the lost tanker will mean yet another failure to report to General Derrick. And so, the conflict continues. The secret of Dominion. Have you discovered it? And what is Emerald Tree? More clues follow in Episode 5, A Galahad for the Dominion. Dominion, an unrelenting source of evil and oppression. Will its secret ever be found? What is the key to the Emerald Tree mystery? For now, the war goes on. Following the loss of a Dominion tanker to space pirates, once again, General Vera Derrick has been called to account by the dangerously powerful Igra Thor. General Derrick, we meet again. I do not see the reason for these repeated summons, Igra Thor. Do you not, General? It's quite simple. The leader is not pleased with your command. I am not pleased. We engage the enemy more frequently, Igrathor. So naturally our losses will be greater. An interesting analysis, my dear. However, the Council of the Seven has decided to provide support for your command. Until Sector D shows improvement. You... You expect me to share command in my sector? This decision is not open to question, General. You will obey, or you'll be tried before the Council of the Seven for insubordination. Who is this support person you refer to? You may have heard of him. His name is the Shire. The Shire? A bounty hunter? A murderer who was once imprisoned on the planet Satar? Oh, Dare you even suggest that I should take him into my command? Your sparring grows tedious, General. Vishaya will leave with you today. He will do what you have failed to do. 
Hunt down and eliminate the traitor Richards. You are to provide him with anything he needs to complete his assignment successfully. How long will this Vashaya be operating out of my command sector? You ask questions without answers. I control this game, General. Vashaya awaits you in your space shuttle. Dismissed. The rescue of General Zane's daughter from the space pirates has resulted in Stephen Richards being promoted to rebel commander. Although the rescue mission was a complete success, apparently one casualty was overlooked. Christina! Christina! I heard you were at the base hospital. Are you all right? I'm fine, Steve. It's uh, Beta here who's feeling a bit out of sorts. Uh, uh. You took a robot to the hospital for treatment? <laughs> I keep forgetting that you still don't know all of Beta's strange little quirks. You see, Beta checked himself into the hospital. Hello, Commander Richards. Beta, you do look a bit under the weather. Ever since Orion 4, I've had a dysfunction in my joints. My metal connectors are expanded and out of shape. I can barely use my grasping and walking appendages. Well, it sounds like humidity got to your mobility connectors. Exactly what I was telling him. We're on our way to robotics maintenance to get him patched up. You see, Beta thought he had a bad case of alpha influenza. But you're a robot, Beta. Some of my symptoms were just like Christina's when she had alpha influenza. The general took her to the hospital. Now, don't worry, Beta. Robotics will have you up to speed in no time. I still don't think I understand. He'll be fine, Steve. Oh, by the way, I've been thinking about something ever since you rescued me from those space pirates. Were you bluffing when you threatened to blow up that Dominion tanker? Good question. I'm glad I never had to answer it. On board a Dominion shuttlecraft, returning to her command ship, General Vera Derrick makes her feelings known to the bounty hunter, Vashaya. I want you to know from the beginning, Vashaya, I dislike you intensely. But since you're here, and there's nothing I can do about it, I'll give you the help you need to eliminate Richards. But the sooner you finish your business in my sector, the better. Might I add, the feeling is mutual. Vashaya, your tone is threatening to the general. Noted, humanoid. But it doesn't concern me. Remember, I'm here to finish a job you botched. What do you mean? When you were assigned the task of eliminating the traitor Richards, you made an almost human error. You were too sure of your sensors. You didn't even bother to check if Richards were really dead. The Dominion has no room for such errors of judgment. I'm curious, Vashaya. Just what makes Dominion Homeworld so confident that you can capture Richards? I have an edge. I know how Richards will think in strategic situations. We were in the Academy together as cadets. You were in the Dominion Academy? I've led many lives, General. Thor knows them all and makes use of them as he sees fit. It was my background with Richards at the Academy that led to this assignment. That's the personal matter. Come to the point, Vashaya. Your plan is... To use my knowledge of Richards against him. Example, he's a very soft touch when it comes to people he cares about. A definite character flaw. And you propose to exploit that flaw, Vashaya? Precisely. We'll transfer a contingent of rebel prisoners to the Outlands for execution. I'll arrange to leak this information to the rebels on Cygnus 3 before we make the transfer. Oh, Richards will try to rescue the prisoners. He won't be able to resist such a noble gesture. Richards has served aboard Dominion prison ships, Vashaya. He knows their weapon systems. He understands that any fighter attack would prove useless. You're not as dull as you look, humanoid. But an all-out attack would not be Richard's response. He'll use a small landing party and try to take over key areas on the prison ship. I'm sure of it. You seem to know your man very well. Your plan has merit, Shia. As it happens, the prison ship Zeta is orbiting above my command ship right now. 
It should prove sufficient for your needs. Connors, take over the controls. You can handle that, can't you, Major? Major? Yes, Major. Your continued bungling is responsible for the loss of my high standing with Igrithor. Someone has to pay for that, Connors. Yes, General. Take notice, bounty hunter. I repay in kind. Never forget that. Cygnus Three. two days later. Commander Richards is called to a special briefing. So, we know the Dominion is transferring by prison ship over a thousand rebel prisoners to the Outlands for execution. General, did you say by prison ship? Yes, McCormick. The prison ship Zeta. The transfer will take place within the next 15 hours. How reliable is this intelligence, Father? It came from an alien, a proton mercenary we've dealt with before. Usually his information is sound as long as he thinks he's paid enough for it. Well, what you're really telling us, General, is that the information may not be totally accurate, but you can't ignore it. Exactly, Steve. It could be a chance to save over a thousand of our people. But, General, any rescue plan will have to be executed with extreme caution. We can't rule out a Dominion trap. You're right, of course, McCormick. Steve, I want you to try something. Think the way Dominion Corps Command would for a moment. It might help us come up with a plan of action. Let's see. What strategy would Corps Command use in this situation? There was a flight training exercise from my Dominion Academy days. It involved camouflaging our fighters with meteors. Meteors, Commander? Yes. We used tractor beams to hold the meteors in position while we hid behind them. Now, that way we were able to sneak through the enemy's scanner range without getting caught. A bit unorthodox, but I don't see why it wouldn't work. Steve, how many people would you need to carry out such a plan? Oh, five. Myself, you and Veda, McCormick, and one more. All right. I'll go collect Beta from Robotics. Meet you in Launch Bay after McCormick and I recruit our fifth pilot. Uh, Lieutenant Stanwick, I think. Good choice. Remember, there's no time to lose. The lives of over a thousand of our people are at stake. 73, 74, 75 gold standards. There you are, Krieg. The balance due now that the job is completed. It was almost too easy. The rebels took the bait. Now it's up to you to spring the trap. Tell me, Krieg, how did you get the information about the prison ship transfer to Cygnus Three? That's not part of the deal, General. My methods are my own business. Unfortunately, your services are necessary, Krieg. But you are a mystery. And I don't like mystery. How do you manage to know all you know? And why are you never caught? You ask questions without answers, General. So I have been told. <laughs> Don't worry, General. You got what you paid for. You might say it was your move this time. General, Vishaya, Krieg at your service. You'll hear from us again. Ah, Connors. General, Command Control said you wanted to see me. Major, I want you to hear the final details of the plan to capture Richards. Proceed, Shire. I'll allow Richards and his landing party to come aboard the prison ship Zeta with little or no difficulty. Once on board, I'll have them trapped. There will be no escape. Very well, Vishaya. Since it's been almost 13 hours since Krieg planted the information with the rebels, it's time for you to transfer to the Zeta. If Richards is coming, he'll be arriving soon. There's a viewing console on level three of the prison ship. You can scan every section, see and hear every move they make. <laughs> Excellent. Once Richards is captured, all the praise will be mine for eliminating the most dangerous traitor the Dominion has ever known. Space, a black void, except for the flashing lights on four rebel fighters. They're on their way to the prison ship Zeta to attempt a dangerous rescue. 
We're getting close. Now, check your attitude controls, McCormick. Attitude controls stable, Commander. All right, we're about to enter the meteor field. But keep your eyes open, everybody. Those rocks move fast. Lieutenant Stanwyck to flight leader. I think I found a meteor I can handle, Commander. Well, which one, Stanwyck? Everything I see is too big for tractor beam control. Over to the left, Commander. I'm almost behind it. That meteor's too big, Christina. This tractor beam will overload. Veer off, Stanwyck, and that's an order. I can handle it, Colonel. Wait. What's happening? Red line. Overload. Malfunction in the power unit. Commander. Break off, Stanwyck. I can't. It, it's too close. It's, it's going to... McCormick. Take over Stanwick's point position. I copy, Commander. Uh, concentrate on the mission, everybody. Commander, over there. Two o'clock. Readouts confirm those meteors to be within tractor beam limits. Uh, good work, Beta. Let's tractor on and get out of here. We can't waste any more time. Invisible behind meteors of enormous size, the three spacecraft drift toward the prison ship. It's getting late, Beshire. Feeling nervous that your plan to lure Richards into this trap might not work? You'd enjoy watching me fail, wouldn't you, Connors? Just observing your methods. If you ask me, I don't think Richards is going to show. By processing available data, I predict you're going to look very foolish within the next few hours. You mechanical cretin! I've had enough of you and your general! Don't touch me! With this one hand, Connors, I could snap your control center at any time. There's something about me you don't know, humanoid. I was on Satar's prison colony for ten long years. They never tell you that Satar orbits a neutron star. A star that emits radiation. Very powerful radiation. Eventually it drives a man completely out of his mind. I must be allowed to function. I could terminate you right now. With great pleasure. Do you understand? Yes. Good. Then I'll let you function a little longer. But stay out of my way. <laughs> Radar 1 calling Vishaya. This is Vishaya. What is it? Sir... We just picked up three unusual meteors. They're traveling in a kind of formation, as you predicted. Well, what do you know? Keep tracking them. Vishaya out. <laughs> I told the general I knew how Richards would react. The Academy meteor trick. He took the bait, Connors. How should we close the trap, Vishaya? Double the guard around the prison cells. Remove all but three guards from the docking bay. I want to give Richards all the rope he needs to hang himself. Unaware of the trap Vashaya has set, the rebel assault team arrives at the prison ship Zeta. With all power shut down, they maneuver with jets of compressed gas as they zero in on their target. There's the prison ship. It's big enough to hold a city. Fighters one and three. Come in as close to me as you can. I'll connect umbilicals to both of you as soon as I attach to the prison ship. Do it as quietly as possible, Beta. Umbilical to the Zeta completed. And with no reaction from the prison ship. Good work, Beta. Commence umbilical attachments to fighters one and three. Roger, Commander. Latched and locked together. The Zeta and the three of us are now a single unit. Christina. I still think I should be coming with you. Believe me, Beta friend, following your orders and staying with the fighters is vital to the success of our mission and to my safety. Mm, all right. I understand my instructions and know what to do when I hear Christina's signal, Commander. Thanks, Beta. Now, McCormick, Christina, get into your pressure suits. We'll all rendezvous outside the Zeta docking bay. Remember to use the handholds on the umbilicals and stay close together during EVA. I copy, Colonel. Depressurizing. Okay, this is it. Here we go. Easy does it. Docking bay then ahead. Stay where you are for a moment. I'm going to swing around front and try to locate the guards. 
Can you see anyone, Steve? Negative. Oh, wait. There's one guard inside, but it looks like he's asleep. Come on, follow me in. Try to land just above the airlock, quietly. Coming in. I'm down, Commander. Colonel Zane, give me your hand. Made it. We're all here, Steve. Okay, help me with the airlock door. Not so much noise. Okay, now close it. Everyone down. The guard could see us through that spaceport. Going to equalize the pressure in here. So far, so good. Let's get out of these helmets. Commander, there are only three guards in this whole docking bay. That's odd. There should be at least a squad, if I remember correctly. We're going to have to take those guards out, Steve. Right. Phasers on disable. And don't miss. If we hit those refueling tanks, it's all over. Now, as soon as the door is clear, we move. Now, let's lock up these guards and get to the cell blocks. Hurry! <laughs> Look at them, Connors. Wandering around in total ignorance of their fate. Are the men in position? Yes, for sure. All right, Richards. Just keep coming. Only a little further. This is too easy, Commander. I'm getting a bad feeling. I agree. This has setup written all over it. How right you are, Richards. Drop your weapons. Guards, move in. Benarduzzi says, Very wise decision. Take the girl and her friend to a cell. Bring Richards to me. I've waited a long time. Time for this. So, Commander Richards, we meet again. Well, well. The Shire. You remember me. I remember you. You and your landing party were trapped so easily, Richards. You must be losing your touch. And Major Connors. This is beginning to look like a Dominion reunion. Command ship to Vishaya. This is Vishaya. General Derrick is waiting to speak to you. She says it's urgent. Put her on hold. I'll deal with you later, Richards. Guard, take him down to the cell block with the others. It's not over yet, Vishaya. Believe me, it's not over yet. Connors, follow them down. And if he makes a wrong move, don't hesitate. I to... understand. And I don't care who told you to put me on hold. Vishaya, come in at once. This is General Derrick. Yes, General. Have you captured Richards? Of course I've captured Richards. Anyone else? A girl. I believe Richards called her Christina. And a young officer of no consequence. Did you say Christina? That could be General Zane's daughter, Vishaya. What was that noise? I'm checking the screens now. That explosion just blew off the starboard side of this ship. This is Radar 1, sir. Rebel fire has disabled warp drive. We're a sitting duck, sir. I demand to know what's happening. Impossible. We're under attack. Surrounded by rebel fighters. Fish Dryer, you and Connors take the nearest escape pod and get out before it's too late. Losing that prison ship will cost you. I promise you that. Aboard the crippled prison ship Zeta, General Zane joins his victorious rebel officers. Frankly, Christina, I was worried. But when Beta signaled us, we sent in everything we had and we won. I was very concerned about you, Christina. It took so long for you to signal that you had taken over the ship. Oh, Beta friend, I appreciate your concern. It just took McCormick and me a little longer than we thought to overcome our guards. Colonel, that sprained ankle trick of yours was great. Those guards were so surprised, the rest was a cinch. It works every time. And with all power gone on the Zeta, there was no way for them to escape or retaliate. Great work, Beta. Why, thank you, Commander. But it was nothing, really. So what's next, General? After we offload our people and the Dominion prisoners, I suggest we blow this prison ship to pieces. I want to make sure it will never be used to keep anyone in chains and misery again. The rebels of Cygnus III have a victory to celebrate, but it's fleeting and temporary at best, for the Dominion never rests.
they will be back. The secret of dominion. Have you discovered it? And what is Emerald Tree? More clues follow in episode six. Diamonds in the sky. For the past several weeks, Vishaya has secretly been working on a deadly ray designed to destroy entire solar systems. He's called in an expert to make final adjustments. The expert is Dr. Michaels, the same doctor who saved Commander Richard's life on Cygnus III. Lured to the other side by promises of wealth and fame, Dr. Michaels prepares to test the deadly new weapon, the cryon beam. Dr. Michaels, I feel it necessary to remind you of the importance of the weapon you're perfecting. You have to understand something, Vishaya. For the past few years, my work has been strictly medical. It's been ages since I've worked with cryon particles or anything else. Ah, but your expertise is legendary, Doctor. However, I will be keeping a close watch on you. I made a bargain, Vishaya. Remember what happened to the last scientist on this project. I know. But there's something I don't understand. His notes say that the cryon beam was to be used to cool the atmospheres of planets too hot for colonization, not for the elimination of all life. Yes. Well, there's a military application here. I understand this device is capable of extinguishing the suns that rebel planets orbit. Am I right, Doctor? Yes, but... Vishaya, the moment those suns die... The planets will grow colder and colder until... Why, the deaths of those people living on those planets would be... I'm aware of the end result, Doctor. Now get busy and order that test beam fired. Dr. Michaels to generator control. Generator control standing by, Doctor. Transfer power from all levels to the cryon beam on the test star. Acknowledge. Ten seconds to full power. We will fire on your command. Five seconds to test firing. Three seconds. Three on insertion. Two. One. Fire. The star has been completely vaporized. Beautiful. I'd say the beam is perfected. Brilliantly done, Dr. Michaels. What have I done? You'll have to excuse me, Fashaya. I've got to have some time alone to think about all this. Don't be too long. We have several more tests to complete before we give our report to General Derrick. A report of complete success with a cryon beam. A wonderfully deadly new weapon. Unaware of Vashaya's new weapon, Commander Richards accompanies his friends to one of the recreation centers on Cygnus III, Club Trispace 17. In the dimly lit interior, a turbaned host with a twisted smile greets them. How do you like it so far, Steve? <laughs> they sure don't have places like this in the Dominion. As crowded as this is, maybe the Dominion has a good idea. Is it always like this? Oh, well, most of the time. Too many people. Too close together. Breeding places for pestilence and disease. Oh, really, Beta? Just an observation. Watch that, Blast. What did he say? Watch your step. Oh. This number. Good. This number. Thanks, buddy. Here's a little something for your trouble. Ooh, danku, danku, danku. What was that? Oh, he's one of the Tri-Space aliens, Steve. I hate to interrupt, but I must state that I am very uncomfortable in this place. Your discomfort is duly noted. Now be quiet, Beta. Tri-Spacers run all these clubs, Commander. Excellent managers, even if they are a little difficult to understand. 
I shouldn't even be here. Oh, you can't work all the time, Steve. When you're not flying missions, you and Beta are trying to trace references to the Lost Emerald Tree Project. So far, I'm afraid we've uncovered very little. And all that data search is most taxing on my modulating converters. The Colonel's right, Commander. We all need a little time off now and then. Order, order. I am your service droid. Punch up your favorite selection, please. Quite a list. Let's see. I think I'll have that. I haven't had triclon stew in years. Make it two. Why not three? Punch. Order complete to release me from this position. Thank you. Order received. Order received. Oh, look. It's Valamini. She's going to sing. A beautiful voice. Who is she? She's an Altusian freedom fighter. A famous one. Altusia. It was conquered by the Dominion over 20 years ago, wasn't it? Correct, Commander. This is their national anthem. Dominion may have conquered their homeland, but the Altusians will never give up fighting for their freedom. That goes double for the rebels on Cygnus III. Affirmative, McCormick, affirmative. On General Derrick's command ship, a secret meeting is in progress. Good morning, General Derrick. Good morning, Connors. You seem cheerful. I take it your mission was successful. Routine. A trip to the earth mines to rotate workers. I always marvel at them. Gray, listless beings without hope. You wanted to see me about something, Major? I have correlated the information you wanted about Vishaya, General. Good. What are your findings? As you know, Vishaya has been with us only a few weeks. But already he's been responsible for allowing over a thousand rebel prisoners to escape. Not to mention the loss of the Zeta itself. And just what do you suggest we do about that, Major? Bridge to General Derek. This is Derek. Vishaya on the warship Burgess is waiting to speak to you. Patch me through. Go ahead, sir. We've tested the cryon beam. A complete success. The rebels will die, General, without ever knowing the reason. Excellent. Is the beam ready to be used on Cygnus 3? We need to do one more test, General. I want to try the beam directly on a planet instead of its sun to see if the end result will be the same. Planet Caspia, I think, will be a nice guinea pig. I'll be in touch. Vishaya out. Well, Connors, I think we'll have to allow Vishaya a little more time to finish his work on this new weapon. There will be plenty of time to resume our previous discussion. But the beam will be Vishaya's success, General. Your command position will be in even more jeopardy with Igor Thor and the Council of the Seven. Don't be too sure of that, dear one. If the cryon beam is a success, I'll make certain the credit is mine. Battle stations, all personnel to battle stations, all shields, repeat, all shields to full power. Pilots to your fighters immediately. General Zane, what's happening, sir? The planet Caspia is sending out a distress signal. Hostile warships are about to enter their solar system. I understand, General. I'll have our fighters off in no time. Squadron 7, 9, and 13, ready for launch. Acknowledge. Acknowledge. This is launch control. Prepare for launch. All clear, launch control. Five seconds, mark. Three, two, ignition. The battle to save Caspia has begun. Richards, to all rebel fighters, form into attack groups. I read two warships and about ten Dominion fighters engaging the Caspian forces. But I only see three Caspian fighters. Confirm. 
Sir, only three Caspian fighters remain, Commander. Steve, concentrate your squadron's attacks on the Dominion warships. McCormick's group will help the Caspian fighters. Copy. I have the warship Burgess on my scope. Wait a minute. What is that on top? Running Dominion warships. Confirm Burgess outline, but there are new additions on top, Commander. Steve, take a look at your scope now. Dominion squadrons are breaking off. It certainly looks that way, but why? I believe I can answer that question for you, Richards. For sure. I should have known. All right, don't keep us in suspense. Why did you order your fighters to retreat? Because we won't be needing them anymore. Oh, this is perfect. I didn't realize I'd have such an attentive audience for my grand spectacle in space. Explain yourself, Vishaya. Watch the planet Caspia, Richards. Very closely. What are you going to do? Just keep watching, Richards. This is even better than I'd hoped. Ready to fire the cryon beam. Fire! Caspia just vanished. How could that have happened? Vishaya! Do you realize what you've done? You've murdered thousands of innocent people. I swear if we ever meet face to face again... If I were you, I wouldn't waste my time on thoughts of revenge, Richards. Because Sickness 3 is next. And there is no escape. Shia out. We'd better report all this to General Zane. Sickness 3 is going to have to be evacuated immediately. Commander, I just thought of something. Dr. Michaels used to work on unusual weapons projects before he became our base doctor. Maybe he can think of something to destroy this cryon beam. There is no file on the cryon beam, Commander. And Dr. Michaels left Cygnus 3 over a week ago for one of the outer systems. Too bad. He might have been a big help. Well, let's get back to Cygnus 3. If what we've just seen is any indication, it may not be there much longer. On board the Burgess, Dr. Michaels is having second thoughts. Ah, Dr. Michaels, you asked for a meeting. Vishaya, I don't want to continue working on the cryon beam. You want to leave this project? I don't have your stomach for it. Dr. Michaels, so far I've been patient with you, but don't push me. My tolerance for weakness is very low. You can't threaten me, Vishaya. Can't I? May I remind you, Doctor, that like the last scientist to work on the cryon beam, you are not indispensable. Do I make myself clear? Very clear, Rishaya. Now, Doctor, within the hour, you and I will be beaming over to General Derrick's ship to watch the destruction of Cygnus III. So don't go far. I'll be in my lab. Oh, Doctor, one final word. The cryon beam will be a success. Or you will become a memory. Yes, the beam will be a success. But at what price to me? Maybe you won't be on Cygnus 3 when I destroy it, Richard. I sincerely hope not. That would be too quick. Too easy. I want to do it my way. And if I get the chance, never doubt I'll do it, Richards. Never doubt it for a moment. Evacuation from Cygnus 3 has begun. But Stephen Richards is missing from mission control. He sits in the almost deserted Club Tri-Space 17, nursing his feelings of guilt and helplessness. Dabber for the laddie? Uh, no... I was looking for that gentleman over there. Listen, you and your people had better get out of here before it's too late. I wouldn't wait much longer. Oh, Danko, Danko. Steve! Steve, everyone's been looking for you. What are you doing here? I wanted to be by myself, Christina. I had some thinking to do about my part in all this mess. What do you mean, your part? What's happening to Cygnus 3 isn't your fault. How can you even think that it is? Christina, the Dominion knows I came here after I found out about my rebel heritage on Centiga. But they can't be sure what else I may have learned on that ice moon. That's why they tried to kill me once. 
They said I was a danger to them. You feel the Dominion has targeted Cygnus III for destruction by this cryon beam because you're here? Because they want to kill you? No, no. That's only part of it. Don't you see, Christina? If I could have figured out the secret by now, Dominion would have been destroyed. There wouldn't be any cryon beam trained on Cygnus III. Well, you can't blame yourself for that. You've done everything you could to trace the Emerald Tree Project and its secret. I know. But it hasn't been enough. Steve, we need your help at Mission Control now. Beta's waiting outside to take us back. Evacuation is underway. We can't stay here. The end of Cygnus III. But I guess there is no other way. How do you overpower a death ray? At Mission Control, the evacuation of Cygnus III is being carried out. Father, Father, Steve and I are back, and Beta is plugged into Comlink. He'll keep us up to date on the evacuation and any emergency transmissions that come in. Good. We've got every launch pad working at capacity. Hundreds of thousands of people have to get off this planet as quickly as possible. General, Christina, I think I have the answer. I think I have the answer. Beta, calm down. What is it? I picked up a transmission from inside the Dominion on that special frequency Commander Richards told us about. It says we can destroy the cryon beam. How can we do it, Beta? Slowly now, so we can follow you. The transmission tells us to spread a wall of diamond phosphate crystals across the path of the cryon beam. The wall of crystals will act as a mirror and reflect the beam, reflect it back to its source. A wall of diamond phosphate crystals. Will it work, Beta? The information for an accurate confirmation is not available, I'm sorry to report, but it is theoretically possible. General, do you realize the odds on that information being valid? Steve, why would someone inside the Dominion send us a phony message about their own super weapon? They believe the cryon beam is invincible. But how do we create a wall of diamond phosphate crystals in space? Where do we even find the material? Scanning the maps of this planet, I locate deposits of that particular mineral in a dry lake bed near the Palmar station at the equator. We transfer the material to fighters and spray a small area of space with it in a repeating pattern. I see. The freezing cold of space will make a kind of wall. How long do we have? Sector Recon reports no Dominion activity in our area yet. We may have the time to make our wall before they arrive. It's worth a try. We'll be gambling everything on this, General. What if the Dominion is trying to stack the deck? Working against time, the rebels have accomplished the impossible. An almost invisible wall of shimmering crystals floats in space. Above it, three tiny rebel fighter craft hover. Okay, McCormick, increase power to your tractor beam. The wall's drifting off course. Roger, Commander. Increasing power. I sure hope this is going to work. Wait a minute. Did you hear that? Scope indicates several warships coming into range, including one with that same strange outline. Yes, Commander. The outline fits Dominion warship Burgess. Christina, climb upstairs and give us cover. We'll position the wall between the cryon beam and Cygnus III. Copy. Sane out. Chromic, are you ready? Anytime you say, Commander. Okay, lock tractor beam on nine. Advance power slowly. We can't afford to lose it. Keep advancing power. And the wall moves. The fighters maneuver it into position. The last hope for Cygnus III. Observation Deck 5, General Derrick's command ship. General Derrick, this is the bridge, sir. We're picking up three rebel fighters on an intercept course. Stand by for further orders. Obviously a suicide squad, General. Bridge, Mrs. Vashaya, tell the people on the Burgess to disregard the fighters. They'll never arrive in time. Yes, sir. Bridge out. This is quite a moment for me. Stand aside, Dr. Michaels. 
the cryon beam will fire on my command. Three, two, one, fire! General, the beam, it's not reaching Cygnus 3. Those fighters, they're supporting something. It's, it's a kind of wall. And the wall reflects the beam. Get someone to turn that beam off. Sorry, General, it's too late. They're dead. That's impossible. But true, General. Every person aboard the Burgess was killed the moment the reflection of the cryon beam hit. I estimate the engine should go any second now. We did it! We did it! Couldn't have done it without you, Beta. That's true, Christina. Fantastic, Commander. I'd better report in. Commander Richards to base. Cygnus 3 base. Go ahead, Commander. The mission was successful, General. Cygnus 3 is safe. On observation deck 5, there is a long moment of silence. Dr. Michaels, what went wrong out there? I don't know. Bridge to General Derek? Derek here. A regular check of the daily log shows a transmission you might be interested in, sir. Play it for us. Attention, attention, all rebel forces. I am a scientist with information on a cryon beam. The beam can be destroyed. Repeat, can be destroyed with a wall of diamond phosphate crystals. I don't like what I'm hearing, Michaels. That's Dr. Michaels' voice. Vice Brent confirms your observation. Quiet, humanoid. Oh, good. Act on this information immediately. My only regret is that I didn't send my name along with that transmission. You've just signed your own death warrant, Dr. Michaels. Guard, get him out of my sight. I'm going to take care of you personally, Michaels. You'll pay for this, Bashaya. The entire incident is a failure. A failure. Richards. You've won this time. But remember, all those who crossed me in the past have died, and none pleasantly. When we meet again, you'll wish you'd never been born. The Secret of Dominion. Have you discovered it? And what is Emerald Tree? More clues follow in Episode 7, Space Rats. A Dominion battlecruiser hides in the blackness of space. Its orbit is circular, miles above the planet Earth. In General Derrick's personal quarters, Major Connors displays a small, furry animal inside a special cage. Ugly. Incredibly ugly. Yes, I know. Look closely. Don't worry. The plasmacine cage is very safe. Oh, the little red eyes are hideous. They shine in the dark, General. What is this creature called, Connors? Rattus spadium. A mutated form of rat, able to survive in almost any environment. Space rat is the common name. He looks too small to be so dangerous. Ten centimeters of carnivorous fury. It lives to eat, General. Notice the enlarged head and the teeth, little daggers of ivory. I'll drop a bit of food into the cage. Vicious little animal, isn't it? Imagine an army of these creatures loose on Cygnus Three, eating their fill. I am imagining it. I like it. If I were to place a pair of space rats on the rubble planet, within six hours their reproductive cycles would result in thousands of these creatures. Precisely what do they eat, Major? Anything, General. It's the key to their survival. Fascinating. Let me know when you are ready to begin the operation. Oh, you have pleased me, Connors. Thank you, General. These little creatures will perform 
perfectly, and the rebels will vanish from Cygnus Three. Deep in a hole carved out of the rocky, wind-swept rebel planet Cartone, General Zane explains the installation of a large metal tank. And so, we install these insulated water tanks in underground locations. Then we cover the hole with plastone, formed in camouflage to blend with the surroundings. Great idea, General. We gain water without the enemy even being aware of it. Not only water, Steve. We're building complete military structures down here too. Watch out, General. The tank. They're lowering it in. A water source here will open up the entire southern polar hemisphere of Cartone for strategic operations. And since this is the dark side of the planet, it'll be completely hidden from Dominion reconnaissance. And that's going to be very important, Steve, because someday we hope Cartone will be the launch site for an all-out attack against the Dominion. Christina, Christina, we'd better get back to Cygnus Three. You and the commander have planetary defense duty tomorrow morning. All right, Beta. Are you ready to go, Steve? I'm ready, Christina. Well, thanks for the inspection tour, General. See you both back on Cygnus Three. The Shire receives a visitor on board Dominion's command ship. Major Connors reporting as ordered, sir. Ah, uh, yes. I just wanted to inform you, Connors, that I know about your matched pair of ratospatium, carefully separated in plasmacine cages. I also know that you intend to set them free on Cygnus Three. But I told no one except... I've never trusted you, Connors. So last week, I had a small transmitter planted in your arm socket while you were in humanoid sleep mode. Transmitter? Arm socket? You had no right... I overheard your conversations with the general. No matter. I want you to go ahead with your plan. You do? Of course. With one difference. If it's successful, you'll share the glory with me, Connors, if you value your ability to function. Do we understand each other, humanoid? Perfectly, Bashaya. Good. Now get moving. I want those space rats on Cygnus Three immediately. All launch personnel, clear the area. Prepare for launch. Launch control. This is Major Connors. Hold for final clearance. Launch of Protojet Thirteen in hold condition. Hold condition. Major Connors calling General Derek. Derek here. A final check on arrangements, General. My descent to Cygnus Three will begin at sixteen hundred hours, just after dark on the Rebel planet. The diversion is planned to coincide with your descent, as you requested. There should be no problem planting the animals near a base outpost. The confusion of the attack. Will provide cover for my landing. I will be supervising the attack myself. The rest is up to you. Derek, out. Launch control. This is Major Connors. Proceed with launch. All alert for launch of Protojet 13. Five seconds to launch. Three, two, one, launch. Quiet, my friends. Quiet. I know you're hungry. But you won't be hungry for long. Cygnus Three, minutes away from 1600 hours. Richards, Christina, and Beta enter mission control. Taking Christina by the arm, they lead her to a door marked "Command Personnel Only." This way, Christina. There's something you need to see before we go on duty. Affirmative. The commander is right. You must see. Beta, you're giggling. <laughs> Affirmative. I can't wait. You're behaving very strangely, both of you. Right through this door. <laughs> Surprise! Happy birthday, Christina. But how did you know? Never it... mind. Beta has something special for you. Now, go ahead, Beta. <clears throat> Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you! Happy birthday, dear Christina! Happy birthday to you! What's happening? We're under attack! Take cover! Take cover, everyone! Beta, where are you going? Christina, this way! This way!
As the diversionary attack begins on Cygnus III, Major Connors moves in to carry out his devious plan. There are the explosions. Time to begin my descent. 4,000 meters. Three. All lights off. Must find a place to land. Here, I think. The trees will shield me from prying eyes. And there's an outpost a short distance away. Couldn't be better. 50 meters. Soft landing. Come, my friends. Food is waiting. I'll use the trees and the darkness to reach the outpost building. Set the auto-releases on the cages. Soon you will be free, my pretties. And I will be on my way. Now, back to the protojet. Carefully, I must not be observed. Halt! Who goes there? Keep your hands where I can see them. Well, a Dominion Major. Quite a surprise. Yes, I'm as surprised as you are. Turn around. Move it. Welcome to Outpost 19, Major. Inside. And don't try anything funny. I'm going to do a weapon search. Don't even twitch. Into the cell. Go on. You're a strange one. No weapons, no papers. Just the name Connors on your jacket patch. This is Sergeant Benton at Outpost 19, calling Command Control. Command Control, what have you got, Benton? I'm holding a prisoner here, Lieutenant. A Dominion Major named Connors. Good work, Sergeant. I'll be there in five minutes. And keep a watch. There could be more. Out. Gonna leave you here in the cell, Connors. But I'll be right outside that door, with a laser pistol in my hand. Got it? Yes. You fool, thinking I would be unprepared for capture. Inside my thumb cavity, a vial of powerful acid poured into the lock. Now I can get out of this cell. Inside this flap on my body cavity, a small but effective phaser. Activate thermal sensors. And aim for maximum body heat. No need to even open the door. The laser burst will go right through it. Goodbye, Sergeant. At Rebel Headquarters, Richards and Christina watch as Dominion protojets break off the attack. Their attack didn't do a great deal of damage. My Dominion background makes me suspect an ulterior motive. But what could it be? Well, I'm sure this was a diversion of some kind. A beta. Yes, Commander. Plug into the Master Communications Console. I want you to sift through all communications within the last hour to locate anything unusual. Rapid scanning of data always gives me severe sensor strain. But my personal health is of little concern when I can be of service. Beta, just do it. Immediately. Of course, Christina. Connecting. If there's anything unusual, Beta will find it. I've got it. What is it, Beta? Transmissions from Outpost 19. The first at 1800 hours, 23 minutes, involves the capture of a Dominion officer, a Major Connors. Interesting. And what's the second transmission, Beta? A short time later, the lieutenant dispatched to Outpost 19 to pick up the prisoner found him gone. And the sergeant who called in the capture was dead. Connors was here and gone. He had a reason. Wait, there's more. The sergeant had been killed by a laser shot, but the body had been half eaten by something unknown. That's it. Whatever mutilated the body is the reason Major Connors was here. He's planted something on Cygnus III. Something that could kill us all. Beta has located the Henderson reports. Reports of unusual events. 
1900 hours, outpost 19. Lieutenant Henderson reporting. When I got here, what was left of the sergeant was directly in front of the door. Uh, there were what looked like small rats chewing on the body, but they scattered when I arrived. I took the body inside. Henderson out. Oh, 100 hours. Hot post 19. Something funny out here. You know those rats I mentioned last time? Well, they've brought a whole lot of their friends to the area. I can see hundreds of them out there, staring at me with those little red eyes. What's taking you guys so long? Henderson out. Oh, 300 hours. Outpost 19. We got rats completely surrounding the outpost. There's tons of them. Maybe it's my imagination, but they look real hungry. Don't leave me here. Somebody help me. Using a terrafoil, the rebels speed across Cygnus 3, heading for Outpost 19. Get us there as quickly as possible, Beta. Uh, Dr. Close, your scientific expertise as a biologist and pathologist will be invaluable to us. I'm anxious to help in any way I can. We'll need an immediate analysis of the sergeant's wounds, Doctor. Commander Richards, you said that the man found at the outpost was severely bitten by something? Yes, and we thought you might be able to shed some light on what kind of animal might do that. We've got to know what we're up against here. Well, there's Outpost 19 up ahead. That must be Lieutenant Henderson waiting for us. I don't see any signs of anything unusual around now. Over here. Over here, Commander Richards. Hurry. It's dangerous to remain outside. Those creatures left a few minutes ago, but they might return at any second. Where's the body, Henderson? I moved it inside the post, sir. I'll stay with the terrafoil, Christina. There may be a need for quick departure. Good idea, Beta. Well, there he is. Not a very pretty sight. What do you make of it, Doctor? Hmm. Hundreds of tiny bites. And look at this. A bite that goes completely through a bone. Christina, hand me that book on animal taxonomy in my medical bag. That's the one. Thank you. I can't believe it. I certainly never thought I'd see it. But it must be. What is it, Dr. Close? A rare animal, a mutation, but one that fascinated me as a student. What kind of monster caused this, Doctor? Far from a monster, Commander, at least in size. This is a tiny creature, no more than ten centimeters in length, with very sharp teeth and strong jaws. Rattus spatium. That's what they look like, all right. Why would Connors deliver such an animal to Cygnus III? He must have set two of them loose. They reproduce very rapidly. I'm sure he intends to have them overrun the planet. And they will. They'll eat everything in their path. We've got to get out of here immediately and warn the others. Space rats, they're coming back. Christina, we're being surrounded. There are tiny red eyes all around the terrafoil. Beta, move next to the outpost door. We're coming out. Roger, out. Christina, Henderson. Put your phasers on kill. We'll blast a path to the terrafoil. Ready? Go! Run, Christina! Look out! The door, Beta! Quickly now! Everybody inside! Ah! My foot! One of them got me! Everybody's in, Commander! There's one on the door! Beta, get us out of here! Quickly! On the command ship, General Derrick lifts her glass in a toast. To Major Connors, may the planet Cygnus III be overrun with space rats eating their fill. Let us not celebrate too soon. Richards is no fool. If he can stop them, he will. Time is on our side. Already the creatures have begun to mate, and they will multiply endlessly. Relax, Vashaya. Richards is a clever, determined young man, but he has no special powers when it comes to the laws of nature. Of course, General. Perhaps I worry too much. Come, lift a glass. Let us savor the moment.
Dr. Close and Colonel Zane are above Cygnus III in a hovercraft, collecting data and viewing the destruction caused by the exploding population of space rats. Dr. Close, look at that. The space rats have already eaten their way through half the forested area beyond outposts 18 and 19. Luckily, it's an area of low human population. But the plant and animal destruction is devastating. Reports from Mission Control, Christina. Nothing seems to work against the space rats so far. They've tried force fields, poisons, explosives... Do the reports indicate human death? We broadcast an emergency all-points bulletin to remain inside. Some humans were caught between destinations, Dr. Close. The death toll stands at 63. Based on the way the space rats are multiplying, I'm afraid Cygnus III will be a desert in less than four days. And then... We'll starve to death behind locked doors. Is there a solution, Dr. Close? There may be. Let's get back to Commander Richards at Outpost 19. There's something I want to try. It may be our last hope. Back on Cygnus 3, there is a flurry of activity above Outpost 19. Okay, out there. Lower the tank. Dr. Close, the system we installed in this hovercraft baffles me. What can a receiver and four loudspeakers do to rid the planet of space rats? Those speakers will broadcast four tones played by the synchrodator here on board the hovercraft. The space rats should be irresistibly drawn toward the sound. Slow the winch, men. The water tank is in position, Christina. Thank you, Beta. Bringing the hovercraft down to within a foot of the tank. Hold it steady, Beta. I'm going out on top of the tank. Careful, Commander Richards. The rats are beginning to gather. I'm going to open the tank and slide the ramp to the ground. When I do, some of these rats will come up after me. Christina, give me laser cover. Ready, Steve. There goes the door to the tank. He's sliding the ramp down. The rats are going crazy. They're coming up the ramp. Cease fire. Cease fire. I'm coming aboard. Uh, there. Way to get that hatch shut. Okay, Doctor. It's all yours. Hope I guessed correctly. Look. The rats are pouring out of the woods. Hundreds of them. Turn up the game. I think we've got them. They appear almost mesmerized by the tone. The rats are moving up the ramp. One just fell into the tank. And more and more. They're tumbling in by the tank. Wait. What's that sound? The rats are imitating the tone. That's the last of them. Christina, use your phaser to cut the cable that holds the door of the tank open. <coughs> The rats are still repeating the tones, Dr. Close, even though you've stopped the synchrodator. Yes, hearing it is eerie. It's a ritual, a death ritual. They've stopped. Soon they'll go into a frenzy. Then, their final act of life. What do you mean, Doctor? Space rats refuse to wait patiently for death, Commander. When there is no alternative food source available, they become... Cannibals. Space rats live to eat, and they die the same way. Once again, the Dominion's plan has failed. The rebels of Cygnus III have survived to continue their fight for freedom in the galaxy. Secret of Dominion. Have you discovered it? And what is Emerald Tree? More clues follow in Episode 8 Double Trouble. The alien planet Delphi, hot, burning acid rain slashes across the surface. 
Boulders wet with death litter the pockmarked face of a forgotten world. Lightning reveals a rebel shuttle on a rough landing site. Standing alongside the spacecraft, Commander Stephen Richards and General Zane are encased in full protection body shells to shield themselves from the planet's deadly rain. They're on a desperate mission seeking fuel from the hermits of Delphi. The seal on the shuttlecraft protects it from the acid rain. Same goes for us, as long as we wear these shells. Wristbands read normal, General. All set. We're heading for those orange lights up ahead. The hermits will meet us there. Why would anyone choose to live in a place like this? The hermits wanted a retreat where they wouldn't be disturbed. It looks like they got what they wanted. Watch it, Steve. Be careful. A puncture in your protective shell could, could be fatal, I know. We're almost there. Orange lights just ahead. Inside here. It's a kind of chamber. The orange lights just float. If I'm not mistaken, the designs on the walls are like temple carvings from 16th century Earth. We wait here. They will know. Ah, oh, Excellency. You will follow me. We can't follow him. He's passing right through that rock wall. Follow humans. Do as he says. We walked through that wall like it was smoke. This is my third trip here, and I still don't understand how they do it. Stand in the yellow cone of light for decontamination. We're also being cleansed of travel fatigue and given a dose of relaxant. You may remove your shells. Welcome to our world. Commander, you think me strange and physically unappealing. It is a disturbing thought pattern to me. You will suppress it. You knew what I was thinking? I forgot to mention the hermits read minds, Steve. They call it mind sharing. You have never personally seen Delphian eye stalks before? I didn't mean to offend you, Excellency. You speak the truth. Good. If you did not, you would be dead. Follow. Delphi is honeycombed with corridors like this one. These moving ramps will take us well below the surface, where the hermits live. Do they know why we're here? The fuel you seek lies at the confluence of the Delphian corridors deep inside the planet. It will be freely given, but you must remove it at your own risk and in your own craft. These terms are not negotiable. General, look at the amount of fuel stored here. There are 3,000 cores of xanthronite fuel in each container, Steve. Well, there must be hundreds. The number you seek is 2,004. Enough xanthronite for a hundred of your years. But how do we get it out of these twisting corridors, General? A shuttlecraft would be capable of carrying the weight, but, but our pilots would most likely die trying to get the fuel out. Unless... Unless what, Jim? Devon, Excellency, there's one Delphian among you who could help us. One who has moved among men and aliens alike. Your kinship with the other and his death to you are known to me, human, but he hides from the world now. Devon. With your permission, I would like to speak with the other. Very well. I will communicate your desires to him. Wait here. General, who is this other? Ever heard of the alien shuttle specialist, Lucan? Who hasn't? He had incredible skill. An absolute magician in space. Lucan is unique. A Delphian who chose not to live the hermit existence. I remember now. Elysia. Yes, Lucan and Elysia. Their mind link was so powerful he gave up his Delphian life to share hers. Greetings, friend Zane. It has been many of your time units since we last met. Greetings, Lucan. I grieve with you for the passing over of the spirit of Elysia. Delphian mind sharing has eased the pain somewhat. But the loss is great, even when shared with the collective consciousness. 
I apologize for intruding at this time, but... Lucan, without Delphian fuel, we don't stand a chance against the Dominion. And only you can teach us how to get our shuttles in and out of these corridors. To do that, I would have to go back into your world. You ask much. Lucan, you know our enemy. Your help is vital. Friend Zane, you rescued my beloved Elysia from a Dominion raiding party once, long ago. For that reason, I will do what you now ask. How soon could you be ready to leave? I have been many time units away from the controls of a shuttlecraft, but the asteroid belt in the RK sector should sharpen my timing quickly. I will meet you on Cygnus 3 in one of your days. Until then... Let's get back to base, Commander. Our whole future may ride on this. Good morning, Vashaya. Who is this? Major Connors, meet Lucan. Lucan, the alien shuttle specialist? How did he get here? I captured him, you idiot. Do you think he walked in here and begged to have his vocal cord severed? You severed him? He called me a lunatic. Me! Besides, his Delphian voice grated on my nerves. But he could have given us valuable information. How dare you question my methods, you simple-minded collection of spare parts? What's this? What's going on here? Who is this Delphian? That, my dear General, is the famous Lucan. Oh, I'm impressed, Connors. How did you capture him? I... The humanoid had nothing to do with it. I captured him. He was near my home in the R.K. sector when I spotted him. You live in an asteroid belt? Of course, General. A place both dangerous and strangely quiet. Do you find that unusual? I don't find it unusual, considering the condition of your mind. I warn you, Connors. A toy like you can be broken. Leave him alone, Vashaya. Tell me about the Delphian. I intercepted Lucan's spacecraft and forced him down on a small asteroid. Well, what information did you get out of him? None, General. Lucan can't tell us a thing. Vishaya severed his vocal cords. You did what? The important thing, General, is that I found his log showing his destination, Cygnus 3. He was to instruct rebel shuttlecraft pilots in precision maneuvers. Cygnus 3? We could have used this alien's knowledge to our advantage. Are you egotistical fool? Lokan called him a lunatic. Truth can be difficult to hear, General. This time you've gone too far! Stop it at once, Bashaya! Let me go. I must continue to function. Humanoid imbecile! Just be thankful I'm leaving you a voice. Inoperative, non functional. Not get away with this, Vashaya. Connors was mine. I command the sector, and don't you forget it. Listen to me, General. Our speechless friend's destination suggests a wonderful plan. An exchange of identities that will result Whatever in... Whatever you have in mind, Vashaya, it is your last chance to prove yourself useful. If you fail... I will not allow myself to be brought down with you. I will cut my losses. This plan is brilliant. Simply brilliant. Now, if you will excuse me, my dear General, I'll throw Lucan into a quiet cell. Then I'm going to take his place on Cygnus 3. With a little help from medical science. Inoperative, non functional. Anxious eyes search the sky above Cygnus 3. The shuttle specialist Lucan is long overdue. I can't understand it. He should have been here hours ago, McCormick. He could have been delayed by Dominion fighters, sir. They were noted in grid area 9 on our scanners. Are we ready for him, Steve? Duplication of the Delphi corridors is complete, sir. 
120 kilometers of lights, 300 meters apart, making corridors that intersect at odd angles. If Lucan can train our pilots to move through that... Clear area for spacecraft arrival. Incoming vehicle. Tunnel number one. It's Lucan. Did you see that? He's coming in upside down. Unorthodox methods can prove very effective at times. He's on final. Hovering now. Look at that roll. A 180 from a hover just before touchdown. Exactly the kind of maneuver we need. Greetings, friend Zane. Greetings, Lucan. We were becoming concerned. Welcome to Cygnus 3. An unavoidable delay, I'm afraid. Lucan, this is my daughter, Christina. Pleased to meet you, sir. We're grateful for your help. I shall do everything in my power to make this visit worthwhile. And now, Christina, could you show me to my quarters? It's been a long trip. Of course, Lucan. Right this way. Follow me. Sir, I know this sounds crazy, but does Lucan seem different to you somehow? Different? I'm sure it's just the strain of adjusting to the world again. But now that you mention it... Oh, this is ridiculous. See you at the morning briefing, Steve. I'll be there, General. Tomorrow could be the most important day of our lives. Pre-dawn on Cygnus 3, Vashaya's diabolical mind reviews his plan. Oh, 300 hours. Black as the inside of a tomb. Good. Time for me to plant the limpet mines on every shuttle I can reach. With a skill born of long practice, Vashaya moves noiselessly from building to building. But as he reaches the hangar... Paul, you there. Step into the light. Oh, Lucan, sir. Sorry to startle you, Sergeant. Just taking some spare parts out to my ship to do a few minor repairs. Yes, sir. Will you be needing any help, sir? No, but I thank you for your kindness. Your ship is docked with the Rebel Shuttle, sir. Just around that corner. Thank you, friend. That's perfect. Gullible idiot. Actually believing anyone would repair a vehicle at this hour. This must be the door. There they are. Now, all I need to do is attach a charge to as many shuttles as I can. And turn on the radioactivated detonator. The shuttles will explode on command. All right. Hold it right there, mister. And don't move. What is the meaning of this? You told me you were going to repair your ship. But you went right by it. Then I saw what you're putting on the shuttles. Explosive charges with tuners preset to a radio frequency. You would have made a very good investigator, my friend. Whoever you are, I'm taking you to security for questioning. Move it. Of course. You have the upper hand. Except for one thing. Ah, the wonderful element of surprise. Ah. What to do with the body? Oh, brilliant idea. My friend, your funeral will be spectacular. I'm going to stuff you into the thrust output of this shuttle. And tomorrow morning, when they fire up, you'll fry like a pig on a barbecue spit. <laughs> On the bridge of the Dominion command ship, General Vera Derrick has just received some very distressing news. This could put the entire Cygnus 3 operation in jeopardy. Has this unexpected development been verified? Lucan has escaped, sir. His cell is empty. Oh, I don't understand. He was thoroughly searched before he was put away. All we know is that the guard on level six is dead and Lucan has disappeared, along with one of our observation pods. Is it possible to alert Vishaya about the escape? No, sir. He ordered deep security silence, not to be broken for any reason. Then launch an automated explorer probe. I must know what happens to the Delphian. Do it. Immediately, General.
You're on your own, bounty hunter. Succeed, and the glory will be credited to my sector. Fail, and the rebels will have done my work for me. Oh, it's perfect. Oh, seven hundred hours on Cygnus Three. Twenty shuttlecraft line the launch bay tunnel. A young pilot stands alongside each ship, ready for Lucan's instruction. Greetings, Commander Richards. I trust you slept well. Very well, thank you.、Uh, Lucan, you wish to say something? Sometimes you remind me of someone else. I can't seem to. Relax, friend Richards. It will come to you. Are the men ready to begin? Everything's set. All pilots to your shuttle craft. I'd be honored if you'd accompany me in my craft, Commander. I assure you, it will be interesting. I'd like that, Lucan. I might even learn something myself. You just might. Sequential launch in five seconds. Mark three, two, one. Shuttle craft, three seconds of vertical climb and booster. Now, pay close attention, friend Richards. This is where it gets interesting. Try to move, Richard. Well, I, I can't. Paralyzing isotropic beam. I don't understand, Lucan. Lucan, just let me turn this voice coder implant off. Voice coder implant. You see, I never told you my name was Lucan. The Shire. What's the meaning of this masquerade? Look outside, Richards. Twenty shuttles in perfect formation. A pity all those pilots are about to die. You're mad. Perhaps. You're about to see a chain of explosions synchronized to every other tick of this timer. It all starts with the fifth tick, sort of a countdown to death. No! Don't do it. Do you feel? Power of this moment, Richard. Stop it! Stop it, Vishaya! It will stop itself, Richard. There. Even the quiet has a certain grandeur. Don't you agree? If I could move, but I... you can't. Oh, this is a great success for the Dominion and for me personally. Twenty rebel shuttlecraft. Oh, beautiful! I suppose it's my turn next. How unimaginative! No, Richards. You will live. Live with the knowledge that the rebels will suffer and die because you're one of them. That's part of my own personal revenge. What are you talking about? Don't you remember? Your testimony sent me to prison on Satar. Ten years of my life on a radioactive wasteland. You'll pay. Dearly for that, Satar wasn't my doing. You put yourself there. You murdered a man in cold blood, Vishaya. There had to be punishment. And now you'll know the consequences of that punishment, Richards. I've waited a long time for this chance to see you suffer, and there's nothing you can do to stop me. We'll see about that, Vishaya. Soon I'm going to destroy you and all of Dominion. I know about Emerald Tree. Emerald Tree? You're starting to rave, Richards. Enough talk. Time for you to go back to Cygnus Three. I'm turning the isotron beam off, but I remind you, I have you covered. So don't try anything heroic. Get in that ejection capsule behind you. Move. I'll be back, Bashaya. I promise you. You haven't seen the last of me. You're beginning to get on my nerves, Richards. Goodbye, rebel fool. Auto rotation to eject trajectory. Eject. In a different sector of space, 
A Dominion Automated Explorer probe discovers a tiny observation pod in orbit around a featureless moon. The Explorer's data sensors lock on, noting sector, time, and location, as well as the absence of life. Inside, a crumpled form slumps awkwardly over the control panel. The orbiting mass has become an icy casket, a final resting place for a lonely fighter who could not speak. Lucan, whose escape led only to the cold graveyard of space. Lucan, your spirit has passed over, and we mourn your loss. But a Delphian life is not taken without consequences. The Dominion will pay. The secret of Dominion. Have you discovered it? And what is Emerald Tree? More clues follow in Episode 9, Illusions. From the moment Stephen Richards learned of something called Emerald Tree and of the existence of a secret that could destroy the Dominion, he's been obsessed with the need to uncover it. What could it be, and how could it be found? This target practice may be necessary, Christina, but it's not one of my favorite things to do. Here comes your score, Steve. Thirteen out of fifteen. A point eight six 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 accuracy rating. Final target group in place. Fire five shots when ready. Oh, my concentration's off. I've got something on my mind I can't seem to shake loose. Well, finish up here and we'll go someplace and talk it out, okay? Commander, a comment if you please. Angle your right shoulder toward the target a bit more and your accuracy will increase by 13.4%. Are you sure, Beta? Affirmative, Commander. It will place you directly online. <coughs> 100% accuracy on final target group. Total cumulative score, 96.500. Next, please. Oh, that did work better. Thanks, Beta. My pleasure, Commander. Let's walk back to base for lunch, Steve. I'm starved. You can tell me what's on your mind on the way. It's my parents' last message, Christina. It haunts me. You know it might never be possible to put a definite meaning to that message. I can't accept that. My parents lost their lives trying to tell me the secret that could destroy the Dominion. I have to find it, Christina. Commander, as I recall, their message was, to destroy the Dominion, first you must destroy, and then the transmission was cut off. What could it mean? Destroy what? What could be so crucial to the Dominion system that to destroy it would mean an end to the whole thing? The key is probably in your Dominion past, Steve. But where? In what random combination of thoughts and facts? Beta, I wish I had memory banks to scan like you do. It is more convenient and efficient. If I might be permitted to observe, there are many deficiencies in the human brain. As you're forever reminding us, Beta. On the other hand, humans have some things I deeply admire. Ears, for example, wonderful parts. That's it, Beta. You're a genius. Why, thank you, Commander. But all he said was I to... think I finally know a way to get close enough to Dominion to learn the secret. It just might work. During lunch, Richards outlines his daring plan. I know I'm right, General. I've spent months trying to figure this out, and finally I think I have a plan that'll work. Sounds interesting, but extremely dangerous. However, I'm willing to listen. Christina, pass the meat enhancer, uh, the beef. And Beta... I believe I'll have a refill on the Opergian beer. Send out for Opergian beer, me. I'm not the service droid, really. I'm listening, Steve. 
Well, first a question, sir. How much do you know about Dominion Homeworld? Not nearly as much as we need to. We know it's on the planet Vega, that Igrathor appears to be in charge, and that the planet's surrounded by a deadly high-energy force field. As far as we know, no one's ever seen their leader. Precious little is known about Igrathor. And every attempt to penetrate the force field has resulted in death. Ah, Veda, thank you. Just set it down here. I've alerted the service droid if you need anything else. Have I missed anything? Quiet, Beta. General, when I was with Dominion, nothing of importance was decided without definitive orders from Vega. No questions asked. Vega? Not core command? Uh, correct. Now, if we could somehow penetrate Dominion home world, I feel sure we could learn the secret, the way to destroy this stranglehold on the galaxy. You're not suggesting a direct assault on Vega. It would be suicide. No, not an assault, sir. A way to eavesdrop on the planet's internal communications. A listening probe planted on one of the Vega moons. A space ear. An extremely bold and intriguing possibility, Commander. What exactly are you proposing, Steve? Well, the standard catalog shows that Vega has three moons. Now, one of them. Luna 1 has an atmosphere tolerable for humans. Correct, Beta? Affirmative, Commander. But the atmosphere on Luna 1 is quite thin, approaching the dead zone. Barely breathable for your life form. But breathable. Sir, a small landing party would plant a listening device on Vega. What it picks up could be monitored from our long-range scanners recently installed in the Cartoon bunkers. It's a long shot, Steve. But is there any alternative, Father? If this works, it could be a major breakthrough. The mission is within the limits of probability, General. It's high risk, no matter what the probability. Sir, if the Dominion is vulnerable, if it is hiding a fatal weakness, it'll be found by listening in on Homeworld. All right, if you're convinced the secret can only be found on Vegas, Steve, then we must try to find it. Get your landing party together. Permission to go to Luna One granted. On Dominion Home World, deep inside the caverns of Vega, a conversation between two familiar voices is in progress. You have done well, my friend. I sensed a change in tactics, but could not pinpoint the origin and plan. Transporting proton workers from Nitra to Cygnus III gave me perfect cover. Humans speak so freely. It is easy to discover their plans. They intend to come to Luna One. So be it. I will be waiting for them. Time is now a factor to be considered, sir. Yes, it will be costly to me, but it must be done. I will turn my attention toward Luna One, and away from the master plan for a time. These rebels cannot be allowed to play their game pieces out of turn. Only I decide the move. The Luna One landing party travels through the blackness of space, heading toward a small moon in the next star system. The long and perilous journey has just begun. Course plotted and locked in, Commander. Computer will course correct as needed. Estimated time to the Vega Moon, Beta? ETA, one day, three hours, 57 minutes. Well, let's put the time to good use, then. Dr. Close, as our mission scientist, what can you tell us about Luna One? Beta, scan the standard catalog for Luna's raw data, please. One of three Vega moons. Luna One is in the star system Cagulus Epsilon. It is barren, waterless, and cold. The atmosphere, a marginal mix of oxygen and nitrogen. Pressure equivalent to 18,000 feet of Earth's altitude. That's mighty thin air, Commander. Computer course correction. Zero, one, nine... Mark. Acknowledged, computer. An interesting fact. We are not the first Luna One landing party. You mean the moon is inhabited? Not exactly. Does the name Dr. Armin Brewer mean anything to anyone? Or the Brewer Expedition? Wait, uh, I came across that reference when Beta and I researched the Vega system. Um, an exploration team from Earth. Searching for possible colonization sites in the galaxy about... 40 years ago. 
Those expeditions to find settlements were common before Dominion came to power. My father was navigator for the one to Cygnus III before it was settled. Computer course correction. Zero, zero, eight. Mark. Acknowledged, computer. I don't recall seeing the findings of the Brewer expedition, though. That's the mystery, Commander. After making a verified landing on Luna 1, the entire expedition disappeared. All attempts to locate the team or its ship's log were a failure. No sign of the spacecraft or any of the crew was ever found. The Brewer expedition to Luna 1 vanished without a trace. The Rebel mission begins its landing on Luna 1. Okay, Baker, take her down in that clearing. Power to one-third. Port thrusters on auto. We're on final. Now, when we get down, Baker, you stay with the shuttle. Be ready to lift off in a hurry. Roger, Commander. Won't be too soon for me. This place gives me the creeps already, and we haven't even landed. Power hover. Steady over landing target. Fifty meters. Now, Dr. Close... We'll be relying on you and Beta for constant readings and analyses once we're on Luna 1. I'll be paying special attention to respiration rates. Remember, there's barely enough oxygen to keep us functioning at normal performance levels. Take her down, Beta. Descent countdown. Ten meters. Five. Two. One. We have contact. Power off. Give me a quick scan of the surface, Beta. Planet's atmospheric and geographic readings match the standard catalog data, Commander. Subsistence conditions for human life forms, no more. What's that noise? Commander, I'm getting unusual energy readings. Some of it could be coming from the force field around Vega, but most of it's coming directly from Luna 1. Keep monitoring, Beta. All right, everybody, let's plant that listening probe and get out of here as quickly as we can. Baker, release the descent ramp. As the landing party leaves the safety of the rebel shuttlecraft... What was that? There it is again. I'm scanning. Indications of a large mass of energy behind those rocks, coming directly for us. Try to reach the safety of those boulders. A fire as you go. Phasers on kill. What is it? Must be 12 feet tall. Look at those claws and its teeth. It's obviously some kind of mutation. Run. Run for it. Phasers don't seem to affect the thing. It just keeps coming. It... Wait. What's happening? It's gone. But where and why? We were at its mercy. Energy mass no longer readable, Commander. What was its composition, Beta? No known life form, Doctor. Just massive energy readings. Our phasers were useless against it. Why didn't it kill us? Commander, we've got to rest a moment. Respiration rates were reaching dangerous levels. We must breathe normally. It's important. Dr. Close, I feel lightheaded and nauseated. Oxygen narcosis, Christina. Don't be concerned. You're hypoxic, that's all. Commander, might I suggest we proceed to the coordinates you've chosen for planting the listening device and then get off this moon as soon as possible? Nothing about this place seems right to me. I couldn't agree more, Beta. All right, now stay alert. Follow me. Did you feel that? Yes. A seismic disturbance of some kind. Rock strata on Luna 1 is shifting. Tremendous pressure from below the surface. A rock slide, Steve, and it's heading right for us. Try to outrun it. Head for that clearing. Beta! Steve! Can't move! Something's holding me! Christina, this way! Break free! Can't! It won't let me! The rock slide! Christina! Beta, help me clear these rocks away from him! Christina, answer! 
after me. Are you all right, Christina? Carefully, watch her head. It's bleeding. Move her as little as possible. Christina, it's Steve. Can you hear me? Beta med scan quickly. It's not possible, Commander. There are absolutely no readings at all. Oh, Christina! No readings? You've got to be mistaken. Dr. Close, scan again. Pulse? Negative. Respiration? Negative. Brain waves? Negative. You mean she's dead? No, she is not dead. I would know. Not dead, Steve. But she isn't alive either. She appears to be in stasis, a suspended state of some kind. I have no other satisfactory clinical explanation. We've got to get her back to Cygnus Three. Maybe something can be done for her there. What about the listening probe, Commander? Oh, forget it. I dropped it back there somewhere. Beta, take Christina. We've got to move fast if she's to have any chance of survival. The landing party quickly returns to the shuttlecraft. But a surprise awaits them. I'm getting dizzy, Doctor, and my headaches. You've exceeded all limits for oxygen starvation long ago. I'm having the same symptoms, even hallucinating. Speaking of hallucinations, I don't understand, Commander. What do you see? Nothing. That's the problem. Unless my coordinates are off, our shuttle should be right in front of us. Can you confirm, Beta? With all that's happened. I'm a bit out of sync, Commander, but you are correct. That's where we left Lieutenant Baker and the shuttle. They vanished. Then we're trapped, trapped on Luna One. While the Rebel landing party struggles with the unknown, unexplained events have also been happening within the Dominion system. Krieg, two of Dominion's top commanders are missing. Their ships simply disappeared from our observation scopes. You were paid to find out what happened to them. I've already given my report. The facts cannot be altered. The next move is not yours to make. You've given no report, Krieg. You just said watch the scope, and your patience will be rewarded. Oh, you call that intelligence information? Why? Major Connors were here. He would know how to deal with this incompetent fool. Unfortunately for us all, your humanoid is still being refitted and reprogrammed. Never fear, General. I can handle Krieg myself. Then do it. You will tell us what we want to know, Alien. Are the Dominion commanders dead? Have they been purged by Homeworld? Is it possible to broaden our base of power and take command of their sectors too, General Derek? The missing Dominion command ships are back on the scope, both of them, exactly where they were before they disappeared, and communications back online too. I told you all would be as it was, and so I take my leave. <laughs> I don't understand. Were they really gone or not? Is it a trick for Shia? Probably just a communications malfunction. Don't waste any more valuable time on it. There's nothing in it for us. To West Creek, no one dismissed him. I believe the alien is gone, General. He seems to have slipped away, as he so often does. On the surface of Luna One, what's left of the Rebel landing party counts its losses. Let's see. Baker's missing, along with the shuttle craft. The listening probe's buried under tons of rock. And then there's Christina. We're alone, Doctor Close, except for something that's out there. This is how the Brewer expedition must have felt. What a barren place to end one's life! Wait, Commander. The energy field is receding. Readings show it's losing power rapidly. Beta's right. It's fading away. Should reach normal levels right about now. Christina, she's moving. Med scan, Beta. Hurry. Her life signs are all returning. And the head wound and body lacerations have disappeared. It's as if she were never hurt at all. A 
amazing. Uh, why is everyone staring at me? Oh, Beta, stop hopping around like that. You're giving me a headache. Besides, you look ridiculous. <laughs> now, that's the Colonel Zane we all know. I'd say she's going to be just fine. Well, what are we doing out here in the cold anyway? Why aren't we in the shuttle? Christina, the shuttle vanished. We're trapped here. <laughs> you must be losing it, Commander. The shuttle's right behind you. What? Well, I'll be... This is all totally illogical and a terrible strain on my circuits. Commander! If you could manage to tear yourselves away from the beautiful scenery here, the shuttle is standing by for immediate liftoff. Is everything all right over there? Just fine, Baker. We're on our way. Did you plant the listening probe, Steve? You destroyed it in the rock slide. Or at least, I think it was. Come on, I've had enough of this place. Let's get back to Cygnus 3. Debriefing this mission is going to be interesting. How do we know what actually did happen to us on Luna 1? Well, the mission wasn't exactly a success. Without that probe working, discovering the secret seems as far away as ever. And yet, I have the nagging feeling that we did discover something of importance while on the Vega Moon. The question is, what? In a small cave behind a pile of rock and debris, a ship's recorder transmits its log once every 12 hours, just as it has for the last 38 years. It will continue until its power source is exhausted. Captain Dwyer, final log, Brewer Expedition. I've told you everything, all dead. I am the last. I had to survive to tell the story. Horrible, unspeakable terror and power. And now you know the secret of this thing. It must be destroyed or Earth is doomed. The entire galaxy is doomed. The secret of Dominion. Have you discovered it? And what is Emerald Tree? More clues follow in Episode 10, The Search Party. Orbiting in space, a Dominion command ship shines golden in the reflection of the sun. Inside, General Derek confronts her enemy, Vashaya. You may have the ear of Igrathor, Vashaya, but I am not impressed with your performance, and I command this ship. General, you're overreacting. Just because I broke your toy, Connors. You dare refer to Major Connors as my toy? What then? A humanoid? An advanced robot at best? You behave as if he were human. You tore him apart. Yes, and I enjoyed it. Connors is my second in command. He is valued and trusted. Not is, General. Was. Major Connors is being reconstructed. Meanwhile, your actions have put my command in jeopardy once again. My actions? Your humanoid led the all-out attack on Cygnus III that failed. He turned back. He was facing four armed transports. His decision was entirely logical. I disagree, General. I reviewed the log. Perhaps you should do the same. I'll put it on the screen for you. You better have your facts right, Vishaya. This is what Connors was facing. I'll use the multiplier and add enhancements. Now, look closely at the outline of those transports. I see. He should have caught that. They're unarmed. Notice the Malcon rails? Only one planet uses them. The Apergians. The alien informant Krieg confirmed their involvement. And they call themselves neutral. They must be taught a lesson. They will be. A lesson they'll never forget. With your permission, I leave within the hour. 
Opergian homeworld will be totally annihilated. Good. Vishaya, though I dislike you intensely, I must admit, you do your job with admirable enthusiasm. There's much to be done before I... Uh, General, I... Uh, Are you in pain, Vishaya? Uh, a knife being turned inside my head. Sit down. We'll apply Q system immediately. Uh, hurry! Unbutton your shirt. The applicator must be over the heart. Uh, relief. The sharp pain inside my head is almost... Uh, it's gone. Readout confirms a physical exam required. You must contact Dr. Ariel Jodma immediately. Is she the only doctor on board? Yes. Why do you ask? Let's just say we don't get along. An examination is a most unwelcome interruption. But I suppose it must be done. Nevertheless, expect Opergian homeworld to disappear from all scanners by noon tomorrow. Good day, General. The man is an overbearing fool. I hope his head explodes. It would be a pleasure to be rid of him once and for all. On the dark side of the rocky, wind-swept planet Cartone, Commander Richards marvels at the progress of the new launch platforms that will soon be used against the Dominion. Fantastic! The struts are up, liners are in. Hey, your crew's made remarkable progress, Baton. Thank you, sir. It's such a great feeling to be pulling out ahead of the Dominion for a change. Uh, are we talking about the same thing? I forgot, sir. You just got back from Luna One. Yes. Well, what's been going on? While you were on the Vega Moon, sir, Rebel forces made tremendous advances on all fronts. Every gamble we took, every guess we made was right. And at the same time, Dominion aggression against us almost stopped. Did you say, while we were on the Vega Moon, a noticeable decrease in a Dominion show of power? Are you sure, Baton? Positive, Commander. There were almost no patrols, no attacks, hardly a blip on the scanners for a week. Interesting. I wonder. Maybe we learned more about the secret while we were on Luna 1 than we thought. Commander! Commander Richards! Urgent calmly. Can you come down, sir? Uh, right away, Sergeant. Give me a hand, Baton. It's General Zane, Commander, on full scramble. Richards here. What is it, General? Steve, we just got an urgent message from inside the Dominion. From inside the Dominion? Affirmative. It came through in old 20th century Morse code. Clear as a bell. On the same frequency we used to check Lotron tubes. Who sent it? We don't know, Steve. But the message said the Dominion is about to move against the Duchess. Their plan is to destroy the Opergian planet. Well, they must have found out about the transports, General. I've contacted the Duchess myself. She's taking the message seriously and evacuating the planet. Evacuating? Why? She's only got five hours, Steve. We owe the very existence of Cygnus III to the Opergians, General. Well, they're in this trouble because of us. I agree. The location of the Opergian ship is on your computer in sub-3. Leave immediately, Steve. You must get them out safely. Three Vagon-type Dominion cruisers thunder toward Opergian homeworld. Their mission? Total destruction of every form of life on the planet. In the lead cruiser, Dr. Ariel Jodma completes her examination. I'm afraid our tests show a few problems, Vishaya. I was aware of that when I came in here. Could you possibly elaborate on your diagnosis for me? You were exposed to ten years of neutron radiation while in prison on the planet Satar. Is that true? Quite true. Your central nervous system has been extremely resilient. Unusually so. But radiation is radiation, my dear Vishaya. And the human body is only the human body. There is a point to all this, Doctor. Yes, there is. 
your body is losing its long fight against the radiation effects. A reversal process is taking place. Will this reversal cause any severe damage to my normal functions? Quaintly put, eventually it will cause your death. Your concern is overwhelming. No doubt you've already calculated when my bodily functions will cease. The prognosis is that you have three... Years? Uh, more like three weeks. What? You heard me. Being a soldier of fortune, you should accept death quite easily, Vishaya. Only three weeks. Are you quite sure? I rarely miscalculate. But even if there is a remission, it will merely delay the inevitable. By the way... There will be side effects. What side effects? Odd feelings of heat centering about your heart. And your flesh will change, darken in color, becoming purple. Doctor, I really don't want the to hear this. heat will increase inside your veins until... But no matter. You will be unconscious by then. I would suggest you put your affairs in order, Vishaya. Thank you very much, Doctor. Your diagnosis is painfully clear. My pleasure, Vishaya. Oh, on your way out, would you tell the nurse to send in the next patient? An Opergian command ship slowly moves towards Cygnus III. Its outline reveals hundreds of spacecraft clinging like lice to its surface. They are Opergian workships crammed to capacity with refugees. Commander Stephen Richards approaches for rendezvous. Incredible sight. All those ships. Well, at least they're on their way. Let's see. Short line comlink is 23-9. The Duchess should be expecting me. Calling Opergian Command. This is Rebel Commander Stephen Richards. Violation of approach distance by intruder. Prepare to fire. Oh, not again. Duchess... This is Stephen Richards. On my command, fire. That was a warning, Stephen. Hold your present position. But, all right. All right, holding position as ordered. Because I agreed to help you and your friends, Stephen, we have been forced to evacuate our homeland, leaving everything behind. I am angry, very angry. General Zane has apologized to me and my people. But you, Stephen, have not. But there was nothing else we could have done. When the attack on Cygnus III came, we were forced to use your transports as a bluff. It was a costly bluff, Stephen. I know. And I'm sorry. Will you permit me to come aboard, Duchess? I'll try to explain what happened. Perhaps then you'll understand why. Never mind, Stephen. It's not necessary. It's just that it hurts so much. No further explanation is needed. Permission to come aboard. Use docking port number three. The bridge of the Apergian command ship is crowded. Duchess Bianca Azizi, a direct descendant of the Queen, is very much in control. Locator scanner to full. Screen nine for Cygnus three. Rebel planet up on nine. Full ahead. Full ahead, Excellency. Cygnus 3 in 12 hours, 41 minutes. This ship handles almost like a fighter, Bianca, in spite of its size. But with all those hitchhikers on the outside, Stephen, we're burning fuel at a fantastic rate. There are 17,000 people on this ship alone. If the Dominion finds us before we reach the safety of Cygnus There's 3... There's no way Vashaya could locate this ship. All personnel to battle stations... An enemy explorer probe just missed us, Excellency. A Dominion Seeker must be nearby. A Seeker? It'll launch more probes. Use the Null System to destroy the Seeker. Vectoring. All ships locked on. Two. One. Launch. You see, guidance on all ships target the Seeker, Stephen, and then launch missiles for the point where locator scans intersect. I get it. At the Null Point. Null System on ready. Countdown. If that Seeker launched more than one probe, we could be in deep trouble. Seekers are automatic. It's just luck when they locate a target. Our luck just ran out. A probe has found us. Two. One. 
that takes care of the seeker. But now the Dominion knows our location. The probe reported back automatically. Get to communication, Stephen. I'll handle things here. Your people must know. Inside Vashaya's lead war cruiser, a young officer reports. Backup scanners confirm previous readouts, sir. Human life forms are totally absent from the Opergian planet. Only small mammals and gill breathers remain. Do you stand by your report, Lieutenant Kerr? Yes, sir. I checked the scanners twice to be absolutely sure. Where can they be? Where? I can't think with this headache. Are we still going to use the Criston cannons on the planet, sir? Naturally, Lieutenant Kerr. The Opergians may have eluded us for the moment, but we can make sure they have nothing left to come home to. Comlink, sir. It's General Derrick. What can the old witch want now? Patch it. This is Vishaya, General. Vishaya, one of our seeker probes located a large ship near the outer limits of Opergian space. I thought you'd like to know. A large ship. Anything else? The report indicates the presence of over 17,000 life forms on that ship. The Apergians. We've got them. Their coordinates are on your screen, easily within range. We leave immediately. Mishaya out. Lieutenant Kerr? Yes, sir. Patch me through to the other Vagon cruisers. They're armed and ready, sir. Green lights on all the other units. And we're online, sir. Attention, Attention all units. units. This, this is Vishaya. Vishaya. We leave immediately for the coordinates on your screens. Arm Priston cannons. Full destructive force. Prepare to fire on the Opergian homeworld. Fire! As Vashaya rushes to overtake the Opergians, General Derek pays a secret visit to the robotics lab where Major Connors is being reconstructed. Welcome, exalted one. The General honors us. Show me Connors, technician. Where is he? Suddenly, General. He is being kept at zero degrees between working sessions. The chart indicates Connors is connected. He's stored in tray four. We are very pleased with our work. Reconstruction is excellent. Yes, he looks just as he did. His programming is all but complete. Do you require activation? I want to add a personal touch to his program. Certainly, but implantation must take place in the twilight state. A precondition that triggers an auto-sequence. You understand? Bring him to the twilight state now. It is always gratifying to watch them come to life, so to speak. Humanoid, class one, nameplate, Connors. Moments now, a few adjustments. Humanoid, class one, nameplate, Connors. Technician, this is a very private moment between the humanoid and myself. I make myself clear. Oh, a thousand pardons. I shall wait outside. Twilight stay. Receptors targeted for programming. Connors, can you hear me? Voice recognition. Storage activation. Good day, General Derek. Programming receptors are available. Connors, this is a primary command. Primary command accepted. Motivational implant. Vashaya is dangerous. Vashaya is dangerous. For my protection, Vashaya must die. He must be eliminated. Vashaya must be eliminated. Action command. You will arrange for Vashaya to be killed when I give the order. I'll choose the time to implement. I will arrange to have Vashaya killed at your command. Programming complete. Complete. Welcome back, my pet. 
Unaware of Connor's new instructions, Vashaya races to a rendezvous in space. Fast and brutally efficient, the Vagon cruisers are nearing the intercept point. Closing. Visual in three minutes. Prepare for retrofire. Retros to computer positive. Hold the retros, Lieutenant Kerr. I just thought of something. A straight line from a Pergian home world passing through their last reported position would end at... Cygnus 3, sir. At our speed, delaying retrofire only four-tenths of a second will place us between the Opergians and Cygnus 3. They would be unable to get past us. Affirmative, sir. We would be directly in their path. Reprogram the retrofire. Yes, sir. Plus four-tenths. Retrofire in 20 seconds. Set Criston cannons for the Opergian command ship on main scanner. Retros to computer positive. Three, two, one. Give me open channel on Comlink. Channel open, sir. This, this is Vishaya. Enemies of the Dominion must die. It's Vishaya. Dominion warships dead ahead. We're trapped. He'll destroy us all. Is the reward for treachery. All ships prepare to fire Briston cannons. Fire! What happened? I don't know. The cannons fired, but the charges never reached us. It's Devon from Delphi. Devon, what have you done? I have interfered with your world, Richard. For the moment, time has stopped, and all in the war machine wait with it. Stephen, we're moving past the Criston charges. They're frozen in space. Yes, my friend. And they shall stay frozen until your party reaches Cygnus 3. It is written, the hermits of Delphi may stop time, but there is a condition. We may not touch, may not harm, may not interfere, and you will not upset this delicate balance, Commander Richards. This act is coldly taken in direct retaliation against the Dominion for the brutal death of Lucan, our brother. Look, we're passing under the Vagon cruisers, and they can't do anything to stop us. Engineering to bridge. This is the bridge. Go ahead, engineering. There's a mystery here, Your Excellency. Suddenly, our fuel supplies have increased threefold. We have no explanation. For the brutal death of Lucan, our brother. Devon again. The fuel is to help us return to Cygnus 3. Remarkable. He's given us our lives. Engineering, full power. We're heading for Cygnus 3. And we're going to make it. Hours later... Time begins again for the Dominion. The Opergians. They've disappeared. Where are they? Where have they gone? The answer to Vishaya's question is home. Home to a new life on Cygnus 3. The Secret of Dominion. Have you discovered it? And what is Emily Tree? More clues follow in episode 11, The Plot Against the Shire. Dominion, at times a sleeping dragon, seemingly vulnerable, less alert, only to erupt with fire and destruction, crushing the rebel forces. 1900 hours on Cygnus 3. An event has already taken place that will have startling consequences. As Christina Zane opens the door to her room, she notices a familiar form on her bed. Oh! Beto, what are you doing lying on my bed? I is that an ice pack on your head? Christina... Auto-diagnostic data indicates a high-intensity filibration in my head plate. 
according to my memory banks. This is what you do when you have a headache. But it doesn't seem to be doing me any good. Now that's not too surprising, Beta. Here, scoot over. Let me sit down and get that ice pack off your head. The drop in temperature will cause your synaptic circuits to malfunction. I feel awful. Oh, Beta friend, you're a robot. Take my word for it. You can't have a headache. On the other hand, a dysfunction this strong could only be caused by one thing: acting on conflicting primary commands. You're right, Christina. I had to choose, and I did. Oh. Oh, now maybe it isn't as bad as you think. Just tell me what happened. Remember last week when we were all at the club try space seventeen? I remember. Commander Richards was talking about needing more source information if the secret that could destroy the Dominion is ever to be found.、Mm -hmm. He said the only way to get at that information was to go back to his old Dominion command ship, and then he would be able to search Philip's locker to see what、Just、was left. What I want to do? I want to go back to my old Dominion command ship. I've been thinking a lot about Philip's lately. He was aboard quite a while before he was killed. If I could get into his locker, there might be some clues in his personal effects. Just can that idea, Commander? The General would never agree to your going back inside a Dominion command ship, no matter what the reason. McCormick is right, Steve. It would be suicide, and there's no guarantee that Phillips's things haven't been destroyed, even if he did leave something behind. Order, order! I am your service droid. Punch up your favorite selection, please.、Uh, give us a couple more minutes, okay? We're not quite ready. No order. Human indecision. No order. Human indecision. Commander, the odds against successfully completing a mission such as you are suggesting would be very high. But speaking solely from the standpoint of logical deduction. Oh, stop it, Beta. There's nothing logical about this idea. Oh, you can't resist quoting statistical probabilities, can you? I realize I may do that a bit too often. Commander Phillips was an experienced intelligence operator. He wouldn't have risked notes or evidence. You're or... saying Phillips was a professional. That's exactly my point. If a pro had found out anything about the secret, he would have figured a way to keep that information safe until he could get it out. Maybe it's waiting to be discovered, and all I have to do is go there and find. I don't believe it, Beta. Beta, tell me exactly what you did. Oh, Christina, I I helped Commander Richards go back to the Dominion command ship. How could you, Beta? Your primary purpose is to protect me and all the rebels on Cygnus Three. You might have sent Steve to his death. I know, but his reasons for going were so logical. If he found the secret to destroy Dominion, all the rebels would be saved. What could I do? Oh, I see. I understand now. A classic robotic nightmare: conflicting primary commands. Oh, poor Beta. But I still can't believe you actually did it. I did it. But the course I plotted to Dominion Core Command would conceal Commander Richards from scanners most of the way. We've got to tell Father. Maybe it's not too late. Steve wouldn't disobey a direct order to abort the flight. It's too late, Christina. What do you mean? By my calculations, if all has gone according to plan, Commander Richards is already on board the Dominion Command ship. And if not? Then he's been captured, and the last thing he told me was he wouldn't allow himself to be taken alive. Aboard the Dominion command ship, in General Derrick's private quarters, a game of quadrimensional chess is being played—a game with moves made for keeps. Queen takes pawn. Check. It's time to eliminate the Shire, dear one. My plans for personal power must move forward. Your move. King takes queen. I will review the alternative methods and report my choice to you immediately. Rook to rook five. Check. I don't want to know how it will be done, just when it's over. 
Understood. King, tonight, one. Perfectly, General. I will not disappoint you. Night, tonight, six. The shy has grown unstable, irrational. You will actually be doing the Dominion a patriotic service. Rook to Bishop Three. General, might I suggest an ingenious move? If the Shire simply disappears, his untimely demise need not be associated with us in any way. Rook to Rook Eight. Check. Yes. I could report him. Missing in action, a term I've always found useful. King to Bishop to. If we're clever enough, Igrathor and the leader will have no second thoughts about the Shire's death. Then see to it. I want the Shire eliminated permanently. Rook to Bishop eight. Check and bait. It appears I'm the winner this time, my pet. Deep in the labyrinth of passageways on General Derrick's command ship, Stephen Richards makes his way down a long row of storage lockers. His heart beat loud in his own ears. Richards checks the locker nameplates reflected in the glow of his hand light. Getting close. Let's see. Bennington, Peters, Phelps, Post. No Phillips. His locker must have been cleared out. Another dead end. What's that? His heart about to explode in his chest. Richards freezes and waits for his fate to be decided. Hold it right there. Hands over your head and turn around very slowly. Do exactly as I tell you, or you're dead. The prison ship Rom, in endless orbit around a dead sun in the outlands of space. On board, Major Connors. He was expected. No one enters the Rom without prior clearance. It houses the most dangerous of Dominion's convicts. Take me to the prisoner at once, Sergeant. Yes, sir. We'll take this elevator cage. After you, sir. Prisoner ninety-one. He's a bad one, sir. You're the first visitor he's ever had, I think. Deck requested. Deck D, cell block two. Stand clear of door, please. The cage moves down. Following his new programming, Connors is about to meet with an assassin. Prisoner ninety-one, Grigory Roshin, age fifty-two, in and out of prison most of his adult life, sentenced to the Rom six years ago for a brutal murder. An attempted escape resulted in a one-year disciplinary sentence on Satar. Now serving the balance of his life term on the Rom, all parole denied. Destination reached. Deck D. Cell block two. Follow me, Major. I expect to be left alone with the prisoner, Sergeant Troy. Do you think that's wise, sir? I mean, ninety-one is one of the most violent prisoners on the Rom. I assure you, I'll be quite safe. Remain outside the cell until I signal. Whatever you say, sir. This is his cell. I'll code you in, Major. Well, well, a visitor, and if I'm not mistaken, a humanoid. I'm here because I need your talent, Roshan. Which one? I have so many. <laughs> your speed, Roshan. Your deadly accuracy, and your knowledge. Knowledge of what? Not what, Roshan. Whom? Ah, you want someone. Eliminated. Do I know him? Your cellmate on Satar, the Shire. The Shire. That sadistic maniac. He's a crazed animal. 
You've made a good choice coming to me. He is fast and smart. He won't be taken out easily. If I agree to your plan, what's in it for me? Freedom, now, today, and the promise that you will become the richest man in the galaxy. Explain. Say a freighter loaded with rich cargo enters my territory. I could alert you. I'm sure an old pirate like you would know what to do with that information. Yes, that could be very lucrative. Uh, wait a minute. Why don't you just kill him yourself, humanoid? My programming does not permit it. And it is wiser to be once removed from an event of this nature. I owe this, Shia. Eliminating him will be a pleasure. We have a deal, then? Deal. <laughs> Back on Derek's command ship, Richards has been discovered. Stand perfectly still. I'm going to turn on the light. Colonel Richards? Lipton, wait, I can explain. What are you doing here? How did you get inside? Lipton, believe me, it's not the way it looks. I was just trying wait, to... Wait, quick, get behind that partition. Someone's coming. He might recognize you. What do you mean? What's going on? No time to explain. Just do what I tell you. Lipton? Hey, Lipton, is that you? You look like you've just seen a ghost. Is everything all right? Oh, sure. Fine. I, I was just leaving. You know your phaser's in your hand. Oh, well, replaced a photon cell. I was just putting it away. Well, I'm on my way to hoist a couple. Want to join me? <laughs> you look like you could use a belt or two. <laughs> uh, I'll take a rain check, okay? I I've got watch detail in a few minutes. Well, too bad. Take it easy, Lipton. Colonel. Commander. You can come out now. He's gone. Lipton. Lipton. I don't understand this at all. You had every chance to turn me in, and you didn't. Why? What are you doing back on the command ship? I'm not sure why, but I'm going to trust you. I came here looking for Carl Phillips' personal effects. Anything he might have left behind. Anything that we could use against the Dominion. By we, you mean the rebels? It's all right. I knew Phillips. You did? And I've got something that might be useful. His personal diary. It's in code, unbroken so far. When we learned he'd been tortured and killed, we raided his locker before the Dominion could get to it. We? What's going on here, Lipton? Why would you know where to find Philip's personal diary? He was an undercover rebel spy. I knew that long before you did. You see, Phillips organized a resistance group on board, a fifth column. I'm part of it was even when you were still here. Rebel sympathizers aboard Derek's command ship? Unbelievable. After your visit to Centiga, you were supposed to be our most important recruit, Commander. Listen to me, Lipton. I've got to have that diary. Will you help me get it out? Count me in, Commander. My days here are numbered anyway. I've been a little indiscreet sabotaging missions lately. Major Connors has his suspicions, I'm afraid. Well, then come with me, Lipton. Help get the diary where it belongs. You don't need to ask twice, Commander. But we're going to need quite a diversion to get out of here in one piece. Don't worry about it. We'll take care of everything. But I'll have to hide you until the night watch. Then you'll come back with the diary. You bet. It's my ticket to freedom on Cygnus 3. Cygnus 3, Mission Control. Lieutenant McCormick reports another unexplained disappearance in space. McCormick, it's obvious you're under stress. When you get back to Cygnus 3 for debriefing, a reason for all this will be found. With all due respect, General, you weren't here. You didn't see a 36,000 kilo protojet melt into space like so much fog. What's your status now, Lieutenant? We're still in Quadrant 4, sir. We were jumped by three Dominion protojets. We've lost Lieutenant Fosterman. They got her on the first pass. And Baker's protojet is badly damaged. But we blew two of them to space dust, General. And I had the third one in my sights, ready to take him out. When he just faded away. You're sure it wasn't a move into hyperspace? No way, sir. No boosters, no afterburn, no nothing. And even crazier, my scanner showed no trace of matter. Just 
massive energy readings. All right, Lieutenant. We'll discuss it later. Bring your men back to Cygnus 3 immediately. We're on our way. McCormick out. Father? Father, is there any news about Steve? Nothing. We've been listening in on the Dominion Channel, but so far it's just the usual. I still can't believe that Steve would risk everything on an impossible mission. I'd really be angry if I weren't so worried. I know. However, we can be fairly certain he hasn't been captured. The Dominion wouldn't be able to resist parading a prize like Steve before the entire galaxy, alive or dead. On General Derrick's command ship, the greenery of a hydroponic garden exists side by side with the Dominion machinery of death and destruction. But even this oasis of peace and beauty may grow dangerous. All right, Connors, I'm here. But I won't be for long, so get to the point. I can barely breathe in this heat. Our business won't take long. Let's walk toward the waterfall. I won't be seeing you again, Vashaya. No? Has General Derrick finally decided to get rid of you? <laughs> Where are you going? I'm not going anywhere, Vashaya. It is you who's being dismissed. Who are you kidding? Not another step, Vishaya. Well, my old cellmate, Roshan. Didn't you learn anything on Satar? You were never a match for me. Stop moving. Don't come any closer. Why don't you just shoot me, Roshan? You're not still afraid of me, are you? I told you to stop moving, Vishaya. You forced me to kill you too quickly. I've got the upper hand this time. I want to see you sweat. Plead with me to spare you. Like you made me do on Sata. Never. You'll just have to keep backing away from me, Roshan, because I'm coming for you. You see, I have nothing to lose. I'm dying already. You didn't know that, did you? Did you? What, what are you talking about, Vishaya? Stay where you are. Roshan, look out behind you, the edge of the waterfall. What? No! Vishaya! So much for old cellmates. You never were smart enough to take me, Roshan. Now... I believe you and I also have a score to settle, humanoid. Wait! It wasn't me, General Derrick. All this was her idea. I was programmed, Messiah. Please! <coughs> You're attacking the wrong target. It was Bendumo. That was long overdue, Major. Uh, oh, no! Pain again, exploding inside my head. This, this heat. I've got to get out of this hydroponic cesspool before I pass out. What to do with you, Connors? You have an annoying habit of rising from the ashes. Oh, I see the perfect final resting place for father like you. I'll just drag you over here to the compost masher. In you go. Fertilizer. Useful to the end. <laughs> brilliant, Vashaya. Positively brilliant. <laughs> Red alert. Fire in the launch bay. Firefighting personnel and equipment to the bay on the double. That's it, Commander. The diversion. We'd better get out of here while they have their hands full. Ready for blast off, Lipton. All systems go. So long, Dominion. Next time I come back, I'll have the secret to destroy you and all you stand for. Three, two, one... 
Hang on, Lipton. We're going directly to hyperspace. Fire! All clear, sir. No immediate pursuit on the scope. Your resistance group is amazing, Lieutenant. General Zane is going to want to know everything about them. It could be an important tool. I'll help in any way I can, Commander. You already have, with Philip's diary. What a find. We've got to break that code. I'm convinced there's something important in there, Lipton. Maybe even a secret. The secret of Dominion. Have you discovered it? And what is Emerald Tree? More clues follow in episode 12, The Emerald Tree. Vashaya's protojet moves through Star Lane 47, half crazed from the unchecked effects of the deadly radiation sickness. His tortured mind is motivated by one thought, revenge, revenge against Stephen Richards. But time is running out. I feel like I'm boiling inside. A constant hammering in my head. Got to stay conscious a few more hours. Got to. The lone fighter heads toward a Dominion checkpoint. Sergeant Nick Perchek is the duty officer inside the control center. Suddenly, the bank of scanners in front of him lock onto a flickering dot that appears on the screens. He opens the comm link. Dominion checkpoint aid to unidentified protojet Unauthorized use of this star lane is forbidden. What is your security clearance? Repeat, you are entering a restricted area. Identify yourself immediately. This is Vishaya, you fool. Are you challenging me? Code me through on my personal authority. I, I can't do that, sir. My orders are clear. I must have your security clearance. No exceptions, sir. I have no time to play your games. You can't stop me. No one can stop me from killing Richards. No one. Sir, I'm... I'm going to have to alert Corps Command. Authorization for your pass-through of this area does not show on today's log. I don't care what you do. It won't matter anyway. I'll be gone. Nick stares at his scope. In seconds, the tiny blip has evaporated. Reaching up, he rewinds the tape and plays part of the verbal exchange between Vashaya and himself. No Fate is unpredictable, game. for Sergeant Nick Perchek is a member of the fifth column inside the Dominion and Lipton's contact because he is on duty at this distant checkpoint on this particular day. The course of the war is about to alter forever. It won't matter anyway. I'll be gone. I've got to get this information to Lipton on Cygnus 3. But I can't risk a transmission until night watch. Please, don't let it be too late. Commander Stephen Richards has been called to Cartone. Startling intelligence information has been uncovered. Nice to see you again, Commander. Oh, Sergeant Baton, I'd like you to meet Lieutenant Lipton. Pleased to meet you, sir. Nice to meet you, too, Baton. So what's this information that's so sensitive it can't be transmitted to mission control, even on full scramble? Don't ask me, Commander. I build towers, remember? The intelligence work belongs to Bunker Room 1, and my orders are to escort you there on the double. Right this way, gentlemen. By the way, Lieutenant... That fifth column group of yours was great news. Thanks, Sergeant. I hope we made a small difference every once in a while. Oh, Lipton's being too modest. They've made a big difference. They warned us of Vishaya's attack on the Opergians and of the assault on Ventress water supply a while back. Here we are, sir. Bunker room one. Uh, Baton, all I see are solid rock walls. <laughs> That's what they all say. Just pull that lever, sir. Very impressive, Sergeant. One final security check ahead, sir. The double helix area. Follow me, gentlemen. Did he say double helix? Stand on the metal plates, please. 
This is the genetic scan, isn't it? That's right, sir. You see, Lipton, each person's cellular genetic code is like a fingerprint. Only this fingerprint is tamper-proof. Index fingers on the lighted panel, please. Reading dominant and recessive genetic configuration for two subjects. Scanning complete. Welcome to Bunker Room 1. Commander Richards and Lieutenant Lipton, you may enter. Bunker Room 1, a beehive of intelligence gathering devices, listening to the secrets of a galaxy. Welcome to Carton, Commander. McCormick, how's your squadron attack training and surveillance work coming? We'll be ready when you need us, sir. Lieutenant Lipton, pleased to have you with us. Likewise, McCormick. Commander, I'll get right to the point. We've had the planet Vega under intensive surveillance. Data's been collected that, well, just doesn't make sense. Exactly what is so mysterious, Lieutenant? Take a look at this readout on the screen, sir. These are the geoseismic readings from Vega for the last 14 hours. Have these figures been verified? Commander, I can tell you that this data was also recorded at Core Command recently. I've seen it myself. Dominion home world appears to be undergoing major crust and plate shifts. Readings all the way up to factor six. Well, okay, tremors, volcanic activity. But I still don't see the mystery. I'll advance the findings. What do you make of this conclusion, sir? After seismic shifts of major consequence, the planet appears to repair itself? Impossible. A planet that repairs itself? Even more strange, Commander, the high-energy force field around Vega has been steadily diminishing. This was the level 12 hours ago recorded by our space probe. And this is the level right now. Explanation, Lipton? None, sir. I hate to say this, but there's still more, Commander. Actually, this is the real reason you were called a cartoon. Take a look. Vita scans of the planet Vega, capable of recording emissions of any life form, produce no readings at all. Nothing. What are you saying, McCormick? The life forms on that planet are not being picked up by our scanners. That can only mean one thing, Commander. They do not represent life form as we know it. General Derrick arrives at home world seeking personal vengeance. Where is everyone, Igrithor? There was no one at the landing area. Security seems to have disappeared. Your concern is noted, General. But my security measures are none of your business. Why are you here? Ordinarily, I would have made this decision myself. But since you sent for Shire to my sector, I felt I must put my case to you personally. What? What was that? Pay no attention. That's an order, General. Get to the point quickly. You have all my reports, Igrathor. You are aware that Vashaya has been incompetent, unable to produce results, and he's grown unstable, maybe going out of his mind. What is it you want? What I want, Igrathor, is permission to eliminate the bounty hunter. Igrathor, are you listening to me? Perhaps I should see the Consul of the Seven if you are too busy. Unnecessary, General. I speak for the Council and the leader. Are you all right, Igrathor? You sound different. Tired. Go! Leave me! Take your petty human vengeance any way you choose. I do not have the time. Be gone! Suddenly, the ash gray Vega planet convulses violently. Before Derek's terrified eyes, the walls around her crack and split into hundreds of fine, spidery tracings. Then they begin to disintegrate. What's happening, Igrathor? Oh, help me! Somebody help me! 
The floor under Derek buckles and shifts, tearing a gaping hole in the surface. One moment, the general balances on the edge of an inferno. Then she's gone, swallowed up forever as tons of white-hot lava explode from the core of the planet in liquid fingers of death. Without warning, something extraordinary begins to happen. The Vega world appears to heal itself, to cool, to repair the awful damage. Finally, not yet. It's too soon. More time. I must have more time. Returning to Cygnus III from Cartone, Commander Richards learns that Philip's diary has finally been decoded. I've given orders that we're not to be disturbed. I need your best thinking. Please speculate freely on the diary's contents. The secret we're looking for could be right in front of us. Beta helped with the decoding process, and he's plugged into the cryptograph ready to assist. A most fascinating code, based on cuneiform, space law, and a famous 21st century chess game. Not now, Beta. Correct me if I'm wrong, but as I see it, Philip's diary is actually two separate documents. That's correct, Commander. Part one includes the Dominion military intelligence he'd uncovered. Part two is what interests me, General. Philip seems to be searching for Dominion's essential mystery, its origin. And Emerald Tree is mentioned. The same words my parents used in the holograph. True, Steve. But there's no logical thought progression that I can follow. It's almost a code within a code. Not exactly, Christina. The human brain cannot instantly match the relationship of seemingly unrelated data. However, my higher functions have pinpointed some interesting probabilities. And were you going to share those probabilities with us, Beta? Why, certainly, Christina. To begin with, there are 42 references to a Professor Max Schumann. Didn't you know him, Father? Not very well. Odd fellow, if I remember correctly. Always talking about a utopia. 39 references to the QR-23 planet and 56 references to the Emerald Tree Project. Then there are a number of other references. To other... For five hours, the diary is probed for meaning. Two items recur, Emerald Tree Project and the name Professor Max Schumann, a former teacher on Centiga. He was a close friend of both Carl Phillips and Richard's parents. When the Dominion attacked the rebel outpost, he escaped. Opposed to war and violence in any form, he and his followers colonized the primitive planet QR-23 on the fringe of the galaxy. General, the connection is clear. Professor Max Schumann is the only person still alive who might know what my parents' Emerald Tree project was all about. I must go to QR-23 and talk with him. All right, Steve. Permission granted. But do it quickly, or it may be too late. Sixteen hundred hours on Cygnus III. After his evening meal, Richards returns to his quarters. Who's there? Hello, Richards. The Shire. I've come to kill you, Richards. And there's no way you can escape. <laughs> An urgent message for Lieutenant Lipton from inside the Dominion flashes across the vast emptiness of space in ancient Morse code. At Mission Control, the message is received and decoded. Emergency. Vishaya on way to Cygnus III to kill Commander Richards. Information received at ten hundred hours today, Dominion time. Priority red dispatch. Ten hundred hours? Communications. Contact General Zane. Tell him I'm on my way to the commander's quarters and request security backup. Behind a locked door, 
The Shia points his laser pistol at Richards. I'm going to kill you, Richards. Give it up, Vishaya. I'm dying, Richards. And you're going to die with me. You're crazy. Perhaps I am. But it's because of you, Richards. You did this to me when you sent me to Satar. And now you're going to pay. You need medical attention, Vishaya. You're barely able to stand. I've waited a long time for this moment. Nothing will stop no. What's happening? My vision clouding over. I can't see. Commander, are you in there? Open the door. Commander Richards, can you hear me? Stand back. I'm going to blast the lock. Commander, Commander Richards. It's all right, Lipton. I just need a few minutes to pull myself together. Is Vishaya... Yes. He's dead. He had me cold, Lipton. But the shots missed me when he collapsed and died. It was that close. Then it's finally over, sir. Yes. The last chapter in a long and twisted story. QR-23, a gentle, primitive planet on the rim of the galaxy. It's a forgotten place of strategic importance to neither side in the Dominion conflict. Locked in a time warp from another age, it turns slowly on its axis in a sea of stars. In a mud and straw hut facing the Sea of Ellipsis, Professor Max Schumann proposes a toast. We'll drink to my good friends, your father, your mother, and Carl Phillips. Mmm, delicious. What is it? Made from the wild grapes of the cobra vine. We do not live an entirely deprived existence, Stephen. Professor, you've read Phillips's diary? I have. What do you want to know? What was the Emerald Tree Project? Ah, Emerald Tree. A vision of paradise? or a nightmare. Can you explain, sir? On Centiga, Phillips, your parents, and I used to dine together once a week. We would sit and talk for hours about our work. Anything new on those propulsion boosters, Robert? We're making progress, Phillips. Slow, but sure. I wish our unofficial project was going as well as the boosters, Carl, dear. Max, where's the food? We're starved. Patience, patience, Patricia. Epicurean delights take time. You're not still fooling around with that energy theory, are you? You two are playing with disaster. We don't agree with you, Max. Our energy device would be a miracle worker. Wait a minute. What's all this about an energy device? Go on, Patricia. I can't stop you. Tell Carl about your emerald tree. Well, in a nutshell, Robert and I have a theory just a theory at this point. As you know, technology already exists enabling us to move matter, beaming objects from one location to another. Essentially, matter reverts to energy, then back to the identical form of matter again. With me so far? More or less. What are you getting at? Hypothesis. Why couldn't there be a machine that could reduce matter back to pure energy? Then instead of just reforming it the way it was, transform it change it make it reappear in a new or better form but where does emerald tree fit in oh that's max's name for our energy theory i used the example of the ordinary leaves of a tree being transformed into sparkling emeralds a pretty image don't you think really transformed or would the new form be just an illusion and would the transformation be permanent good questions we haven't gotten that far into the theory as yet Max, as usual, sees sinister connotations in what we're proposing. It could produce chaos. In the wrong hands, it would completely upset the natural balance. But it could do remarkable good, Max. Anyone or anything damaged or flawed could be repaired, transformed, whole and better than before. But according to whose standards? Forming matter at will from pure energy would give the operator the power of creation. The ethical questions are staggering. 
know it's a monstrous evil and I, for one, am glad the technology doesn't exist. And I wish you two would just let the whole area alone. I don't understand. I'm still confused, Professor. Emerald Tree was just an energy theory? Reforming matter out of pure energy? Then how does the Emerald Tree Project lead us to the secret my parents told me about? Like most answers, Stephen, they usually just produce more questions. I've told you all I know about your parents' work. Professor, before they were killed, my parents made the connection between their work on Emerald Tree and the secret that can destroy Dominion. Now, it's clear from his diary that Phillips was looking for the same thing before he died. Come back with me to Cygnus Three, Professor, and help the rebels find that connection. I cannot, Stephen. I can't understand your world. It frightens me. Perhaps when destruction and killing ceases, perhaps then there will be a place for someone like me. Farewell, Stephen. And God speed. For 36 hours, Richards maintains radio silence. Using hyperspace, he races past the third stellar ridge, through the Aries constellation, and finally reduces speed around the Horn of Taurus. Approaching Cygnus 3, he makes contact with Mission Control. This is Commander Richards on Special Frequency X-19. Come in, Mission Control. Do you read, Mission Control? This is General Zane. What is your situation, Steve? Well, QR-23 provided some of the answers, General, but not all. However, I'm convinced we're on the right track. Come to Mission Control as soon as you land, Steve. We're in final preparations for the Cartone assault on Vega. We must strike soon. Roger, General. On my way. Richard's out. The secret's so close. I can sense it. Almost touch it. It's all connected. The Vega findings, our experiences on Luna One, the diary, and my parents' energy theory. I'm not exactly sure how, but in some way, Dominion is the Emerald Tree. The Secret of Dominion. Have you discovered it? And what is Emerald Tree? More clues follow in episode 13, The Secret. Rebel Mission Control, the 11th hour. Final preparation for the all-out assault on Vega is underway, when suddenly, without warning, Intruder spacecraft entering Sector 4, Grid Area 8, sir. Identity type, Simmons? It's a Dominion command ship. Sound General Quarters, Code Red. Attention, this is not a drill. Condition, Code Red. All pilots to your fighters. Ground personnel to your support positions. Repeat, this is not a drill. This is General Zane. Come in, Cartone. Cartone, standing by. Launch your fighters, McCormick. Rendezvous with Richard's group. We're under attack. Code red. Understood. Commencing launch sequence. On the dark side of Cartone, a large camouflage nest of boulders silently splits open. The grid struts of a launch tower thrust their way into the Cartone darkness. Final countdown. Three, two, one. Launching. The rebel forces fan out, heading for the Dominion command ship. But an unusual twist of fate awaits them. General, the Dominion command ship has stopped. It's lowering all protective shields. Beta, infrared scan the command ship from your vantage point. What's going on? Scanning infrared now, General. All shields withdrawn. Bay area doors open. Entire ship exposed to our lasers. Steve, we're being hailed over the emergency comm link. I'll patch it through to all squadrons, sir. 
Dominion Command Ship to Rebel Forces. We come in peace and friendship. All defensive shields have been lowered. Identify yourself. Sergeant Nick Perchek of the 5th Column. We have taken full control of this ship. Lipton, can you verify voice ID? Sounds like Perchek, sir. Ask him for today's code word, Simmons. Request today's code word, Sergeant. Roger. Code words. Emerald Tree. It's Nick, all right. This is General Zane. Explain your present situation, Sergeant. Former commanding officer, General Vera Derrick. Missing and presumed dead on Vega after a Factor 7 geoseismic event there. We have confirmation of that event, Sergeant. Go on. The remains of Derek's humanoid were found in a compost masher on board the command ship. And Vishaya? Well, you already know about him. Loss of three commanding officers provided enough confusion to allow the fifth column to take control of the ship. Is your group able to maintain command? Affirmative, General. And we're offering the full firepower of a Dominion war cruiser for the rebel assault on Vega. Steve, you've heard all this? I copy every beautiful word, General. All attack fighters return to base, but maintain full alert status. Sergeant Pritchett. Yes, General. Take your ship into standard orbit around Cygnus 3. Beam down as soon as possible for final briefing. Our assault begins in a few hours. Inside the trembling caverns of Dominion Homeworld, a farewell takes place. What do you want, Creed? Master, the rebel assault on Vega will begin in a few hours. I humbly petition to remain and assist you, Master. Impossible, Krieg. I cannot afford to sustain your image any longer. You have served me well. One of my best creations. I... I do not wish to leave, Master. I've grown comfortable in your world of dominion. You are required to give back the energy that gave you life. I need it. Now, Krieg. Now. Do not destroy me, Master. You need me to intervene, to change the odds, to shift power and momentum. I will do your bidding in all things, Master. I feel your strength, Creed. The rebels will come, and I will be ready with one final move. Vega's energy field continues to lose power. Finally, the listening probe left behind on Luna 1 breaks through. Lieutenant McCormick sits spellbound on Cartone as a tortured voice speaks to him from the dead. Captain Thomas Dwyer, Brewer Expedition, Luna 1. How to begin? There is something on this godforsaken moon, something terrifying, so real, yet not there at all. It torments, attacks, tortures, reduces us to whimpering slaves, begging to be spared. No defense, no escape, a different form each time. It toys with us, probes and steals our thoughts. We do its bidding. We are nothing. Nothing. What's happening? Why are we losing the transmission? Sorry, sir. The probe switched to quadrant two. It's automatic. Covers Luna in four segments, sir. Be back to us in about ten minutes. Contact General Zane. Play back this section for him and patch them in for the next transmission. Yes, sir. The probe resumes transmitting. There is a captive audience on both Cygnus 3 and Cartone, straining to catch every word. We know now what it is, but the knowledge comes too late for us. I feel its power, an energy level beyond measuring. The visible forms disappear. 
but it's still here, holding us, using us, killing our will. Don't come unless you can destroy. Ten more agonizing minutes, then the captain's final words are heard. All dead. I am the last. I had to survive to tell the story. Horrible, unspeakable terror and power. And now you know the secret of this thing. It must be destroyed or Earth is doomed. The entire galaxy is doomed. The rebel leaders are meeting one last time to try to make the connection between Emerald Tree, the Secret, and the Dominion. For whatever reason, Dominion's power is at a low point. You can see evidence of it all over the galaxy. We took advantage of it when we seized the command ship. We've got to put all these clues together. A new way of looking at the evidence is needed. Duchess? There does seem to be a common thread running through all that's happened, General. The controlled manipulation of a powerful energy source, probably on Vega. And with that energy presence, terrifying illusions usually occur. Illusions? Wait a minute. Appearance and disappearance. Damage, then repair and healing. It's Emerald Tree. You mean the Dominion has a machine? Like your parents envisioned? A device capable of transforming pure energy into anything it chooses? Of course. Then it could create warships, whole armies, a show of force devastating enough to conquer and enslave a galaxy. If you were convinced it was real. Max Schumann was right. In the wrong hands, the Emerald Tree power has become a monstrous evil. And the proof is on the Dwyer tapes. It was there all along. Beta, cue up the captain's log to replay only the references to control or manipulation of the expedition members. Queuing up now. Editing. First reference. It torments, attacks, tortures, reduces us to whimpering slaves begging to be spared. It toys with us probes and steals our thoughts. We do its bidding. Holding us, using us, killing our will. Dominion must have used this energy source from the beginning, creating monsters, spacecraft, anything they needed to instill terror. We also have been doing its bidding. The line between reality and illusion was erased. How much of this war hasn't even been real? But I don't completely understand. Where does the Brewer expedition fit in? Logically, Sergeant, they were Dominion's guinea pigs, tested and probed to learn about the inhabitants of this galaxy before they attacked. To destroy Dominion, first you must destroy... destroy the energy source responsible for its power and control. That's the secret. If it is, then somehow we've got to get inside, find the energy source, destroy it and the device that controls it. But the force field around Vega, it's still deadly. That's no illusion. Too many have died trying to get through it. Perhaps I might have a solution. But you humans have neglected to consider a most important variable. Either the power source on Vega is diminishing simply because it's being used up, or Dominion's weakness is another illusion, luring us into a trap, a trap with no escape. The rebel strike proceeds on schedule. Beta's plan is to break through the energy field in a daring maneuver. One miscalculation and instant death. Commander Richards and Lieutenant Lipton in Protojet 1. Come in, command ship. Are you in position? Affirmative, Steve. The Duchess and I are orbiting outside the Vega atmosphere. McCormick's assault team is standing by. Launch the two drones. 
we'll fire boosters when we see them. Counting down. Three, two, one, launch. From the port side of the command ship, two automated pilotless fighters emerge and are guided toward the Vega energy field. I have a visual on the drones, Commander. Protojet 1 to Protojet 2, ready to fire attitude correction boosters. Three second burn, Christina. We'll tailgate each drone as closely as possible. Roger. Boosters ready on Protojet 2. Fire. Approaching energy field. Timing critical, Commander. No margin for error. Okay, everybody, hang on. This is gonna be one wild ride. Running interference, the drones hit the energy force field. Ready, hyperspace. Fire! Before the hole in the energy field can close, the two rebel protojets slip into the Vega atmosphere in a perfectly timed drafting maneuver. All right! Beta, you're terrific! Yes, I did do rather well, didn't I? Commander, what's happening? We're caught in some kind of giant vortex. Gyro's out of control. Stabilizers won't work. Spinning. G-forces. Crushing. I can't breathe. Like miniature tops spun by a giant hand in space, the protojets spiral down at a heart-stopping pace. They will incinerate if speed is not reduced. Pulling apart! Can't stop! <laughs> you still don't understand, do you? This game is mine. Is everyone all right? Christina? Okay, here, Steve. Who or what was that? I don't know. Lipton, contact the command ship. Lieutenant Lipton to General Zane. Do you read, sir? I read you, Lipton. What's going on? Why are you holding position? Holding position? We were attacked. Tumbled and pitched in every direction, General. Not according to our readings. Your positions have remained unchanged since penetrating the force field. Not another illusion. You mean nothing happened to us at all? The landing party is on the Vega surface. Unbelievable. The shapes of mountains, rivers, trees changing and disintegrating before our eyes. Like watching a time exposure image. Whoever or whatever is holding these things together isn't doing such a great job anymore. Commander, this whole planet's shifting under our feet. Beta, have you pinpointed the source of the energy readings? Coming from that opening in those rocks, Commander. Definitely underground. All right, stay together. Let's go. Richard's group carefully picks their way through the crumbling passages inside Dominion Homeworld. Dust and debris choke the corridors. Commander, the energy source is behind this door. Laser pistols ready. We're going in. Empty. I don't see anything, but I sure do feel something. I feel it too. We know you're here. Rebel forces surround the planet. You have no chance to... <laughs> Your species continues to provide amusement. I will assume form. Don't move. Stay where you are. Your pitiful weapons are useless against me. Touch me and you die. Who are you? I am known as Igrathor. Where is the leader and the council of the seven? They are me, and I am them. Only I exist. I am Dominion. True or not, you're not doing it alone. Show us the source of your power, the machine that transforms energy into matter of your choosing. <laughs> How primitive. But then, limited intelligence was the reason I chose your galaxy for my game. There's no machine. The power comes from me. You? That's impossible. In your world, yes. Not in mine. Where is your world? In another galaxy. My kind ruled for millennia. Creating whatever we wanted or needed from pure energy. From ourselves. We gave substance. And what we created gave us purpose. 
What happened to your world, Igrithor? Destroyed. In an ion storm. My world and the source. A boundless fountain of pure energy to which we return again and again to continue the game of illusion. Why do you keep calling this a game? Your dominion creation destroyed whole planets, made slaves out of countless people. Your words have no meaning for my kind. Dominion is my purpose, my existence. Why Earth and its galaxy? After the destruction of my world, I wandered for thousands of your years, searching for the right time and place to undertake my greatest challenge. Here, I found what was needed. Here, I began. And I chose well. Human and alien alike were quick to pick sides and give full substance to my final illusion. Commander, might I point out there's no longer a source for him to return to for more energy. He is using himself up. His power is coming to an end. If he is holding this planet together... I understand, Beta. Only moments left. Why didn't you just destroy us? We do not seek the ends of our creations. The game is to sustain and manipulate them until the last possible moment. Then return to the source to begin again. I will never begin again. Dominion's power will cease to exist. What gave you the right? In my world, there is no right or wrong. Only purpose no longer matters. I am no more. With no energy field left to stop them, the landing party escapes from Vega, and not a minute too soon, the entire rebel force watches the disintegration of Dominion Homeworld. It's starting. Forces unnaturally held in check for years suddenly let go, and Vega explodes. Huge chunks of the planet break free. Hot gases from the interior hit the coldness of space and crystallize into a million splinters of light. Vega's core glows in its last brief struggle to survive. Then, nothing. It's over. Dominion's power is finally destroyed. This is not an end, my friends, but a beginning. We've been given a second chance, and we must not waste it. We'll call an immediate ceasefire, and convene a council of equals to settle our remaining differences. Perhaps Professor Max Schumann will give us guidance for a better world this time, based on freedom and justice. New from old, order from chaos, peace from destruction, emerald tree the way my parents thought it could be. That's the real secret of Dominion. I wonder, what are the probabilities that Igra Thor was the only one of his kind to survive the destruction of his world? Could there have been others? Interesting.
will stay where you are. You will not move. We have some preparations to make. And then... Then something very odd happened. Half of Dr. Marlowe came alive. His right side first. His right eye lighting up while his left eye stayed dead. His right hand twitching while his left hand remained stiff. Half of him came alive. Only half. Theater 5 presents Terror from Beyond. What's that? Did someone... Remember! Try and remember! Sir, you will not remember. Do you understand? When we are gone, it will be gone. As if it had never happened. And you will not remember. But you've got to remember, John! You've got to! The whole future of mankind, of life on Earth, depends on it! You've got to! I sat up in bed, listening. The surf was pounding at the foot of the cliff. But that was all. Had I really heard something, or just imagined it? I didn't know. All I knew was I was in a cold sweat... But that wasn't surprising after what had happened. The deaths and... Deaths? But they'd been accidents. Maybe if I went back over it from the beginning... That's right, John! Start back at the beginning! Then maybe you'll remember! And you've got to! You've got to! When was the beginning? When I arrived at the base, I suppose... Went to the administration building for that first briefing session with Dr. Marlowe and Roy. Oh, it's good to see you again, John. It's good to see you, Doctor. Great to have you aboard, John. Did you mind our doing this? Pulling strings to have you assigned up here for a while? Are you kidding? You said it was something interesting. We think it is. As interesting and important as any space work that's being done anywhere today. I know. We'll be putting a man on the moon in a few years, but... If we're to go on from there, one of the things we should know is what we're likely to find. In other words, whether there's intelligent life anywhere in the solar system. Mm -hmm. That's why I hated leaving the old project. You haven't. <laughs> this is still part of the old project. Uh, remember what our problem was on Van Gogh? Of course. A radio telescope can pick up any message from out there that might be beamed at us, but it's sometimes very difficult to tell precisely where it's coming from. Exactly. Well, we're using a technique here that'll take care of that. A light beam, rather than radio waves. You mean a laser? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, we discussed that. We've already hit the moon with a beam no bigger than a pencil, but suppose you do establish a contact, how do you get your feedback, your response? Well, we believe we've solved that problem, uh, theoretically at least. But we needed an electronic specialist to work on it with us. That's why we requested you. When do we start? Right away. Uh, by the way, you're sharing a cottage with Roy. Now, why don't you go on down there with him? Drop your luggage, we'll get to work. The work. I remember that. Weeks of it. Finally, the big night. The night of our first test. It was clear and cool. The ocean still, not thundering, but whispering at the base of the cliffs as if it were waiting... All the stars sharp and clear like signposts on the road to the infinite. Dr. Marlowe at the computer, Roy and I at the center console. T minus two. Check. By the way, Doctor, I meant to ask you before, what made you pick Damus as our first target? Well, it was a few weeks after you left the project. We got a message from there. No. Well, there was some question about it, John. First, as to whether it was really was a coherent message, and second, as to whether it was from Damus. The British got a fix on it, too. And it was on the hydrogen wavelength, the one we always said anyone out there would use. That's 
true. And even though we never got another one, I thought it was worth exploring further. Of course. But that's fantastic. Yes, it's an exciting prospect. But it's also a rather frightening one. Why do you say that? We're reaching out, John. We're getting close to the secret of matter. The origin of life. The mystery of the universe. Sometimes I become a little afraid. Afraid that we may stumble onto something that's too much, too big for us. T-minus ten seconds. Check. Power on. Give me a reading, John. Vector nine. Eighteen point two and steady. Time. How long to contact? Three minutes, 28 seconds. We sat there tensely, watching our instruments on the clock. Then... There it is, the feedback. We've done it. The trick now will be to maintain contact. Oh, wait a minute. What's that? It sounds like a pattern. Listen. Even numbers. Now odd numbers. Great Scott, do you think we've got something? Follow it. Follow it. Start with an even series. We started following the pattern, and we got nothing. We kept at it all night, most of the next day. Still nothing. Wait. The next night, it's starting to come back to me now. I remember. I remember. It was the sound of the generators that woke me. It was about two in the morning. I padded out along the duck boards to the control building. The lights were on. I went in. And there was Dr. Marlowe. He was sitting at the control panel, and he was strange. His eyes were open, but he didn't seem to see me. Dr. Marlowe? Dr. Marlowe, what is it? What are you doing? Dr. Marlowe! Then, something very odd happened. Half of him came alive. His right side first. His right eye lighting up while his left eye stayed dead. His right hand twitched while his left one remained stiff. And then... What? Oh, oh hello, John. Is uh, anything the matter, Doctor? No. Why should anything... What am I doing here? Doctor, have you ever walked in your sleep before? Oh, not that I know of. Of course, I haven't been sleeping too well lately. Rather disturbing dreams, but... John, did you change this beam frequency? No, Doctor. You must have done it in your sleep. Shall I switch it back? No. Cut the power, but leave it. I'd like to look at it again in the morning. Do some thinking about it. Somehow, neither of us mentioned it the next day. We just went on with our work, collecting data, trying for another contact, if it had been a contact. And that night, yes, it was that night that we discovered what it meant. The generators woke me again. I looked at my watch. It was almost three o'clock, and for some reason, I was terrified. The door of Roy's room was open. As I went by, I saw that his bed was empty. Then I was walking along the duck boards to the control building. The lights were on again. I looked in through the window. And Dr. Marlowe was at the panel as he'd been the night before with that same dead look on his face. And Roy was standing in front of him, talking to him. I could hear him through the window. Dr. Marlowe. Dr. Marlowe, what is it? Is anything wrong? He's asleep. Walking in his sleep. Better get John. He started toward the door. Then, apparently deciding he'd better not leave the generators on, he turned and went toward the master switch. And as he did, Dr. Marlowe moved. His face still dead, expressionless. He got up, took a heavy wrench, and followed Roy. Then, just as Roy put out a hand to throw the switch, he hit him. I saw Roy's body crumple to the floor. I stood there frozen, unable to move. Dr. Marlowe looked down at him for a moment with no sign of emotion on his face. 
Then, like a zombie, he went over to the workbench again, picked up an odd assortment of tools, and returned to Roy's body. He bent over him, looking at him as if he were a laboratory specimen. And as I realized what he was going to do, my paralysis left me. I shouted and started for the door, but just before I reached it, I tripped, hit my head, and that was the last I knew. not sure how long I was out, but when I came to, I was lying in front of the door and a dark shape was bending over me. John, what happened? Keep away from me. Don't touch me. I saw what you did in there. And where? When? Just now, in the control room, to Roy. What do you mean? I just came up here from my cottage. I had a bad dream, came out to get some air, and I found you lying here. But I tell you, I saw you and... And what? I, I must have imagined it, dreamed it, because... I thought I saw you kill him. We looked everywhere, but there was no sign of Roy. Then we hurried back to the control building and searched it again. He's not here either, John. No. Must be in my mind. Of course, if it had really happened, there'd be something, if not his body, at least his blood. Where, John? Where would it be? Right here, in front of the master switch. But there's nothing. No. Except that the floor is wet. Looks as if it's been scrubbed. Hey, you're right. John, did you change the beam frequency this way? No, Doctor. You must have done it just the way you did last night. Last night? You mean something happened last night, too? You don't remember? No, no. Tell me what you thought you saw happen tonight, whether you believe it or not. Well, you were sitting at the control panel with your eyes open, but as if you were asleep. Yes, the generators were on, and the beam frequency was set the way it is now. Roy was speaking to you, but you didn't answer him. Then when he started to cut the power, you picked up a wrench and hit him. I hit Roy? But that's not the worst of it. After that, you picked up some tools and bent over him as if... Well, as, as if he were a laboratory animal. Telling you about it now, I know the whole thing's mad. It's impossible. I wonder... You mean it could have happened some way? Without your knowing it? In the old project. And in this one. We've been listening for messages from out of space. Trying to determine whether intelligent life exists anywhere in our galaxy. John, if it did exist, what form would it take? Well, it wouldn't necessarily look like us with two arms and legs. Exactly. But... And suppose it existed in a totally different form. In the form of electrical energy. Electrical energy? Why not? Isn't that the way the brain functions? Giving off electromagnetic waves? And what do we know about Deimos? Suppose... Suppose living beings existed there. In the form of complex electrical charges. And a channel were suddenly opened between it and the Earth. Our laser beam. Mm. You mean they could travel down and take hold of someone? You I'm and then... speculating, John. Of course, even if it's true, we don't know if these entities are malevolent, dangerous or not. When they killed, made you kill Roy? Because he was going to shut off the transmitter, cut off contact with their base. As for the rest, well, they'd be very interested in the human body, particularly the brain. They'd want to examine it, study it. Do you realize what you're saying, suggesting, Doctor? Intelligences from outer space, another world... The taking over of a man's body by forces yes, that we... Yes, John, I know what I'm saying. And while I'm only hypothesizing, I don't really believe it's possible. Do you own a gun? Yes. So happens I do. Well, start carrying it. And if you notice me doing anything strange, don't hesitate. Shoot. And shoot to kill. <laughs> I didn't go back to sleep that night, and I was convinced that I would never sleep again, because it would be then that it would be easiest for them to... No, no, I can't think about it. I won't, even now. I felt a little better in the morning. I went over to have another talk with Dr. Marlowe, but he wasn't at his cottage. He wasn't anywhere on the base, and no one seemed to know where he was. 
Then I called Colonel Gately at headquarters. No one there knew anything about Dr. Marlowe or Roy. But by that time, something had happened to me. It had all become blurred, like an old nightmare that you know was frightening, but whose details you can't remember. About a week later, the colonel called me and asked me to meet him at the police station in the town nearby. You knew Swanson pretty well, didn't you, Parker? Yes, of course. Some fishermen found a body in their nets this morning. We'd like you to look at it. Oh? All right. Brace yourself. Here. Good Lord. I... I can't be certain, but... I'm fairly sure it's Roy. How did he die? We'll have to wait for the coroner's report, but my guess is that he fell off the cliff. And Dr. Marlowe? Nothing new on him yet, but if they were together, his body may turn up soon, too. He was a better prophet than he knew, because Dr. Marlowe came back that very night. I'd taken something to make me sleep. It was the only way I could sleep, but the sound of the generators woke me. I took my gun and went to the control building. The lights were on. I opened the door... And there was Dr. Marlowe. He was standing near the console, his face thin and drawn, and his eyes blank. And when he spoke, his voice was hardly human, as if someone was speaking through him. It is unfortunate that you awakened, Parker, and even more unfortunate that you came in here. What do you mean, Doctor? Where have you been, and why are you talking so strangely? We have been looking over your planet, studying it and its life. Particularly, you so-called humans. We have found it very interesting. And now, we are ready to go. Go? Go where? Wait. You said we. Dr. Marlowe, have they... You will stay where you are. You will not move. We have some preparations to make. And then... Her voice, that horrible voice, broke off. And Dr. Marlowe swayed as if he were about to fall. I grabbed him, held on to him. And then his eyes changed, came alive. And when he spoke again, it was with his own voice. John, John, for heaven's sake, help me. They got me. They took me that night. Took me all over the country, looking, examining, studying. They picked my brain, John. And now they're going to take me with them. Take you? Back to where they come from. Not my body. They're not interested in that. But the essential me. And in heaven's name, shoot, John. Shoot me! And now, we are ready. Look here. At his eyes. Look closely. Yes, like that. As your friend told you, we are taking him with us. But you will not remember what has happened. You will remember nothing. Do you understand? Because someday, we may come back. I stood there, frozen, holding Marlowe. Suddenly, he broke my grip, pushed me away. Walking stiffly and mechanically, he went to the door, opened it, and went out along the duckboards to the edge of the cliff. Then, without hesitating, he stepped over the edge and disappeared. Now do you remember, John? It's all true! They exist! And they've got me here! Not only that, but they may return to Earth again for others! John, they're coming back now. They're coming. Do something. When I woke up about a half hour ago, I found this all written out on the pad I keep next to my bed. I remember some of what I'd written. But other parts, like Roy's murder and Dr. Marlowe's death, I don't recall at all. Either I'm mad, completely mad, or... No. No, I can't think about that. In any case, if I showed this to anyone, the world would think I was mad. 
There's only one thing to do. Tear it up. Every last page of it. Every last page of it. Every last page of it. Theater 5 has presented Terror from Beyond, written by Robert Newman and directed by Warren Somerville. In the cast, Robert Dryden, Ralph Camargo, and Gilbert Mack. Audio engineers Marty Folia and Bill Sandreuter. Sound technicians Ed Blaney and M.C. Brock. Original music composed by Alexander Vlastatsenko. Orchestra under the direction of Glenn Osser. Executive producer for Theater 5, Edward A. Byron. This is Fred Foy speaking. Wheat checks, rice checks, and good hot Ralston present Space Patrol! High adventure in the wild, vast reaches of space. Missions of daring in the name of interplanetary justice. Travel into the future with Buzz Corey, Commander-in-Chief of the Space Patrol. In today's transcribed adventure, Buzz and Happy are in their spacesuits, investigating a gigantic six-wheeled atomic digging machine on the planet Mercury. As they walk across the deeply cracked ground in 300-degree heat, the huge machine starts moving toward them with increasing speed. They're trying to run us down with the machine, Commander. Get to the ship, Happy. It's hard to run in these bulky suits. Maybe we can dodge the driller. Don't try it. The driller's big, but it can turn like a cat. It's gaining on us. Don't look back. Run. Hey! Quick, Happy, on your feet. My foot's caught the crevice. Hey, give me your hand. No, you, sir. I can't get loose. I'm caught. Commander, get away, please, while you can. The driller's almost on top of us. We'll be back in just a moment with today's Space Patrol story, The City of the Sun. Hey, gang, listen to this poor old rocket ship here at the Lunar Fleet Base. You know what the trouble is? That rocket's trying to run on ordinary fuel. Now, here's that same rocket ship loaded with super fuel. Now, that's what I call a real blast-off. And, boys and girls, to get a bright and snappy start, you need super fuel, too, especially in the morning. So start your day with a breakfast that supercharges you, a nourishing breakfast with a checkerboard super cereal, like Rice Chex, triple crisp Rice Chex, triple crisp because it's toasted three times. And, oh, boy, is Rice Chex delicious. Makes breakfast sparkle, that's how good it is. Rice Chex. Golden shredded rice biscuits in that modern bite sized design for easy eating. So remember, gang, to start off bright and snappy in the morning, eat a nourishing breakfast with a checkerboard super cereal and get supercharged. Today, try your spoon out on Rice Checks. Commander Corey and Cadet Happy are on the planet Mercury, organizing space patrol units into a search for Professor Mallison, whose spaceship vanished on the dark side of the planet. But now, a second emergency on another part of Mercury sends Buzz and Happy racing to the hot side of the tiny planet to Solaria, the city of the sun. Who's behind the sabotage, sir? I don't know, Happy. That's what we've got to find out. But I've got a pretty good idea what the motive is. What's that, sir? Solaria has suddenly become very important because of the mineral deposits that have been found about 60 miles south of the city. South? That means it's hotter than the Solaria area. Well, how do they work it? With robot-controlled mining equipment operated from Solaria. And with spacesuits, a few technicians can work in two-hour shifts on the mining site itself. Oh, and whoever sabotaged the power plant doesn't want those mining operations to continue. Yeah, it probably cuts into their own source of revenue. I suppose this is more important, but... I sure would have liked to locate Professor Mallison first. We've got the search units well organized, Happy. They'll comb the entire dark side of Mercury with infrared viewscope scanners. Well, do you think the professor could still be alive, sir? Mm, he's been missing over four days. 
That would be a long time to hold out in sub-zero temperature on the dark side of the planet. Well, how about the spacephone signal picked up yesterday, though? That, that was from Mallison, wasn't it? Yeah, it was his code, all right. But it was an automatic signal. It could have been sent from one of the small rockets Mallison had aboard his ship. When released, it automatically sends back information on cosmic radiation, temperature, and Mercury's own magnetic field. Oh, that's what Mallison was studying? Yes. Even if he locate the rocket, it wouldn't mean it's anywhere near Mallison's ship. A commercial spaceship picked the signal up briefly just for a few seconds. All they got was Mallison's identification code and the temperature. 122 degrees below zero. Yeah, which could mean that Mallison released the rocket several days ago and it landed on the dark side of the planet. Right. Commander, what's that? It looks like steam shooting out of the ground down there. It's like a geyser. Geyser on the hot side of Mercury? Happy, check our exact position. I don't like the looks of this. Yes, sir. I'll call Solaria Space Control. Corey and Terra 5 to Space Control Solaria... Corey and Terra 5 to Space Control, Solaria. Space Control, Solaria to Commander Corey, Lieutenant Orris here. Lieutenant, I'm flying low northeast of Solaria. My cadet and I have sighted something that looks like steam shooting out of the ground. Steam, Commander? Yes, I'll give you our position. Check it against the location of water conduits leading to the city. Yes, sir. Happy, got the data? Yes, sir. We're 10 degrees, 27 minutes, 48 seconds south by 112 degrees, 51 minutes, 08 seconds east. Got that, Lieutenant? Yes, sir. I'll check it against the chart. Commander, do you suppose it is a broken conduit? I don't know what else it could be, Happy. Possibly a quake broke the pipe. Commander, it looks like a broken conduit, all right. Solaria's main water supply line runs right through that point from melting and pumping station number three on the cold side of Mercury. Better check with Solaria water control. See if they've noticed a drop in pressure. Yes, sir. Thanks for telling us. If that's a bad break, we'll be in a tough spot here. Is there a seismograph in Solaria? I believe there is, sir. I suggest you check the city engineering office. Have them contact other cities on the planet and see if there's been a quake in this area. Yes, Commander. We'll circle this vicinity to see if any further trouble develops. Report back when you get the information. Corey, out. Well, from the looks of that ground down there, sir, they must have a lot of quakes in this region. You mean those deep cracks? Well, those were formed millions of years ago, Happy, when Mercury first began to dry out under the terrific heat. Yeah, but with one side of the planet covered with ice and the other side with blistering heat, well, wouldn't there be a lot of quakes? Well, as far as I know, there hasn't been a serious one reported in recent years. We'll keep circling till we hear from Solaria. Yeah, we take it easy, Burdock. This is pretty rough ground. Well, these atomic drillers weren't made for comfort, bro. And I want to get plenty of distance between us and that broken water conduit. We're going 70 with this thing. If we hit one of those cracks at the speed, we'll tip over. Just quit worrying. We're riding on six wheels. And each of them are 20 feet in diameter. And every wheel has its own power drive. I think we're in more danger of being spotted by a space patrol ship than we are of upsetting this monster. What do we do with the driller when we get to our spaceship? We just leave it. It's pretty well camouflaged to blend in with this cracked yellow ground here. We can find it again if we need it. You aren't planning to drill any more holes in the Solaria water supply, are you? No, uh, not right away. But this job will cause plenty of trouble. You think they'll be able to repair it? Probably. But with things like this happening, trouble with power and water... The rival companies are going to think twice about using Solaria as a base of operations. Hey, Burdock, watch it! Nearly tipped us over. Well, we just relax, Joe. We're almost to the ship. Well, sir, it looks like the conduit broke in just that one place. Uh, that's lucky. But even at that, it'll take several hours to get many equipment out here to repair it. Space Control Solaria calling Commander Corey aboard Terra 5. Corey here. Go ahead, Lieutenant. A maintenance crew is getting ready to leave Solaria now, Commander. They know the location. Oh, good. We'll head for Solaria. What about the seismograph reports? No quakes have been detected anywhere on Mercury, sir. The chief engineer doesn't understand how that conduit could have broken. How's your water supply? Pressure has dropped to less than a quarter of normal, sir. We're already on a strict water rationing. Nearly all industries have been ordered to shut down for 24 hours. Will it take that long to repair the damage? At least. Oh, uh, Commander... Colonel Henderson thought you might be interested in a report on Professor Mallison. Well, yes, I am. Have they found him? No, sir. But another automatic signal was picked up by a cargo ship, apparently from a grounded instrument rocket. It isn't much help. What do you mean? It's sending inaccurate information. The cargo ship pilot got a rough fix before the signal stopped. It's on the hot side of Mercury, but the temperature data was 122 degrees below zero. Same as the other report. The sending mechanism must have been damaged when the rocket landed. Yes, sir. Uh, thanks, Lieutenant. I'll contact you when we reach Solaria. Corey, out. All right, Happy. Get on vector for Solaria. Yes, sir. Hey, wait a minute. Look down there on the ground. What is it, Commander? See those gouges? A sort of crisscross pattern. Yeah, two rows of them. They're tracks. What would make tracks that far apart? Some heavy earth-moving machinery, probably. Oh, from when the conduit was laid. Uh, I don't think so. Focus the viewscope toward the steam spout. 
Yeah, see? The tracks end right near the place where the break is. Hey, that's right. Follow those tracks in the other direction, Happy. Hey, they lead away from Solaria. That makes them interesting. Any surface equipment out here would be more likely to come from Solaria than anywhere else. We're going to find out where those tracks lead. Just a few minutes more, Grove. Our ship's on the other side of the jagged butte. Oh, she'll be glad to get out of this villa. You're mighty peculiar, aren't you? You don't like spaceships either. Who says I don't? Well, didn't you get space sick the other day? Well, or was it because I shut down the lab ship? You shouldn't have done that, Burdock. He wasn't bothering us. He was on some scientific mission. Well, it's just too bad. He came snooping around just as we blasted off from our hideout. We didn't have a chance. Don't be so squeamy. By acting quickly, we probably kept the space patrol from spotting us near the power relay station. And what's the matter? It's a reduce It's a ship. Yeah. It's flying low, right toward us. Think they see us? I don't know. Hey, why'd you stop the driller? Because if we're moving, they might spot us. But with the sides and top of the drill camouflage, they might not notice. Uh, They went right over. It's a space patrol ship. They must have spotted the break in the water line. Yeah, but why were they going so slow? How do I know? We'll just sit tight and see what they're up to. Happy, look down there. The tracks stop. It's hard to tell. The ground must be packed almost as hard as concrete in some places. I'll circle back. Use the viewscope scanner. Yes, sir. Uh-oh. Hey, there is something down there. A hump of something. A small hill, maybe. Now, look closer. Did you ever see a hill on wheels? Yeah, I can see it now. It's a big piece of machinery, and it's camouflaged. Happy, get our spacesuits out of the locker. I'm setting the ship down. Yes, sir. Check the refrigeration units in the suits carefully. We're going to be walking around in oven temperature down there. They must have seen us. Why would they land their ship clear out here? Just take it easy, Rolf. We're safe in the driller. Nobody could get in unless we opened the door. Somebody's getting out of the ship. Two men. Hey, hey that's Terra 5. Come into Corey's ship. We don't open up. Corey will go back to his ship and report us. They'll send a crew out here with cutting torches. If Corey gets back to the ship. How can we stop him? We'll stop him all right. You just wait and see. Wow, now that we're on the ground, that machine looks enormous. It's an atomic driller, Happy. The camouflage covers the drill part, but it's built to cover the toughest kind of terrain and drill through solid rock. Yeah, then that's what happened to the water conduit. Drilling into the main would be simple for that machine. Yeah, it looks that way. Have your gun ready, Happy. Whoever's in there probably won't be too eager to answer questions. Hey, Commander, it's moving. They're making a getaway. Get back to the ship, Happy. Yes, sir. Commander, it's coming toward run, us. Run, Happy. They're trying to run us down. It's hard to run in these bulky space suits. Maybe we can dodge the driller. Don't try it unless you have to. That driller's big, but it can turn like a cat. The, gr- the ground's so full of cracks and ditches. Commander, it's gaining on us. Don't look back. Run. Hey. Half on your feet. Quick. My foot's caught in the crevice. Hey, give me a hand. Run for it, Commander. They can't get both of us. You've got to get away. No, give me your hand, Hap. No, you, sir. I'm caught. Commander, look out. The driller's right on top of us. You've got to leave me. We'll be back with Space Patrol in just a moment. Shh. Space Patroller Dick Tufeld, gang. I've got a secret for you. Wait till I close the door. Okay? Now, here's a secret Buzz Corey wants you to know about. The secret of how space patrollers get a rip-roaring start in the morning. Now, here's what they do. They eat a breakfast that supercharges them. A good breakfast with one of the three checkerboard super cereals. Rice Chex, Wheat Chex, and Instant Ralston. Chex, they're the super cereals with that modern bite-sized design. The cereals with a swell new taste you'll like right off the reel. And to warm up your motor, there's Instant Ralston, the hot super cereal. Has a heart-of-the-wheat flavor that you'll really warm up to. So now you know how space patrollers get that rip-roaring morning start. Get a flying start yourself every morning, gang. Sit down to a nourishing breakfast with a checkerboard super cereal and get supercharged. Rice checks, wheat checks, good hot Ralston, the super cereal. 
Flying low above the hot side of the planet Mercury, Buzz and Happy have sighted a gigantic atomic drilling machine. The driller is driven by Burdick and Grulf, who have bored a hole in the water conduit leading to Solaria, a city in the sun-baked Mercury desert. Buzz and Happy don spacesuits to investigate a cleverly camouflaged drilling machine. Suddenly, the driller started up, rolling across the cracked and fissured earth on its six giant wheels. Happy caught his foot in a large crack in the ground. And now, as Buzz tries to pull Happy free, the enormous driller roars down upon them. It's no use, sir. It's still right after us. It's going to crush us. Fall flat. Dive into that crevice quickly. Yes, Happy, are you all right? I guess so, sir. I'm half buried in the dirt. Uh, don't move yet. Stay down in the crevice until the driller's out of sight. We don't want them coming back to finish the job. I sure thought we were goners when that big thing thundered over us. We we're lucky to find the crevice deep enough. They're still going, I guess. Yeah. Fortunately, they didn't stop to wreck our ship. That means they're sure they crushed us under the wheels. The driller's completely out of sight now, sir. All right, into the ship, Happy. We won't take time to get out of these suits till after we blast off and start our search for that drilling machine. Well, here we are. Here's your space suit, Burdock. Get into it and let's get to the ship. Mm, I see you were already. Yeah, all but the face piece. You know, sometimes I get the impression you don't enjoy riding in a driller. What the funny stuff. Let's get out of here. <laughs> How do we know Corey didn't send a space phone message before he got out of his ship? You're right, Grove. But before we leave, I'm going to set a magnesium bomb and leave it in here. What for? I'll make sure that this drill is useless to anybody else. And it'll leave this cab in such a mess that the space patrol can't find any fingerprints. All right. All right, but let's get at it. There's something up ahead, sir. Looks like smoke. You're right, Happy. It's the drilling machine that's on fire. It's not moving. Hey, do you suppose whoever was in it got out? Well, let's hope so. Uh, wait a minute. By the color of the smoke, that must be magnesium. It must have been deliberately started to wreck the control mechanism. But where's the driver? Uh, take a look at that scorched area on the ground a few yards from the driller. A blast-off scar. Uh -huh. Our driller operator had a spaceship hidden here. Turn on the viewscope, Happy. Maybe you can pick up a trace of him. Now contact Space Control Solaria. Commander Corey aboard Terra 5 calling Space Control Solaria. Commander Corey calling Space Control Solaria. This is Space Control Solaria, Commander. Lieutenant R.S. speaking. Lieutenant, relay this bulletin to all Mercury Space Patrol units. Yes, sir. A spaceship of unknown type just blasted off from the vicinity of the broken water conduit. Interrogate all space-borne private craft. Ground all suspicious ships and hold the occupants. I'll relay that message, Commander. Can you give any sort of description of the ship? No, we merely saw the blast-off scar. Looked like it was from a small space cruiser. That water main break was deliberately sabotaged. An atomic driller did the job. Atomic driller? Yes. We found it abandoned near the break. Tell Colonel Henderson I want investigators sent out to examine it. They'll need firefighting equipment. Yes, sir. Make an immediate check of all known atomic drilling machines on Mercury. Where they are and who has them. Yes, Commander. How's the water situation in Solaria? It's even more serious than we thought, sir. We're setting up cargo ships to bring some in from other cities. Oh, uh, Commander, a Venus-bound passenger ship reported seeing a wrecked lab ship south of Solaria. The pilot thought it might be Professor Mallison's ship. South of Solaria? How far south? Fifteen DU, sir. That's the hottest part of the planet. Even if the ship wasn't badly damaged by the crash, it looks bad for Mallison. The same passenger ship also picked up Mallison's automatic coat, sir. And another temperature report. 122 degrees below zero. Below zero? That seems impossible. Have you sent any units to investigate? Not yet, sir. Colonel Henderson... Uh, yes, I know. You've got problems of your own, Lieutenant. You give me the location of that crash ship. I'll investigate it myself. And 87 degrees, 16 minutes, 43 seconds west. Good night. I suppose that's the ship you shot down? Shut up, Inverness. I got their frequencies, both of them. Got it, Lieutenant. One more thing, Commander. The passenger ship pilot isn't sure, but he thought he saw something moving near the crashed ship. It doesn't seem likely. No, it doesn't. But I'll get there as quickly as I can. Corey out. Corey alive? Yeah. It was somebody else we ran over with the driller. Cut it off. That is the first ship you shot down, and there's someone still alive. There couldn't be. That was four days ago. And even in the best space suit made, nobody could live four days in that heat. What are we going to do? I'm going to make sure. Maybe we can get there before Corey does. And if not, we'll cut Corey's investigation short. Murdoch, maybe we didn't kill those men with the driller. Maybe it was Corey and somebody else, and they escaped somehow. Well, if he did, he wouldn't escape this time. You marked down those coordinates, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, they're right here. All right. 
I'll take the controls. You get on the view scope. We don't want to get close to another ship, especially Corey's. We're nearly to the location, sir. Drop her down a few thousand feet, Hap. Yes, sir. Hey, this part of Mercury looks even worse than where we were before. Rougher terrain. Yes, and it's even hotter. Close to 500 degrees. Now, listen. Get that down, Hap. Yes, sir. M-L-S-28. Mercury Lab Ship 28. That's Mallison's identification code. Temperature minus 122 degrees. Hey, it cut out. Minus 122 degrees. I got a fix in that signal, Happy. It's almost directly below us. Look. It's a cracked up ship, all right. A lab job, too. Get your spacesuit on, Happy. Yes, sir. Whatever we do, we've got to do it fast. Hey, Commander, down there by that cliff, it's a man in a spacesuit. That's incredible. He's waving to us. Stand by for repeller ray. That's the lab ship, all right. Even in the view scope, you can see it's pretty badly smashed up. Yeah, but we're too late. Corey ship is landing right near it. What do we do? He'll probably go in to find what's left of Mellison. When he does, we'll swoop down and bless the wreckage. And then shoot up Terrify. Better not get so low, Burdock. They may see us. There is not much they can do about it. Anyway, I'm keeping between them and the sun. Nobody's going to look up at the sun, especially here on Mercury. Wait a minute. They're running right past the ship. Where are they going? Oh, maybe. Seeing something close to the cliff. Burdock. It's a man. And he's alive. After four days in the blessed furnace down there, it's impossible. See for yourself. Uh, must be Mellis. We've got to make sure that none of them get out of here. Get your space suits on, Gro. We aren't going to land. Not unless we have to. But I'm going to make sure that all three of them are finished before we leave here. Check your suit spacer phone, Happy. That's working okay, sir. And so's the temperature control. And we'll need it. All right, open the outer hatch. Allison's acting pretty strange, sir. He just stands over there and motions to us instead of coming toward us. It's hardly a normal way to greet rescuers. Let's see if his spacesuit transmitter's working. Professor Mallison, this is Commander Corey. Can you read me? He's just waving more excited than ever. Professor, if you hear me, hold both hands over your head. He's doing it. Apparently he can hear us, but his transmitter's out. I thought I heard something in the earphones just for a second and another voice. Professor, is there some reason why you want us to come over there? If there is, hold your hands straight out at your sides. Yeah, th- that's what he wants us to do. We better do as he asks. But how did he manage to survive in this heat? Commander, it's a cave. Yeah, I see. Commander, can you hear me now? Oh, yes, Professor. My space phone wasn't working, so I couldn't answer you. Commander, you've got to look at this. It's a happy surprise to find you alive, Professor. That spacesuit must be remarkably resistant to heat. It isn't the suit that's responsible. Just look in here, where the beam from my atomic light is shining. It just looks like an ordinary cave. Further back. Look at the walls. You mean that shiny blue-black mineral? Commander, that's ice. Ice? Ice. In this part of Mercury? Right. Thousands of tons of it, perhaps millions. And that's how you manage to stay alive. It's cool in the cave. Yes, with 570 degrees outside, inside it's a constant 122 below zero. And your automatic rocket transmitter was right. Commander, do you realize what this underground ice means to Mercury? To the people of Solaria in particular? You mentioned millions of tons. A conservative estimate. Think how easily it could be melted and piped to Solaria. Only a matter of a few miles in comparison with the present hall of more than a thousand. It certainly is a timely discovery. Dozens of conduits can be built from here to Solaria at a fraction of the cost of the one line that was broken. A spaceship? Yeah, it must be a space patrol craft. Let's get to our ship, Professor. Believe me, this news will be welcome in Solaria. Well, what I don't understand is how all this ice could be underground in the hot part of Mercury. The rock above insulates it. This is not a new phenomenon by any means. Why, on the planet Earth, more than a thousand years ago, Indians in the Arizona desert used to get ice from a natural cavern such as this. Hey, wait a minute. That's not a space patrol ship. It's a private cruiser. Hey, you're right, sir. It's taxiing around on repeller ray. I've seen that ship before. Why, it's the one that shot my lab ship down. Are you sure? I'm positive. Hey, what's a crazy fool doing? He's backing the ship right toward the cave. He'd better get out of here or he'll run over us. He's got something worse than that in mind. He's seen us and doesn't want us to get out. Well, maybe he's just backing up to get room to blast off between here and the opposite wall of the canyon. Up in your life. Quickly, get out of the cave. He's going to put his stern in here and turn on his rocket blast. It's lucky we saw him in time to get out of the cave. I get behind this rock. 
Maybe he won't see us from the ship. Hey. You're right, Commander. He's pushing the tail of his ship back in the cave with blasts from his forward rockets. He really intends to see that we don't get away from here. But keep close to the rock. I think we'll be safe here. Hey. He's keeping his forward rockets on to hold the ship in the cave. Something tells me he's going to regret this. Wow. The ship's wrecked. It shot right across the canyon into the opposite wall. His hand must have slipped off the controls. No, Happy. The heat from his rocket exhaust turned the ice into steam and it popped the ship out of the cave like a cork. We'd better get over there, Commander. They may be badly hurt. If they haven't got spacesuits on, they haven't a chance. Commander, I see somebody getting out. Yeah, there are two of them. And they do have spacesuits on. Let's get them. By their attitude, I don't think we'll have any trouble. No, sir. You know, uh, during the last few minutes, sir, I, I really realized what a wonderful thing water is. Isn't that so? Yes, sir. In the form of ice, it saved Professor Mallison's life. And when those two fellows turned it into steam, it uh, simply cooked their goose. <laughs> <laughs> An exciting preview of next week's new Space Patrol adventure after this important question. Have you sent for your Space Patrol spacephone yet? You better hurry! hurry! Yes, sir, this sensational offer is soon going to end. And you don't want to be left without one of these thrilling new space phone sets, do you? No, siree. So, hurry! hurry! More fun. You can talk back and forth on the space phone to someone a straight 50 feet away. Just like talking on the telephone. Complete with two space phones, 50 feet of communication cord, and secret briefing sheet. Now remember, these are official space phones, made especially for you on Earth. Real beauties, too. Gleaming blue and yellow plastic. Look exactly like the space phones Buzz Corey and the gang use. So don't wait a single day. Hurry! hurry! Yes, sir, you have to hurry, because this offer soon comes to an end. To get the complete Space Patrol space phone set, do this. Buy a box of Instant Ralston. Then, with your name and address, send 25 cents in coin and an Instant Ralston box top to Space Patrol, Box 686. St. Louis, Missouri. This offer good only in continental U.S. and may be withdrawn at any time. That's Space Patrol, Box 686. St. Louis, Missouri. And now for a preview of next week's exciting Space Patrol story. Buzz and Happy have just entered a spaceship in Neptune City spaceport in search of a traitor against the United Planets. They pause in the open hatch a moment. He may be up forward, tampering with the controls. Wrong guess, gentlemen. Uh, Commander, look out! Here we are, Cadet. I've got a ray gun. Yeah? Well, I've got a... Oh. I warned you. Oh. Carter, put down that gun. Don't try to get to your feet, Commander. What are you doing in this ship? Preparing it for its last voyage. <laughs> There's an explosive hidden aboard. Time to go off two hours after blast-off. And you, my friend, <laughs> will be aboard. Be sure to be with us next Saturday for the exciting story, The Queen of Space! Boys and girls, this is your commander. Do you know how life-giving oxygen is carried to the cells of the body? By the bloodstream. So when a person loses a great deal of blood in an accident or in sickness, there's not enough blood left to do that job. Result? The person dies. So, will you help me save lives by joining the Space Patrol blood boosters? It's fun, it's patriotic. So join the Space Patrol blood boosters today. <laughs> Space Patrol, an original Mike Moser production starring Ed Kemmer as Commander Corey and Lynn Osborne as Cadet Happy was written by Lou Houston and directed by Larry Robertson. Other players were Ken Mayer and Norman Jolly. Dick Tufel speaking. Now, don't forget to tune in next Saturday and every Saturday when Wheat Checks, Rice Checks, and Good Hot Ralston again present the new exciting Space Patrol! And be sure to see another exciting Space Patrol story 